Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door. We're going to begin tonight's festivities on a scientific note with something that will save you a good deal of money. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, it seems that quite a few people have taken to turning off their refrigerators during this program. Yes, they've discovered they can deep freeze all sorts of things by just listening to Inner Sanctum. Letting their blood run cold. (laughs) Well, Mr. Host, that's quite an idea. Have you any other scientific suggestions? Oh, certainly, Mary. For instance, here's a way to cut down on your laundry bills. Instead of having the laundry start your clothes, just put them on top of your radio Tuesday nights. In a sanctum, we'll scare them stiff. (laughs) (laughs) Now it's my turn, Mr. Host, and I'd like to make a suggestion, too. It's about an easy way to get more enjoyment out of your teapot. Here's the whole trick. Just use Lipton tea. In every cup of piping hot Lipton's, there's extra tastiness waiting to delight you. And the reason is Lipton's grand brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the tangy, full-bodied flavor of Lipton's. And what a pleasure that flavor is. No wonder more folks buy and enjoy Lipton's than any other brand of tea in the world. They've found, as you will, that Lipton's always has brisk flavor. It's never flat, always lively and spirited, with the hearty zest of tea at its best. So next time, serve Lipton tea. Its brisk flavor gives you more contentment in every cup. Now, friends, lend an ear to tonight's story. An original radio play by Robert Newman called Blood of Cain. Starring two of your radio favorites, Mercedes McCambridge and Carl Swenson. A tale of blood spilled in hatred and vengeance. A blood that carries a curse that is as old as man. Hmm? You don't believe that's possible, eh? And suppose you put out all the lights, pull your chair up close, and listen. A small square, once fashionable, on the outskirts of New Orleans. The iron balconies where elegant ladies once sat are now rusty and sagging. The paint on the rambling houses is cracked and peeling, and grass grows between the cobblestones. The bayous and the jungle have crept close to it, and at night the cries of strange birds, the croaking of giant frogs can be heard. What was formerly a living portion of the old world has become a place of decay and death. More pigeons died this evening. I saw them towering up and up into the darkening sky as if to escape the pain gnawing at their vitals and then fall into the square and into the garden. I still didn't believe, couldn't let myself believe. And then I saw her, standing in the shrubbery, the bag from which she had been feeding them still in her hand. I knew then that I could wait no longer, that I had to find out. Louise. Eugene. The pigeons. There's something wrong with them. They're... Dying. Yes. Yes. How? And why? I'm no chemist, but I'd I'd say it was poison. Poison? But who would do that? Louise. Now listen to me, dear. Please listen. I love you. I've loved you since I first came down here. First met you. You know that. And you know that I'll understand. Now tell me, why have you been doing it? You're the only one who feeds them. The only one who could do it. Oh, no, I didn't. Louise, where are you? Grandfather. Grandfather. Oh, oh, my dear child, what is it? The pigeons. They're dying. It's the second day now. And Eugene said... He said what? Have you looked at any of them, Dr. Phillips? Examined them? 
<laughs> Will you go into the house, my dear? I, I'll be along in just a minute. But, Grandfather... Please, please, dear. Yes, Grandfather. Go ahead. I'm very sorry you did this, Owen. Mentioned it to her. Did you examine any of the pigeons? I did. Poison. Probably from my laboratory. But then... Then you know... I know a great deal, Mr. Owen. I'm her grandfather. And I think it would be very wise if you kept away from Louise. Did not see her again. What? Well, that's ridiculous. I, I love her. I'm and... sure you do. But perhaps I did not make myself clear. If you continue to see her... It might prove dangerous for you. I didn't eat any supper that night. I went back to my room and sat there in the dark, staring at the shuttered, brooding house. About 11 o'clock, the door of the doctor's house opened quietly, and Louise came out. Without looking right or left, moving almost like a sleepwalker, she went up the street. I hesitated only a minute, and then I hurried down the stairs and after her. And just as I got downstairs, the door opened again, and... Is that you, Owen? Well, yes, Doctor. She just left the house. I was watching from the window. Yes, and... I know. She's done it several times, and this time I was determined to follow her and see where she goes. Look, she's hailing a cab. My car's right across the street. Quick. Louise went in there. What, what kind of a place is that? Uh, yeah, that smell. It's the smell of death. From the noise, I would say it was an abattoir. A slaughterhouse? Good Lord. But, but, but Why? Why would she come down here in the dead of night? I like you, Owen. I think you know that. And it was for your own sake that I warned you to keep away from her. There are things that you do not... Well, that you cannot know about her. No? Well, we'll see. I'm going in and get her and find out from her. Just a moment. There she is. Just inside the gate, talking to the watchman. No sense arguing about it, lady. I just can't let you in. But you must. You've got to. You always did before. That's just it. Now, once was all right, even twice. But, well, if you want to know the truth, the men have been complaining. Nobody exactly likes killing steers. But they say that the way you stand there watching them, well, well it makes them nervous. You've got to let me in. I'll make it worth your while. Watching the killing? Me, I... I've just got orders from the Oh, that... Uh... Oh, that's awful. It's horrible. I'm, 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 I'm going in again. No, 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 no. In, in the state she's in, well, having you come on her suddenly would have a very bad effect. But uh, you wait here. I'll go. No, 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 he wouldn't let me in. Take her out to the here. car, Owen. Come on, let's go. He can't go now. Leave him lying there like that. He's he's hurt. He may be dying. No, no, it's not serious. He's just stunned. We can phone for an ambulance as soon as we get home. But we've got to get her away from here immediately. <laughs> Sit down, Louise. Yes, Grandfather. I'm sorry I ran away like that, Eugene. But I suddenly felt strange. Ill. It's all right, Louise. You've been feeling that way quite often lately, haven't you? Yes. Yes, I have. Just what makes this feeling so strange? Well, it, it's hard to describe. It's as if I weren't myself anymore. It's the opposite of sleepwalking. It's as if I were awake, but not really conscious. And I hear voices, voices telling me to do things and whispering a name, a name that sounds like Jonah. Like what? You've been in my study reading my books. No, but I haven't, Grandfather. You always forbade me to... And how did you know that name? Well, whose name is it? And, well, what does it have to do with Louise? It's the name of a family which is almost extinct, and it is a name which means death. Mm -hmm. Oh, what do you mean? 
I was always very interested in the Jeunard family for reasons of my own. And I've collected all the historical references to them that I could. These references start with the 13th and 14th century. But by the 15th century, they had become the traditional executioners of France. Executioners? And in those days, you know what that meant. It was a Jeunard who put the torch to Jeanne d'Arc. A Jeunard received a handsome request from Louis XI for services rendered. A Jeunard operated the guillotine during the French Revolution. Perhaps that's why the family migrated here after the fall of the Republic. They came here? Yes. Twenty-odd years ago, there were a whole series of particularly atrocious murders here. The murderer was finally caught and executed. His name was Max Jeunard. Why do you tell me all this? And why should I constantly seem to hear that name? Well, even when you were little, my dear, you used to have those strange fits, spells when you would do unpleasant things. Afterward, you could never remember them. Oh. Now, do you remember poisoning the pigeons and going to the slaughterhouse? What? Oh, no, well, no. Well, I've never discussed the matter with you because I thought it might actually implant the idea in your mind. I'd hoped that if you were left alone, you'd outgrow it, but... But what? You still haven't told me what all this about the Jonas has to do with me. It has a great deal to do with you, my dear. You see, Max Jonat was your father. <laughs> well, now there's a girl with a real tradition in her family. A murderer for a father and a long line of ancestors who were real killer dillers. I was beginning to get a little worried about her. Fooling around, poisoning pigeons and things like that. And I can see now that there was method in her madness. After all, practice makes perfect. Good gracious, Mr. Host. Louise may turn out to be a very dangerous person. Yes, Mary. She's not the kind of a character you'd like to have ringing your doorbell. I should say not. Why, usually, as our Lipton listeners know, a doorbell is one of the nicest, most friendly sounds there is. Because so often it means friends are dropping in for a visit. Of course, your first thought is to make them welcome. So after you've taken their coats and made them comfortable, pour them a cup of flavorful, spirited Lipton tea. You know, it's wonderful how Lipton's add sparkle to the conversation. For there's extra enjoyment in its grand, brisk flavor. Mm, each sip is brimming with such lively, full-bodied tanginess. Yes, serve your friends Lipton's when they call. And when you say goodbye to them at the door, you can be sure they'll come back for another visit and another cup of Lipton tea. That's a friendly suggestion, all right, Mary. And now, are we ready to get down to business again? The kind of business that Louise's family has specialized in for a good many years. Murder. Oh, I know that what she's been interested in so far is small fry, but I think from now on she'll really be cooking with gas. Just a moment later now. Sitting in Dr. Philippe's study, Louise and Eugene Owen stare at the elderly gentleman with shock and horror in their eyes. You mean my father was a murderer? Your father, and his father before him, back as far as the family's history can be traced. Well, I don't believe it. And even if it is true, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to think this need to kill can be passed on from generation to generation. Well, of course, Owen, there is absolutely no scientific basis for it. Still, how else can you explain some of the things that Louise has been doing? Oh, it's true, it's true. These spells that come over me when I don't know what I'm doing. That name which I never heard consciously until... Oh, no, it can't be true, it can't... Oh, Louise, there No, Eugene, you... don't. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. If there's even a chance that it's so... Well, I didn't want to tell you. I, I was never very close to your father because he was a rather strange son-in-law... But if you want to know more about him, there is someone you should talk to. Joel Ferguson, down on Gaylord Street. He was the very last person to see your father alive. Yes, 
Mr. Ferguson? Yes. Who is it? My name is Louise Philippe. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes. Just a second. Come in. In here. Thank you. What did you say your name was again? Louise Philippe. At least that's what I always believed it was. Until yesterday. And then I discovered that my name was Louise Jonas. Jonas? Not Max Jonas? Yes. He was my father. What do you want of me through all these years? It wasn't my fault. You know it wasn't my fault. I, I only did what I had to do. I don't know what you mean. I was told that you were the last person to see him alive. And that perhaps you could tell me something about him. Yes. There are things that I can tell you. That he was evil, but that he knew he was evil. There was a curse on him that made him do the things he did do. Voices that whispered in his ear, told him to kill, made him kill. Voices? And in the end, at the last minute, he thanked me. He thanked you for what? For stopping him from doing any more killing in the only way he could be stopped. And when I put the rope round his neck... The, the rope? I was the state executioner. It was I who hanged him. You... You killed my father. I, I only carried out the sentence that was passed on him. And, and why... Why are you looking at me that way? I didn't know. I only came here to see you because... You're lying. If you were his daughter, then you were like him... You came down here to kill me. Kill you? That, that knife there in your bag. Huh? I didn't even know it was there. You're lying. Keep away from me. Keep away. But I didn't come down here to kill you. Then stop staring at me like that. Put that knife away. No. Oh, no. Oh, don't come near me. No. Oh, no. Good evening, Mr. Owen. Uh, where's Miss Louise Benson? I must see her right away. I I'm sorry, sir, but she's not in. She went out about a half hour ago. Oh, uh, well, where did she go? I'm afraid I don't know, sir. She didn't say. Well, what about Dr. Philippe? He's not in either, sir. He left right after Miss Louise as soon as he heard that she'd gone out. Oh? It seemed to me, sir, he looked rather worried. He said something about uh, Mr. Ferguson. Ferguson? Great Scott! If she went down... Thank you. Who's that? I'm looking for Miss Louise Philippe. I was told that she... Is that you, Dr. Philippe? Yes, Eugene. Is she here? Yes, she's here. But you're too late, just as I was too late. What? What, what do you mean? Inside there. See for yourself. Oh, don't tell me that anything's happened. Good. Lord. Louise. She won't answer you. That's the way I found her when I got here. Sitting there with a knife in her hand and Ferguson lying across the table, dead. Eugene. Louise. Eugene. Oh, Louise, Eugene. darling. Oh, why did you do it? Do... Do what? Ferguson. Dead? Yes, dear. Didn't you do it? I don't know. I didn't even know who he was when I came down here. And I found out that it was he who executed my father. And I started to hear those voices. Voices telling me to kill, that I had to kill. Then there was a knife in my hand. Oh, I can't remember. Voices. That's what Max said at the trial. It was the only defense he offered, but that he heard voices telling him to kill. It didn't save him. But in your case, a woman... What are you saying? Well, there's no sense even trying to escape. That would only make things worse, you know that. Yes, Grandfather. Except that there is only one way that things could be it worse. That is, if I were allowed to live. But, Louise, don't say that. You must... Oh, it's true, Eugene. 
For centuries to be a journal meant to bear the mark of Cain. Well, I'm the last of the journals, and there must never be another. Well, I had not gone quite that far, my dear, but perhaps you're right. I am right. To my grandfather, Eugene. Louise, come back. Wait. No, no, no. Let her go, Eugene. She's my own flesh and blood. But I think that may be the best way after all. Yes? Well, we'll see. Louise! Wait, please! It's no use, Eugene. It's all very clear. Clear as witches, bro. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Maybe it's because of our love that I understand. Maybe that was what was wrong with the Jonas. They never knew love, only hatred. But there is a cure. It lies there, in the river. Louise. No, please, dear. There's a curse on me, on all the Jonas that ever were. You're right. There is a curse, but not the kind that you think, dear. Listen, I was at the library all afternoon reading, and I think I understand now, for the first time, you understand what? The nature of the curse and how it can be ended. Because it can be ended in only one way. Oh, Eugene? Is that you? Eugene? No, Grandfather. It's not Eugene. Louise, why, I thought you... Why did you come back here to Ferguson's place? I don't know, Grandfather. The voices, the call in my blood, it's too strong. I tried, I wanted to end it finally and completely, either in the river or with the police. But I couldn't. You mean you're not going to give yourself up? No, Grandfather. I'm not going to give myself up. But that's not all I mean. Louise, you still got that knife? Yes, Grandfather. Walking up the street, realizing that I was still holding it, that it was red with blood. I think it was then that I knew for the first time what it meant to be a journal. Oh, look, Louise, you're completely distraught. That, that's only natural. But now, look, you put that knife down and let me take you home. I'll give you something that'll help you sleep and then... No, tomorrow... Grandfather, you won't give me anything. Ever again. Well, Louise, you... You're not going to kill me. Yes, Grandfather, that's just what I'm going to oh, do. No, please don't. no, don't try to get away. I'm younger Louise, and quicker than you. Sake, Louise. Just one quick no no, 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 listen to me. Listen carefully. You can't kill me. There's nothing driving you to do it. You see, you're not a journal. What are you saying? It's true. I, I am a journal. Next, you're not as my son. But you're not evenly, distantly re related to us. You're lying. You're lying. You're just saying that. No, no, that. no. no. I, I swear it's true. I changed my name when I studied medicine to avoid the stigma. But Max kept it. Your father was Louis Martin, the judge. You're lying. How is that possible? But because I adopted you after your father's death for a reason. It was your father who condemned Max to death. She didn't know Max was my son, and I didn't tell him until later. Your mother died when you were born, and I, I was your father's physician. And when he was desperately ill, I offered to adopt you and take care of you. And then when the papers were signed, I told him who I was, what I was going to do, that I was going to destroy you to avenge my son. And that's what killed him. But all those horrible things I've been doing, poisoning the pigeons, killing Ferguson... You haven't been doing them. It was I who did them, using drugs and suggestion to make you believe that it was you, so that you would either destroy yourself or... Oh, thank heaven, Eugene! Eugene, did you hear? Yes, dearest, I, I heard. And I told you, didn't I? Eugene! So it was a trick. A trick to trap me. Yes, doctor, it was. I was at the library and at City Hall all day, looking up the records. Here, drop that knife. No, Owen. This won't be as poetic a death as the one I'd planned for her, but... The, the lights! Louise, put the lights out! Oh, that won't help you. Either of you. You won't get away. I'll find you in the light or in the darkness. And... Ah, there you are. Die, then. Now you'll die! 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 Louise! It's not I! It's not you! What did... Then who did... Let go of me! Let go of me! Light! Louise, quickly! Eugene, what happened? Who did he... Ferguson. 
Yes. He stumbled into him in the darkness, thought it was one of us. Then he must have tripped. The knife. He must have fallen on the knife. Well, somehow it... It seems only right that the last of the Journals, who killed so many, should be destroyed by the dead. <laughs> Too bad, Doc. You were a character we certainly could use on this program. But now at least you've got the perfect answer for the rest of your family when you meet them in the... wherever it is that dead murderers congregate. When they ask you who you were with last night, you can always say, that was no lady, that was my knife. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could put a new point on that old joke, Mr. Host. Oh, oh I like to sharpen up an old saw now and then, Mary. <laughs> Well, let me see what I can do along those lines. Um, how about the best things in life are tea? Mary, <laughs> I'm afraid your enthusiasm for Lipton's has got the best of you. <laughs> well, maybe you're right, Mr. Host. But it's so easy to be enthusiastic about Lipton's. Once you taste that marvelous brisk flavor, you can't help being a real Lipton fan. And that lively, zestful taste is something you folks should start to enjoy right now. Next time you visit the grocers, get a package of Lipton tea. Try it. I know you'll enjoy it. May I add a word of advice, friends? If you should happen to bump into an elderly gentleman dressed all in black on a dark street some night... Don't get into an argument with him. Especially if he happens to be carrying a blood-stained knife. After all, you can end up just as stiff if you're dead right as if you're dead wrong. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Pavilion by Hilda Lawrence. And next week's Inner Sanctum story, brought to you by the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, and directed by Hyman Brown... Next week's story is called Skeleton Bay. It's about a lady novelist who writes murder mysteries until she decides she'd rather be a character instead of an author. She chooses Skeleton Bay as a vacation spot, but it turns out to be her last resort. <laughs> now join us next Tuesday on Skeleton Bay. Until then, friends. Good night. Pleasant dreams? <laughs> Ready in a jiffy and as tasty as can be. That's Lipton's noodle soup. It's a grand chickeny tasting broth full of tender golden noodles. You'll love its fresh cooked, homemade flavor. And Lipton's noodle soup is ready to serve in a few quick minutes. It's economical, too. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. Ask your grocer for Lipton's noodle soup mix tomorrow. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. names and characters used on Inner Sanctum are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, students of the Mysteries.
mystic marvels of manifold murder, <laughs> this is your host, extending a cordial invitation to step through the creaking door of the inner sanctum, where we probe deep into the dark and cavernous depths of men's souls to see what makes them kill. Mm -hmm. Our clinic here is the whole vast world of crime. And you who listen in may hear us dissect our characters at a safe distance. And unless your nerves are strong, you'd better take my advice and uh, keep your distance. <laughs> Why, Mr. Host, that's not the kind of advice to give, folks. It sounds unfriendly. Well, what would you suggest, Mary? Well, give them some sort of friendly advice. Like pointing out to them the extra delight they'll get from a cheering cup of Lipton tea. Then go on to tell them why Lipton's is so downright delicious. Tell them that the reason is Lipton's brisk flavor. And don't forget to mention that brisk is the tea expert's own word for the spirited, full-bodied flavor of Lipton's. So refreshing and so zestful. Explain that Lipton's brisk flavor is never flat, but always lively and, and satisfying. And in closing, remind them to try Lipton's soon. Because in every cup of Lipton's, there's extra enjoyment. And now, that's the kind of advice you should give, folks. Well, Mary, you seem to have given it to them already. So we can go ahead and get launched on Skeleton Bay. That's the title of tonight's story. An original radio play by Emil Tepperman. It's about a lady novelist, a writer of mystery stories. It opens at a swanky hotel with private cabins situated on a storm-swept rock-bound coast. The story itself is all about... Mm -hmm. You guessed it. Murder. And here's Betty Lou Gerson as Carol Winter, the lady novelist, who will give us a blow-by-blow -blow description. I'll tell you first about the night I met Michael Barrett. It was in August at Skeleton Bay... I'd come to the hotel supposedly for a rest. That was what I kept telling myself. But in reality, I didn't know why I'd come here. Skeleton I'd seen the name Skeleton advertised Bay. months ago. Skeleton Bay. Since then, it kept hammering, Skeleton hammering, Bay. hammering at the inside Bay. of my brain. Skeleton it's Bay. like the voice Skeleton of impeccable feet commanding me. Commanding me. Commanding me. Because I didn't like crowds, the hotel manager had given me a cabin near the beach all to myself. It was the middle of the night, but I couldn't sleep. The wind came in from the ocean, howling like a hungry beast across the shoals. And the pounding of the surf mingled with the angry, baffled growl of the sea. I sat at the window in the dark, staring out at the beach. I was restless, excited. It was then I saw the signal. It was just a winking little light a few yards away on the beach. Someone was blinking a flashlight on and off, on and off. I was able to make out the figure of a man in boots and a leather jacket. He was signaling toward the hotel. But to whom? I had the answer in a moment. A man moved past my window, going down toward the light. He had his collar turned up against the wind. His hat brim pulled low. But I knew who it was. Mr. Field. A small, furtive man who'd come up on the train with me. The two men met. Barely a stone's throw from my window. I could hardly see them huddled closely together. This was excitement. Mystery, intrigue. The stimulation I wanted and needed. I had to know what was going on. I threw on a raincoat, opened the cabin door. The wind swept my hair in a streamer and the spray stung my face as I hurried down the beach. My blood began to race. My heart to pound. Those two men were not engaged in any conference. They were locked in struggle. It was a deadly silent struggle with only a grunt now and then. I saw the flashing gleam of a knife. But I couldn't tell who had the weapon. The tall man in the leather jacket or the furtive Mr. Field. And then... Then I saw the blade plunge home. Into the throat of the furtive Mr. Field. I felt a sudden surge of wild elation. This was murder. I had witnessed murder. The tall man let the body of Mr. Fields slide down to the sand. Then he looked up and saw me. He stood there with a bloody knife in his hand, and we looked at each other. Who are you? I'm Carol Winter. 
I have this cabin here, number five. You saw me kill him? Yes, I saw you. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to help you dispose of the body. He told me his name was Michael Barrett. He lived on the opposite side of the bay in the house high up on the cliff. It won't be so easy to get rid of the body. If I had the boat, I could take him out and drop him over, but it's too rough tonight. If there was some place to hide him for a day, I could come across in the boat tomorrow night. You can hide him in the closet in my cabin. Nobody will look there. Better lock the closet door. Yes, of course. You sure nobody will come snooping here? Nobody comes here but the maid. All right. I'll be back tomorrow night with a boat. Did you pick up the knife? Yeah. Got it in my pocket. Well, I guess that's all. Good night, Carola. Good night, Michael. All night I sat up alone with the locked closet door between me and the staring, sightless body of Mr. Field. At breakfast the next morning, they'd already discovered the disappearance. And the maid says his bed wasn't slept in at all. Oh, Think he could have yes, committed suicide in the ocean. You oh, just I hurried through my man. breakfast listening to the gossip all around me. Yes, no, in broad daylight, I... I hardly believe the thing had really happened last night. You know the hotel manager thinks it might be murder. Oh. I have him phoning for the police. The police? I hadn't counted on that. Anything wrong, my dear? You look sick. I do feel a bit dizzy. I think I'll get some fresh air. Oh, poor dear. It must be quite a shock to her. She came up on the train with Mr. Field, you know. Out in the open air, I let the wind cool my fevered face as I hurried down toward the beach. It was only 9.30 in the morning. A whole day. A whole evening before Michael could come for the body. And the police would be around all day investigating, snooping. And all the time, Mr. Field would be sitting in my closet, staring blankly out of his sightless eyes. When I reached my cabin, I put a hand on the doorknob. Suddenly, I, I went cold all over. The door was unlocked. Stood still as a statue, listening. Yes. If there was someone inside. Someone moving around. I only had my handbag. I had a pistol in it. I always carried it for protection. But my handbag was inside on the dresser. Slowly. Slowly, I pressed the door open. Half inch. An inch. And then the door creaked. Is that you, Miss Winter? The maid... It was only the maid, of course. She'd be making up the bed. Why hadn't I thought of that? Miss Winter, is that you? Yes, it's I. What are you doing in that closet with those keys? Why, they're just my past keys, Miss Winter. I was just going to tidy up the closet. I didn't ask you to do anything to the closet. Well, but that's part of the job, Miss Winter. I'm supposed to do that in all the rooms. Well, you leave this one alone. Keep away from that closet, do you hear? Yes, Miss Winter. But I was only trying to help. I want your help. I'll ask for it. Now, please leave it once. Just as you say, Miss Whitney. I'm sorry if I did anything wrong. Did she suspect anything? I hadn't liked her tone. Why? Why had I been so sharp with her? Now she'd surely think there was something in the closet. Something she shouldn't see. At lunchtime, I didn't want to leave the cabin. I sat at the window. And I could almost feel the sightless eyes of Mr. Field staring at me through the closet door. Someone at the door. Who? Who? Just a minute. Uh, Miss Winter? Miss Carola Winter? Yes, I'm Miss Winter. I'm sorry to trouble you, Miss Winter. I'm Detective Sergeant Smith from headquarters. Uh, may I come in for a moment? Well, yes, please do. What can I do for you, Sergeant Smith? Uh, we're out here investigating this field business. He uh, hasn't turned up yet. Well, I'm sure he will in time. Well, I wish I could be so sure, Miss Winter. What do you mean? We've gone through his room. Found some mighty queer things. Queer things? Uh, it seems this Mr. Field's in some sort of racket. There's a good chance he may have been murdered. You don't say. 
I uh, understand you came up on the train with him. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. Did you uh, have any conversation with him on the train? Mm, no, none at all. Uh-huh. Uh, you're the Carol of Winter who writes the mystery novels, aren't you? <laughs> the same. <laughs> yes, I've read every one of them. They're darn good, Miss Winter. Why, thank yeah. you. Uh, do you think you'll get a plot out of this? Uh, I mean, Mr. Field. Why, uh, I can't tell yet. I wish you'd keep me posted on developments in case it does turn out to have a plot. Well, I sure will, Miss Winter. Uh, by the way, we found this picture among the papers in Field's room. I'm, I'm showing it to everybody around in case they might recognize it. It's an old newspaper item, about ten years old. Can't figure out why he was carrying it around. It's about a guy named Wycliffe. It's wanted for murder in Canada. Here, take a look at it. I felt the blood racing in my veins, pounding at my wrists. The picture of the man named Wycliffe who was wanted for murder in Canada it was a picture of Michael Barrett. Well, it looks as if Michael Barrett is a lucky guy with a beautiful woman ready to commit murder for him. But what'll he do when she runs out of victims and begins looking at him with a calculating eye? <laughs> As for Carola, she sinned heavily. Because murder is the greatest sin. Yes, if you ask me, she'd better hope for a depression, then all wages will go down, including the wages of sin. <laughs> well, I, I never knew that murder and economics were related, Mr. Host. Oh, definitely, Mary. Take the high cost of living, for instance. Why, those prices are murder. <laughs> oh, yes, Mr. Host, it is difficult when the cost of living starts to climb. But then, so often, the things that really add up to good living are just simple, inexpensive pleasures. Like that piping hot cup of Lipton tea that many of us find waiting when we come down to breakfast each morning. As you read the morning paper and sip that cheery cup of Lipton's, the whole world seems brighter. It's simply wonderful the way that lively, spirited Lipton tea gets you off to a fresh start. For Lipton's brisk flavor gives you all the natural zest of tea at its best. Gives you extra delight, extra satisfaction. So remember this, folks. At breakfast time, dinner time, or any other time when you want a grand, refreshing drink, pour yourself a cup of Lipton tea. And now... Let's get back to the rock-bound coast of Skeleton Bay and see how Carola entertains the grisly guest in her closet. I don't remember now how I got rid of that Detective Smith. I, I told him I'd never seen the man in the picture and sent him away. The day was interminable. From my window, I could see the guests moving about the beach. But none of them went in swimming. The weather was too rough. I wondered if Michael would be able to bring the boat over tonight. If not, how much longer could I sit guard over Mr. Field in the closet? Now and then, I'd see Detective Smith poking around on the beach. And then, without warning, he was standing over the very spot where Michael had stabbed Mr. Field. I watched him bend down and examine something. Was there a telltale drop of blood there? Did Smith know that was the murder spot? I saw him frown. Then he stood up, walked quickly away. I had to know what it was he'd seen there. I slipped on a coat, went out. Started toward the spot on the beach. Going somewhere, oh. Miss Winter? Oh, it's you, Detective. Uh, going anywhere in particular? Uh, no, no, I'm just going up to the hotel for dinner. It's almost dinner time, you know. Oh, fine, I'll walk up with you if you don't mind. Not at all. Hey, can I help you? I'll take your arm there. <laughs> Thank you. The sand is so soft. As it's still wet. We had high tide last night. Oh, uh, um, Miss Winter. Yes? You a sound sleeper? What? Why do you ask? Well, I just thought maybe you might have heard something last night. Like a fight or something. A fight? Yes, yes. I was just looking at the sand back there, down near your cabin. It's all messed up, stamped around. Well, what's that got to do with me? Oh, nothing at all. Except I think there was a fight there last night. Maybe that's where Mr. Field was killed. You... 
You think Mr. Field was murdered? It's beginning to look more and more like it, Miss Winter. Somehow, I, I don't know how I managed to get through with the dinner. I hurried back to the cabin. I stopped at the door, shocked and unbelieving. There was a light inside. Someone was in there. This time, I had my handbag with me. I took the pistol out. Once more, I inched the door open. It happened. The thing I feared. The closet door was open. And there was the maid... stooping... over the body of Mr. Field. What are you doing there? The body. It's Mr. Field. You killed him. Suppose I did. What are you doing with that gun? What do you think? No! The wind was high. And the weather was rough. And fortunately, no one heard the shot. I pushed her body into the closet next to the body of Mr. Field. And closed the door. Now. Now I was a murderer, too. Let me in, Carla, quick. Oh, yes, yes. Michael, Michael, I thought you weren't coming. It's been a terrible day. What happened? Come here, I'll show you. Is he still in there? <laughs> See for yourself. Great Scott, a woman. Who is she? The maid. She opened the closet while I was out. You killed her? Yes, Michael. I, I had to kill her. There are detectives at the hotel looking for Mr. Field. Mm. I suppose if I was smart, I'd kill you, too. Then there'd be no one to talk. Yes, Michael, that would be smart. Go ahead. Kill me, if you can. I knew he couldn't kill me because I'd seen it in his eyes. We were two of a kind, both wild, both reckless, both eager for the thrill of danger. He, too, wanted to be like the wind. We'd both been brought together here by some force stronger than either of us. And we loved each other. Carla, darling. Michael. No more now, Michael. We have work to do. Yes. I'll take them down to the boat. I'll help you. We carried Mr. Field and the maid down to the boat. I'll take them out away and dump them. And after that, Michael? After that? Then I'm going home. To your house on the cliff on the other side of the bay? Yes, Carola. Michael, take me with you. What? Take me with you to your house up there on the cliff. I'm sorry. I can't. You, you can't? Why can't you? There isn't anything I can tell you. What are you hiding up there in the house on the cliff? You mustn't ask. Please, Carola, you mustn't ask. Why, you're married. You have a wife up there. No. Then what? I can't tell you. But you... You're going away, leaving me forever. Not forever, Carola. Go back to the city. I'll come to you soon. I returned to the city and waited. I waited a week, a month. But Michael Barrett did not come. I wrote to him, but there was no answer. And then one evening, I saw him. I was returning home in a taxi, and I saw him standing across the street looking up at my window. And he saw me get out of the cab. He turned and started to hurry away. Michael! Michael! Michael, don't go away! Michael! Michael, why did you try to run away? Don't you know? You're afraid. Yeah, let's call it that. But you love me, Michael, don't you? Carola, it's no good. There's nothing but ruin for both of us if I stay. We'll be together forever. It's impossible. I won't let you go back to that house on the cliff. I don't care what it is you're hiding up there. I won't let you go back. Goodbye, Carola. Wait. I'm going. 
Better forget about it. Don't go yet, Mr. White. So you know about that, too. I saw the old newspaper clipping Mr. Field carried. I see. Why are you looking at me like that? You know why I killed Mr. Field? Because it tried to blackmail me about that old murder. Michael, dear, I'm a good deal smarter than Mr. Field. You see, I write mystery novels. I know how to handle such things. What do you mean? Wouldn't do you any good to kill me. I've written out all about you. Your real name and about that old murder in Canada. Would be found if I should ever be killed. Oh. Michael, darling, I'm blackmailing you. There's only one thing I want from you. Your love. It shouldn't be so hard for you to meet my terms. All right, Carla. You win. We'll be married tonight. Soon after we were married, Michael began going out evenings. Once, sometimes twice a week. Staying out all night. He'd return late the next day. When I asked where he'd been, his temper would flare up into something terrible. I stopped asking. But I couldn't rest. I had to know where he went. One evening, I followed him. He boarded a train for Skeleton Bay. At Skeleton Bay, he set out to walk from the station. And I followed. It was no longer summer. Trees were bare and the night was forbidding. I kept behind him when he skirted the bay to the narrow road that led up toward his house high on the cliff. It was a small stone house. And the wind whistled around it, against it, and above it. I stole to one of the windows. It was barred like a prison. Carefully, I raised my head above the sill, peered into a lighted room. Michael was there with a woman. For the first time in my life, I knew the meaning of frustration, jealousy. Michael told me he wasn't married, but this woman, I'd helped him to do murder. I'd killed for him. I'd lied to that detective for him. And all the while, this was the secret he'd been keeping from me. I opened my handbag. I took out the pistol. I looked into the room again. The woman was alone now. Michael was gone. So you came <gasps> up after all, Carola. Michael, you, you sneaked out. You knew I was here. I'm sorry you saw through that window, Carola. Is that your secret? That woman? Part of it, but it's the part you mustn't know. But I do know it now. That's why I've got to kill you, Carola. That knife. You've still got that knife. Yes, Carola. But I've got this, Michael. <laughs> He fell at my feet. And I looked down and watched him die. Now I knew why I'd really come to Skeleton Bay that first day. It was for this. To kill Michael Barrett. So he's dead. <laughs> at last. You've killed him. You. The woman in the house. You. You saw me kill him? Yes, I saw you. What are you going to do about it? Help you dispose of the body, of course. Help me dispose of the body. Well, those were the very words I'd said to Michael Barrett down there on the beach. Now this woman was saying them to me. Who, who are you? I'm Elizabeth Wycliffe. I'm Michael's sister. Sister? And you want to help me dispose of his body? See the bars on those windows? Yes. I've been a prisoner in this house for ten years. You what? Michael killed the man I was going to marry ten years ago in Canada. He murdered him. But, but this house, the, this prison... Michael brought me here. He's kept me a prisoner because he knew if I got free, I'd tell the world he was a murderer. And that's the secret. The secret he wouldn't even tell me. I shot her. Yes, I killed her, too. There outside the house, and she fell beside Michael. And I rolled both bodies over the cliff, down into the sea. (laughs) 
This is the end of my book. The best mystery novel I've ever written. I know that in writing it, I deliver myself into the hands of the law. But I can't stop. I can't help myself. So now, I'm finished. I will mail it to my publisher and wait for Detective Sergeant Smith to come and get me. It looks as if Carola's mystery novel will earn a lot of money after she's executed. Yes, but I'd say it's tainted money. Hmm? Why tainted? Because she'll be dead, and a ghost can't own money. So taint hers. <laughs> the trouble with Carola was that her conscience was too little and too late. It told her not to commit murder after she'd done it. Well, that's certainly too late, Mr. Holt. Oh, yes, Mary, especially for her victims. And now, what's on your mind? Well, Mr. Host, right here, I'd like to say a word to our listeners on behalf of our veterans. You know, friends, ex-servicemen are returning to civilian jobs with a lot to offer their employers. They've had valuable training and experience in highly specialized service jobs. Many of them were able to keep up with their civilian jobs and learn new trades through special correspondence courses. And they're coming home fully equipped to do the same fine job as civilians that they did in the services. So let's give them every employment opportunity to put their increased skill to work. And so, friends, we take our leave of lovely Carola Winter. She would have been better off if she'd remembered that the pen is mightier than the sword. Because the sword is leading her right back to the pen anyhow. <laughs> oh, yes, and remember, friends, when you go on a vacation, always insist on plenty of closet space. Yes, you never know what unexpected guests might drop in or drop dead. <laughs> By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Death in the Limelight by A.E. Martin. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will bring you another Inner Sanctum mystery directed by Hyman Brown. It's about a young chemist who discovers the secret of perpetual life. But he made the mistake of getting involved with death. <laughs> so, until next Tuesday... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's a swell dish, folks, that's easy to make and mighty easy to take. Lipton's noodle soup. You can prepare it in a jiffy, and the whole family will love its delicious chickeny tasting broth so full of tender golden noodles. Lipton's noodle soup has all the fresh-cooked, homemade flavor of grandmother's noodle soup. Yet it's economical. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So get Lipton's noodle soup mix tomorrow. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friend. This is your host of the Inner Sanctum inviting you in through the creaking door. Come on in and enter into the spirit of things. <laughs> oh, uh, don't pay any attention to those gurgling sounds you hear. They're the unfortunate ones. 
The midnight spirits who were caught haunting before midnight. Poor things. All they can do now is gurgle. Because they've evaporated into distilled spirits. <laughs> what a horrifying thought, Mr. Host. Can't we ever talk about the brighter side of life? Well, don't forget, Mary, murder is my business. Well, thank goodness it isn't mine. And right now, I'd much prefer to talk with our Lipton listeners about something more conducive to happy spirits. I mean, a cup of hearty, piping hot Lipton tea. You know, it's really wonderful, the extra delight you get from this superb tea, friends. And the reason is simply this, Lipton's grand, brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the fresh, full-bodied, lively flavor of Lipton tea. Because unlike ordinary teas, Lipton's is never flat-tasting or lifeless. Lipton tea is always spirited, full-flavored, truly satisfying. Why, I'd even go so far as to say that once you've tried it, I think you'll enjoy Lipton tea more than any other tea you've ever tasted. And I'll go even further, Mary, and introduce our listeners to tonight's story. It's an original radio play written especially for Inner Sanctum by Emil Tepperman. And starring Richard Widmark in the role of Alex Gregory. It's about a man who became master of a secret so fearful that it could never be revealed to any mortal, living or dead. But let him tell you the story himself. How he learned the most terrible secret in all the universe and what he did with it. It was an evening in September, the 15th to be exact when I first learned of the existence of Elixir Number 4. It happened at Professor Jarman's house just off the college campus. You've heard of Jarman, of course. He was to chemistry what Einstein is to physics. But it was his daughter, Elaine, that I was interested in that evening in September when I rang their bell. Well, hello, Alex. Gosh, is it that late? I'm not even dressed. Hi, sweet. Snap it up, will you? The last show starts at 8.30. Well, it won't take me long. Wait for me in the library. I'll be ready in a jiffy. I knew my way around the house. I went into the library, and the first thing I noticed was that the door to Professor Jarman's private study was ajar. It had never happened before. The private study and the laboratory beyond were forbidden territory in the Jarman home. Not even Elaine was allowed in there. And now the door was open. I'd heard stories of Jarman's experiments with new and secret formulae. So here was a chance. A possible chance to find out what the old codger was working on. I couldn't resist. I pushed open the door and I stepped into the private study. I could hear Jarman in the lab talking to himself. Elaine had told me once that he always talked to himself in the lab. I stood quietly in the study, but I couldn't make out what he was saying in there. I looked around. The study was just a small cubbyhole with a chair, a bookcase, and a desk. And on the desk, I saw the open diary. A single sentence was written on the open page. I stepped closer. And then... I got the first shock. For that sentence was written in Latin. My Latin was rusty, but I was able to decipher the words, We tie secretum in elixir quartum perpetus habeo. In elixir number four, I have the secret of perpetus life. Perpetus. That was the one word I couldn't seem to place. In elixir number four, I have the secret of something. Life. I was puzzling over that word perpetus when suddenly the laboratory door was flung open. What are you doing at my desk? Oh, uh, hello, Professor Charman. I asked you, what are you doing at my desk? Well, the, the study door was open. I, I thought I'd see if you were in here. You were reading my diary. Oh, no, no, Professor. You saw the entry in my diary. Oh, really, Professor, I assure you... You I... read Latin. L Latin? Well, I, I don't understand. You're sure you don't understand Latin? No, no, I, I, I don't. Am, Alex. Ready? And... Well... Well, is anything wrong? Elaine, I've told you time and again, no one is to be admitted to my study. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. 
You must have left the door open. Oh, Alex, you should I'm terribly come. sorry, Elaine. I, I found the door open and I thought Professor Jarman was in here. I, I just wanted to say hello. All right, all right. No harm done as long as you can't read Latin. Now, get along, you two. I'm busy, but keep out of my study hereafter. I took Elaine to the movies, but I haven't the faintest recollection of what the picture was about. Through my mind kept running that Latin sentence. We die secretum in elixir quartum perpetus habeo. When I said goodnight to Elaine at her door after the show, I hurried home to my room and I got out an old Latin dictionary. I looked up the word perpetus. And then I got a strange, cold feeling down my spine. For the word perpetus meant perpetual. The Latin sentence which Jarman had written in his diary meant, in elixir number four, I have the secret of perpetual life. Professor Jarman had discovered the secret of immortality. All the next day, I conducted my chemistry classes purely by instinct. I couldn't take my thoughts from elixir number four. Every voice in the classroom seemed to sing the same refrain. Accomplished by adding to a dilute solution of H2SO4 a quantity of... Immortality. Never to know the fear of death. To live on serenely. To watch the world change through the centuries. Never to die. It grew on me like a festering tumor, this terrific dream of immortality, everlasting life. I had to have elixir number four. In the afternoon, the first free period I had, I went down the hall to Jarman's office. Come in. May I come in for a moment, Professor? Oh, it's you. Yes, come in. I haven't much time. Professor, uh, I want to apologize for last night. Let's forget about it. No harm done. Well, whatever it was you had written in your diary, it uh, it must have been pretty important. Oh, no, no, not at all. Only some chemistry notes. Nothing of any importance. Just something I've been experimenting well, with. Well, I'd be very glad to assist you, Professor. Anything I could do, That's I'd be... very kind of you, young man, but I don't need any assistance, thank you. As a matter of fact, the experiment is completed. You mean you're all finished? All but the practical application. Oh. Well, couldn't I help you on that? It won't be necessary. Tonight, I'm taking the last step. Tonight? I knew what that meant. Tonight, he was going to use elixir number four. He was going to administer it to himself. I had to act tonight or never. Jarman's keys were on his desk. I distracted his attention and I managed to pick them up without his noticing. Then I hurried across town to a locksmith and had him make duplicates of Jarman's house key, his study key, and his laboratory key. Then I returned to the college and I managed to replace the keys on Jarman's desk while he was out. Now, I was ready for an adventure into immortality. At 8.30 that evening, I let myself into Charman's house, opened the study door, and stepped quietly over to the laboratory. I knew Elaine was at a sorority meeting. The professor and I were the only ones in the house. Charman was standing at the lab table with his back to me, talking away to himself. There was a small vial on the table and a hypodermic four. syringe alongside it. The quantity administered yesterday will be sufficient. At my age, since my blood is too thin, I require the additional dose. But a younger man would need only one injection to cause the necessary type change in his blood. Who's that? Good evening, Professor Salmon. I hope I'm not interrupting. What are you doing here? How did you get in? So elixir number four changes the bloodstream, hmm? What do you want in here? Quit stalling, Professor. I know what elixir number four is. Ah. So this is it. Elixir number four. Careful. Don't spill it. 
How much of this stuff have you got? Hey, that's all there is. Five cc's. You mean you haven't got any more? It took me five years to distill ten cc's. Before that, I experimented for ten years. I failed three times. And this is your fourth try, huh? Elixir number four. And there isn't any more of it? It will take me five years more to make up another bat. Please be careful. Don't drop it. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't. You, uh... You said this is enough to make the average man immortal. Me, for instance? Not for you. You hear me? Not for you. Oh, yes, it is, Professor. It's for me. I won't let you... What are you doing with that mallet? What do you think? No. I'm so sorry, Professor. Wait, I, I'll let you have it. Don't kill me. I've got to kill you. When I take this dose of elixir number four, I'll be immortal. And I don't want anyone to know it. Oh, wait, you fool. You'll never enjoy your immortality. You'll wish you were dead a thousand times. I'll come back to remind you, back to remind you. Oh, oh. I didn't hit him hard enough to kill him. That wasn't part of my plan. But when he lay unconscious on the floor, I searched among the chemicals until I found what I wanted. I mixed some chemicals in a test tube, and I watched the fumes forming. Then I held the test tube against Jarman's mouth, forcing the deadly gas into his lungs. When I was sure he was dead, I wiped the tube clean of my fingerprints and put it back in the rack. Then I picked up the vial of elixir number four, the hypodermic syringe, and I hurried away, locking all the doors behind me. As soon as I got home, I filled the hypo with elixir number four, and I gave myself the injection. Almost immediately, I felt a strange radiance pervading my body. A new strength was flowing in my blood. I was immortal. I couldn't die. I would go on living and living and living forever. Hey, what's going on here? What's all this about living forever? If you ask me, it would be more of a curse than a blessing. Now, just suppose we all took a shot of this elixir number four. I think of all the people who'd lose their jobs. Grave diggers and stone cutters and shroud makers and hearse drivers and... Oh, why go on? You see what I mean. Why, everybody'd be out of a job. We'd all practically starve to death. Well, then, Mr. Host, maybe we can be glad that nobody has ever found the fountain of youth. You know, I think it's not a matter of trying to live forever. The important thing is to get more enjoyment out of every day. Mm -hmm. For instance, Mary. Well, for instance, one splendid way to get more enjoyment out of an otherwise dull day is to invite your friends in for tea. It's a delightful neighborly custom, made even more delightful when the tea you serve is Lipton's, because there's so much extra pleasure in Lipton tea. The party will seem more of a party. The conversation will be more sparkling, and your reputation as a thoughtful hostess will soar to the skies the moment your guests take their first sip of Lipton tea. For Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor makes it a favorite with everybody. So when friends drop in for tea, or the family gathers around the dinner table, serve them Lipton's. Tea at its delicious best. And now let's get back to our story. We're all anxious to see what this fellow Alex does with his secret of perpetual life. Just imagine, a man with all that time on his hands. Time to kill. And kill. And kill. And kill. Immortality. I had it in my blood. I could feel it pulsing in my veins. The vitality, the power. I had to establish an alibi. Not that I expected to need an alibi. Jarman's death would surely look like an accident or suicide when his body was found in the laboratory in the morning. But I wasn't taking any chances on a murder charge. I had so much more to lose now. Wouldn't it be ironic if they were to execute me for murder? <laughs> me, an immortal. Oh. 
Next morning, I stopped at Jarman's house and rang the bell. I knew Elaine must have gone right to bed when she returned from the sorority meeting last night because she never disturbed her father when he was in the lab. But now, when she discovered that he hadn't been to bed all night, she'd want to investigate. And I wanted to be there when the body was found. Oh, good morning, Alex. Hello, sweet. What's wrong? You look worried. (laughs) Come on in. Alex, I am worried. Dad's still in the lab. He didn't go to bed last night. Well, what of it? He must be working on something big. No, no, I'm afraid something's happened. I I knocked at the door just now and there was no answer. The door was locked? Yes, but I have a pass key. I I wonder if I ought to use it. Well, of course you should. Well, please, Alex. You come with me. Of course, darling. Together we opened the laboratory door. I was all set to act horrified when we discovered the body on the floor. But there was no need to act. I was horrified. For the... The lab was empty. There was nothing on the floor. The body of Professor Jarman was gone. I don't know for how many hours after that that I walked the street. Confused and frightened and uncomprehending. I tried to reason it out. How Jarman's body had walked out of that lab. There was only one solution. Jarman had already taken one dose of elixir number four. It must have counteracted the poison that I'd forced into him. He must have gotten up and then walked away. But where? And why? I recalled what he'd said before I hit him with the mallet. Yes, I could hear his voice faintly strumming at my brain. You'll never enjoy your immortality. You'll wish you were dead a thousand times. I'll come back to remind you. The next day, I went to Elaine's house, and I saw that she was taking her father's disappearance pretty hard. Oh, Alex, I I don't know what to make of it. Do you think that... that Dad... Oh, did he... No, no, take it easy, baby. Maybe he's just uh, suffering from amnesia. Maybe he just walked out of the house. He might turn up tomorrow. I have a terrible feeling, Alex, that, that he's dead. What makes you think so? Oh, I don't know. No, no, please, Elaine. That won't do you any good. Oh, but it's the uncertainty. If, if I only knew for sure. Alex. Hmm? Do you believe in mediums? Communicating with the dead? Do you believe a medium can put you in touch with the dead? Oh, is that what you're thinking of, darling? Going to a medium? Don't you see, Alex? If if Dad... Oh, if Dad is dead, maybe... Maybe... I was worried, too. I had to know if Jarman was dead or alive. I had to know before I could start enjoying life. Yes, yes, that might be a good idea, Elaine. Can't hurt to try. There's a medium in town. Oh, I... I don't know what I want to do. Let me think about it. Well, sure, sure, darling. In the days that followed, I began to doubt whether I really was immortal. Was elixir number four really the elixir of life? Was I really going to live forever? If there was only some way to prove it. Then I remembered what Jarman had said, that the elixir caused a change of blood type. Well, that'd be easy enough to check. Elaine was taking a medical course, so I asked her to test my blood on the pretext that I thought I had anemia. It won't hurt, Alex. Just... The needle? Ouch. (laughs) There, now I've got all the blood I need. Just sit here a minute while I make the test. Well, uh, does it take long? Mm -mm, Only a minute. Alex. She was excited. There was something different about my blood. Alex. Alex, come here quick. What? Look. Oh, look, Alex. I I can't be mistaken. Uh, Your blood... It's a new type. Elaine couldn't get over the discovery that my blood was a new type. I'd asked her not to tell anyone about my new blood type, but I knew she wouldn't be able to keep the secret for long. And once it got out, people might begin to suspect what I already knew for sure, that I was immortal. 
Oh, I couldn't afford to have that known. Because then everybody in the world would be envious of me. They'd hate me, too. Because they'd know I could go on living long after they were dead. Oh, no. No, it had to be a secret forever. No one in the whole world must know. Except myself. And the only person who could spill the secret now was Elaine. So, there was only one thing to do. Elaine furnished the opportunity herself the next day. Alex, I've been thinking about that medium. I've got to know if... if Dad is alive or... or dead. All right, whatever you say, darling, if it'll make you feel any better. I'll go with you, of course. Just the two of us, huh? We made a date to go to the seance that evening. And I made my plans accordingly. I didn't intend that Elaine should leave the seance alive. We arrived at the medium's house promptly at nine o'clock. The medium asked Elaine and me to sit close to each other. And then she put out the lights. Alex. It's all right, sweet. I'm right here. I'm right next to you. Oh, I'm frightened. No, there's nothing to be frightened about, darling. I'm right here with you. But it's so dark. I can't see anything. I don't hear anything. Where's the medium? She's still here. She's right across the table. She's gone into a trance. Do you think she'll contact that spirit? I don't know, darling. Wait and see. I timed myself carefully, waiting for the moment when the medium should be well into her trance. Then I took out of my pocket the hypodermic syringe. I held the plunger in my left hand while I gripped Elaine's arm with my right, my thumb over the artery. Alex, my arm, your fingers hurt. It's all right, sweet. Slowly, I brought the hypodermic needle up close to the artery. One bite of the needle, a single plunge of the plunger, and death would come almost instantaneously. And no one in the world could say that it hadn't been heart failure. But suddenly, just as I had the plunger ready, I heard... I heard something strange. A sound. In the room where there should have been no sound. You'll never enjoy your immortality. You'll wish you were dead a thousand times. I'll come back to remind you. Back the to dead. remind you. Back the voice of the dead. You, back to remind you. Back Charmin, to where are you? you. Charmin, stop. You're dead. You're dead, Charmin. You can't be talking. You're dead. I saw your dead body. I killed you myself. Suddenly, the lights flashed up. The room was full of police. Arrest him, officer. He killed my father. You heard his confession. That, that voice. That was Dad's voice, Alex. A recording. What? A recording? That's why he always talked to himself in the lab. He had a wire recording machine. He talked while he carried on his experiments so that there'd be a permanent record. The wire recorder picked up everything that was said in the lab the night you killed him. But we could never have proved it was your voice in court if you hadn't confessed just now. Yes, but the body. I found Dad dead that night when I got back from the meeting. And I hid the body until I could find his murderer. And now, Alex, I found him. <laughs> All through the trial, Elaine sat and watched me. All the time the jury was out, she sat and watched me. And she watched me while they read the verdict of guilty. Her eyes never left me when I stood up to be sentenced and heard the judge say... Alex Gregory, it is the judgment of this court that you be confined to the penitentiary... For the rest of your natural life. <laughs> me. Me of all people. Me sentenced to imprisonment for life. Me in whose veins runs the precious elixir number four. Imprisonment for the rest of my natural life. Which means forever. Forever. <laughs> 
I feel kind of sorry for Alex. Has he really got a tough break? Locked up in a cell for all eternity and no way out. Yes, looks like they'll have to build a new jail around him every thousand years or so. Of course, there's one way out for him. He could let his beard grow for a couple of centuries, and when it gets long enough, he could hang himself. Oh, imagine <laughs> such a thing, Mr. Host. Yes, it would be sort of... Breathtaking, wouldn't it, Mary? <laughs> Poor Alex. He probably had many good impulses in his lifetime. As the trouble is, he didn't follow them. Well, Mr. Host, I'm afraid that's something we all do every now and then. For instance, perhaps some of you Inner Sanctum fans have promised yourselves the pleasure of trying Lipton tea, but somehow just haven't gotten around to it. Or maybe you've just forgotten it when you're writing out your grocery list. Well, this time, make sure. Add Lipton tea to your grocery list right now. For until you do try it, you're missing a real treat. Why not start enjoying lively, full-bodied Lipton tea beginning tomorrow? And now, friends, before I say goodnight, here's a pleasant bit of philosophy. Biologists tell us that all life starts in a little cell. And for convicted murderers, it ends there, too. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Death in the Limelight by A.E. Martin. And next week's Inner Sanctum story brought to you by the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup and directed by Hyman Brown. Next week's story is called You'll never escape. So, if you feel in a capturing mood, join us next Tuesday. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Friends, you want to know how to make an ordinary meal into a feast? Start it right. Start it bright with tempting, heartwarming Lipton's Noodle Soup. Lipton's Noodle Soup is ready to serve in a jiffy, and what a treat it is. Lots of tender, golden noodles and a world of real chickeny flavor that makes it taste homemade. It's economical, too. Lipton's Noodle Soup mix costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So try Lipton's Noodle Soup real soon. And don't forget to tune in next week at the same time for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, gentle friends of the Inner Sanctum. Welcome through the creaking door for another soothing half hour of sweetness and light. <laughs> oh, I've learned a new trick. Would one of you like to step up here and be sawed in half? What? No volunteer? Well, maybe you're right. The first part, the sawing in half, that's easy. But the second part, the uh, putting together again, I'm still not very good at that. <laughs> Mr. Host, how can you joke about such things? Are you trying to get our listeners in a mood for enjoying themselves? That's it, Mary. Well, jokes like that certainly won't put people in a good mood. Here's a much better way to do it. Just serve folks a piping hot cup of Lipton tea, and they'll be in a good mood in a minute. For Lipton's is the password to pleasure. It's tea at its delicious best. Thanks to Lipton's brisk flavor. 
Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the fresh, lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea. Unlike ordinary dull-tasting teas, Lipton's is never flat. It's always spirited and satisfying. Try it real soon and get the extra enjoyment of Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor. What does a man think of when there's murder in the air? The close presence of death. Does it have matter and substance? Does it generate unseen light waves that touch a man's subconscious? Or unheard sound waves that speak to him when he sleeps? Well, let's listen to I Walk in the Night, written by Emil Tepperman. With Larry Haynes in the role of Peter Lang to tell you this story himself. I don't know if it was the ringing of the doorbell that awoke me. It dragged me back to consciousness out of a deep, heavy sleep. I felt groggy. As if I'd been drugged. My eyes were so heavy. So hard to keep open. That infernal raining. I stumbled out into the hall. Myrna's room. My wife. There, opposite mine. I knew the door would be locked. We'd quarreled last night while the Judsons were visiting from the house next door. Myrna had made a scene. She went to her room and locked herself in. Pete! Pete, wake up in there! As I stumbled down the hall of the front door, I recognized Phil Judson's voice. Phil and Henrietta lived in the house next door, just across the lawn. Pete! Pete! All right. All right, I'm coming. Just a minute. Okay. I got this open. There. Oh, thank heaven you woke up, Pete. I thought you'd never hear me. What's wrong, Phil? What's that poker for? Henrietta saw a prowler come out of this house. A prowler? What's the matter with you, Pete? You look groggy. Wake up. I, I don't know. I feel as if I'd been doped. Uh, what's this about Prowler? Henrietta saw him climbing out of Myrna's window. She yelled to me, and I grabbed the poker and came running out. The poker? What, what, what's what? the matter with you? Didn't you hear me? A man was in Myrna's room just now. But, great Scott. Myrna's alone in there. Come on. Myrna. Myrna, you all right? Open the door. She doesn't answer. Phil, are you sure the prowler came out of this room? Yes, and he ran around the house and got away. Uh, look, Pete, uh, have you got a key to this door? Oh, it's bolted on the inside. We've got to break it down. Come on, put your shoulder to it. <laughs> Once more now. <laughs> well, where's the light switch? Oh, here. Here, I've got it. Better not come in, Pete. Oh, let me in. I've got to see. <laughs> Take it easy, Pete. Oh, Bernard. Strangled. Strangled to death. Oh, Bernard. Look at the black and blue marks on her throat. This chain on her neck, it's broken. It was her locket. The one I gave her last Christmas. Killer must have taken it with him. And see here, her fingernails, there's bits of skin under them. She must have struggled and scratched the killer's face or hands. Why, Phil? Why should anyone want to kill her? Then began the long torture of the investigation. Detectives swarming over the house. Men in derby hats examining the body of my wife. Measuring the room, searching for fingerprints. And finally, more men who came and... Carried her away forever. Through it all, Phil and Henrietta sat with me, trying to give what comfort they could. Oh, Peter, dear, please talk to us. I can't stand seeing you sit there with your head in your hands. It won't bring Myrna back to life. Henrietta's right, Pete. You've got to get a hold of yourself. I know. I know, but... I can't stop thinking about it. Those marks in the throat, the torn chain, the locket gone. Look here, Pete, there's 
something we have to talk about. Now, get that dazed look off your face and listen to me for a minute. Yes, yes, Phil. There's a police inspector in Myrna's room right now. O'Brien is his name. He'll be coming in soon to question you. Now, you'd better not tell him about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. I don't get you. It would look bad for you. For me? Oh, well, what do you mean? Phil, you, you don't think that I... <laughs> Suddenly, I caught my breath. My right hand in my bathrobe pocket had touched something cold. Phil and Henrietta both stared at me. Peter, what's wrong? Phil. Phil, look what I found in my pocket. What is it? Look. A locket. It, it's Bernice's locket. The one that was torn from my throat. Phil. Phil, how could this get in my pocket? Here, give me that, quick. But, Phil. Give it to me. Where is it? We're in his locket, all right. You recognize it, Henrietta? Yes. What are you going to do with it, Phil? Get rid of it, quick. Out this open window. Well, if the police find it out there, they'll think the killer dropped it. But, Phil, it was in my pocket. What, what are you looking at, Phil? Your hand, Pete. What? Your left hand. <laughs> I looked down on my left hand. There on my wrist were three long gashes where the skin had been scraped. As if by the fingernails of a woman fighting for her life. Phil. Do you, do you think I could have killed her? Nonsense. I don't believe it. You could never do a thing like that, Pete. Couldn't I? How can you be sure? How can I be sure? Peter, please... Don't talk like that. You're, you're making yourself out some terrible monster, but you aren't. Phil and I know you... You can't be like that. I don't know. Maybe I got up in my sleep and, and killed Myrna without ever knowing it consciously. After all, I, I did have that quarrel with her last night. Cut it, Pete. Here comes O'Brien, the detective. I hope I'm not intruding. Oh, no, no. It's, it's all right, Inspector. Come in, O'Brien. Mr. Lang is very upset. The shot. Yes, I understand. Believe me, Mr. Lang, you have my deepest sympathy. I wouldn't bother you at all at a time like this, but... Uh, Inspector O'Brien was a pink-cheeked, cherub-faced, chubby little man. But his eyes were cold and blue and restless. They kept jumping from Phil to Henrietta to me as he fired his questions at us. Mr. Lang, uh, one more thing. Uh, I understand you had a small party here last night? Oh, no. No, it, it wasn't a party. Just Phil and Henrietta and, and, and Ted Hale. Ted Hale? Yes, Mer Myrna's cousin. Oh, I see. Uh, this Ted Hale, a cousin of your wife, she said. Pardon me, Inspector. Uh, yes, Mr. Johnson. Peter's too easygoing and good-natured to tell you about Ted Hale. But as Peter's attorney, it's my duty to give you certain information. Oh, go ahead. Myrna, Mrs. Lang, owned considerable property in her own right. Recently, I drew a will at her request. In it, she leaves a sizable sum to... Ted Hale. Oh? Uh -huh. Oh, I, I... I just thought of something. What is it, Henry? Well, Peter was so groggy when he woke up. That's right. He looked as if he'd been drugged. Well, don't you remember last night? Ted Hale went in the kitchen to mix the last round of drinks. Oh, Henrietta, that's ridiculous. On the contrary, it's quite important. Now, uh, tell me, this Ted Hale, what does he do for a living? Why, he works for me in my brokerage office. Uh -huh. To please Myrna, I gave him a job as my confidential secretary. Hmm. Uh, I suppose you tell me where Mr. Ted Hale lives. I think I'll have a talk with him. Now, all you have to do, Pete, is sit tight. Let O'Brien follow up his lead. But Phil, I can't let him arrest Ted Hale. He didn't kill Myrna. I did. I must have. The locket. He scratches. It, it's not fair to Ted. As your attorney, I won't let you strap yourself in the electric chair. You go back to your room and get some sleep. Uh, Henrietta, do you mind going back to our house by yourself? Of course not. I'm going to sleep right here in the living room on this couch in case Peter needs me tonight. On my bed in the dark, I kept seeing a thousand pictures. Myrna, her face modeled with strangulation. Phil, always so sure of himself. 
Henrietta, worried and frightened. And O'Brien, his face grim and his blue eyes cold, going off to question Ted Hale. I must have been close to dozing off when I heard the doorbell faintly, as if in a dream. I tossed about in bed for a moment or two. And then I heard the voices in the living room. Phil's, cold and harsh. And someone else's, loud and angry and frightened. I got out of bed and opened the door. I went down the hall to the living room. I had to know who was in there arguing with Phil. It was Ted Hale. Ted, what are you doing here? Phil phoned me. He told me about Myrna. I called him up. Told him O'Brien would be coming for him. I suggested he come over here and talk it over with me. Pete, don't let them arrest me. You've got to help me. Me? Help you? You know I didn't kill Myrna. Well, I'm not sure. Pete. What? I was here last night, you know, when you had that fight with Myrna. What do you mean? If I'm arrested, it says I had a motive. But what about you, Pete? You were always quarreling with Myrna. Now, look here, Ted. If you're threatening me... I only want you to help me, Pete. Don't let them arrest me. Hide me. Hide me out till this blows over or till they get the real killer. I think Ted is right, Pete. We should help him. But where? I'll handle it. You have a dark room fixed up in the cellar, haven't you? Yes. We'll stick a cot in there and let Ted hole up for a day or two. Nobody will think of looking for him in this house. Poor Peter. Seems to be in a daze half the time. Yes, his trouble is that when he's awake, he's half asleep, and when he's asleep, he's half awake. <laughs> hey, no wonder he can't sleep well. He seems to be such an honest person, he can't lie easy. Hmm? You know, it's too bad he doesn't go over and stay at Phil's house, Mr. Host. Phil and Henrietta seem the kind of people who do everything to make him comfortable. Well, I just hope they know something about hospitality, Mary. Oh, I'm sure they do. Why, everybody knows that the proper way to treat guests is to serve them something delicious. For example, when guests drop in at my house, the first thing I do is put on the tea kettle. And almost before they have their wraps off, I have my best tea service out, and I'm serving them some of my fragrant, fresh-made cake and a cup of heartwarming Lipton tea. For no matter what time of day or night guests arrive, there's nothing like wonderful Lipton tea to make them relax and feel at home. Yes, Lipton's brisk flavor is so lively and, and full-bodied and satisfying, it just naturally hits the spot with everybody. In fact, I always say, whenever you want to serve your friends or your family a grand, refreshing drink, make it tea. And make it tea at its delicious best. Lipton tea. Now, let's get back to our sleepwalker. There's no telling what he might have done while we were talking about tea. Now, let's see. Where were we? Peter and Phil were going to hide Ted Hale in the cellar. Now, listen to me carefully, Peter. If Ted Hale is arrested and talks, O'Brien will learn about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. He'll start digging into things that won't look so good for you. No, Phil, wait. And I know you're trying to help me, but if I did it... If, if I did kill Myrna, then there's no use trying to protect me. It isn't right. I'm a dangerous man. Fiddlesticks. But you can't brush it off like that. Do... Do you know what it means to lie awake in the night... wondering whether you've killed your own wife? Wondering whom I'll kill next? Cut that out. We've got business to attend to. Now, here's my plan. We'll let Ted stay here tomorrow. And then tomorrow night... I'll smuggle him out of the country. Get him passage on a freighter to South America, maybe. You think he'll go? Sure, he'll go. He's scared stiff. But we'll need money. Lots of money. Now, how much have you got in the safe at the office? Well, about 10000 in cash, but there's a batch of negotiable bonds. They'll do. I'll go down to the office the first thing in the morning and get them out of the safe. Uh, you had the combination? Yes, you gave it to me when you gave me your power of attorney, remember? Oh, yes. Now, don't you worry about a thing. Oh, um, here... Take this powder. Hmm? It's just one of the bromides that Henrietta uses. It'll help you get to sleep. By tomorrow morning, everything will be fixed up. Fine. Fine. 
It was almost dawn when Phil left. And it must have been hours later, close to noontime, when I felt myself being roughly shaken out of a heavy, troubled sleep. Pete, Pete, wake up. Uh, what? Hey, wake up. Come on, snap out of it. Huh? Oh, Phil. Gosh, I, I feel groggy. What was in that powder you gave me? Never mind the powder. Get your eyes open. Got something to tell you. Phil, what's wrong? What happened? Listen to me carefully, Pete. I went down to the office before business hours this morning and opened the safe to get the money out. Yes? The safe is empty. Empty? The securities are gone. Well, it can't be. Who else had the combination besides you and me? Only Ted Hale. Oh? Do, do you think that... I'll bet you a dollar to a donut he's gone. Come on, let's check. <laughs> Look, Pete. There's a light in the dark room. He must have got up early and beat me to it, to the safe. Ted... Ted, you in there? <laughs> Always the optimist, huh? Come on, open it up. Ted! Good heavens. Ted Hale hadn't gone anywhere. He was lying there on the cot. His head was a bloody pulp. It had been bashed in while he slept. With a long-handled coal shovel which lay there alongside the cot. Great Scott. He's been murdered. We stood there in a narrow dark room, Phil and I, and we looked at each other. There was a strange gleam in Phil's eyes. I tried to read the meaning of that gleam, but he averted his eyes too quickly. He dropped his gaze to my hands. I saw what he was looking at. My hands were black and grimy with coal dust. And on the grimy, coal blackened handle of the shovel... It was a fresh set of fingerprints. Phil, did I kill him? Did I kill him in my sleep? The same as murder? Phil, I can't stand it being a murderer. I'm going to give myself up. You'll do nothing of the kind. If you did it, Pete, you're not responsible. But you do think I did it? And murder, too? I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Just think, Phil. Maybe, maybe tonight I might kill you or Henrietta. There's no telling what I might do. Rubbish. No, no, Phil. It's hard to believe, but there's the proof. I'm a murderer. I'm dangerous. There's only one thing to do. I won't let you do it. What else is left? Come on. I'm going to help you hide Ted's body. <laughs> How much further, Phil? Oh, there it is. There's the bridge up ahead. Okay. Here, help me with it. We had the body of Ted Hale in a sack with a pair of hundred-pound dumbbells to weight it down. Myrna's funeral took place the next morning, and I had to endure the condolences of friends and business associates. But Phil and Henrietta stood by me all through it. It'll be over soon, Peter. Then you can rest. Keep your chin up. I'll get rid of the stragglers. Look. Look who just came in. Where? Oh, Inspector O'Brien, what does he want, Phil? Take it easy, take it easy. Let me do the talking. I uh, came to pay my respects, Mr. Lang. Oh, well, thank you, Inspector. No trace of Ted Hale, is there, is, Inspector? I'm afraid not, Mr. Judson. We're combing the city for him, but I'm afraid he's got clean away. You see, uh, it was marvelous to see how calmly Phil could talk to O'Brien about Ted Hale. Knowing all the time just where the body was. Under that bridge. I glanced at Henrietta. She was watching Phil, too. Yeah. You know, uh, know what I think, Mr. Judson? I think Ted Hale will never be caught. I have a very funny feeling that he's dead. Later that afternoon, I took a taxi cab and I went down to police headquarters. 
I'm asked to see Inspector O'Brien. Ah, oh, glad to see you, Mr. Lang. You're looking a little better this afternoon. I <laughs> feel better, Inspector. I, I feel better because I've come to an important decision. Oh, yeah? Inspector, I've decided to tell you something that'll startle you. <laughs> That's pretty hard to startle an old hand in my business. Go ahead, I'm listening. All right. Inspector, Ted Hale didn't kill Myrna. I killed her. That is, I think I killed her. You think you killed her, don't you know? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I assure you, I'm perfectly safe. Uh, just a second now. You either killed her or you didn't kill her. If you kill somebody, you know it. No, not in this case, Inspector. You see, I, I think I did it in my sleep. Both times. Myrna and Ted Hale, too. Uh, hold on now. I'll get someone to take notes. I suppose you start from the beginning. I told him the whole story. I feel it awaken me. We found Myrna strangled. The groggy, drug feeling I'd had. How Ted Hale had tried to blackmail me. And how Phil had awakened me once more and we'd gone down to the cellar. We found Ted with his head bashed in. I talked for a solid hour. I'm glad you came to see me, Mr. Lang. Glad you've told me all this. You must have had a hard time reaching a decision to come here. Yes. Yes, it was hard, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Phil wanted me to go away. It would have been so easy to go away and let him take care of things. But I, I'd never be able to sleep for fear I'd kill someone else. Well, you needn't worry, Mr. Lang. There won't be any more killings. Not if I'm safely in jail. You're not going to jail. You're going home. What? In those notes the stenographer has taken, Mr. Lang, I have almost enough material to convict the real murder. I need just one more thing. Now, I, you go home and wait. Don't worry. You, you mean I, I, did, I didn't kill Myrna and Ted? Now you just go along home and take it easy. I'm back at home now. It's two hours since I left O'Brien's office and I've taken the time to write down this full account. Just as I gave it to the stenographer. As I write now, I can look across the lawn to Phil Judson's house. Five minutes ago, I saw Inspector O'Brien and two detectives go in there. The front door is opening now. I can see them coming out. O'Brien first, then the two detectives. With Phil between them. They've got handcuffs on Phil. And here comes Henrietta. She's running across the lawn, coming here. Peter! Peter! Coming, Henrietta. Peter, they've taken Phil away. Yes, I saw it off in the window. Oh, darling. Everything went right, exactly as we planned oh, it. Oh, baby, baby. Hold me tight, Peter. Hold tight. <laughs> we can be together now, forever and ever. I'd have killed a dozen learners for you, baby. I know. And you were clever, Peter. So clever. And the hardest part was getting Phil to cooperate. <laughs> but I knew he'd do anything for a friend. What a fool he is. He stepped right in and took over. <laughs> you should have seen O'Brien when I told him the story. I could tell exactly what he was thinking. Here's a poor, innocent sap whose best friend is framing him. Giving him drugs and then making him think he commits murders in his sleep. Oh, Peter. <laughs> as soon as he's convicted, I'll be free. And we can go away together. All yeah. right. Huh? But you'll have to cancel that trip. Both of you. O'Brien. Oh, you... You heard what we said? Sure did, every word. <laughs> Remember at my office, Mr. Lang, when I told you I only needed one more thing to clinch the case against the murderer? Well, this was it. I faked the arrest of Mr. Judson. Then I sneaked back to see what you'd do about it. <laughs> you did plenty. Well, Pete certainly ruined a perfect crime by talking too much, which all goes to show that it's not wise to kill and tell. Mercy. <laughs> People do go out of their way to get themselves into trouble, don't they, Mr. Host? I'm really surprised at Henrietta, though. For being a partner in crime, Mary. No, 
for not being a partner to her husband. Most women, you know, take great pride in looking out for their husband's happiness. Mm -hmm. You mean like mending the bullet holes in their shirts? Oh, Mr. Host, (laughs) there are lots of better ways than that to keep a husband happy. For example, when your husband comes home from work, give him the refreshment of a brimming cup of piping hot Lipton tea. Lipton tea makes a wonderfully pleasing drink at mealtime or any time, because Lipton's is such a grand tea, so deliciously different, more flavorful and full-bodied. If you've been forgetting to get it, why not jot down Lipton's on tomorrow's grocery list now? Remember, Lipton tea always meets with favor. Because Lipton tea gives you brisk flavor. And now, friends, a parting word of advice. If you ever wake up and think that you've murdered someone in your sleep, don't go to the police. Now, just take another powder, brother, and go back to sleep. <laughs> Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Innocent Mrs. Duff by Elizabeth Sanksy Holding. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will bring you another Inner Sanctum mystery directed by Hyman Brown and called Accident. Does the wind whistling in your ears frighten you folks? Oh, now don't be scared. Because when you're pushed down an empty elevator shaft and you hit the bottom... Nothing ever can frighten you again. It's just an accident. And you'll learn all the mystery of it if you're listening to Inner Sanctum next week. (laughs) Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. For a wonderful soup, be sure to try Lipton's Noodle Soup. Lipton's is the extra delicious noodle soup that folks rave about on account of all those tender golden egg noodles and that honest-to-goodness chickeny flavor. Tastes like homemade soup that you'd spend hours in making, yet Lipton's is ready in a jiffy. Lipton's Noodle Soup mix costs less and makes lots more than ordinary canned soups. So get some Lipton's Noodle Soup tomorrow. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. All waiting to go through the squeaking door. What a long line. But everybody's here tonight. The line reaches right to the edge of the grave. (laughs) Been waiting long. What? Seven days and seven nights? Dear, dear, you should have not. I can always slip the latch string out and you could hang around properly. (laughs) Why, Mr. Host, people don't need a latch string to do that. Didn't you know that all our listeners hang on your every word? Oh, yes, Mary. There's no better place than Inner Sanctum for people to get the news. Or the news. (laughs) As a matter of fact, we have some good news for our listeners right now. Folks, there's a new delight waiting for you when you try Lipton tea. Now, many of you may have been drinking tea for years, but until you taste Lipton's, you just don't know the full pleasure of tea at its delicious best. Lipton, you see, has brisk flavor. In fact, brisk is the very word that tea experts themselves use to describe Lipton's spirited, full-bodied flavor. Unlike ordinary dull-tasting teas, Lipton's is never flat, but always hearty and satisfying. 
Lipton tea gives you more contentment in every cup. So do try it soon. It's tea at its tastiest. Lipton tea with that grand, brisk flavor. And now for tonight's story. It's an original radio play written especially for the Inner Sanctum by Hank Warner. Called Strands of Death. And starring Santa Ortega in the role of Henry. Do you love your wife? Do you enjoy buying her a handsome fur piece, perfume, jewel, or nylon? Do you wonder secretly what you would do if the finery you bought her was used by her to win another man so that she could leave you? Oh, you can't answer, can you? Well, this is the story of one man who can. Meek, mild Henry Turner. I should have known at once. That morning in the office, when Judson was reading the newspaper aloud, that something was wrong. The unidentified body of a young woman strangled with a brand new pair of nylons was found last night. Unidentified? Yeah. In the hallway of a rooming house at 72 Beach Street. Unidentified? Near the body, which was fully clothed, police found a handbag containing a sales slip from the Silvertone Hosiery Company. Incredible. Police were at a loss to... Helen always carried identification, charge account, keys. Nice to discover. And a second pair of nylon. But if it wasn't Helen... No, no. Of course it was Helen. Well, that's a pretty piece of news, eh, Turner? <laughs> By the way, you bought some nylons for your wife the other day, didn't you? So what's the matter? Are you sick? Was I sick? Johnson wanted to know. Wonder what his face would have looked like. But I told him right there that the police were wrong. That the body could be identified. And it was Helen. My wife. I went to the police. The body was at the morgue. Uh, this way, sir. Uh, here it is. Uh, steady. No. No. It's not Mrs. Turner. It's not Helen. I know how you feel. The shock of relief. But it wasn't relief. I walked from the morgue to our apartment... My brain was pounding with a question I hated to face. If it isn't your wife, who is it? If you didn't kill your wife, who did you kill? I didn't know. I didn't know. I got to the apartment. Weary, exhausted. Questions unanswered. My foot kicked a telegram that had been slipped under the door. I tore it open. It was from my wife. From Helen. The telegram was like a hand tearing the black curtain from my mind's eye. Could at last recall what had happened. What I had done. Why I had killed a strange woman. Thinking it was Helen. It swirled across my brain like a crazy picture. The night I came home after a hard day. Hello, baby. Hello. Gosh, I'm tired. Anything special for dinner? You could stand a good meal right now. What do you expect me to do? Slave over a hot stove for oh, you? Oh, Helen, please. I'm sorry. I'll enjoy whatever you've got. Maybe you will. But I'm sick of potato salad and cold cuts. Oh, well. That's all you ever say. Oh, well. Look, darling, I'm tired. Let's not argue. Please. After all, things could be worse. You get your permanence, new dresses all the time, shoes, hats. Why, you're the best-dressed woman in the crowd. I suppose you'd like me to wear rags. Ah, oh, that's where you're wrong, baby. You're a good looker and you need pretty clothes. And you can have all my money can buy. Happy? Let's have a kiss, huh? Oh, I guess you're good to me, Henry. Let's eat. What I was really upset about, I suppose, is that I haven't got a single pair of nylons to wear with a new dress I got today. A new dress? Lovely, you like it. Black. 
I plan on wearing it tonight. Could look lovely with real sheer nylons. Tonight? Oh, I didn't tell you. Girls are having a bridge over at Margie's. I won't stay long. Do you mind, Henry? I'm not very hungry. I'll slip into the dress if you don't mind. Go right ahead. Mm, Trader sounds very good tonight. My compliments, Mr. Schmidt, darling. Hey. That is stunning. You like it? And how? Yeah, you certainly should be wearing nylons with that dress. Yes, sirree. Oh, well. Oh, uh, would you mind, darling? I uh, bought a carton of cigarettes in my briefcase in the hall, please. Oh, yeah, I'd better take a pack with me. Henry! Nylons! <laughs> oh, you beast teasing me like this. <laughs> oh, they're lovely. Think nothing of it. Anytime you want nylons, just call on me. When? Where? Did you have much trouble? Ma'am, did you say trouble? Nothing at all. I just stood in line for three hours at the Silvertone shop. Of course, it rained for about two hours. But after all, nylon. Oh, Henry, you're wonderful. Oh, I'm crazy about them. I put them right on. Oh, Marge and the girls will eat the hearts out. Uh, if you permit my saying so, ma'am. You sure have a pretty pair of legs. Uh-huh. Uh, don't be late, will you? Darling, I'll be back as soon as I can. Bye. I sat around listening to the radio and reading the paper, waiting for Helen to come back. Hello? Oh, Henry. Um, Helen there? Oh, hello, Marge. Uh, didn't, didn't she... Oh, uh, she went out about two hours ago. Why? Oh, well, just thought I'd tell her Silvertone's got some nylons. I'll tell her. How's your bridge party? Bridge party? Well, that's tomorrow night. Be sure and remind her, please. I will, Marge. All right. Good night. Bridge party. Tomorrow night. Marge's. I tried to sleep. I couldn't. I rolled around from side to side, thinking, thinking, wondering. It was no use. I got out of bed. I paced the floor. I didn't dare call Dottie's. Oh. Hello, darling. Helen, where are you? When do you expect to get home? Oh, in a couple of days. Billy wants to take in some skiing. Oh? Hello, Henry? Henry, don't you hear me? <laughs> Must have hung up on me, Billy. How oh, I managed to get dressed and shaved. I don't recall. I don't know how long I walked the streets. My briefcase was in my hand. I must have parted from one account to another because my sales book shows that I took orders for some of my firm's new carpeting that day. These things I don't recall at all. But the line. The nylon line. It's strange that I shouldn't remember getting on it. All I know is that Suddenly, I found myself part of it. How long I'd been on line, I don't recall. I told myself I had no business being on this line. I should have been out getting orders. But I felt chained to the line, waiting for the store to open. Finally, the line started moving. I asked for the same size and shade I bought the home. Then I saw her, leaving the store. I walked after her. Helen! Yes. Oh, I... I thought you were... Helen? Uh, yes. I, I hope you'll excuse me. Did you get some nylon? Yes. Sometimes I wonder whether it's worth the trouble just for one pair. So exhausting. I could stand a cocktail. 
Why are you looking at me like that? Where shall we have it, Helen? There you go again, Helen. You sure have Helen on your mind. Call me Louise. We had the cocktails. And then dinner. And I walked her home. In the hallway. This hall light seems to be out all the time. Well, it's been a lovely evening. You really need those nylons? I reached over to kiss her. She turned her head. Swung her back to me. I put my arms around her waist. Kissed her neck. What's Helen got that I haven't got? I got them for you, Helen. What shade? Rosy Dawn. How oh, smooth and soft they are. <laughs> they look lovely against your pretty white skin. <laughs> A tickling my neck. What are you... Oh. Oh. Look lovely around your pretty white throat. I got them for you, Helen. Just for you. Bye, Helen. That's what happens in a dark hallway when a girl embarks on, um, shall we say, sheer folly. <laughs> oh, Mr. Host, to think there probably were people who would have helped Louise just inside that doorway. But they couldn't hear her, Mary. Nylon stockings aren't like chains. They don't rattle when they're wrapped around someone's throat. <laughs> well, at that hour of the night, folks aren't expecting murders on their doorsteps. <laughs> The family was probably out in the kitchen having a last-minute snack before bedtime. Perhaps the radio was on, and they were all listening to the latest news headlines. Meanwhile, Mother would be fixing up a plate of sandwiches and brewing up a pot of Lipton tea. For Lipton tea would surely be part of the picture. Served with a late evening snack, it gives a happy ending to the day. And because it's so relaxing and enjoyable, a piping hot cup of Lipton's adds extra delight to any meal. Why waste time just thinking about it? Why not get a package of Lipton tea tomorrow and treat yourself to its mellow, full-bodied flavor? Remember, Lipton's gives you brisk flavor. Wonder whether Henry's realized his sheer recklessness. Pretty thin, isn't it? Poor fellow has just strangled the weed. A nylon collie baby, if ever there was one. Under the impression he was killing his wife, Helen. Let's see what else he has to say about the telegram he just got from his dear, dear wife. The telegram I held in my shaking hands convinced me of the horrible truth. It wasn't Helen I had murdered. The telegram was dated the very night in which I had strangled the unidentified woman. I'll be home in a couple of days to pick up my clothes. Please don't be too unhappy. <laughs> Please don't be too unhappy. I wasn't. I was beyond that. I would never be unhappy again. Or happy. I felt only one desire. Kill Helen. I passed the nylon line again. The next day, walked by it. I was drawn back to it. I joined the line. I didn't move fast enough. I felt a slight bump from behind. I, I turned. I'm sorry. Helen. You must be mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry. We got him just in time. They're closing. Sold out. Wish my husband would stand in line. Oh, dear, it's starting to rain. 
Can I drop you off? My car's around the corner. We drove a bit into the country. She was nice. Just bored. We pulled into a side road. Is out of town so much? My arm was around her shoulder. She snuggled against me. The same heady perfume. Helen's perfume. My free hand reached for the bag with the nylons. Thanks, dear. They hung around her like a necklace. I pulled both hands and twisted. I knew sooner or later they'd get me. But I couldn't help it. All I knew was that I had to kill Helen. I knew I would have to kill anyone who reminded me of Helen. Until... Until Helen herself was home. Yes, Commissioner, we've got all the men out. Yes, I'm assigning Keating to it. I'll keep you informed. Goodbye. Uh, Keating. Yes, Inspector? Come in, please. Commissioner on you again? Uh, we've got to do something and do it fast. The city's going crazy. It's only an idea, but it may work. Now, you know the details. Both women wore the same size stockings, same shade. Both used the same perfume, same size clothes. Both pretty, same color hair. Eyes, uh, yours. Uh... Want me to dye my hair? Right. Now, those nylons, both pairs and the extra pairs found on the women came from the Silvertone shop on Madison Avenue. What about a fur coat? Can I take your pick of the two with the property clerk? He may lay low for a while with the panic on. Yeah, we'll have to take our chances on that. But if this is the work of a madman, and it looks like it, he'll try it again. Now, drop everything. We'll arrange to have you hang around the counter. The shade is Rosy Dawn, size nine and a half, fifty-one gauge. Well, there'd be more than one man asking for that. It's the Vogue right now, you know. Yeah, we'll have to take our chances. Yes, mister, what's yours? Make up your mind, mister. There's lots of people waiting. Oh, I, I, I beg your pardon, I... I was just looking over there. I, I thought I recognized someone. Thanks and shade, please. Uh, uh, Rosie Dawn, nine and a half, fifty-one gauge. Sit down there. I'll get them. Rosie Dawn, nine and a. Rosie Dawn, nine and a half, fifty-one gauge, Lieutenant Keating. Thank you. Uh, would you mind stepping up this way, ma'am? This is the last box. That gentleman wants a pair too. Oh, not at all. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. Helen. Oh, you must be mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry. You look so much like... How much, please? Dollar sixty-five. I'm sorry to keep staring at you. You still think I'm Helen. You could be. Well? Care for a lift? I'm taking a cab to 51st and 3rd Avenue. I don't mind. I live down near 2nd. Stop, driver. I told you, you said... Never mind. What are you looking at? That cab in front of the house. A woman getting out. My wife, Helen. Must be coming for her clothes. With those bags. Hey, you are, cabby. Keep the change. I'll just sit here until she goes in. So, hubby wanted to play while wifey was away. Uh, what, what's that? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I need these nylons now for my wife. Oh, uh, driver, take the lady down to Second Avenue. Uh, then come back to me in about 15 minutes. What's the address, lady? I'll be getting out here, too, as soon as he goes into the building. Who's there? Anybody there? Is that you, Henry? Yes, darling. It's me. You scared me. I scared you? Mild, meek, adoring Henry. Your husband. Scared you. Don't talk like that, Henry. I explained everything in my wire. You got it, didn't you? Your wire? Yes, my darling. Made everything clear. Very clear. The cold and the wind and the rain. Standing in line for hours and hours. 
For nylons. My darling. Don't come near me. Stay away from me. Don't be alarmed, darling. I brought you some nylons. Look. Pretty? I really don't need them. I got plenty. <gasps> you won't need any more after these. Stop it! You won't need any more. No, I could hear her trying to revive Helen. It was no use. But she'd come in too late. And she bent over me. Summoning what strength I had, I grabbed her leg, <gasps> tripped her. Wait. As I had hit the wall, the gun dropped. I grabbed it. Better not. Get up. Sit in that chair. You're the nylon murderer, aren't you? Yes. You're a detective. Pretty smart. What are you going to do? Strange. I wanted to kill you. And I saw you in the store. Miss, uh... Lieutenant Keating. Oh. Now oh, that Helen is gone, I... I feel at peace. I don't want to kill anyone. I know how you feel, Henry. I loved her. You believe that, don't you? Sure. But she was no good. Get up. What for? Get up, I said. Now walk over to that closet. Go on. Open the door. Now turn around. Don't try anything or I'll have to shoot. Walk in. I'm sorry. <coughs> so sorry, Miss Kitty. Now, they can come and get you. Both of you. Kitty. Kitty, you all right? Nasty bump, Inspector. Did he get away? He, he was bleeding pretty badly. Now the blood leads into the bedroom. What? That oh. oh. oh, crazy fool. He's hanged himself. With nylons. Crazy? I wonder. Cut him down, Brady. Well, too late, Inspector. There's a note on the floor. Let's see it. Miss Keating will understand. Do you, Lieutenant? Yes, Inspector. I do. Now, wasn't that a wasteful cup? Imagine cutting poor Henry down. Ruined a perfectly good pair of nylon. He should have untied the knot. Well, one way or another, it goes to prove that when you've got a case of nylon, you've got your hands full. As for poor Henry, one way or another, he faces a long stretch. Well, there's one good thing about it, Mr. Host. With Henry dead, ladies can stand in nylon lines once again without being afraid. Yes, Mary, tomorrow is another and a happier day for the ladies. Oh, but it needn't be just for the ladies, Mr. Host. Tomorrow can be a red-letter day for their families, too. That is, if they remember to put Lipton tea on tomorrow's grocery order tonight. How about that, friend? Jot it down right now so you'll surely remember. You'll be doing yourself and your family a good turn. Because you'll all love grand Lipton tea. Everybody does. Because Lipton's has such delightful, brisk flavor. Because it's so satisfying and, and zestful. Don't let another day go by without trying it, will you? Tomorrow, be sure it's Lipton tea you ask for and Lipton's you get. Because Lipton tea has that wonderful, brisk flavor. An 
now, friends, before I bid you a fun farewell, I must tell you about the wife of a friend of mine who smokes nylon cigarettes. Yes, it burns her up. She has to roll her own, but she sure gets a run for her money. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Lying Lady by Robert Finnegan. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown. Starring Victor Moore, the famous Hollywood and Broadway star. It's called Murders in the Moor. A scalp-raising, toe-tingling story about a little man and a big knife and girl. Lots of girls. But most of them will be no good to anybody because they end up dead. <laughs> Until next week, then, and our special star, Victor Moore. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm? <laughs> For tomorrow's lunch, let's see. Now, why not serve creamed salmon with peas? And lead off with a soup that's super, wonderful Lipton's noodle soup. You've never tasted better fresh-cooked chickeny goodness in your life than you get in homemade-tasting Lipton's noodle soup. Now, that I can promise you. It's easy to prepare, too, and costs less, yet makes lots more than ordinary canned soups. So why not get a supply tomorrow of Lipton's noodle soup? And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present... Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door. Hmm, what's that? You're scared. <laughs> Don't be frightened. Why, we've been beating our brains out to make things pleasant for you. Yes, take that fellow lying on the floor. Now, that's a nice guy, really solicitous. He put a bullet through his head because he didn't want you to be bored. <laughs> hmm? Oh, you don't like that pretty lady hanging from the chandelier. Well, you fix that. We'll cut it down and nail her to the wall. And she'll be a pin-up girl. <laughs> My goodness, Mr. Host. Sounds as if there's nothing you and your friends wouldn't do to oblige. Oh, but there is, Mary. You never catch us being nice to anyone to oblige. Not on your death would we do that. <laughs> I can't believe you're so different from most people, Mr. Host. And most people enjoy doing nice things for others. Mm, like what, Mary? Why, like always having Lipton tea on the table. That's one of the nicest things you can do for your family and friends. Why do I say Lipton tea? Well, there's a good reason for that. Lipton's has that wonderful brisk flavor. And brisk flavor is the thing that makes a world of difference between Lipton's and other teas. In fact, brisk is the tea expert's own word for that fresh, lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea. And it's a word you'll agree just naturally applies to Lipton's the very first time you taste this delicious tea. For Lipton's has a zesty, full flavor that makes it stand right out. So, for extra cheer and comfort and satisfaction in your tea drinking, get acquainted with Lipton's right away. Why put up with just so-so teas any longer when there's so much more pleasure to be found in Lipton's brisk flavor? <laughs> Do whatever it is that you do when fear fastens cold fingers on your spine. A cigarette, perhaps, or a handkerchief to twist. Anything to brace you against tonight's tale of horror. It's an original radio play written especially for Inner Sanctum by Michael Sklar and called Death 
is a double crosser. Our star tonight is Lawson Zerby, who plays the part of Harry Smith, murderer. I looked at the blood splattered mallet, still gripped in my hand, and down at Marie's body. It was like coming out of a bad dream, only to go into a nightmare. Instead of using a mallet to cut the King Midas diamond, I'd used it to murder my wife. And the big diamond was still in the vice, still sparkling in the light of the work lamp, still tormenting me with the glow of its inner fires. The thing was evil. Anderson had warned me. Does the diamond frighten you, Harry? <laughs> no wonder. The story of great diamonds is a history of intrigue, violence, murder. Anderson was right. My luck had been all bad ever since I came to his house. It was one of those old New York brownstones. Big enough for several families, but... Only two people were living there when I came. Anderson and my wife. Marie was working as his housekeeper and she gave me the land. He's about 70 years old, Harry. He lives all alone here. It's perfect for you. No family? No wife, no children, no friends. He never goes out except on business and no one ever comes to see him. Sounds good to me, Marie. Good. It's perfect. I'll tell him you just got out of the army. He won't ask questions. He'll never find out you were... In prison. What does he do for a living? He's a diamond cutter. A diamond cutter? He don't say. He was famous once. Diamonds? He doesn't cut little ones, Harry. Only the great big diamonds worth thousands of dollars. I moved in with Marie, and for a while everything was quiet. I didn't mind the quiet after that five-year forgery rap in Sing Sing. And and one day the... Peace and quiet ended. I met old Anderson on the steps going down the street. Good morning, Harry. Oh, hello, Mr. Anderson. Hey, you look all excited. Some good news coming your way? I hope so, Harry. Of course, I can well afford to be idle, but it would be pleasant to work again. And it's nice to know that people still remember you. Is it a, a job? A wonderful job. If I get the assignment, well, I'm sure I'll get it. He couldn't give it to anyone else. Uh, a diamond? One of the largest diamonds in the world. The King Midas Stone, discovered last year in the Kimberley Fields. It was purchased recently by Johnson, the multimillionaire. I'm on my way to his home to discuss the cutting. Well, good luck. I sure hope you get the job, Mr. Anderson. The next afternoon, Anderson invited me up to his workroom. On the bench was a square black velvet covered by a white cloth. Something big was underneath that cloth. Anderson lifted it. And for the first time, I saw the King Midas diamond. How do you think of it, Harry? For a second, I couldn't talk. The blood was pumping too fast. 215 carats. When I'm finished cutting, it'll be reduced to 125. How much will it be worth? Diamond like that? <laughs> you could get a hundred thousand dollars and no questions asked. It's funny. It's kind of oily on the surface, but down inside it gleams like it's on fire. Has it frightened you? Yeah. Stone like that does things to you. The story of great diamonds is a history of intrigue, violence. Murder. You, uh, you said something about cutting it. I'd have to study the King Midas until every detail of the task is clear in my mind. Then just a few light blows of the mallet on the chisel, and the result will be a flawless diamond. How long will it take? Oh, I should say about two months, Harry. I went downstairs to Marie. One look at me, and she knew something had happened. I told her my plan. If they catch you, they'll send you back to jail. They won't catch me. I've got it all figured out. This is our chance. He told me himself that the diamond will be worth a hundred grand when he's finished. A hundred grand? Yeah. No more pots and pans and scrubbing floors. 
No more passing phony checks. We'll be set for life, Marie. How are you going to go about it? I'll wait until he's finished cutting the diamonds. How will you know when he's finished? You'd have to know the exact time. If you waited too long, he might turn it over to the owner, Mr. Johnson. Then where would you be? Don't worry. I've got that figured out, too. So you want to become a diamond cutter, Harry? If you'll teach me to work, Mr. Anderson, I promise it won't be any bother. All I want to do is watch you while you go about cutting the King Midas. Diamond cutters aren't made overnight. Takes a great deal of time. I spent 50 years learning the craft. Oh, please, Mr. Anderson, you don't know what this means to me. Well, all right, Harry. I'll let you watch me as I work. So that's how it began. Every day for two months, I went upstairs and watched Anderson as he studied the King Midas diamond. Cleavage must take place along planes parallel to the octahedron bases of the crystal. Step by step, he explained the job, how he would split it, where he would place the notches so that the diamond would split along the exact lines he wanted. He went over every detail again and again and again. Finally, he cut the notches for the splitting. Slowly, carefully. And then he he placed the diamond in the vise. He got out the chisel and the mallet and placed them on the workbench. It was like a wedding ceremony. I was on fire. I couldn't wait. Just a few taps with the mallet, and it's done. Are you going to do it now? No, Harry. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. He kept putting it off. Then I realized what it was. He was scared. He couldn't trust his unsteady hands. It hit me like a ton of brick. He was never going to cut that diamond. You're so smart. What are you going to do now? I'm going to cut the diamond myself. You? Yeah, me. I know how to do it. It's all set. There's nothing to it. But what about Anderson? We don't need Anderson anymore. You mean... Yeah. But... That's murder. So it's murder. They'll never pin it on us. I've figured out a way to do it without leaving any trace behind. We went upstairs. Anderson was standing where I left him at the workbench. He was so lost in thought that he didn't hear us come in. He isn't looking. Get it over with. All right. Let go of me. I... I don't like to do this, Mr. Anderson, honest. Mary, Mary, stop it. It's no use, Mr. Anderson. I don't... Please, please. He begged for mercy. He fought back, but it was useless. I had a firm grip on his neck, both hands, and he was an old man. I squeezed tighter and tighter till his voice was cut off. His body stopped thrashing around. I held him like that a couple of seconds more for good measure. You can let go of him now. He's dead, Harry. Imagine that. Cold-blooded murder. Killing a harmless old man like Mr. Anderson, choking him to death. Doesn't that slay you? And all because of a piece of ice. Why, it makes me hot under the collar. And that cool cucumber, Harry Smith. (laughs) I'll bet he gets so hot that he'll burn before he's through. Burr, Mr. Host. I'd surely hate to look forward to such a fate. Oh, no danger, Mary. That is, unless you plan to embark on a crime career just for excitement. Oh, no thank you, Mr. Host. I find enough excitement in the little everyday pleasures of life. 
Take yesterday, for instance. I was in the middle of the luncheon dishes when the doorbell rang and in walked my cousin Betty, a whack just back from overseas. You can imagine that called for a real celebration. And in no time, I had the tea kettle on and we were sitting down to a real gab fest over our friendly cups of Lipton tea. We were in the sunroom, and the sun was streaming in, lending its bright golden rays to cheer us on. We just sat there sipping and talking. Oh, it must have been for hours, because the sun was going down in a rosy blaze when we finally tore ourselves away. And believe me, Lipton's played a lively part in the fun we had. Even Betty remarked on it. When she got up to go, she said, You know, Mary, it's tea like that that makes a person glad to be home again. And friends, that's really true. Lipton's grand, brisk flavor is worth hunting the world over to enjoy. It gives you such extra delight, complete satisfaction. Try it yourself. Tomorrow, start enjoying Lipton's, the tea with brisk flavor. Well, friends, let's get back to Harry Smith and his charming wife. Such nice people. They killed old Anderson, the diamond cutter, to steal a piece of ice worth a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and unless they have a lot of another kind of ice handy, they'll have to do something fast to get rid of the body. We carried Anderson's body down to the cellar and broke open the brick wall. Placing the old man's body behind it, we bricked it up again. Then we went through my plan. I wrote a suicide note. To whom it may concern. I, Olaf Anderson, because I failed in the task of cutting the King Midas diamond, have decided to take my life. When this note is found, I will be dead. It was easy for me, a professional forger, to fake the suicide note in Anderson's handwriting. I had him say he was going to end it all in the river and that he was taking the diamond with him to his death. And that night, Marie and I took a walk across the footpath over the Hudson River Bridge. When we reached the middle, uh... You got the suicide note in Anderson's overcoat pocket? Yeah. No cars coming from either direction. Now's a good time to drop it. Yeah. The cops will find the coat and figure that he took it off before he climbed the rail and jumped. All right. Come on, hurry. Let's get away from here. We went home. Marie telephoned police headquarters and asked for the missing persons bureau. Hello? I want to report a missing person. It's the man I work for, Olaf Anderson. Yes, Anderson. I'm his housekeeper. And I'm worried because it's so late and he hasn't come home. My name? Mrs. Harry Smith. We went to bed. I guess we would hear from the police the next morning... And I was right. Yes, what is it? Megan is the name, lady. Detective Joe Megan, missing persons bureau. Oh, yes, come in. Are uh, you the party who reported a man named Olaf Anderson missing? Yes, did, did, did you... Did we find him? I think so. I'd like you folks to come down to the morgue with me. The morgue? What for? We've got a body down there. Body of an old man that fits the description of Anderson. It was fished out of the Hudson River early this morning. You might be able to identify it. Here we are, folks. Before I lift the sheet on this slab, I ought to warn you. This stiff ain't exactly pretty. We can stand a little shock, Megan. And I just thought the lady... I'm all right. Okay, then. Well... You recognize him? His, his face. It's gone like he... Like he went through a meat chopper. Most of his clothes were gone, too, when we got him. The poor guy must have got caught in the propeller of a passing ship. Marie, it's Mr. Anderson. Harry. Don't you recognize the pants? They're from that old suit he always used to wear. Oh, yes. Yes, you're right. So you can identify him, eh? I'm sure that's Mr. Anderson. Well, I guess that closes the case. Suicide. Body recovered. And a great big hunk of diamond at the bottom of the Hudson River. It 
was a lucky break for us. We were in the clear, and the King Midas diamond was ours. We went back to the house. I took the diamond up to the workroom, and I placed it in the vise. I got out the mallet and the chisel. I thought it would be easy to cut the stone until I tried. Well, what are you waiting for? My, my hand is shaking. I'm kind of nervous. Things have been coming too fast. Let's put this off until tomorrow. I know I said I'd do it tonight, but... But what? I don't feel so well tonight, Marie. You're lying. How long are you going to keep this up? I take it easy. You said you knew how to do it. I, I, I do. Well, then cut it. For heaven's sakes, get it over with. Don't rush me. If I make a mistake, it'll cost us $100,000. You've been putting it off for three days now, Harry. First this and then that. There's always something. You've always got a reason for not cutting that diamond. Now listen, Marie, I've got to be careful. Knowing how to cut the diamond is one thing, doing it is another. You're scared. That's what's the matter with Don't you. Don't say that. You're frightened. Look at your hands. See how they shake. Well, you can hardly hold the mallet and chisel. You're as bad as Anderson was. She was right. My hands were shaking, just like Anderson's before I killed him. I tried for control. I told myself the diamond was nothing but a chunk of carbon crystal. I, I placed the chisel against the stone. I raised the mallet. But I couldn't bring it down. No, what are you waiting for? I, I don't know how hard to strike. A gentle blow. That's what you said Anderson told you. I, I, I can't do it. You can't do it. Of course you can. Don't be a stupid fool. There's nothing to it. She went wild. She began to shake my arm and scream at me. But her voice seemed to come from a distance. I kept staring at that diamond as though I were hypnotized. My throat was dry as dust. I, I was dizzy. Pinpoints of fire shot across my eyes. The diamond was doing things to me and it was driving Marie crazy. Suddenly I couldn't stand it. Her voice snapped something in my mind. You, you fool, you stupid idiot. Don't stand there like a silly fool. Shut up. Don't you dare shout at me. Shut up. I've had all I can take from you. Why, of all the nerve, you... Harry, put down that mallet. Stay away from me. I didn't mean those things I said. T -t Take as much time as you like. Don't. Hey! Marie. I'm sorry. I lost my head. Marie, say something. She's dead. I killed her. her body down to the cellar, reopened the wall, and placed her body with Anderson's. I'd hardly finished putting the bricks back into place when the front doorbell rang. I cleaned my hands, went upstairs, and opened it. Hello, Smith. It was Megan, the detective. He came in, looked around suspiciously, and closed the door behind him. What's the matter with you, Smith? Me? Yeah, you. You look sick. Me sick? I never felt better in my life. Maybe it's the light. Is your wife at home? No, she isn't. Expect her home soon? I know. No, she went to Baltimore to visit her mother. Left kind of suddenly, didn't she? What are you driving on, Megan? Take the chip off your shoulder. Nobody's picking on you yet. What do you mean? This Anderson suicide. You said the case was closed. It's closed until this morning. Now, there's a couple of angles in the case that don't make sense. I'm not even sure the, the old guy we pulled out of the river is Anderson. But I identified him. Sure you did. Just today, a guy named Keeler showed up at the morgue and swore that same body was his father. It must be Anderson. A suicide, suicide note. Suicide note said Anderson was killing himself because he made a mistake and ruined the King Midas diamond. There, don't you see? But Anderson never got the job of cutting that diamond. Hey, what? Say that again. Anderson never was commissioned to cut the King Midas diamond. How do you like that? It can't be. He told me Look, himself. I got that information straight from the owner, Mr. Johnson. I don't believe it. Johnson was out of town until this morning. I got in touch with him, making a routine check on the facts. He told me he never commissioned Anderson to cut the stone. He said Anderson was too old and unreliable to be trusted with the job. But well, I saw the diamond sought on Anderson's workbench. The diamond you saw... Must have been a phony. 
A diamond. Still upstairs in the workroom. Still waiting to be cut. I couldn't believe it was a phony. I wouldn't believe it. It had to be the King Midas. Megan was getting more and more suspicious. I had to act fast before he got down to the cellar and noticed the fresh plaster on the wall. I had to make sure about the diamond. I'd gone too far now to back out. I hit Megan on the head with an andiron. He was unconscious. I dragged his body into the closet and locked the door. Upstairs in the workroom, I grabbed up the chisel mallet. No time to think now, no time to be frightened. I had to know if that diamond was the King Midas. I put the edge of the chisel to one of the cleaving grooves and struck with the mallet. It chips like glass. Yeah, it is glass. Megan was right. I... I went through all this for nothing. The whole thing was clear now. Anderson had lied to me. He had lied even to himself. Yeah, that was it. He had been unwilling to admit even to himself that he was no longer good enough to be trusted to cut the King Midas diamond. He was nuts. And he made up that crazy story. And I swallowed it. There was one thing left to do. I had to get away. As far away as possible and as fast as I could. I ran to the stairs. Going somewhere, Smith? Megan. Ice your hands. Get him up higher. Now, come on down here. That's close enough. How'd you get out of the closet? It's no trick at all to force that door when I recovered from the crack on the head you gave me. That sock did something for me, Smith. You know, it gave me a brand new angle on this case. A new angle? Yeah. How's this? You thought Anderson had the King Midas diamond. So you killed him for it and planted that phony suicide note on the bridge. You know, we almost fell for it. No, I... You killed Anderson. I wouldn't be at all surprised if you murdered your wife. <laughs> and all for a phony five and ten cent store diamond. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Harry Smith. What a life. A Smith caught between the hammer and the anvil. You know, he never should have lost his head and murdered his wife. No, because now it looks as though he's going to have to lose the rest of him. <laughs> Yes, right now, Harry is really harried. And when the state executioner gets him, he'll be fit to be tied in a noose. Well, this has all been very exciting, Mr. Host. But now, before we go, suppose we leave our listeners with a very special word. And that word is? A word that's quicker to say than a minute. The word brisk. Because, friends... Brisk signifies the flavor you want in a tea. And brisk stands for Lipton tea. So if you like tea at its most flavorful, delicious best, just remember this. Always ask for Lipton tea. Maybe you meant to get it last week and just forgot. Well, keep that from happening again. Right now, put down Lipton tea on tomorrow's grocery list. <laughs> And now, friends, a few parting words of advice culled from the case history of Harry Smith. Remember, you can't afford to cut up when you cut diamonds. And don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today because someone might do you in tomorrow. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Lying Ladies by Robert Finnegan. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Night 
is my shroud. Where would you least expect to meet the man of your dreams? You know, tall, good-looking, well-groomed. In the movies? Tending the soda fountain? Or right in your own dumb way to... Well, you'll be listening to Inner Sanctum at the same time next week to see how your dream may come true as only dead dreams can. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Mm-hmm. <laughs> To make him say, I'll have another helping of soup, please. Better serve lots more Lipton's noodle soup. And serve it lots more often, friends. It's delicious, chickeny tasting soup. Has that real old-fashioned flavor. And it's full of tempting, tender noodles. You prepare Lipton's noodle soup mix with ease and speed. And it costs less and makes lots more. It's Lipton's noodle soup. So ask for some tomorrow. And next week, tune in for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Welcome once again, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Don't hesitate, come right in. Once you get used to these grim surroundings, you'll never leave. Nobody ever does. Once you're in, you're out. <laughs> this is the kind of place that grips you. Mm -hmm. The kind of place where the bars hold and no holes are barred. So, come right in. Your only ticket of admission is your promise not to tell anybody about anything you may happen to hear tonight. Brett, what a coincidence meeting you here at the post office. Yeah, got to mail a package. Yeah, so do I. Hey, our packages are identical. Yeah, that is a coincidence. Yeah. Same size, same kind of fiberboard boxes. Even the same reinforced wrapping tape. Well, <laughs> I'm mailing something fragile. Oh. You should see the cushioning. Now... That's a coincidence. I'm mailing something fragile, too. Two very rare unicorn lamps. I wrapped each one separately. Hey, it wasn't easy with those horns, let me tell unicorn you. Unicorn lamps? Yeah. <laughs> I'm mailing unicorn lamps no. to a special someone in Cleveland. Cleveland? Now, that's really a coincidence. I thought Katie was going to be the only one in Cleveland with unicorn lamps. Katie? Yeah. Did you say Katie? Yeah. Talk about coincidence. Whatever your package, wherever you mail it, Remember the three C's of good packing. Appropriate container, proper cushioning, secure closure. For more information, contact your military postal service. And now for tonight's tale. Lady with a Plan. Written especially for Inner Sanctum by Michael Sklar and Richard Manoff. And starring Elspeth Eric, it concerns a lady living in strange confinement and her fiendish scheme for escape. Moor Penitentiary is a sprawling mass of gray granite on a deserted landscape. To this grim and forbidding place has come a man with a purpose, to visit with Gladys Cross. He's a newspaper writer, and she is tomorrow's feature story. It's not a pretty story. I'll tell it right from the beginning. I'm no stranger to Moore Prison. I was a bride when I first came here. Wife of the warden. First lady of Moore Prison. <laughs> what a laugh. It was a strictly business proposition. Edward got a wife and I got security. And what I thought was a convenient way of life. 
But after two years of living like a prisoner in a house that was inside the walls of a jail, with a man who was 15 years older than I was, I'd had enough. But Edward had other ideas. <laughs> Divorce. <laughs> you don't mean a word of it, Gladys. Stop telling me what I mean. Will you give me a divorce? When you're feeling less excited, we can discuss this sensibly. No, you can't put it off. I've had all I can take. I don't understand you, Gladys. I've been a model husband. Model husband? You've treated me the way you treat your prisoners. You don't beat them. You grind away at their nerves until their minds are so much mush. I'm getting out before it's too late. You're staying here with me where you belong. If you won't give me a divorce, I'll leave without it. Gladys, don't be a fool. No matter where you go, I'll bring you back. And I don't want to hurt you. You can't threaten me. Not you, my dear. I'm thinking of him. Him? How do you... What are you talking about? <laughs> so there is a man. You're inhuman. No, dear. Just a model husband. Trying to keep his home intact. <laughs> There was another man. Stephen Bromley and I were in love. Drawn together by a hate for more prison. Stephen was the assistant warden. I got word to him that I had to see him. To meet me that night at our secret rendezvous. A deserted side road two miles from the prison. When I got there in my car soon after dark, I didn't have long to wait. Stephen? Yes, Gladys. I came as fast as I could. Here, get in the car so we can talk. Something is wrong. I spoke to Edward this afternoon. He refused the divorce. And he threatened me if I left. He suspects there's someone else. What? He doesn't suspect it's me. You, his assistant, he'd never suspect you. He will eventually. We've got to get away. But Edward threatened me. Edward, Edward. Look ahead, Gladys. You know what'll happen? You've seen it happen to the prisoners. You'll snap. Your nerves will give way. He'll, he'll break you. Then stop it. You know there's no way out. There is. Your game... I know what you're thinking, but that's impossible. We could never get away with it. If we could, would you do it? Tell me how. Bucky Briggs. Briggs, the life. Uh-huh. You have him transferred to work in the laundry. Assigned to handle your stuff when you bring it down. What are you getting at? Bucky hates the warden worse than you do. Given half the chance, he'd strangle him in a second. Now talk to him. Begin to feel sorry for him. Let him think you want to help him make a break. Then what? Then all we've got to do is give him the chance to use his hands on Edward. For two hours we talked. By the time we parted, our plan had been worked out in detail. It was a plan for murder. Murder with clean hands. <laughs> The next morning, I took my soiled linens and drove across the prison yard to the laundry. Bucky Briggs came out to the car. He didn't even look up at me. Where is it? In the back of the car. Here, let me open the door for you. I've heard quite a bit about you, Briggs. You want to take your fresh stuff home? But I don't really believe what they say. Look, lady, the warden needles me enough. I don't have to take it from you, too, see? Well, I don't know what you mean. You I want just... your fresh laundry, don't you? In a minute. I just want you to know that I'm interested in your case, Bucky. So is your husband. Get your laundry now. All right, Bucky. The seed was planted. All it needed was time. I began to plan the visits to the laundry in advance. The remarks I would use stopped intimately and at close quarters out of the earshot of others. And after a month, it came like the fulfillment to a patient prayer. I was at the laundry waiting for Bucky to bring my clean stuff to the car. He came out, stepped into the car, took a quick glance around, and suddenly slipped close to me. It's up to you, baby. Get me out of here, and then it'll be you and me all the way. The deal? I've got it all figured out, Bucky. You don't waste time, beautiful. Give me the dope. Tomorrow, when I come back. Be ready. Check. I'll get way to some friends to pick me up on the outside. Just one more thing. My husband. It'll be a pleasure, baby. I made a final check with Stephen and then everything was set. 
I was sitting in the car the next day when Bucky came out. I reached over the front seat and opened the rear door for him. Get in, Bucky. And stay down. Spot me. It's been fixed. The guard's busy on the other side. Where are we going? To the house. What about the warden? He's in town today. Stop asking so many questions. Okay, baby. This is your show. Just make it good. This is the back of the house. Not a soul in sight. Now follow me out, hurry. That's the cellar door. Open it, Bucky. Right. Now, down the steps. Now what? The coal bin. Hide in there. You may have a long wait. I got patience, baby. I've been waiting two years for this. When it's clear, I'll call you. Three bangs on the steam pipe. I get you. That's when I take over. Our room is directly overhead on the second floor. Check. All right, Bucky. Get in the bin. Hold on, baby. It's no way to say goodbye. What? I like them personal. Like this. No, not now, Bucky. Not... Well, that's more like it. Something to remember you by. Edward returned an hour later. I was puttering around the dinner table too jittery to sit and wait for the commotion to break. And then, quicker than I expected, it happened. Siren, that must be the break. I know they can't get away with a break here. Hello. What the devil's happened? Briggs, form a searching party and wait for me. I'm coming over. Briggs is broken out. Any thought of how he did it? Nobody won't get far. I'll find him. And when I do... I'll break him for good. That a boy, Warden. You show him. But instead of listening to that alarm, you should have paid more attention to that wife of yours. Because that siren is cooking up something that will be a real scream. <laughs> Somebody, please, help me. Most of us wouldn't think twice about answering a plea like that. We'd help save a life in an emergency, even if it were a total stranger. I'm hit. Somebody get me a medic. And if we can't depend on our buddies in time of need, who can we count on? But how do you help out when you don't know that there's an emergency? How can you meet a need you don't know about? One sure way is by giving blood to the Armed Services Blood Program, where your blood can help save someone's life. That's because the Armed Services Blood Program is the primary source of blood for military hospitals. And they need regular donations from us and our families. So contact your blood bank or the lab at your medical treatment facility. Be a lifesaver through the Armed Services Blood Program. And remember, their supply is our supply. The Roberts. They gave us a toaster. Joanne and Ed. Toaster. Mrs. Perez. Toaster. When you're looking for the perfect gift for any occasion, don't forget about U.S. savings bonds. A bond is the gift that keeps giving because it pays competitive rates when held for at least five years and will continue to earn interest for up to 30 years. Bill and Martha. <laughs> toaster. Oh, your Aunt Libby. A hot toaster oven. Ooh, the Phillips. Toaster. U.S. savings bonds because unlike many gifts, you can never have too many bonds. Contact your finance office for more information. And now, back to Our Lady with a plan. <laughs> and what a plan. Her husband, Warden Cross of Moore Penitentiary, is searching for Bucky Briggs, an escaped convict. But Gladys has hidden Bucky in the cellar of the house. He's waiting there now to kill the warden. And Gladys, she's waiting too. For murder. I went up to bed after Edward left. And lay there tense. The sirens had stopped. For hours there was dead quiet everywhere. And close to midnight I heard the door open downstairs. 
was Edward. I could tell from his footsteps that he was tired. He was heated. I lay perfectly still, waiting for him to come in. Paris. Yes? Get up. Yes? Right away. Incredible. Right away. No one knows how. I didn't answer. He was a different person. Hurried. Shaken. I watched him as he undressed. He looked suddenly older than ever. And I felt a sickening revulsion at the dejected spectacle he had become. I lay perfectly still as he slipped into bed. He fell off to sleep. He was fast asleep now. I reached down over the side of the bed for my shoe and softly tapped its heel against the steam pipe. Edward was still asleep. I lay back and waited. Slowly. Slowly. And Bucky's silhouette stood outlined in the half light from the hall. He moved quietly into the room right past me. In a moment, his big, hulking figure, looking more gorilla-like than ever, stood towering over Edward's bed. I saw his hands reach out cautiously for Edward, but just a moment too late. Get away from me. This is the payoff, Warden. Oh, Edward was awake. And like a flash, he kicked it out of Bucky's reach. I sat there paralyzed as he broke. I should have Desperately, Edward tried to tear Bucky's hands from the approach. But Bucky held on, tighter and tighter, and digging his fingers deeper into the soft fleshiness of Edward's throat. That is not what I would say. I didn't move. I didn't speak. And he understood. Gladys, you never get away with this. Shut him up, Bucky. Easy, baby, easy. Another squeeze of his throat. Uh, just like you wanted him. I want to see for myself. You don't have to. When I twist her neck, stays twisted. Dead. He's dead. Now get me out of here. There's a rope and a scaling hook behind the cellar door. Check. Stick close to the house until you reach the hedge. Then out across the south wall gate. Check. All right, now go. Did you forget something? What? Come here. Oh, please, that Bucky, please. Now, you gotta do this more often. I'm getting to like it. Please go. Okay. Just one thing. Remember, give me two hours before you turn in the alarm. I'll be waiting for you out there. Goodbye, baby. <laughs> As soon as he was gone, I glanced at my watch and followed the second hand around twice. Now I was ready. You know, you know, who is this? It's Mrs. Cross. Bucky Briggs was hiding in our cellar all the time. He's killed my husband. Huh? Do something before it's too late. Which way'd you go? Toward the south wall. Nice. I put the phone down. My part was over. The rest was up to Stephen in the main tower. I waited five seconds, ten seconds, twenty seconds. Then all of a sudden it came like a million shrieking demons. From the window I saw the long fingers of the searchlights pointed at the south wall. And pinned beneath the glaring lights was Bucky, frantically pulling his way up the rope. Watched as the bullets hit all around him, kicking puffs of powder off the stone wall. One of them had to find his mark. Oh. But he shut it, then caught himself. He was hit, he had to fall, but he didn't. Hand over hand, he started up again, higher and higher. Oh. He was hit again, but he didn't stop. And then before I could realize what had happened, 
He was over the top and gone. Hello? Mrs. Crash? You found him on the outside? No. I had to trace him. Okay, got away. But how? He was hit twice. That's right. The car must have picked him up. If we'll get him, unless those bullets kill him first. He's got to die. He can't live. He mustn't live. Oh, do worry, Mrs. Cross. We'll find him. Dead or alive. I hung up. Days. Now Bucky was out there, waiting for me. A light. A machine gun. He knew now that I'd double-crossed him. And he was waiting out there to kill me. The next week was a nightmare. Edward's funeral, the messages of condolence. No chance to see Stephen alone. And then one night a week later, he came to me. Nervous, worried. You messed it up, Gladys. No trace of Briggs, which means he's alive and out there. That's not so safe for you. But we're safe here. Of course, Gladys. We just happen to be leaving here. Oh, no, Stephen, I'm not going. That's impossible. The new warden's arriving next Tuesday morning. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Gladys, even if you could stay on, I'd argue against it. But what about Briggs? It's a big world out there, remember? We'll get lost in it, you and I. So lost that no one will ever find us. Not even Briggs. Say you'll go. I have no choice, I suppose. Good girl. Now, listen, I've got it all figured out. My resignation is in, takes effect next Tuesday night. Tuesday morning, you take the train to New York and head straight for the Hotel Empress. Don't budge out of your room. I'll be along in the evening, okay? You're not listening. I was thinking of something. What? Something Edward said when he died. Hmm? You'll never get away with this. Tuesday morning, I was on the train for New York. It was a short, pleasant trip. And my fears began to disappear. Once I reached the crowds of Grand Central Station, I knew I'd be safe. I threaded my way through the crowd. Just one of thousands of people. And suddenly, there was a hand on my shoulder. Hello, baby. Bucky. What are you being, doing here? How did you find me? I've been waiting for you, baby. Like I said. I got friends back there. The grapevine tipped me off when you was leaving, and here I am. But, but, but I... The bullets? <laughs> Just like nothing. Takes a lot to stop me. Come on, let's get out of here before some bulls bust me. No, wait, Bucky. Just, just give me a minute. I've got to call my hotel to, to hold my room for me. You can't wait. Well, if I don't call, they'll cancel it. Okay, but only a minute. Make your call over there so I can keep my eye on you, sweetheart. I don't want to lose you. Bucky had nodded toward a drugstore. It was a slim chance, but it was better than I'd expected. I entered the store, made a quick dash for the other door. I flung it open and raced madly toward the taxi stand. Over my shoulder, I caught a glimpse of Bucky. He'd seen me. Hey, wait a minute. I ran to the cab and jumped in. Hotel Empress in a hurry and lose that cab behind us. Okay, lady, this is the Empress. We shook that other camp. I headed toward the entrance. Just as I entered, I caught a quick glimpse of a cab pulling up to the curb that I couldn't stop to see. I rushed into the hotel, up to my room, and locked myself in. Before I even had time to think, the phone rang. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Cross. I just sent a gentleman up to see you. I banged the receiver down. So it was Bucky in that cab. I had to get out. There was only one elevator, and I couldn't try the stairs because I didn't know which Bucky would use. I had only one way out, the desperate way, and I decided to take it. I unlocked the door. I turned off the light, and I took a pair of scissors from my handbag and waited behind the door. I wasn't a moment too soon. Come in. I pressed against the wall behind the door and watched it open slowly. Then, leaping forward, I plunged the scissors into his back. Gladys, it's me, Stephen. Stephen! 
You said you were coming at night. I... What? I left earlier to surprise you. Why didn't you phone? I did. You haven't arrived yet. Uh, oh, Stephen. Uh, Hello, baby. Bucky! Surprised to see me, huh? Hey, who's that? Steve Bromley. <whistles> you done him in. Nice work, baby, but why the chase? I, I, I had to run. I... I understand. The screw was following you. Thought you'd lead him to me. Yes. Yes. Sure, well, you did right, baby, but... Well, let's get out of here. No! You got no choice. Come let on. Let go of me! Shut up. You'll have a whole hotel and I... Let go of me! Come on, baby. You're on break. Get you're... away from me! Come on. What's going on in here? The house take holding. I'm Captain. getting out of here. There we are, both of you. Look for that guy on the floor. You ain't going anywhere for a long time. Let's see you. Here. Preach, chum. This ain't no toy. Neither is... Ah! Oh, my hand. Now, let's get going. There isn't much more to tell. You were at the trial, you know the rest. I'm back at Moore Prison for good. As a real prisoner this time. Bucky, he's got a few hours before they take him to the chair. Mrs. Cross? What is it? Bucky Briggs is just outside the cell. You have to go in 15 minutes. He wants to talk to you before he goes. To me? Yes. All right. Doesn't matter anymore. Thanks. It's okay. Five minutes, Bucky. And we're just outside. Hello, baby. I don't have anything to say to you. Yeah, but I got something I want to ask you before I go. It's bothered me ever since I was nabbed. All right, ask. Why didn't you leave when I asked you to back in that hotel room? Why? <laughs> As if you didn't know. No, what? If I went with you, I knew it was the end for me. What are you talking about? You wanted to kill me. Me kill you? What you figured out? Oh, stop acting, Bucky. It doesn't make any difference now. All right, so I double-crossed you the night you escaped. I called the tower exactly two minutes after you left. What? So that's how they picked me up so fast. I thought you knew. What a sap bite. And what a sap bite. Bucky! You dirty double crosser. Bucky, keep away! Help! Double crosser. Oh, throat! Get double your crosser. Head. Get your Brown hand. Break your neck. Break the rope, Or I'll shoot. You're too late, screw. She's dead. I broke her neck. It don't make no difference now. Can't kill me twice. Now there's a nice, gentle character, that Bucky. Just a little too restless with his hand. So here and now, I'm starting a new movement for Inner Sanctum Mysteries. From now on, our slogan should be, when you grab a throat, stop and think, then stroke. Don't choke. <laughs> Before we say goodnight, friends, here's an epitaph for the tombstone of Gladys Cross. Here lies a good heart rent asunder by a man with a soul full of thunder. Her sweetheart named Stephen tried to help her get even. Now they all live in peace six feet under. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is I Hate Blonde. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm. <laughs> Try Lipton's Noodle Soup. 
and tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host opening the squeaking door for another session of the AGGMS. The Association of Ghouls, Ghosts, and Midnight Spirits. Oh, may I see your membership card as you enter, please? But, uh, oh, no, no, it's not a printed card. All you have to do is show me your wrist. If there's any blood pulsing in your arteries, then you don't belong here tonight. Better come back and try some other time. After you've passed your mortuary test. <laughs> Well, Mr. Host, I'm afraid I don't qualify as a member of your AGGMS, Association of Ghouls, or whatever it is. But I am a charter member of the ILLB Society. The ILLB? What's that, Mary? It's a new one on me. Why, those initials stand for I Like Lipton's Best. To join this club, all you have to do is see that the tea in your teapot is always Lipton's. The club password isn't a word at all. It's that familiar sound of appreciation. Mmm. -mm. For really, Lipton tea is delicious, as zestful and spirited as can be. And the reason? Very simple. It's Lipton's brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea. That brisk flavor has made a lot of friends, for more folks buy and enjoy Lipton's than any other tea in the world. So, try a cup of Lipton tea yourself. I know you'll say, as so many others do, I like Lipton's best. And now for tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery. It's an original radio play by Emil Tepperman, called Make Ready My Grave, and stars two radio favorites. John Banks and Richard Widmar. It's about a boy and a girl who've just been married. A piece of colored string, an open grave, and a hangman's noose. That train is the Southeast Limited. See it? Long, sleek, and powerful. Clicking off the miles and the humming rails. A masterpiece of 20th century mechanical perfection. Nothing about it to suggest lurking hate or fear or superstition or death. But let's take a look into compartment A, car 17. John and Betty Loomis, just married, are going for their honeymoon to John's ancestral estate. John. John, I'm so happy. <laughs> How soon do we get to Louisville? In about an hour, Betty. Just think, I married into one of the oldest families in the state. I hope you'll be very happy, darling. Oh, I will, I will. You do love me, don't you, John? Of course I do, baby. I'll always love you. Always. No matter what happens. <laughs> what do you mean, no matter what happens? What could happen? John, something's bothering you. No, no, it's nothing at all. You're hiding something. There's something you haven't told me. It's nothing, Betty. It's nothing to worry about. You don't want to tell me? No, not now. Maybe later. Why are you playing with that piece of yellow string? What? You've been playing with it ever since we came onto the train. Hmm. <laughs> Gosh, I... I never noticed. I watched you. You've been tying a knot in it. A knot? Good Lord. I must have tied it without 
knowing what I was doing. You... You've tied it into a noose. A hangman's noose. I, I don't know how I came to make it or where I picked it up. Well, it, it's only a piece of string. Yes, it's only a piece of string. Betty. What is it, John? Here, take this. A gun? Take it. But why? If, if I should ever try to... If I should ever try to strangle you... John. Please listen to me. If I should ever try to strangle you, promise me to use that gun on me. What are you talking about? Bloomersville, next stop. No, this... Next stop, Bloomersville. This is where we get... John, what's this all about? That piece of yellow string and, and now this gun? Put it away, Betty, and remember what I said. Don't ever forget it. Dark here. This is just a way station. The train only stops here to let us off. Otherwise, it goes right through. Oh? I thought Loomisville was a big town. Well, it used to be a hundred years ago, but now there's only the Loomis estate. Well, are we far from the estate? About two miles. Old Herman Galt should be here to pick us up in the station wagon. Herman Galt? Mm -hmm. He's the handyman. There's been a Galt working for the Loomis family for the last hundred and fifty years. John, I don't like it here. Dark and that wind. Oh, the devil can Galt be? I wrote them what train we were taking. I'm ready, what? Mr. John. Oh, Galt, you frightened my wife. I'm sorry, ma'am, if I scared you. Oh, that, that's all right. It, it was just the way you spoke so suddenly out of the darkness. If you'll follow me, I've got the station wagon back here. John, he doesn't like me. Oh, no, that's just his way. He's very devoted to the family. Where do you get to know him? I don't think I care to. Johnny, he's driving too fast. It's so dark. Don't worry, Betty. Galt knows this road like the back of his hand. We'll be there in a few minutes. I'm frightened. Darling, please, tell me why you gave me the gun. No, I, I can't tell you now, Betty. Maybe after you meet Uncle Everard. John. What? What's that in your hand? What? Oh. Another piece of string. A red one this time. Oh, I, I, I must have picked it up in here, off the seat. You've knotted it into another hangman's noose. Golf. Oh. Yes, Mr. John. This piece of red string, did you put it here? No, sir. Then how did it get here? You ought to know. Yes. Yes, I, I ought to know. Uh, God, why are you stopping here? We're home, ma'am. This is the entrance to the Loomis estate. I've got to get out and open the gate. I'll be right back. Betty, I've, I've got to get out, too. I've got to see for myself. See what, John? You stay here, Betty. Oh, but, uh, stay right where you are. Wait a minute. I'm coming, back, too. Betty. Get back in the car. Mr. John is right, ma'am. You shouldn't go with him. Take care of her, Galt. I won't be long. Galt, where's he going? That is the Loomis family cemetery. Cemetery? What does he want to see in there in the middle of the night? He'll tell you himself, ma'am. In due time. No, I'm going to find out right now. Better not, ma'am. Better come John! Back. John, wait for me. Betty, I told you to stay I'm in the going car. with you. I want to know what there is in that cemetery. Get back in that car. I'm your wife now. I have a right to know what this is all about. I'm going with you. All right, if that's the way you feel about it. But hold on to that gun I gave you. Keep it in your hand all the time. John, why? You'll find why? out soon enough. This is the gate of the family cemetery. All the Loomises and their wives are buried here. But it's so shadowy. White tombstones look like ghosts. Hold my hand, John. No. Just hold on to that gun. John, whose grave is this with the high tombstone? My great-grandfather's. Stuart Loomis. He founded the Loomis estate. This is my grandfather's grave. His wife. Here's my father. My mother. And... And that's all. That 
Should be all. What do you mean? Come over here. This is what I came to see. This is what I've been afraid of. John. John, it, it's an open grave. Freshly dug. Yes, Betty. It was just dug tonight. But who is it for? Betty, darling. I, uh, I'm afraid it's for you. What's poor Betty letting herself in for? With a fresh grave waiting for her on her honeymoon. And a husband who ties little strings into hangman's nooses. But you know, come to think of it, Betty's a lucky girl at that. How many girls who get married nowadays can count on finding a nice snug place all ready for them to lie down in and rest? In peace. <laughs> Gracious, Mr. Host, Betty doesn't seem like a lucky bride to me. Why, most brides have things much easier. Because there's so many things today to help them make their marriage a success. For example? For example, Lipton tea. With Lipton tea on the pantry shelf, a young bride today has a much better chance of making her home a happy one. Just the other day, I was talking to a friend who just got married. As we sat there in her kitchen, sipping our Lipton tea, me occupying the only chair, and she perched on the kitchen stool, she said... You know, Mary, it was silly of me to worry about being able to cook the things Jack liked. It's not nearly as difficult as I imagined. Take this Lipton tea here. It answers the whole beverage problem as far as Jack is concerned. He's happy as long as he has Lipton's morning, noon, and night. <laughs> well, I told her I could understand that. Because most husbands I know about are partial to Lipton tea. And it's because of the extra satisfaction that's in Lipton's wonderful, brisk flavor. Satisfaction, did I say? Mmm, you just try Lipton tea and see if that isn't an understatement. Try Lipton's tomorrow. And now let's hurry back to our date in a graveyard. Remember? With poor Betty, whose husband has just told her he's afraid the freshly dug grave is for her. John, what do you mean? Who dug this grave for me? Who? <laughs> if I told you, you'd think I was crazy. No, you've got to tell me. If I'm in danger, I have a right to know. Was it God? Your Uncle Everard? No. Well, at least I don't think so. His wife, Christine. Betty. Do you believe that a... Ghost could dig a grave? Ghost? Do you mean I, I'm in danger from a ghost? Oh, I told you you'd think I was crazy. John, what? Why are you looking at me like that? I don't know. Betty, have you got that gun with you? No, I, I left it in the car. What good would a gun be against... A ghost. There's a station wagon still waiting at the gate, but I don't see Galt. Maybe he went up to the house. Galt, where are you? Hello there, John. What? What's up? Uncle Everard. What happened to Galt? He came up to the house. Said you'd gone into the cemetery. So I thought I'd better come down. Oh. Is... Is it there? Yes, it's there. A freshly dug grave. Yeah. Uncle Everard, this is my wife, Betty. Who are you, Betty? Hello. You saw the grave too, Betty? Yes, and, and John says he thinks it's for me. I, I'm afraid I don't understand all You this. haven't told her anything yet, John? Well, just, just a, a little. I, I couldn't bring myself to. I think it's time you did. <laughs> Tea, Betty? Thank you, Uncle Everard. I will have a little more. You, John? No, thanks. Too bad Christina's ill. She's upstairs in our room. But I hope she'll be better by tomorrow. 
You can see it in. Maybe. What do you mean? That grave out there. Maybe it'll be filled tomorrow. John, don't you think it's time you kept your promise to tell me what this is all about? You tell her, Uncle Everett. Well, Betty, there's a ghost in the Loomis family. That's it in a nutshell. Oh, I see. And it was a ghost who dug that grave. Hmm? I know it sounds mad. But after 150 years, we Loomises have come to the conviction that it can't be anything but a ghost. 150 years? You mean... John's great-grandfather, Stuart Loomis, settled this strip of seacoast under a patent from the colonial governor. There's his picture over the fireplace. Wait. He doesn't look much like you, John. Stuart Loomis was a hard man. There was a French privateer in these waters who made a lot of trouble in those days. Gaston Leroux, who sailed the seas with his wife, Antoinette. But what has a French pirate and his wife to do with that grave? Stuart Loomis captured Leroux and his wife, and under the authority conferred upon him by the governor, had the power to hang them. You mean the woman, too? Yes. He hanged them both on a gibbet where our family cemetery now stands. Oh, how terrible. Before he died, Gaston Leroux laid a curse on the Loomis family. He swore that just as his wife was hanged, so would all the Loomis women die. He swore that he would come back and dig a grave for the wife of a Loomis in every generation and furnish the noose by which a Loomis would strangle his own wife. But, but that's incredible. Short while afterward, a fresh grave was found beside the gibbet where LaRue had been hung. That night, Stuart Loomis's wife, John's great-grandmother, was found hanging by the neck from the eaves of this very house. And Stuart Loomis? I told you Stuart Loomis was a hard man and had made many enemies. There were many who hated him deeply and bitterly. He was arrested and tried for the murder of his wife. Convicted and executed. Now you know the secret of the Loomis family. But, John, that, that still doesn't prove there's a ghost. No, that one incident doesn't prove it. But it happened again when the next Loomis married. John's grandfather. And to the next Loomis, John's father. Sometimes a year after he married, sometimes five years. But the curse never fails. It's happened in every generation? Yes. And now, John Loomis has brought a new wife home. There's a freshly dug grave waiting in the family cemetery. And, and I'm next. Hmm? I don't know, Betty. Maybe that grave isn't for you. What? Maybe it's for Christine. For my wife. This, this is all ridiculous. A ghost couldn't dig a grave, make John strangle me to death. Uncle Everard, you, you can't believe such a legend. It can't be true. Maybe not, my dear. But the graves of the strangled Loomis women are out there to prove it. Well, this is your room, Betty. I'll have God call you at eight tomorrow morning. Good night. Good night, Uncle Everett. Good night, John. Good night, Uncle Everett. This is such a big room. It's so gloomy. The whole house is like this. It lies gloomy and sullen under the Loomis curse. Oh, Betty, I love you so much. We'll beat the curse together. Let me go, darling. I want to change my clothes and wash. All right. There's the bathroom over there. I'll only be a minute. All right, darling. Oh, it's a lovely bath. <gasps> Betty, what is... John, quick. What? Look. Hanging from the shower bar. What? A hangman's noose. 
It's a real one this time. Of rope. Ready to hang someone. Who put it there? It's the Loomis curse. We can't get away from it. No ghost could have hung that rope there. Let, let, let's call Uncle Everett. All right. Have you got the gun with you? No, it's in my handbag. Well, get it. But John... Get it, I say. All right, John. Here. Here, I've got it. All right, now keep it with you all the time. And don't be afraid to use it on me if necessary. All right, let's get your uncle. This is his room. I wonder if I ought to wake him. It might upset Aunt Christine. She's sick. We've got to wake him. Better knock harder. Well, it wasn't locked. Call him. Uncle Everard. Uncle Everard? He doesn't answer. But there's a light in the room. Push the door further open. All right. Well, there's nobody in the room. The bed's empty. Uncle Everard? Aunt Christine? Maybe in the bathroom. The door is open. Oh, Betty! John, what, what, what? Aunt Christine. She's hanging by the neck. She, she's dead. The same kind of a noose is in our bathroom. Uncle Everard Hanger, it's the Loomis curse catching up with us. No well, Galt, any trace of Uncle Everard? I searched the whole house, basement to attic, not a sign of him. He must have gone out, come along. But it's raining. We've got to find him, Betty, come on. dark out here. How will we ever find you? I have a flashlight, ma'am. You look. What? Fresh footprints in the slush. Oh, they must be Uncle Everard's. They lead down toward the cemetery. Come along, go. Here, Mr. John, you can see for yourself the footprints lead right to this new grave. But why did he come here? There's the answer, Daddy. A cross at the head of the empty grave. Throw your flashlight on it, go. There's something written on it. It says, Christine Luke. <gasps> Betty, what is it? Look. Over there. Another grave. He's dug another one. There's a cross on this one, too. Does it say anything? Yes. Yes, it does. It says, Betty Loomis. <laughs> John, sit close to me. That portrait of Stuart Loomis over the fireplace looks so real. It frightens me. Now, remember, Betty, whatever happens, hold on to that gun. And don't be afraid to use it tonight. Where is Gold? He ought to be here soon. He went to look for some weapons. Here I am, <gasps> what, John. Gold, you always frighten me coming in so quietly. I'm sorry, ma'am. Here, Mr. John. These ought to be pretty good weapons. Size? Yes, I had them sharpened only the other day. They could slice a man's head off in one stroke. Take one, Mr. John. Thanks. But I'd hate to use it on Uncle Everard. If he shows up tonight, you'd better use it. Maybe he's come back into the house through the back way. I'll go through the house again if you'd like. This time I'll start with the attic. Be careful, Gulp. I will, Mr. John. John, I don't like him. Gulp? And I don't think he likes me either. Oh, is that true? Darling, what's that? Must be God in the attic. Help, Mr. John! Help! You must have met Uncle Everard hiding up there. Stay right here, Betty, and hold on to that gun. John, be careful. Don't worry, just take care John, of yourself. John, come back. I'm frightened. I'm afraid to be alone. There's, there's nothing to be afraid of. I have this gun. And if anybody comes... I... The lights... Lights went out. Who, who's there? Who's in this room? Don't come any closer. I have a gun and I'll shoot. I can't see you, but I'll shoot at the sound. John, help! Rope. Around my neck. 
bullets off our shoes. <laughs> it's not loaded. I took the bullets out when you left it in the car. Galt. Yes, ma'am, it's Galt. Mr. John is busy up there in the attic with the body of Mr. Everard. I killed him, too. And when Mr. John comes downstairs, he'll find you. And I'll cut him down in the dark with my scythe. Why? Why? There were others besides the pirate LaRue who hated Stuart Loomis. Like my own great-grandfather, he was in the service of Stuart Loomis, and he hated him. When LaRue laid the curse on the Loomises, my great-grandfather decided to make it come true. It was he who strangled the wife of Stuart Loomis. And through the years, the gods from father to son have handed down their hate. You... You're mad. Maybe. I'll tighten the noose and finish Benny, you. where are you? Why is it dark in here? John! Benny! Benny. John, look out. It's all he has his eye. And so with I. John! John! Oh! Oh! Darling, where are you? Here, John, here. Oh, darling. We finished forever with the Loomis curse. Well, that was a pretty rough honeymoon for Betty. But, you know, there's a lesson in her story for forgetful wives. Yes, if you keep tying little colored strings to your fingers to remind you of things and you still can't remember them, why not try a rope neatly tied around your neck? It's sure to help you forget. (laughs) Oh, dear, Mr. Host, there you go telling our listeners how to forget things when I've got something for them to remember. Oh, I didn't realize that, Mary. What is it you want them to remember? It's Lipton tea, folks. And you don't need any string tied on your finger or any such reminder. To make sure you get it when you visit your grocers tomorrow, just remember that Lipton's is the tea with the wonderful brisk flavor. The fine quality tea that gives you all the goodness nature meant tea to have. I wish you'd try a cup of Lipton's soon, because it's so delicious. Just ask your grocer for Lipton's. Remember, Lipton's is the tea with brisk flavor. Ah. And so our evening's over. With the usual quota of corpses to qualify for the ghoul school. We're working on a special matriculation for bachelor ghouls. Oh, uh, in uh, case you didn't know, a bachelor ghoul is one who believes that two can die as cheaply as one. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is I Hate Blondes by Wolf Kaufman. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups We'll bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Dead Man's Turn. It's a a little night course in murder, that's all. As you have your choice of majoring in choking, shooting, drowning. But uh, why don't you just listen in to Inner Sanctum next week and you'll get all the inside told. Oh, yes, next week part of the country goes on daylight saving time. If your area remains on standard time, tune in to Inner Sanctum one hour earlier. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Want a delicious dinner treat in a hurry? Then Lipton's noodle soup mix is the thing for you. In just a few quick minutes, you have a grand-tasting chickeny soup ready to serve. Lipton's noodle soup is full of tender golden noodles and seasoned to perfection. And it's economical, too. Costs less and makes lots more than ordinary canned soups. Just ask your grocer for Lipton's noodle soup mix. Your family will love it. And don't forget to tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you once again to the Inner Sanctum. Do come in and join our circle, but watch out you don't get Double cross. <laughs> What's that? Oh, you're disturbed by those bodies dangling from the ceiling. Well, you know some people, they just die to come here. Then they hang around week after week and never say a word. <laughs> well, I have a theory about that, Mr. Host. Yeah, What's that, Mary? Maybe the reason they're hanging around is because they think we're going to serve refreshments later on. Sure, that could be, all right. You know, lots of folks are like that. And who can blame them? When there's good food ahead, they just won't leave. And that's especially true if there's a chance that Lipton tea is on the menu. Now, the reason for that is simply this. Lipton tea is tea at its delicious best. Because Lipton's has such grand, brisk flavor. In fact, brisk is the very word the tea experts themselves use to describe Lipton's full, hearty taste. You'll agree, I'm sure, the very first time you try it. For Lipton's is so lively and full-bodied and satisfying. Yes, it's that brisk flavor that makes more people buy and enjoy Lipton's than any other brand of tea in the world. So whenever you ask for tea, make sure you ask for Lipton tea. And now, friends, draw close your chairs. If there are no faint hearts among us, we'll begin tonight's tale of terror. A story written especially for Inner Sanctum by Michael Sklar. Our star tonight is Santa Sotega, who plays the role of Elwood Fitch in You Could Die Laughing. We wanted to escape our problem, to forget about it, so we went to the movies. But there was a doctor in the story, and every time he appeared on the screen, I remembered. Halfway through the picture, I, I couldn't sit there anymore. I nudged Catherine, and we got up and walked out. The street was cold and dark and empty. Elwood, what do you want to do now? I just want to go back home. All right, dear. Get in the car. Elwood, I... I want to talk to you. All right, there's time for that. Please, dear, let's stop being silly about this thing. Let's face it. I am facing it. But you're not. Don't argue with me. For heaven's sake, don't you understand? The doctor said you only got a year to live unless we moved to Arizona. Doctors are human. They can make mistakes. Not three, doctor. I don't care. Why are you so stubborn? Why are you so dead set against Arizona? You ought to know why, Catherine. Me? Yes, you. Because of me? Yes. I haven't given you much, Catherine, not even children. But I've been able to make a living. We've been able to get along. What would I do in Arizona without a job and without money? Elwood, slow down. I can still drive a car, Catherine. You're speaking. Let me alone. Passing through a red light. Elwood! That man crossing the street! Look out! You hit I... Catherine. Did I... Yes. He's lying on the ground. Good Lord. He walked in front of the car. Well, we, we, we've got to help him. Is... Is he... He's dead. Oh, hell! I didn't mean to do it. I couldn't help it. It happened so fast. Better call the police. Police? Well, you said he's dead. The police. Catherine, there's no one but us on the street. Nobody else saw it happen. Well, what difference does that make? Get back in the car. Edward, are you suggesting I was that... speeding. I passed a red light. And now this. They'll arrest me. They'll put me on trial for manslaughter. But my... He's dead, isn't he? We can't help him. It won't do him any good if I go to jail. But 
running away, leaving the body. Catherine, we've got enough troubles without this. We're going to get into the car and drive straight to the garage. I've got a year to live, and I'm not going to spend it in prison. Good evening, Mr. Fitch. Want me to put the car away for you? Yes. Show must have let out early, huh? We we didn't stay to the end, Dan. I didn't care for the picture. Ah, them pictures. I always tell my wife. Say, what did you hit? Hit? Yeah, your front bumper. Blood on it. Oh. Oh. That, that blood. A, a dog ran in front of the car. Uh, do me a favor, Dan. Wash it off before you put the car away. Sure thing, Mr. Fetch. <laughs> I didn't sleep well that night. Bad dreams, all mixed up. About doctors. They all looked like the man lying on the street. And their faces were covered with blood. I woke up... exhausted. Breakfast is on the table, Elwood. Uh, Just a moment. That newspaper can wait. Your toast is getting cold. Oh. Here it is. What are you looking for? The story. You mean last night? It's in the newspaper? Listen to this. Stenger, victim of hit-and-run driver. The body of Augie Stenger, underworld character, was discovered early this morning at the intersection of Broad and Main Streets. Police believe Stenger was the victim of a hit-and-run driver. <gasps> the, the front door? Yes. Do you, do you think it's the it's police? I don't know. Get a grip on yourself. I'll see who it is. Morning. You, Mr. Fitch? Uh, yes. What can I do for you? I don't like to talk business on the front doorstep. Business? It's about last night, that accident. <laughs> what accident? Don't try to act innocent. I saw that hit and run. Now can I come <gasps> Let me handle this, Andra. Who are you? My name is Chandler. I was sitting in my car last night at Broad and Main Street. I saw the accident and I followed you home. Thought I ought to talk to you about it this morning. What do you want? The cops are looking for that hit-and-run driver. I'm the only guy that knows you're him. It ought to be worth something for me to keep my mouth shut. You want money? Yeah. Blackmail. Don't talk to him, Edward. Send him away. No, we can't do that, Catherine. He'd go to the police. But Elwood... Leave this to me. All right, Chandler. I'll give you the money. How much? Five hundred dollars. That's chicken feed. A thousand. Ah, now you're talking sense. When do I get it? I'll give it to you now. It's in my coat pocket. Here. Here it is. You'll find exactly one thousand dollars in twenty dollar bills. Thanks. Now, get out of here. Now, wait a minute. Don't get nasty, Fitch. I'm doing you a favor. You got your money. Now get out. I'm going. But I'll be back. I call this the first installment. Elwood, where did you get that money you gave him? Money? Last night you said we couldn't go to Arizona because we had no money. You you just gave that man a thousand dollars. Where'd you get it? I was ashamed to tell you. I took it from Stenger. Stenger? The man we hit. I put my hand inside his coat to see if his heart was beating. The money was in the inside pocket. Edward, how could you? Don't look at me like that, Catherine. We've been married a long time. Long enough for you to know that I'm not a crook or a murderer. But to kill a man and then take his money. Try to understand. All day long I've been thinking. A year to live... A year to live. When you know you're going to die, it does something to you. You forget what's right and what's wrong. I thought with that thousand dollars and a few hundred we've got in the bank, I thought we might be able to go to Arizona after all. Well, the money is gone. Yes. Don't think about it anymore. How can I stop thinking? You heard what Chandler said. That thousand dollars is the first installment. He'll blackmail us out of everything we own. Chandler. 
Shut the door, quick. Who is it, Catherine? Shut that door, Mrs. Fitch. You were here only yesterday. What do you want now? The cops are after me. You and me are on the same boat. What have you done? What do they want you for? Murder. Murder? Murder? You shouldn't have come here. I figured this place ought to make a pretty good hideout. No. You can't stay here. Who's going to stop me? I won't allow it, Elwood. I won't have this man in my house. All right, cut the squad. No. I stood a lot in you, Chandler, but... Stay away from me. Don't you dare touch him. Elwood! Oh. Elwood! Oh. No, don't. Don't, don't cry, Kathy. I'm all right. Any more back talk, Fitch? No. Okay. I'm moving in. He took over the house. He used Catherine and me as servants. Treated us like dirt. There was nothing we could do about it. Just the three of us. Cooped up in that little house. We couldn't go out. Food and cigarettes were sent up from the store. Went on like that until Tuesday morning. Hush, Elwood. Chandler will hear you. He can't. He's in the bedroom. You're... You're going to give yourself up? I can't stand this anymore. I can't stand... Well, do what you think is best, darling. I've made up my mind. Rather than put up with that man, I'd prefer to go to prison. I'll call the police right now. Hello, operator. Get me police headquarters. Got a pal at headquarters, Fitch. Hey, Chandler. I don't... Don't point that gun at me. Cancel that call. Oh, oh, all right. Hello, operator. Operator. Never mind that call to police headquarters. No, 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 nothing's wrong. I, I just made a mistake. Thank you. You made your last mistake, Fitch. <laughs> Imagine that black villain, Jack Chandler. First he blackmails Elwood, then he blackjacks him, and now he blackballs him from using his own telephone. You know what I'd do if I were Elwood? I'd apply for a writ of habeas corpus. That is, if Chandler doesn't turn Elwood into a corpus first. <laughs> Things do look bad for Elwood, I must admit, Mr. Host. My, what a lot of unpleasant surprises he's been having. Yes, and he's in for a lot more, Mary. Goodness. Well, right now, I'd much rather talk about pleasant surprises. Well, that's a lady's privilege, Mary. You go right ahead. A good instance of a pleasant surprise happened to me one of those glorious sunny days last week. Florence Perry and I drove out to the woods to gather spring wildflowers. But we'd scarcely reached the woods when the sky clouded over and in a few minutes we were chilled to the bone. Back to the car we hurried, figuring the whole afternoon was ruined. And it was then that Florence brought out that pleasant surprise I mentioned. A whole big thermos of heavenly hot Lipton tea. Well, we sat down and had ourselves a regular tea party right there in the woods. Suddenly everything seemed bright and cheery again. Lipton's had certainly saved the day with its bracing, cheery taste, its delightful, brisk flavor. The same thing happens so often with so many folks. Any time during the day, Lipton's is a pleasant, refreshing treat. Tea with a glorious, full-bodied tang that adds extra zest to every occasion. The reason? It's worthwhile remembering, friends. Lipton tea has brisk flavor. <laughs> Now, friends, let's get back to those lovely people, Jack Chandler and Elwood Fitch. Chandler the murderer and Elwood the hit-and-run driver. Yeah, it's quite a pair. Together, they make a full house. A moment ago, Elwood tried to give himself up to the police, but Chandler caught him at the telephone. So, you were going to double-cross me, eh? No, I was only going to tell the police about myself. What do you suppose would happen to me when the cops came for you? I ought to kill you right now. Oh, no. You I... shut up. First thing I'm going to do is pull out that phone so you don't make no more calls at headquarters. <coughs> yeah. That settles the phone. Now, stand up. What are you going to... The door. Can you see who it is through the window, Fitch? Yes. Take a look. But remember, I still got this gun. Don't try any tricks. It's a man. Recognize him? 
No. Now listen. Before you open the door, I'm taking your wife into the next room with me. I'll be able to watch you and hear every word you say. You know what I'll do to Mrs. Fitch if you double-cross me. Yes. Okay. Now answer the door. Fetch, Elwood Fetch. That's right. May I come in? Yes, of course. I'm Detective Farley from headquarters. Here's my badge. Mind if I ask a few questions? What about? Well, I've been assigned to the Stenger case. Familiar with it? I... I read about it in the newspaper. A hit-and-run driver. That's the case. What do you know about it, Fitch? Why, Nothing. Are you sure? See, here, you, you don't... You think... and your wife went to the movies Friday night, correct? Yes, that's right. Did you drive straight to your garage from the movies? Why, uh, no. It wasn't a good movie, so we left early and went for a ride. Did you pass the corner of Broad and Main Streets? Uh, no. We went in the other direction. You're lying, Fitch. I've been checking garages for that hit-and-run car. Your garage man told me you brought your car in Friday night with blood on the bumper. I told him... We ran into a dog. Don't make me laugh. Your story wouldn't hold up a minute if that fool garage man hadn't washed the blood off. Are you going to arrest me? I need evidence first. When I get it, I'll come back. Blood on the bumper. That cop is wise to you, Fitch. He, he said he'd be back. Sure. He'll be snooping around looking for proof. Yeah, this is one heck of a hideout. I'm leaving. You're going away? Uh, glad of that, ain't you? Well, you got nothing to celebrate. What? What do you mean? I need time, plenty of time to get away from the city. I'm not going to leave you here to squeal to the cops as soon as I'm out of the door. We wouldn't tell the police. Yeah, I'm going to make sure you don't. I got one murder rap on me already. It might as well be three. Three? Elwood, he means... Listen, Chandler. I swear we won't tell. Why should we? Remember what you said. We're both in the same boat. The police are after me, too. You tried to double-cross me once before. I ain't taking any chances. Please, please. There's no use begging. It won't do no good. When? When When are you going to do it? Before I go. Sometime after dark. The rest of that day was a nightmare. Chandler wouldn't let me separate from Catherine. Everywhere we went, everything we did, he was always behind us with that gun in his hand. The gun. I had to take it away from him. He was much younger than I, big and tough. But I had to try. I watched for my chance. It came late in the afternoon. He was lighting a cigarette. He put the gun down on the living room table while he felt in his pockets for a match. Both of us were the same distance from the gun. I made a dive for it. Hey, get away from that rod. No, let go. Oh. I can't live with this. Catherine, help me. Grab his hand. Let go of me. Let go. Hold him, Catherine. Hang on to him. Oh, help. I, I... He's dead. I had to shoot him. I, I had to. Now what will we do? I don't know. What would he do if the positions were reversed? Call the police. No. The money. The money I gave him. The thousand dollars I took from Stenger. He still got it. It's ours again, Catherine. We're going to Arizona. Arizona. Don't you see? It's just like it was before he came. We'll take the money and we'll go to Arizona. But his body... He's a murder, he said to himself. We'll put the body into the car, drive out to the suburbs and leave it on the highway. The police will think it was just another gangster murder. I was just able to squeeze the dead body into the luggage compartment. Hurry, Elwood. Let's get away before one of the neighbors sees us. Oh, my gosh. Now what's the matter? The gasoline gauge. It's almost empty. Oh. We'll have to stop at the garage. I drove back to the garage. Had Dan fill the tank. And paid him with one of the $20 bills I had taken from the body of Stinger. Dan gave me a queer look as he brought me the change. Here you are, Mr. Fitch. 
13 gallons out of a $20 bill. Thanks, Dan. Oh, uh, by the way, did a detective come around to your house the other day? Uh, yeah, yes, he did. <laughs> I, uh, I hope you don't hold it against me telling him about that blood on the bumper of your car. Oh, of course not, Dan. Why should I? After all, I had nothing to hide. <laughs> oh, that's right. Well, you know, to tell you the truth, Mr. Fitch, I, I was a little suspicious of you. I, oh. I thought you really might be that hit-and-run driver. Not that it matters much now. No? No, no. The police don't care much now about that driver. Why not? Oh, he's small potatoes now. I just heard over the radio that uh, that guy Stanger was just about dead even before that hit-and-run driver hit him. I... How could that be? Well, uh, the way the radio explained it, Stenger was shot in the back, and uh, he staggered out into the street, and then the car hit him. But you said he wasn't killed by the car. Yeah, that's right. The coroner's inquest showed that he, he died of a bullet wound. He'd been murdered. The police even know who killed him. They, they know the killer's name? Uh-huh. I heard it over the radio just a minute ago. Oh, yeah, um, Chandler. Jack Chandler. <laughs> I don't remember driving away from the garage. It kept going around in my brain. Chandler had murdered Stenger. Catherine and I had run away from a crime we hadn't committed. No wonder Chandler had seen the accident. No wonder he feared the police. And now he was dead. His body packed into the luggage compartment of the car. Elwood, you're not listening to me. What? Oh, I, I, I was thinking about Chandler. That's what I was talking about. If he killed Stenger, why can't we go to the police and confess everything? Because we killed Chandler. Push for self-defense. Would the police believe that? They'd have to believe it. Even if they did, it would be murder in the third degree. They'd learn about the thousand dollars. I'd be held for trial. We'd never get to Arizona. No, Catherine. We've got to go through with our original plan. Edward, that siren... It's a police car behind us. What are you going to do? They may not be after us. If they do stop us, let me do the talking. Hey, forward! Stop that car! Don't be afraid, Catherine. I'll handle it. Uh-huh. Middle-aged man and woman. You answer the description, all right. Name Fitch? Yes. What's the trouble, officer? There's an alert out for you. You bought gas back at your garage a few minutes ago. Paid for it with a $20 bill. That's right. Got any more of those bills on you? Why, yes. And I'm over. Here. Here they are. Uh-huh. Looks like it's all here. This is the stuff, all right. What stuff? What are you talking about? It's money. It's counterfeit. Just like the bill you gave the garage man. Counterfeit? Phony money down to the last dollar. Move over. We're driving to headquarters. Well, that's the story, Detective Farley. You'll find Chandler's body in the back of my car. Willing to put your signature to this confession, Mr. Fitch? Yes, I'll, I'll sign it. Oh, you could have saved yourself a lot of grief. I knew you were the hit-and-run driver when I came around to your house. But I needed the proof, and you gave it to me when you broke one of these phony $20 bills. Did you know then about the money? Sure. Stinger had a long record as a counterfeiter. His girl told us he was carrying $1,000 in bad money the night he was killed. Naturally, when we didn't find the money on his body, we knew it had been taken by the hit-and-run driver. And the blood on the bumper of your car was the giveaway. Well, now that you've caught me... What's going to happen to me? Well, depends on the jury. You might get 20 years. Might get life imprisonment. You might even get acquitted. I'm in the courtroom now. Catherine beside me, waiting for the decision. The jury just filed in. The judge has asked if they reached a verdict. The foreman of the jury is rising to his feet. Your Honor, we find the defendants not guilty. Oh, 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 oh Catherine. Oh, Elwood, thank heaven. I don't know whether it's 
To laugh. Oh, Christ. Oh, darling, you were right in the very beginning. Money or no money, we're going to Arizona. Well, fooled you that time, friend. Slipped you a happy ending when you weren't set for it. But that jury decision... I don't know. It sounded a bit fitchy. <laughs> but seriously, friends, do you like happy endings? I don't, but then some people do. You know, someday, just to make sure, I'm going to have some research organization take a gallows poll. Well, Mr. Host, that seems a lot of trouble to go to when there's plenty of proof right in front of your nose that says people love happy endings. And what is that proof, Mary? It's the way thousands and thousands of families every day top off delicious meals with delicious Lipton tea. There's a real happy ending for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, folks. Try it and see. In fact, so that you won't forget it, add Lipton tea to your grocery list right now, this very minute. It's the world's favorite tea, and you're always sure of getting tea at its tastiest when you get Lipton's. Because remember, Lipton tea has that marvelous brisk flavor. <laughs> A parting word of advice, friends, drawn from the experiences of Elwood Fitch. If your wife wants you to take a trip, don't argue. No, don't pretend. Simply bash her on the head and deliver her to the police. You can always say she tripped. <laughs> oh, yes, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is I Hate Blondes by Wolf Kaufman. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Screams in the Night. Of course, there'd be lots of screams. The kind you like. Blood-curdling. And there's the usual triangle. A man, his wife, and another girl. But the joker is... He who grafts best... Gasps last. Don't get it? <laughs> and for the details, better be listening to Inner Sanctum next week. Mm. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm. <laughs> begin at the beginning of the meal, friends, with the soup. If you want soup to be both delicious and easy to prepare, make it Lipton's Noodle Soup. Here's a soup that has real honest-to-goodness chickeny flavor. It's full of tender noodles, and because it comes in modern soup mix form, it saves both time and money. Lipton's Noodle Soup mix is quick to make, and it makes lots more than canned soups, yet costs less. Try Lipton's Noodle Soup. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host, waiting to act as your guide through the squeaking door on a specially prepared travelogue. Mm-hmm. First, we'll take a little jaunt with Jeopardy along the path of peril, where we'll prowl with panic until we take the left turn into Horror Highway and thence via Terror Turnpike straight into the road to ruin. 
<laughs> I don't think I like your itinerary, Mr. Host. If you don't mind, I'd much rather take a shortcut to the Highway of Happiness via the kitchen. And uh, pray tell us by what signpost shall we recognize your blithesome Highway of Happiness, Mary? Well, you'll just know you're headed for pleasure when you take your first taste of swell Lipton tea. Because, oh, what a world of contentment there is in every cupful. What flavor, what wide-awake flavor. No wonder the tea experts say there's only one word to describe Lipton's, and that's brisk. No wonder more folks enjoy Lipton's than any other brand of tea in the world. It's because Lipton tea never tastes dull, flat, or dreary. It's always lively and cheery. Yes, Lipton's is the world's favorite tea, and it will be your favorite, too, once you taste that brisk Lipton flavor. So be sure you try Lipton tea. Listen now to the strange tale of a boy and his twin sister and their dog and the records of Hurricane Cole. It's called Detour to Terror. An original radio play written especially for Inner Sanctum by Emil Teppelman. And here is Mason Adams as Jerry Watson to tell you the story himself. I had a strange, uneasy feeling all evening after Linda left to drive to Hurricane Cole. Somehow, I had a presentiment of danger. Linda and I were twins, and always, in some uncanny way, each of us had been able to sense when the other was in trouble. Tonight, the feeling was very strong. Butch sensed it, too. He was only a mongrel pup, but he was smart. I shouldn't have let Linda go alone, but she had insisted. She was a feature writer for the Manhattan Magazine, and she'd run across the trail of a story about an old family of wreckers who lived down by the shore near Hurricane Cove. The tale went that this family had made a living in the old days by placing false signals on the shore in order to lure ships onto the rocks and then loot them. It was this story that she'd gone to investigate. Unwilling to go to bed with that uneasy feeling lying heavy upon me, I dozed in the chair by the fire with Butch's whine in my ears. It must have been a dream, because I saw Linda's white face floating in a sort of haze. And then I saw the fear in her eyes as she called to me. Jerry! Jerry, help me! Help me! I came awake suddenly with a cold sweat in my face. Butch was on his haunches by the fireplace, nose in the air, and howling as if for the dead. I felt myself trembling. Linda. Linda in danger. Somewhere, somewhere out in that storm, Linda was calling to me for help. She needed me terribly. Come on, Butch, we're going after her. Within 20 minutes, I was speeding through the storm out along Highway 9. I remembered Linda's telling me just what route she'd take. See, Jerry, I'll go out on 9 to here and then turn off on the old shore road. It isn't used much anymore, but it's the shortest route to Hurricane Cove. And if I leave now, I should be there by midnight. The mist lay heavy on the old shore road and the rain drove against the windshield and the swirling fog played strange tricks with my eyes. But I knew I was almost an hour behind Linda, and I had to make time. Now, don't worry, Butch. We'll catch up to her. We'll find her. If I could only go faster. It's fog. I can't see 20 feet ahead of... Hey! It's a red lantern on the road. What? What? It's a detour sign. Bridge ahead, washed out. Detour. What will I do, Butch? How do I know what Linda did? Did she drive straight ahead or did she take the detour? I, I've got to know I can't sit here waiting. We'll take the detour, Butch, and pray it's the right choice. This detour isn't taking us anywhere, Butch. I don't think Linda came this way. Maybe she didn't see the detour sign back there. Drove into the washed-out bridge. Maybe that's what the danger was. 
No, she couldn't have missed that red lantern even in the fog. She must have turned off. She must have come this way. Hey! There's the car, boy. She's in the ditch and blocking the road. It's Linda's car. Come on, let's get to her quick. Gosh, it's coming down and... Never mind the lightning. Let's go. She's not in the car, Butch. I don't see her in the car. Oh, no, she's not in here. Linda! Linda! Where could she have gone, Butch? She was always scared of thunder and lightning. Linda! How can we look for her in the dark and the fog? What is it, Butch? What have you found over there? I'm coming, boys. I'm coming. Where, boys? Where? Behind the tree? All right. <gasps> Linda. Linda. She's not. She. Linda. Open your eyes. It's, it's Jerry. Linda. Oh, oh. Linda, don't. Don't be scared, Linda. Everything's all right. It's me. It's Jerry. Oh, oh Linda. Jerry. Yeah. Oh, thank heaven. Oh, Jerry, take me away from here. Sure, kid. Come on. Uh, here, I'll, I'll help you out. Come on. My car is over this way. I must have fainted. I knew you'd come, Jerry. I had a feeling you would. I was afraid it might be too late. Here, get in the car. Yeah. Come on in, Butch. <coughs> Gosh, you're soaked to the skin, kid. <laughs> what happened here? Well, there... There was a man. He was hiding up there behind a tree. The headlights caught him when I got stalled in the ditch. How'd you come to land in the ditch? Well, there's a tree lying across the road. See, look over there. You can just see it in the headlights. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Gosh, it's a big one. Must have been struck by the lightning. That's what I thought at first. But when I got out to look at it, I saw that it wasn't struck by lightning. What? Jerry, that tree has been deliberately cut. Linda, are you sure? Sure I am. It's been cut by a saw. The minute I looked at it, I realized it wasn't any accident. Somebody meant to block this road. Great Scott. So I hurried back into the car and I tried to turn around. I wanted to go back. You couldn't have turned around anyway. This road is too narrow. No, well, I was too scared to realize that. I started backing up and the rear wheels landed in the ditch. And it was just then that I saw the man. He was coming out from behind the tree and he was all hunched up so I couldn't see his face. And when the headlights struck him, he ducked back and he disappeared. Well, I was afraid to stay in the car, so I jumped out and I started to run. Then I could hear him coming after me. And I must have tripped and my head struck something. And that's all I knew till you found me. Are, are you sure it was a man you saw, kid? Yeah, positive, Jerry. I don't get it. <laughs> what was the idea of blocking the road? <laughs> what, what's the matter, boys? <laughs> he hears something. Look over there. Someone running through the woods carrying something. I'm going after him. Careful, Jerry. Look. Butch has that man by the trousers. Oh, he kicked my... Hey, you don't to kick my door. Jerry, be careful. Come on back here, you. Jerry, I'm coming with you. Oh, it's no use. He ran away in the night. Uh, are you all right, Butch? Look, Jerry. Whoever he was, he dropped what he was carrying. Uh, what is it? it? Looks like a big board of some kind. Here, I'll turn the flashlight on. Yeah. What's the sign? It has lettering on it. What's it say? What's well, that? Great Scott. What is it, Jerry? It says, bridge ahead, washed out, detour. Jerry, this is the detour sign from the highway. Yeah. They only put it up there to lure you onto this back road. Then they blocked the road with a tree. Kid, it looks like we're in some kind of a trap. kind of a mess have we got these poor people into? Imagine finding that poor twin sister unconscious behind the tree. And it took Butch to find her, too. I wonder what kind of a tree it was. Oh, probably a dogwood tree. As you can always tell a dogwood tree by its bark. 
there's poor Linda in all that trouble, and here you go, making puns. Uh, I can't help it, Mary. That's my nature. I ought to know it's your nature by now. And I ought to know, too, you can't change people. Take those of us who like to start each day off with piping hot lips and tea. Why, nothing in the world could change us. In fact, breakfast just wouldn't be breakfast without Lipton. Lipton tea just seems to go with a bright bowl of gay yellow jonquils, a sunny-checked gingham tablecloth, and, of course, the morning paper. Part of the reason is Lipton's deep amber color and tempting aroma. But the big reason breakfast wouldn't be right without Lipton's is Lipton's grand, brisk flavor. It's so lively and tingling with zip. Just a cup or two of Lipton's and your spirits catch on and your day's off to a bright start. Yes, breakfast time or any time is the right time to enjoy Lipton tea. So for real tea-drinking pleasure, ask your grocer tomorrow for brisk Lipton tea. Well, let's get back to our story now and see what happens along that deadly detour. I have a hunch that Jerry and Linda are in for a lot of trouble. Trouble and twins, you know, never come singly. We got back in my car, wet and shivering, Linda, Butch, and I. We tried to figure out what to do. Don't you see, Jerry? This is the way those old-time wreckers used to work. They'd place false signals on the shore so that the ships would be lured onto the rocks. Mm Mm-hmm. You think that phony detour sign back there... It was there. just like a false signal to a seaman. It lured us onto this back road. When they get good and ready, they'll come for us. Maybe you're right, kid. Well, Jerry, we can't just sit here and wait to be murdered. Look, Glenn, up there in the hill through the trees. See those lights? Looks like a big house. Hey, maybe they've got a phone. We could call the police. Uh-huh. And maybe... Maybe what, Jerry? <sighs> Nothing. You think maybe they're the ones who lured us here? We'll have to take the chance, Linda. The ground here is so soft. Isn't there a path through these woods? There is. We could never find it now. (sighs) Anyway, this is the quickest. There are the lights of the house. Up ahead through the trees. Such big trees so old and bare. They look like evil things. Like they're waiting to twine their arms around us and crush us. Quit it, kid. You'll work yourself up for nothing. We'll be at the house in a minute. What? What is it? The lights. They went out. The house. It's all dark. Quiet, Butch. Why did they put the lights out, Jerry? Maybe they went to sleep. What do we do? We'll go up and ring the bell. That's what we'll do. Jerry. What? Do you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, someone playing the piano in there. In the dark. Oh, it sounds uncanny. Come on, I'm going to ring the bell. Piano stopped? Yeah. I think I hear someone coming. Still no lights? Excuse me, the creeps. Someone's opening the door. Good evening. Caught in the storm, eh? Won't you come in? Uh, your lights, aren't they working? (laughs) How stupid of me. I'd forgotten. Yeah. That better? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Jerry Watson. This is my sister, Linda. This is Butch. How do you do? My name is Considine, Gregory Considine, and you're quite welcome, I assure you. Mr. Considine, there's been a tree cut across the road down there. Tree? Cut? You mean struck by lightning? I don't think so, sir. I think it was done deliberately. I'd like to use your phone to call the police. Hmm. I'm so sorry. The phone is out of order. 
The storm, you know. I'm sure you must be mistaken about the tree. But you must be soaked through and through. Please follow me into the library. I'll get you some dry clothes. Jerry, did you see his eyes? He's blind. That's why I was playing the piano in the dark. Right in here, please. It's a nice crackling fire. You can warm up while I ring for my handyman. Matt will be here in a moment. I heard what you said to your brother, Miss Watson. Oh, I'm sorry. Not at all. I manage quite well. You live alone here, Mr. Considine? Uh, just my brother Vincent and I, and Matt, of course. We seldom see strangers here. No one uses this old back road. Mr. Considine, someone put a phony detour sign out on the main road. Really? Sounds almost incredible. Ah, here's Matt. You uh, ring for me, Mr. Gregg? Matt, uh, this is Miss Watson and her brother, and, and Butch. They've been caught in the storm. I think there's some dry clothing in the west room. Yes, Mr. Gregg. Here, yeah, this way, please. Are you in there, Gregg? What have you done with those people? Oh, dear. That's my brother Vincent. I'm afraid I'll have to ask a favor of you. Please overlook anything Vincent may say. He's... Shall I say, a bit strange. Oh, here you are. Well, introduce me to your friends, Greg. Go upstairs, Vincent. Go upstairs, Vincent. Is that all you have to say to your brother? What are you going to do to these people? What are you planning for them? Vincent. You can't shut me up. Look here, mister. And young lady, take a bit of advice from me. Don't stay in this house overnight. Or you'll never live to see the morning. Get out, quick. Matt, you know what to do. No. Yes, Mr. Gregg. No, please. Keep away from me, Matt. Keep away. I warn you, Mr. Get your sister out of it. No, hey, let go of me, Matt. Hey, he knocked him out. I regret that it was necessary, Mr. Watson. Vincent is difficult at times. Please pay no attention to what he said. I'm very sorry that you had to witness this painful scene. Uh, Matt, please carry Mr. Vincent upstairs and lock him in his room. I hope you like these rooms. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm sure we'll be comfortable, Mr. Considine. They're adjoining rooms, as you see. And these doors bolt on the inside. I advise you to keep them locked all night. We surely will. Thank you for these dry clothes. And for the tea. You're quite welcome, I assure you. Now just try to get a good night's sleep. Everything will be all right in the morning. Oh, Jerry, I'm scared. So is Butch. And so am I. What'll we do? First thing to do is bolt the door. Blind. Yet he frightens me, Jerry. The way he ordered his brother knocked down. Jerry, there's something I've got to tell you. What is it, kid? The name of that family of old time wreckers is Considine. You mean these are the people? Their ancestors used to loot ships. And now they're working on motors. Poor Vincent tried to warn. Jerry, what are we going to do? We've got to get out of here before they come up to finish us off. Let's take a look out the window. Oh, it's pitch black out there. Blocked by the streak of lightning, did you see? Yes, I did. That man, that Matt, standing under the tree with a rifle. We're stuck. No escape. <gasps> What's that? Someone tapping against the wall. In there. Can you hear me? Who is it? It's Vincent. I'm in the room next door to you. It's locked on the outside. Can you get me out? We'll be right there. Quiet, Butch. Oh, Jerry, maybe there's a chance. If Vincent will help us. Come on, kid. Yeah. No noise. Shh. Come on. Here, this is the door. Look, it's bolted on the outside. They must keep them locked up all the time. 
Well, here goes. Vincent? Here I am. Don't make any noise. My brother has ears like a cat. And don't let him fool you. He may be blind, but he's more dangerous than any man who can see. How are we going to get out of here? Matt's watching outside with a rifle. Listen. The piano. My brother is amusing himself in the dark. He always plays the piano when he has something on his mind. Do you know any way for us to get out of here? Well, there's only a slim chance. Now listen to me carefully. The only chance is to get out the back way. But you have to pass the open living room door downstairs. And Greg is in there at the piano. And what do we do? Well, you wait here. I'll go down first. And see if they've left the cellar door unlocked. I'll come back for you. Please, don't move until I return. Be careful. Uh, don't worry. I will. Jerry, what'll happen if Greg hears him? Greg will probably call Matt and then lock him up again. And what'll become of us? We'll worry about that later. Jerry, he stopped playing. Yeah. Do you think he heard Vincent coming down? Oh! 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 Jerry, Greg caught him. What'll we do? Come on, we're going down. The lights are all out down here. I don't hear anything. Where do you think Greg is? Maybe waiting to jump us in the dark. Come on, I don't care. Stick behind me. We're going in the living room. Where's Butch? I don't know. Oh. What is it? My foot touched on me. A body. Oh. 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 Then I'm going to take a chance on the flashlight. Stand by. All right. Oh. Oh. Great Scott. What is it? Look. What is it? I... That isn't Vincent. It's Greg. He's been stabbed. Watch out. Vincent. Somewhere around. He'll kill you. What do you mean? My brother Vincent. The one who's been doing the wrecking. We always keep him locked up. But tonight, he got away. Planted the detour sign. Cut the tree. Vincent did all that. Matt and I, we tried to stop him. Matt went out to the road, took down the deep door side, but it was too late. Watch out. He'll be back. He'll kill you. He's dead. Oh, Jerry. Poor Greg. And we thought of... Oh, the lights. Thank you for waiting for me. Vincent... Where'd you get that rifle? From Matt. He won't need it anymore. What are you going to do? <laughs> what do you think? You're crazy. Well, aren't we all? Now, my good friends, if you'll just say a prayer. Any little prayer will Don't do. Don't point that gun at my sister. It won't do you any good to stand in front of her. This rival is a 30-30. Now... If you're ready. Jerry, he's mad. Look out. Quit! Out of boy, quit! Let go of the gun! The gun went off in his face. Oh, Jerry. Take it easy, kid. He's dead. Don't, don't look at him. He isn't pretty to look at. What you did all right. Oh, kid, you can write your feature story now. The story of the wreckers of Hurricane Cove. And it'll be under your own byline, too. Oh, I'm going to write it under a double byline, Jerry. The wreckers of Hurricane Cove by Linda Watson and Butch. How does it feel to have a byline? Uh-huh, you like it. You like collaborating, don't you? Uh-huh, especially with a pretty girl like Linda, huh? 
<laughs> Which just goes to prove that there's a little bit of wolf in the best of dogs. But do you know the difference between a wolf call and a wolf whistle, Mr. Host? Uh, let me think. When a fellow gives a wolf whistle, he's starved for love. And when he gives a wolf call, he's just plain starved. In which case, there's just one thing to do. Feed him. But if you really want to appeal to his better nature, see that he winds up every meal with a good big cup of satisfying Lipton tea. Men certainly go for that brisk Lipton flavor. It's so lively and full of zip. So make a note right now to ask your grocer for Lipton tea tomorrow morning. Once you taste full-bodied Lipton tea, you'll know why you find Lipton tea in more teacups than any other brand of tea in the world. For Lipton is tea at its delicious best. Start enjoying it real soon. Get the tea with brisk flavor. Get Lipton tea. A parting word of advice, friends. If you should ever awake from a hideous nightmare and find yourself driving in a mental fog along a lane that has no turning with madmen lurking behind trees waiting to strike you down, and strange beasts with red tongues lapping at your ankles, and the bare and ugly trees stretching forth their gnarled arms to crush you, and there is no escape, no escape at all. Why worry about it? You won't come out alive anyway. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Benefit Performance by Richard Say. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Murder in the Night. Correction. There'll be three murders. You know, it's going to take a lot of nerve to hear this tale out, so I don't suppose you'll be listening. That is, unless you've just got to find out how a brass button in a dead man's hand traps the murderer. If so... Tune in to Inner Sanctum next week at the same time. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm. <laughs> Friends, here's a good way to lead off a meal. Serve quick, grand-tasting chicken a Lipton's noodle soup. The first taste of Lipton's noodle soup takes you back to Grandma's own country kitchen. But you get Grandma's results in a jiffy because Lipton's noodle soup is a real old-fashioned noodle soup with oodles of tender noodles in savory golden broth that's easy to fix and costs little. Ask for Lipton's when you ask for noodle soup and you'll hear your folks ask for more. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present... Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. When you heard the sound of the squeaking door, it was exactly 30 seconds past the hour for murder. But don't worry. We won't keep you waiting much longer. Even as I talk to you now, our hero and his victim are standing beside me, wishing I'd uh, dispense with formalities so they can get to more enjoyable pursuits, like murder. <laughs> now, isn't it funny, Mr. Host? I feel the same way in hot weather. You mean the heat makes you feel murderous? Mm, now, this doesn't sound like our Mary. <laughs> Please don't misunderstand me, Mr. Host. 
I mean the heat makes me want to dispense with formalities so I can get to more enjoyable pursuits, like serving myself and my friends tall, cooling glasses of iced Lipton tea in my backyard under the trees. Mmm, what grand iced tea Lipton's makes. So gloriously full-bodied, so full of zip. And it's that brisk Lipton flavor that does it. A flavor that's never flat, but always spirited and satisfying. You see, brisk is the word the tea experts themselves use to describe the livelier freshness of Lipton's. And those same tea experts agree that in iced teas, brisk flavor is extra important. That's why, for the best iced tea you ever tasted, you should always insist on Lipton tea. It's good iced because it's brisk in flavor. So keep a frosty pitcher of iced Lipton tea always on hand. Thank you for those cooling thoughts, Mary. Now into our sizzling thriller, Eight Steps to Murder. Written especially for Inner Sanctum by Emil Tepperman. This is the chronicle of a carefully calculated crime. A crime so twisted and subtle that it had to be blueprinted in advance. As Barry Kroger, in the role of Mark Durfee, the newspaper columnist, tells his story, we shall watch this crime develop, step by step, eight steps to murder. When I decided to kill Basil Archer, I went about it like an architect, laying out the plans for a complicated building project. Only a fool leaves the details of such an undertaking to chance. I calculated every risk. I weighed every possibility of failure. I blueprinted each of the eight necessary steps I had to take. My first step was to get a suitable weapon. I went on Monday morning to the office of a pawnbroker I knew on 48th Street. Uh, good morning, my friend. How are you, Mr. Krug? Come in, come in, Mr. Duffy. Thank you. You know what I want? Indeed, yes. I have it here, exactly what you need. It's uh, fully loaded. You can spin the barrel and see for yourself. Mm-hmm. Nice revolver. That looks a little awkward. Well, you uh, you said you wanted it with the silencer attached. Mm, yes. Uh, how much for this, Mister Krug? Uh, Two hundred and fifty dollars. What? That is the price, Mister Duffy. You know, uh, it's against the law to sell these. Well, yes, but but two hundred and fifty. You will pay it, Mister Duffy. Well, all right. You know what I want this gun for. But naturally. You know I'm planning to kill someone with it. But naturally. Otherwise, would you want a silencer on it? You wouldn't be above a little honest blackmail, would you, Mr. Krug? Uh, Please, do not point that gun at me. It is loaded. I know that. What, uh... What are you going to do? I regret this, Mr. Krug. I'm going to have to kill you. No, I swear to you. Save it. He'll be sorry for this. You'll make a mistake. You'll make a slip. There'll be no mistake. There will. There will. You cannot think of everything. I have thought of everything. This is the first thing. (coughs) You. You. You cannot think of everything. I left Krug's body where it lay and put the silenced revolver in my inside pocket and stepped out into the air. I stopped, stuck still. The rain suddenly coming down in buckets. I hadn't counted on it starting to rain. My alibi for Krug's killing was carefully planned. Everybody at my hotel thought I was still in my room, sleeping out of a binge. The carefully staged a drinking spree last night. But if my clothes were wet, they'd know I'd been out this morning. You cannot think of everything. You cannot think of everything. I hurried back to my hotel, walking in the rain. It was too dangerous to take a cab. I sneaked in the service entrance, the way I'd come out, and walked up the one flight of stairs. As soon as I got my room, I took off my clothes... Dropped them all in the bathtub and started the shower going. Then I went to bed. (laughs) 
About noontime, when the phone rang, I knew it was the clerk downstairs calling because I'd left a call for 12. I let the phone ring. That was step number two. A few minutes later, just as I expected, Ryan, the house detective, let himself into the room with his pass key. I pretended to be asleep, dead to the world. All the cockeyed shenanigans. What a load he must have taken on last night. I heard Ryan go into the bathroom where the shower was still running, and then come out muttering and approach the bed. Wake up, Mr. Duffy. Uh, what? Oh, my head. Oh, you must have been as high as a kite last night. Oh. You undressed in the shower. Left all your clothes in the bathtub. They're soaking wet. I was safe. My tracks were completely covered. This was Monday afternoon. According to my schedule, Basil Archer was to die on Friday evening at 10 o'clock sharp. I was now free to take step three in my blueprint for murder. For this purpose, I went to Basil Archer's office. He was a theatrical producer, you see. His office was upstairs over the famous old fantasy theater where Archer's new play was to open on Friday evening. As I opened the door of Basil Archer's office, I was quite cool. I had rehearsed myself well. Basil was seated at his desk talking to Gregory Sutherland, the young and handsome author of the new play. Hello there, Mark. Glad to see you. Hi, Basil. Just dropped in to get a line on the new play. You know Greg Sutherland, the author? Sure. Greg, this is Mark Durfee. Uh, We've met. I tell you, Mark, Storm Over the Highlands is going to be the biggest hit of the season. Greg's written a fine play. I'm glad to hear that, Basil. Ought to go over big, especially with your wife doing the lead, Nina's a great actress. <laughs> Confidentially, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing Storm Over the Highlands. It's just suited for Nina. Mm-hmm. Nina will be wonderful. Well, I guess she likes working with you, Mr. Sutherland. It's always a good idea for the author and the star of a play to uh, work together. Oh? Have you and Nina been working together, Greg? Well, yes, Mr. Arch. We uh, sort of thought if we could exchange ideas. Uh... <laughs> I never saw two people put their heart and soul into a job like Nina and Sutherland here. They spend every minute they can together. Now, look here, Durfee. I, I don't like the way you said that. Oh, I'm sorry, Sutherland. You know I didn't mean anything. It's... Uh... Well, it's only what people are saying, seeing you both together so much. Uh, what's this all about, Mark? This is the first I've heard of anything. Oh, forget it, Basil. Oh, by the way, here's a package. I want to give it to Nina on opening night. I wonder if you put it in your safe for me till Friday. Why, oh, sure, if you want me to. I'll put it here, on the bottom shelf, next to the payroll money. Come in Friday evening during the first intermission, and I'll get it out for you. Fine. Are those all packages of money on the bottom shelf? Yes. Over a hundred thousand in there. The receipts from my other shows. Here you are, Mark. All safely locked up. Uh, what kind of a present is it? I... I'd rather keep that a secret till Friday. From Archer's office, I went straight to his apartment. I knew Nina would be home. And it was important that I talk to her now. Hello, Mark. I've been wondering if you'd come today. I told you I would, Nina. I've waited so long. Darling. Oh, Mark, how long will it be now? How much longer? Only till Friday, darling. After Friday, you'll be free of him forever. And then you and I... Mm. (sighs) There's work to do first. This is only the fourth step. There are four more to go. Mm. Everything's working according to schedule. The next step is up to you. What must I do, Mark? Oh, I've started the ball rolling. Basil's beginning to worry about you and Sutherland. Mm -hmm. He's got to be encouraged to suspect as much as possible. You've got to be seen around with Sutherland as frequently as you can. Oh, that'll be easy. Sutherland's hardly more than a kid. He worships the ground I walk on. But I'd rather be with you, darling. Mm. There's five days more, Nina. Then we can be together. Always. Outside Nina's house, 
and I stopped for a moment with a queer sensation in the pit of my stomach. It was raining again. It reminded me of Mr. Cruz. You can't think of everything. You can't think of everything. I seemed to hear Krug's voice drumming in my ears. Drumming. You'll make a mistake, uh, Mark Durfee. You'll make a mistake. I won't, Wolf. I won't. You'll make a mistake. Krug. You know, a pawnbroker's life is not an easy one, and Krug took such an interest in his business. And he never suspected Mark Durfee. In fact, he probably liked him for his redeeming qualities. <laughs> Though, come to think of it, Krug was pretty lucky at that. Mark didn't steal anything from the store but the gun, so Krug lost practically nothing but his life. <laughs> you know, Mark's story gives me an idea. I'd like to draw up a blueprint myself. Yes, Mary, another blueprint for murder. Oh, now, Mr. Host, I'd call mine a blueprint for summer refreshment. And I'd like to do it in sound. First, I'd start with the creak of porch rockers on shaded summer streets and the murmur of backyard gardener in the lilac dust. And with the teensters home from school, there'd have to be some sweet swing music, of course. And just to make my blueprint of summer sounds complete... You'd hear the tinkle of ice in tall, cool glasses. Glasses of refreshing iced Lipton tea. Yes, iced Lipton tea just goes with summertime fun and enjoyment. Lipton's has such a wide-awake flavor. The whole family will love it. And that flavor, folks, is brisk. Yes, that's the secret. Lipton's brisk flavor is what makes iced Lipton tea taste extra good. So for a delightful treat to beat the heat, Serve iced tea, and for the best iced tea ever, insist on Lipton tea. Brisk flavor, never flat. Couldn't have done better myself, Mary. But now, let's catch up with our architect of murder. If Mark Durfee's blueprint works out according to schedule, our death rate should go up sharply to about one per person. Let's see. He should be up to his fifth step by now, shouldn't he? Tuesday was a clear day without rain, and I felt better. I knew now that I couldn't make a mistake. In four days, Basil Archer would die as planned. And now, for the fifth step. An easy one for Mark Durfee, because he's a newspaper columnist. It merely requires dictating a little item for his column into the dictaphone at his desk. Oh, there's a new play opening soon, which should be a huge success... If the author and the leading lady can do anything to make it click, they're working harder on it than the producer himself. It looks like they've um, clicked with each other, too. And now, the sixth step. Eight steps to murder, and this is number six. Just a couple of telephone calls to set the sixth step in motion. Hello? Hello? Hello, Nina. Did you see the paper this morning? Mark, darling, it was perfect. Uh -huh. I've had a half dozen phone calls. Everybody knows you met Sutherland and me. Oh, good. Basil saw it, too, at breakfast this morning. He did? How did he like it? Oh, he just looked glum. I don't think he believes it. <laughs> well, all right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Get hold of Sutherland and make him take you out tonight. Uh-huh. There's a fast little nightclub out on the island, the uh, Pirate's Hole. I know the place. Kind of disreputable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. But now, look, you get Sutherland to take you there. You think you can manage that? Oh, he'll take me anywhere I want to go. Good. Be sure to be there tonight, about ten. I'll take care of the rest. <laughs> Speaking. Oh, hello, Basil. How are you? Mark Durfee. Now, look here, no, no, Mark. Look, wait. Take it easy, Basil. I know you want to bore me out about that piece in the column. I thought you were a friend of mine. Oh, look, Basil, that's why I printed that piece. I don't like what's going on. Just what do you mean? If Nina feels like working with the author of the play, she's... Sure, sure, it's... that's all right. But, but, look, why keep things secret? What do you mean by that? Well, you ask Sutherland if he has any plans for tonight. I know what plans he has for tonight. He's going to stay home and work on some lines in the last scene... 
Oh, ho, ho, ho. is that so? What are you hinting at, Mark? I'm hinting that you take a run out to the pirate's hold. You know where it is, out on the island? And you'll see how hard Sutherland will be working on the last scene. <laughs> Where are you? I'm calling from the pirate's hold. Basil was just here. Oh, God. Did he find you with Sutherland? Well, naturally. I did just what you told me to. Fine, fine. And everything is set for tomorrow. You're sure everything will be all right? Oh, yes, quite sure. Now, this is what I want you to do tomorrow. Just before the show opens, you'll take sick. Oh. And Basil will have to put in an understudy for you. Yes, I can do that all right. Then you'll dismiss the servant. Yes. Now, remember this clearly, Nina. You're going to be my alibi for the hour between 9 and 10. Understand? I understand, Mark. I'll be over at 9. But I'll leave a few minutes later by the back way. Only you'll swear that I stayed till a few minutes after 10. Is that clear? Yes, Mark. And good luck. When I rang the doorbell of Nina's apartment Friday night... I knew that every step I'd taken thus far had been right. I couldn't fail. Mark, I was afraid you weren't coming. I was afraid something had gone wrong. Nothing's gone wrong. You sent the servants away? Yes, they're all gone. I'm alone. I can swear you were here till after ten. Good. How... How are you... How are you going to kill him? With... This. A gun. What's that bulky-looking thing on it on the muzzle? Mm, that's a silence, Nina. Oh. Well, you better hurry, darling. You haven't much time. There's one thing more that I've got to do here before I go. Why are you pointing the gun at me? Because I'm going to kill you, Nina, dear. Oh, no, Mark, I don't like that kind of joke. <laughs> it isn't a joke, my darling. Mark, are you crazy? You little fool. Did you think I'd go to all this trouble planning this thing step by step? <laughs> Did you think I was doing all of this for you? But I, I thought you loved me. I, you I thought th I was committing murder because I loved you? <laughs> oh, Nina, you're just another step in my blueprint. Now you've served your purpose, just like Krug. Krug was step one, you're step seven. Mark! I made sure Nina was dead, and then I hurried out and went to Basil Archer's office. I had to be sure my timing was right. This was the eighth and the final step. I knew Basil would be in his office during the first intermission, so... Hello, Basil. Oh, it's you, Mark. Come in. I want to talk to you. What about, Basil? Mark, what's going on between Sutherland and Nina? Oh, no, Basil, you're not a fool. I, I can't believe it. Well, look, if you want proof, suppose you get that package out of the safe, the one I left with you. The package? What's that got? Well, you get it, and I'll show you. Well, all right. Uh, well, here's your package. Now, what do you want to show me? You still got all that cash in the safe, huh? You know, I always have it here. Yes, I know. Say, what are you doing with that revolver? Look, Basil. Look into the muzzle. What the dats? Just right. Oh! I opened the package Basil had given me. It was only an empty box, nothing in it, but there was something here I could put into it now. I stepped across Basil's body, knelt before the open safe, and took out the neatly tied bundles of money and put them into the empty box. A hundred thousand dollars. It was well worth the months of planning, the careful blueprinting. I was a rich man. Now I was ready for the finale. The last bit of routine business, which would finish the whole thing off properly. I picked up the phone and dialed police headquarters. It wouldn't be too difficult to imitate Basil Archer's voice over the telephone. <laughs> I'd rehearsed that, too. Yes, headquarters. Uh, hello. This is Basil Archer speaking. I've just killed my wife. What's that? My wife and Sutherland, they were planning to run away together. 
They stole all the money from my safe and were going away. So I killed her. And now I'm going to kill myself, too. Now, wait, Mr. Archer. Now, wait a minute. Don't do anything I rash. I thought they'd be Just stay there and we send a radio. Now. Now, everything was set. Carefully, I placed the revolver in Basil's cold hand. And left no prints on it. Because I was wearing gloves. I picked up the package and walked out into the hall. But in the hall, I stopped short. Someone had just come into the building downstairs. I peered down and I saw Gregory Sutherland coming up. Mr. Archer, are you up there? You better hurry. The second act is starting. Sutherland was coming up the stairs. I couldn't get out. But I wasn't trapped. Oh, no. There was a porter's closet down the hall. I tiptoed over to it and slipped inside just as Sutherland got to the landing. Mr. Archer, are you in there? Sutherland was in Basil's office now. He'd be finding the body. This was my chance to sneak out. I opened the closet door. What, well, Kitty? Archer's office is one place up. Maybe we can make it in time. The guy said he was going to kill himself. The police had come in answer to my telephone call. Now I couldn't get out. There'd be a crowd outside and I'd be seen leaving. I had to stay in the building. But still, I wasn't trapped. I knew just what to do. Instead of leaving the building, I would walk out of the closet and into Basil's office right after the police. They'd think I'd just arrived. I stepped out of the porter's closet. I started for the door of Basil's office. Then, suddenly, Got a sick, weak feeling in the pit of my stomach. I stopped stock still. I'd almost walked in to my death. It was raining outside. Suppose I'd walked in there with my clothes all dry, claiming that I'd just come in from the street. They'd know that I'd been hiding in the building all the time. The rain, that rain, it almost tricked me again. You can't think of everything. You'll make a mistake. You can't I can't. I can, you old fool. I'll show you. I hurried back into the porter's closet. <laughs> I knew how to beat this, too. I turned on the faucet in the sink. Flashed and drenched myself from head to foot. <laughs> well, now, now, I looked as if I'd just come in out of the rain. I stepped out of the closet, went down the hall... Entered Basil Archer's office, dripping wet. The two policemen were standing over Basil's body with Gregory Sutherland. They all looked up as I came in. Oh, hello, Mr. Gregory. Sorry about this. It's your friend, Basil Archer. Did no. suicide. Oh, no. Oh, it's impossible, Sergeant Moran. Basil wouldn't do a thing like that. Why... Who, who found him? I did, Mr. Durfee. I came to call him for the second act. Oh, this is terrible. He's like an open and shut case. Killed his wife, then came here and knocked himself off. Oh. And what's more, Mr. Sutherland? Yes? Before he knocked himself off, he phoned headquarters and said you'd stolen money from his safe. Oh, well, that's a lie. A rot... Wait a minute. Sergeant. Uh, Mr. Durfee. Yes, Sutherland? How did you get yourself all wet like that? Oh, well, you try not getting wet in that rain. Rain? What rain, Mr. Dorothy? Suddenly, suddenly I went clammy all over. I saw that none of them was wet. Their clothes were all dry. But how, how could that be? They'd just come in out of the rain. What rain, Mr. Dorothy? Well, you, you can hear it, can't you? It's pouring rain. Just listen to that thunder. Thunder? Rain? Good heavens, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. Don't you see, Sergeant? He's been in the building all the time. Trying to make us think he just came in and he got himself all wet for nothing. Sergeant, I bet you a dollar he murdered Archer. You're crazy. Well, it's pouring outside. You can hear it yourself. But just listen to that rain beating down. The thunder. You poor sap. That isn't rain you hear. It's my play next door. Storm over the highlands. Remember? And those are the sound effects in the second act. So, it looks like Mark Durfee was all wet. 
In fact, he got himself so soaking wet, he practically liquidated himself. But cheer up, I'm sure he won't spend more than six months in jail. And that wouldn't be so bad, would it? If they weren't going to execute him afterward. Poor Mark. If only someone had told him. Uh, Told him what, Mary? Well, look, Mark took eight steps to get in the cooler when you really only have to take one step to get cool. (laughs) Sure, just step down to the grocer's and get a large economical package of brisk Lipton tea. Then keep a pitcher of iced Lipton tea always on hand and help yourself to its cooling refreshment off and on throughout the day. That's all there is to it. And you'll find Lipton's makes perfect iced tea because Lipton's is never flat. It always tastes delightfully tangy and full-bodied. That's why this summer, when you want iced tea, you should be sure to use the tea with the brisk flavor. Ask your grocer tomorrow for Lipton's. And so ends our little essay on the modern methods of murder. Of course, our little essays on murder are only for the select few. As a matter of fact, only one person in every 10,000 is capable of murder. Mm -hmm. And speaking of statistics, due to our high birth rate, the population of this country is increasing faster than inner sanctum can kill them. Very discouraging. Very discouraging indeed. Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Panic Stricken by Mitchell Wilson. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups will bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Bury Me Not. Now there's a plot for you. A plot right in the graveyard. Trouble is, the rain's come and uncover it. Hmm? What becomes of the body? Well, now, that's anybody's guess. But come around next week. We'll be right at the graveside, and uh, we'd like to have you drop in. (laughs) Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Now that summer's here, keep cool by keeping out of the kitchen. Serve Lipton's Noodle Soup. It's quick and easy to prepare and gives you a delicious soup in a jiffy with so much less work and trouble. It's the perfect hot dish to serve with cool summertime suppers because Lipton's is luscious noodle soup with real old-time chickeny flavor. Besides, Lipton's Noodle Soup mix costs less and makes lots more than the usual canned soup. Ask for it tomorrow, Lipton's Noodle Soup. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you in through the squeaking door. We're having a party tonight for two of my favorite corpses. I call them Romeo and Juliet. They're newly dead, you know. (laughs) Yes, she's the daughter of a famous society murderer, and he's the pride of the East Side Morgue. Oh, they're so happy together in their mausoleum built for two. And you should see the bridal casket. Shame on you, Mr. Host, making fun of such a tragedy. But, Mary, it was a touching ceremony. Of course, I stood up for the groom... Naturally, the poor fellow couldn't stand up for himself. (laughs) Oh, please. It's an occasion for tears, not for laughter. That's right, Mary. Why, when the bride appeared wearing her grandmother's shroud, everyone had to be cheered up with Lipton tea. Now, that's enough. I will not have Lipton's mentioned at a time like that. 
Lipton tea is for people who know how to enjoy life. These are the folks who really appreciate Lipton's famous brisk flavor. Yes, that word brisk, B-R-I-S-K, makes a big difference when you're sitting down to a cup of hot tea. Brisk means that Lipton tea tastes fresh and full-bodied, never flat or wishy-washy. I wish you'd try Lipton's, folks, even if you're not a regular tea drinker, because you just don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. Well, Mary, let's tee off into tonight's story. It's called The Shadow of Death, and it's an original radio play by that boogie-woogie man, Robert Sloan. Yes, and our star tonight is Richard Widmark, who plays the role of Howard. All set? Then turn off the lights and let in the shadow of death. On a lonely dirt road that borders the village cemetery, a single car slows to a stop and parks in the moonless night. Inside it, a man leans back in his seat and reaches for the hand of the girl he loves. Howard. Yes, dear? Why did you stop here? The cemetery is right over there. Oh, I didn't notice. You drove here last night, too. Did I? Yes. <laughs> well, you're not frightened, are you? Tonight I am. You've been so strange, so far away. I, I feel as if I hardly know you. Darling, you mustn't feel that way. What's the matter, Howard? There's something on your mind. I'm going away, Marie. Oh, no. And I'm not coming back. Howard, why? Well, I don't really know if I can explain it. It seems so incredible, and and yet I know it must be true. What? Something I've discovered about myself. Something strange and frightening, Marie. Wherever I go, I seem to cast a shadow. A shadow of death. I... I don't understand. No, I didn't either at first. I thought it was just a strange coincidence. But it isn't. It's me. I bring death wherever I go. Oh, Howard, you don't really believe that. Well, how can I believe anything else? Haven't you noticed what happens to every living thing I have around me? No. I can't keep a pet of any kind, a cat or a dog. Even a plant dies when I have it in the house. Oh, darling, that's just your imagination. You've been working too hard. You need a rest. No, I'm going away, Marie. I don't want any harm to come to you. Oh, no, please. Nothing's going to happen to me. This is just... What's the matter? Well, nothing. I... I was just looking at the flowers in my corsage. Good heavens. They're dead. You don't believe me either, do you, Doctor? Well, let's not put it on that basis, Howard. After all, I've been trained to look for the physical causes of death, not the supernatural. Then what do you think I should do? Frankly, I'd like you to spend a few weeks away from these surroundings. Go up to the sanitarium I told you about. They'll take good care of you up there. All right, Doctor. I'll make arrangements to go tomorrow. But I know it won't do any good. You'll be surprised, Howard. Two or three weeks from now, you look back on this as a... Yes? That's strange. Those goldfish in my aquarium. They're all dead. <laughs> Tell me the truth, Howard. Are you comfortable here in the sanitarium? They, they don't believe me. They don't believe that people die when I dream about them. People die? Yes, you... didn't you know that? Every time I have a dream about someone, it, it's a sign of death. And the next morning when I wake up, I look in the obituary column and I see the name of the person I dreamt about. Well, Howard, what have they done to you here? Nothing, only they don't believe me. The, the, the dreams, I mean. I had to prove it to them this morning. And it made me feel very bad. What made you feel bad? The dream I had last night. I killed a man, Marie. What? I killed him in my dream. Oh. He was a good friend of mine, too. He lived right across the hall. Oh, hall. Howard, please. You've got to get hold of yourself. But I'm afraid, Marie. I don't want to dream anymore. Oh, darling, I can't bear to see you this way. What way? I'll get you out of here. 
I promise, Howard, I'll get you out of here today. But, Marie, there isn't a chance of getting him out. You may have to stay in this institution for months. Oh, no. Dr. Gerard, can't you see what's happening to him? He's losing his mind. Well, I know he's taken a turn for the worse. That's all the more reason for keeping him here. It might be dangerous to discharge him now. Then why don't you do something to help him? We're doing everything we can. It's not easy. He persists in thinking he has this strange power of death. Nobody is able to convince him he's wrong. What about the man across the hall? Howard said they were good friends. That's another thing. They were good friends. But unfortunately, that man died this morning. Ah, good morning, Howard. How do you feel today? Oh, much better, Doctor. Much better. No bad spells last night? No curious moods? No, I feel fine. Almost well enough to go home. Let me look at your eyes. You will let me go home again, won't you, Doctor? Yes, Howard, of course, of course. You, uh, haven't had any of those dreams lately, have you? No, no, not for a long time. Are you sure? Well, I, uh, I did have one last night. You dreamt that someone was dead? Yes, I did. But 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 I, I, I know it's not true. It can't be true. Whom did you dream about? Marie? No, Doctor. I dreamt about you. That's why I know I'm wrong. You're alive, Doctor. Don't you understand? You've proven it to me. Easy, easy now, Howard. Tell me about your dream. Well, I, I dreamt I was going home. And all the people I'd killed in my dreams were alive again. Yes, go on. Well, somehow or other... I could see my house from this window, and everything was just as it was a long time ago. The flowers were growing, the dog was in the yard. The one that was run over? Yes, everything was well again, and I was well, too. That's why I wanted to go home. But you and Marie's mother didn't want me to. She was in the dream, Marie's mother? Yes, I, I don't know how she happened to be there, but she was. That's all right, Howard. Go on. Well, I started to leave, Doctor, but she held me back. She held my arms like this. And then you jumped up to ring the bell for help. But before you reached it, I was on top of you like this. Oh. I had my fingers around your throat. Oh, dear. And I was squeezing it so hard. I could feel your windpipe bending back oh, until you couldn't breathe anymore. Oh, let go. That's what you said last night, you fool. I got... You wanted me to let go. I let go. Uh, uh, help on until your face turned as blue as it is now. It was almost black before I let you go. But first, first I made sure you were dead. And then I dropped the body. You see, Doctor, my dreams do come true. <laughs> well, have you had any good dreams lately? Howard has. And you know, his dreams don't need interpretation. No, they need cremation. <laughs> Say, it's a lucky thing that guy works on the night shift. It'd be awful if he had daydreams, too. <laughs> good gracious, yes. His dreams not only walk, they commit murder. <laughs> Mary, I was about to say that. Please leave the jokes to me. How would you like it if I talked about tea? Hmm? Well, for goodness sake, I listen to the story, too. And I must say, I'm glad I'm not his um, dream girl. <laughs> that does it. Friends, let me tell you about Lipton tea. All right, you win. But it's only because I have something important to say about Lipton's. Folks, did you know that Lipton's is the largest selling brand in the whole world? Yes, and the reason for that is Lipton's well-known brisk flavor. You know, that word brisk is the tea expert's word for tangy, full-bodied tea, for Lipton tea. Ah, uh, Lipton's is always fresh and spirited, never flat or, or wishy-washy. That's why lots of people drink it not just at mealtimes, but whenever they're taking it easy for a minute during the day. So, folks, try Lipton's and get acquainted with that brisk flavor. Well, 
Let's get back to our dream man and find out what he does in his waking moments. When we left him last, he had just done a little manual work on Dr. Gerard's windpipe. And now, as the good doctor lies comfortably on the sanitarium floor, Howard is in the process of going through his pocket. Well, I'll have to have the keys to your car, doctor. I'll need them to get back home. I hope you won't mind if I hide you under this bed. It may take them a little bit longer to find the body if I do. Yes, who is it? Dr. Frisbee, Howard. May I come in? Well... Yes. Yes, I, I'll open the door. What is it, Doctor? Well, I was looking for Dr. Gerard. I thought he was in here. Oh, yes, yes, he, he was a moment ago. I, I, I think he went down the hall. Uh, no, I just came from there. I guess he went back to his office. Oh, yes, I guess he did. How are you making out, Howard? Fine, fine, Doctor, fine, fine. You seem a little nervous. Your hands are shaking. Oh, well, I... You see, you've dropped your keys. I'll get them. It's all right, Howard. I wasn't going to take them away from you. But I am wondering how you happen to have any keys in your possession. Well, they're... Uh, they're, they're not really mine. Uh, whose are they, Dr. Gerard's? Uh, yes, yes, he, he left them here. I, I mean... You he... mean uh, you stole them from him? No. Oh, come, Howard. You can't expect me to believe Dr. Gerard would give you any keys. Now, you'd better let me have them. So I can give them back. But I, I Let didn't... me have them, Howard. Thank you. You won't tell him I took them, will you? No, Howard, I won't tell. But uh, please don't take them again. I'll go anyway. I'll get out onto the road and I'll get a hitch. Yes, sir, I'll get away. I've got to speak to Marie. Going down, mister? I guess not. I guess I'm a... Oh, oh, here comes another one. Hey, stop! Give me a ride, will you? Give me a ride, please, mister? Oh, he's stopping. Hey, hey, wait for me, will you, mister? I'm coming. I'll be right there. Oh, gee, thanks, mister. You, you going into town? Yes, Howard, but you're not. Oh, Dr. Frisbee. Yes, I've been watching you ever since you took those keys. I thought you'd try something like this. Well, I, I had to, doctor. I understand. Better get in the car, Howard, so we can talk this thing over. All right. You know, it's silly to run away from our place up there. If you really want to go home, all you have to do is ask. I did ask. When? This morning. Oh, wait a minute. Don't start the car. Why not? There's a truck coming. In back. Where? Oh, Howard, let go of me, Howard! I've got to have this car, Doctor. When I finished with it... I'll return it to you. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Walker. Who's this? Howard. You remember me, don't you? Howard, where are you? In a telephone booth around the corner. You were out in the sanitarium? No, I've been discharged. Dr. Gerard said I could go. You mean... You're well again? Yes, I'm completely cured. Oh. Oh, I see. You don't sound very happy about it, Mother. Where's Marie? She's, uh, she's out on a date. When will she be back? Well, I, I don't know, Howard. She, she didn't say. I've got to see her again, Mrs. Walker. I've got to see her once more before I die. Before you die? Yes, I haven't much longer to live. Now, where is she? Well, I... Uh... I think she said she was going to movies. You're lying. I'm not, Howard. I, I, I just can't be sure. But if you go to the theater, you, you might find her there. You don't want me to see her, do you? Uh, no, not until I've spoken to Dr. Gerard. Why? Don't you believe me? Don't you believe I'm well again? No, Dr. Gerard... Never mind what he said. Mrs. Walker, you mustn't dislike me. I'm very fond of you. You... You are, Howard? Yes. I've been thinking a lot about you lately. While I was in the sanitarium. Last night, I even had a dream about you. Keep 
ringing that number, operator. I've, I've got to locate Dr. Gerard. Why the hurry, Mrs. Walker? Howard, how did you get in here? Through the back door. Put that phone down, please. But I... Put it down, I said. Yes, yes. You lied to me about Marie being at the movies, Mrs. Walker. I, I didn't mean to, Howard. I, I told you I wasn't sure she was there. Where is she? This time I've got to know. Howard, how dare you? Take your hands off me. I'm not in a gentle mood, Mrs. Walker. I'm fighting against time. You've done something wrong, Howard. You've escaped from the sanitarium. No, I've done more than that, Mrs. Walker. I've killed a man. Howard. Two men, three men. I, I can't remember how many it was, but there's going to be one more. Howard, you, you wouldn't kill me, would you? Wouldn't I? What have you done to deserve your life? Uh, there... Let it ring. That may be my call. Your call is coming now, Mrs. Walker. Howard, please. Put down that knife. Will you tell me where Marie is? I told you I don't know. I don't know. And I'll wait for her. Right here. Howard, you can't. No, no, you can't. Oh. Yes, I can, Mrs. Walker. Hello? Hello, this is Dr. Frisbee, sanitarium calling. Is Mrs. Walker there? I'm sorry. You have the wrong number. Marie? Marie, darling? What? Why, Howard. Howard, what are you doing here? I've been waiting for you to come home, darling. Aren't you glad to see me? Why, yes, of course I am, and... It was such a surprise I couldn't catch my breath for a minute. Where's Mother? Upstairs. Why? Why, I just wanted to know. You had no other reason? No. Howard, why are you staring at me? I'm not really staring. I'm just looking at you, darling. It's been such a long time since I've seen you. I'd almost forgotten what you were like. Uh, well... Uh, let's go inside. No, if you don't mind, darling, I'd rather go for a ride. You're... You're all right, aren't you, Howard? I, I mean, you're, you're completely well now. Oh, can't you see I am? Uh, yes, but I... I yes. Yeah. Then let's not wait any longer, darling. Come on, we'll go for a ride. Getting late, Howard. Don't you think we ought to go back? No, not yet, Marie. You just keep driving. These few moments we have together, maybe I'll. Marie, why are you stopping here? Uh, we're low on gas, dear. I, I don't want to get stuck on the highway. Oh. Yes, Will it be? Uh, uh, you better fill her up. All right. And uh, have you got a telephone here? Yes, ma'am. Run inside. Uh, thank you. Wait a minute, Marie. What do you want with a telephone? Oh, I was going to call my mother. She'll be worried about me. Oh, no, she won't. She knows you're with me. Besides, uh, she went out for a little while. Well, maybe she's back by now. It, it won't hurt to call, will it? No, I guess it won't. I I'll be right back, Howard. Well, hurry, darling. I want to be with you as much as I can. Yes, I won't be a minute. Number, please. Operator, quick, get me the police. This is an emergency. Yes, ma'am, right away. Headquarters, Sergeant Dunn speaking. Sergeant, listen carefully. I won't have time to repeat it. The murderer of Dr. John Gerard is right here in a filling station on Route 6 at the Hadley intersection. What shall I do? I can't keep him here. Does he know you're on to him? No. No, he doesn't know I read the story in a newspaper just before I got home. He was waiting there for me, and I haven't been able to get to a phone since. Well, don't take any chances. He's a homicidal maniac. Don't even try to stall him if he wants to leave. No. Just stay where you are, and we'll be over there in four minutes. Oh, no, no, that's no good. He won't let me stay here. He'll take me with him. Marie. Oh, he's calling for me now. Marie. Uh, just a moment, Howard. What can I do, Sergeant? What can I do? Well, give me the description of the car, quick. It, it's a dark blue sedan. License number 468J3. We've been going east on Route 6. Oh, I can't talk anymore. He's coming. Marie, for heaven's sake, what kept you so long? Oh, I had a hard time getting the number. There was something wrong with the lines. But you were talking to somebody. Yes, I, I was speaking to Mother. You were speaking to your mother? Yes. She told me not to stay out too late. You're lying, Marie. No, I'm not, Howard. I talked to her. You talked to the police. That's why you lied to no. me. No. You did. Your mother's dead. Howard. I know, because I killed her. Oh. Be quiet. Get back into the car. You're coming with no. me. No, Howard. Howard. 
You're hurting my arm. Get back in the car. Hey, you leave her alone. Keep out of this, you fool. Leave her alone. I told you to keep out of this. Oh, I know. Hey, put down that wrench. Now put it down. Oh, oh. oh I don't good you. Never mind. Get into the car. Why are you stopping here? Don't you know where we are, Marie? This is the cemetery. Where we stopped before. Yes. I like it here. It's so quiet and peaceful among the dead. Let's walk through the ground. Howard, please. Why not, Marie? We're among friends. So many of our loved ones are buried here. It's nice to be near them. Come on, Marie. All right, Howard. You know, darling, we haven't much more time together. The shadow of death has fallen across our path. You said something like that before, but you never told me why. I'm being selfish, Marie. I know I have to die, and I want you to come with me. Why do you have to die, Howard? Because I... I haven't been true to myself, darling. I haven't been true to this power I have. The power of death? Yes. I've helped it along sometimes. Like that dream I had about my friend in the sanitarium. Like the flowers in my garden. Like those fish of Dr. Gerard's. You killed them? Yes. I knew they were going to die. But I shouldn't have helped them. That's why I'm being punished. But Howard... Why are you punishing me? I don't want to die alone, Marie. We've been away from each other so much, darling. I I want us to be together from now on. But... Don't be afraid, darling. I'll be gentle, Marie. So gentle. But you're making a mistake, Howard. No. You are. You've forgotten what you've done. You can't kill me, darling. Why not? Good heavens, Howard, don't you remember? Don't you remember that day at the sanitarium? You said you dreamt about me? No. No, I couldn't have. Yes, you did. Didn't they tell you what happened? No. Your dream. Your dream, it was true. That's why you can't kill me now. Marie, you... You mean... Yes, Howard. I'm dead. I can't believe it. Oh, you must believe it. Here. Here. Look at this tombstone. My grave is right here. No. Read what it says. Read the name on it. It's your name, Marie. Your name. Marie Walker. Yes. Then you... Then you really are dead. I told you I was, Howard. The shadow of death passed over me. Then let it pass over me. Oh. Oh. Hey, got him, Sam. Got him the first shot. Keep out of the way, miss. He may not be dead yet. No, I... I'm sure he's dead. Well, you certainly had a close call. It was all this time to locate your car. Finally spotted it on the road. You all right? Yes, I, I'm all right. Yeah. The name of my grandmother's... Tombstone saved me. How's that? Oh, it, it doesn't matter. Say, that's funny. What? This guy was shot through the shoulder. My bullet wounds weren't serious enough to kill him. What do you mean? Well, I know it sounds crazy, but my shots didn't kill him. He was dead before I hit him. What a shame. Wasting two perfectly good bullets on a guy that was dead all the time. Well, at least they won't have to go far to bury him. Here's one villain who died practically in the middle of his own plot. <laughs> Isn't it funny how many of our stories seem to take place in cemeteries? You know, Mary, I think you ought to open up a concession in the cemetery. And you know what you could sell. Hmm? Don't say it. Don't you dare. 
You know very well that the place to buy Lipton tea is and always will be your neighborhood grocery store. And, folks, that reminds me. You'll find it wiser to buy Lipton's in the larger, more economical size packages. That way you not only save money, but you also make sure that you won't run short on a beverage that's really a household necessity. Brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Well, before I put the skeletons back in their closets, I'd like to give you a parting word of advice. A body should never be left alone at the morgue at night. After all, it might become slab happy. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Whistling Legs by Roman McDougald. Yes, and let me tell you about next week's Inner Sanctum story. Directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. You know, usually our stories are about people who live six feet under the ground. But for next week, we've dug a lot deeper. In fact, it takes place in China. <laughs> and as a special added attraction, we've unearthed a new kind of character for you. Unearthed is right. This guy's been dead for 20 centuries. <laughs> and now it's time to close the squeaking door, so... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm-hmm. Ladies, if your child comes home from school for lunch, you want to give him a quick but appetizing meal. And that's why you should serve Lipton's noodle soup. You see, Lipton's takes no time to prepare, and yet it has a fresh-cooked, old-fashioned, chickeny flavor. And is just swimming with tender golden egg noodles. Your children will love Lipton's grand homemade taste. So don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you in through the squeaking door to another half hour of horror. Come in, won't you? Sit down. I hope you'll forgive me if I don't get up, but I'm terribly tired. I spent last night with a friend who's a book collector, specializes in bestsellers. He certainly showed me some interesting ones. In fact, he tried to bury me in one. Because all the very best sellers have corpses in them. <laughs> Why, that's downright silly. Most sellers do not have bodies in them. But of course they have, Mary. You know the old saying, even the walls have ears. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> you certainly don't make a house sound homey at all. Why don't you talk about the kitchen with its good, warm smells of homemade food? Yes, and while you're at it, you should mention Lipton tea, because Lipton's makes good food taste better. You see, folks, Lipton's has a brisk flavor. And brisk means that Lipton tea always tastes fresh and full-bodied, tangy and spirited, never flat or wishy-washy. That's why Lipton's is such a grand drink at mealtimes, and why it's the perfect beverage to serve when you're entertaining. That's right. That brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. So, folks... Try Lipton's, won't you? And now, friends, if you're willing to gamble with your peace of mind, put out the lights and listen to Death by Scripture. It's an original radio play by that old grave digger, Robert Newman. Yes, and our star tonight is Stefan Schnabel, who plays the role of Stefan. The place is China. Somewhere near the outskirts of Shanghai, a man-made wasteland ravaged and devastated by war. 
Driving through an abandoned village on his way to a camp for displaced persons is Major Roger Mason. Suddenly, the glare of his headlights picks out a strange, wild-eyed figure who stares and scuttles into the shelter of an alley. Mason hesitates for only a moment, then stops his team. Hello there. Come back here for a minute, will you? Hello. Okay, if you want to make a game out of it. This alley somewhere. Oh, there you are. Please. Please, Master, please. I mean no harm. Easy, Uh, easy now. No one's going to hurt you. Certainly not me. I'm an American on my way to Camp 14. Camp 14? The camp of refugees, displaced persons. I know. I was there. Yes, I thought so. How was it they let you leave? They did not let me. I... I ran away. Oh? Why? Because to stay would have meant death. Seems to me it would be a lot more dangerous to go wandering around here. Suppose I take you back there with me. No. No, no, please. I tell you, there's nothing to be afraid of. You think not? (laughs) Very well. What can man do against fate? I tried. You're a witness that I tried. But I warn you, if I go back, it will mean death. Not just for me, but for others. Many others. Tommy? Dr. Corner? Yes. I'm Major Mason. I... Major Mason. I am very happy to meet you. Welcome to Camp 14. I'm very glad to meet you, too. I've heard a great deal about you. The job you've been doing here. Oh, Dad. There was not much I could do when we were all prisoners. But now that we have been freed and are beginning to get food and medical supplies, it is almost like a holiday. May I present Miss Mia Singh, who has been assisting me? Major Mason? Miss Singh? I brought someone here with me, someone I picked up on the road and... Stefan. I did not want to come back. He made me. Well, then he does come from the camp here? Yes, of course. A curious case. We have never been able to discover his last name or even his nationality. We have many kinds here, you know. White Russians, Koreans, Siamese, Burmese. Stefan, why did you do it? Why did you run away? Because I, I was afraid. Because of this. Another one. That same paper. What is it? We found about a dozen of them scattered around the camp this afternoon. But read it. You have not escaped. There is no escape. Do you recognize this symbol here? Japanese Black Dragon Society. It says there is no escape. And it's true. I tried to escape, and what happened? He brought me back. Our benefactor. Our savior. I told you there was nothing to be afraid of, Stefan. Afraid? Is death something to be feared? It is the one escape they cannot take from us. Death. To sleep. To rest. Mm. To rest. He's really in a pretty bad state. Couldn't you put him up in the administration building? Mm. That might be exactly what they want. Uh, What do you mean? It is not like the Black Dragon Society to warn someone they mean to kill. But suppose they don't know exactly who they do want. Wouldn't they do what they seem to have done? Make a general threat and see who showed fear, who did run away. The war is over, Cornell. The major is right, Doctor. Are we still living in the past? And we do have a room here where we can put Stefan. The one down the hall. Very well. But remember, I warned you. I, too, think it will mean death. <laughs> Stefan. Stefan. The door is not locked, Major. Come in. I didn't know whether I'd be disturbing you. Whether you were asleep. Sleep? I never sleep. Never. You're feeling better, though, aren't you? Safer? It is at least quiet. A man can think. I was lying here... Trying to remember. Trying to remember what? If I knew, I would know everything. 
but I don't know. There is much that I can remember. Such as what, Stan? The first one. The greatest one. Many lifetimes ago. The garden with a wall around it. The torchlight bright on their breastplates and helmets. And his face. Then the hill. The place of skulls. The earth shaking. Stop it, Stefan. Whatever it is, you're talking about it. It's horrible. Horrible, yes. But true. Those I can remember. I can't ever forget. But what I can't remember is now who I am, what I must do, and why. It will be horrible, too. As bad as the others, but I... Look, Stephen, I... you're a sick man. Now, you've got to rest. You've got to stop thinking, brooding. I'm going to get you something, some medicine. That will help you to sleep. Then when you're strong again, we'll take you away from here. Sleep? I told you I do not sleep. I cannot sleep. No? We'll see about that. I'll be back in a few minutes. Sleep. He does not believe that it is not for me. Not even the final one, which is dreamless. What's that? Outside the door. This door. But who... Who is that? Who is there? No! No, no, no! Yes, down at the end of the hall there, Stefan's room. Come on, quick. Major Mason, here. This way, down here. It sounded like shots, as if... It was. Look. Dave. No, don't touch him. Let me see. Dead. Unless he's not flesh and blood. Three slugs right over the heart. Must have been fired right from the door there, and... Good Lord. What is it? His pulse, still there. Where's your surgery? Right next to the office, what there is of it. Here, help me carry him in there. We'll operate immediately. Swab. The collector right there. That's it. He must have. Clamp that off. You don't have another one, Major. Suit you then. Tie it. How's his pulse? Weak, but steady. Not a swab. That's it. Mm. Oh, I don't dare probe. Forceps. It, it is almost in the vena cava. No worse than the others. It's absolutely impossible. No one will believe it. But he's still alive. There. The last one. If it does pull through... He even holds out for a couple of hours. I believe anything. How is he, Mia? I don't believe it either. But he's better. His pulse is still strong and there are no signs of shock. I'll stay with him for a while. You go get some sleep. No, I, I'm all right. I'd like to stay until we are sure that... <gasps> Major, look. He's coming to. No. Don't make me come back. Don't make me do it again. Don't. Hello, Stephen. I see him. What? Oh, yes. The American. Why are you looking at me like that? Because you have no right to be alive now. And you wouldn't be if it were not for him. I never had any right to be alive. But I am. And I won't die. I told you I wouldn't. I couldn't. Until I do what I have to do. And what's that? It is coming to me. Slowly. I'm beginning to remember... I do not see it all yet. But I know what it will mean. Vultures and blood. Coffins and death. 
starting to get somewhere. But I wish our friend with a bad memory would stop talking about what he has to do and do it. Here we are halfway through our story with only one shooting and no corpses. Things don't pick up. I'm going to get in there myself and show them how to pour gore. My goodness, aren't you ever satisfied? I've had the creeps ever since this story started. I just refuse to think about what's going to happen next. Well, as the doctor said, as he sewed himself up, suit yourself. <laughs> what an awful pun. Brr. Why, Mary, did you say brisk? <laughs> I did not say brisk, and I'll thank you not to make fun of that word, because it's a mighty important word in the language of tea experts. Yes, brisk. B-R-I-S-K is the word they use to describe the flavor of Lipton tea. Because Lipton's always taste fresh and tangy, never flat or insipid. That's why it's the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world. Well, folks, you just don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. Oh, don't say that, Mary. Not till you've tried some of my special brew, tea and tea. Uh, terror, nightmare, and trouble. <laughs> It is the next evening, about ten o'clock at night. The dust-laden wind still wails around the lonely camp, and the refugees from many nations sit huddled in their rooms. Stefan, his face gaunt and drawn, is sitting propped up in bed in the administration building. Are sure you feel well enough to talk, Stefan? There is pain, but that does not matter. What is it you wish to know, Major? You were shot, Stefan. You know that. Did you see who it was that shot you? Yes, I saw. But that is not important. It does not matter. What do you mean, it does not matter? Just that, Doctor. You see, much has come back to me. Not who I am, but what I must do. And I know now that I have nothing more to fear. That I was shot by a mistake. Mistake? What the doctor said last night about the Black Dragon Society was quite true. There are two men here in the camp for whom the Japanese have been searching for years. Men who have been leading the resistance movement in their own countries. Even now, the Black Dragon Society feels that those two men must die. Do you know who they are? Yes. Do not mention their names. Do not even think them. You know who they are, don't you, Mia? One of them is your own father, Ram Singh. And the other is Pao Tung. Is that true? Yes. It is true. Then I think we ought to go see them at once. Make provisions to get them away from here. is the situation, gentlemen. And I should like to have you escorted to Shanghai as soon as possible. You are very kind, Major. We felt that our best protection lay in anonymity. We may have been wrong. As for the danger, even though Japan has been beaten, not all the members of the Black Dragon nor their agents have been rounded up. So... Nonsense, Ram Singh. You always were too cautious. The Major is right. We should have declared ourselves... Return to our countries at once. I, for one, will be happy to do so now. Good. There are a few things in my room I would like to get first. It will not take but a moment. I will meet you back here. Fine. You still look worried, Father. Do I? Perhaps I am. After all these years, waiting, working, suffering, to be so close to what I waited and worked for. But what is there to be afraid of? The Major has promised you protection? I know, and I'm profoundly grateful. But I keep wondering how Stefan knew. What was that? Out in the compound, and it sounded like... Oh, Tung. Stay here, both. No, wait, I'm coming with you. Father, you stay here. Lock this door and do not let in anyone unless you know who it is. Major Mason! Major Mason, where are you? Over here. This blasted dust is so thick. 
Who's that? Karnoff. You heard it too? Yes. Sounds as if it came from... There he is. Parapu. Yes. Dead? Very. Throat cut from ear to ear. No. No, he... He just left us. He was only gone a minute. That minute was all somebody needed. Dr. Kornov, Ramsey. Major Mason asked me to take you up to the administration building. Oh, uh, just a second. That, that scream out in the compound, uh, was it? Yes. Pao Tong. And, uh, and was he... Yes. Killed. That is why the Major wanted me to come and get you. To put you somewhere where you would be safe. You are ready? Yes. For Pao Tong... To have lived through so much, waited for so long, then... Is it known who did it? No, not yet. But they are closing the gates. Whoever it was will find it difficult to get away. Will they? I wonder. In this dark, where the dust so thick you can hardly see. Besides, suppose it is not someone from outside. Suppose it is someone... From the camp here. Someone who has been here for a long time. We... Oh. Dr. Kunov! Dr. Kunov, where are you? Dr. Kunov! Huh. Must have lost him as we came through the alley. With this wind. Dr. Kunov! Is that you? Who is it? Answer me! Tell me who it is! Oh, oh. Open the door for me, will you, Mia? Of course, Major. Where are you going to put him? Here. Right here, in the office. You told the guards at the gate? They are closed now. No one will get out. But... Stefan, what are you doing up? You should not be out of bed. I... I heard something outside. A cry, and I had to see. Which one is it? Partoon. Dead? Yes. His throat cut. And the other? Your father, Mia. Dr. Kronoff went to get him. He is bringing him here where he will be safe. Now go back inside to bed. Father? Dr. Kronoff? Kronoff. Where is your father? Isn't he here? Oh. Why, no. You were going Didn't to... Didn't you go get him? Yes, yes, I did. We started across the compound together, but it was so dark... The dust was so thick, I lost him. I called to him, looked for him, and when there was no answer, I thought he had gone on ahead. Now stay here, all of you. I'll go. I... I'm sorry, me. Why? Why are you looking at me that way? And what are you sorry about? I am sorry that we became separated, that I lost him. I am sorry that he's dead. Dead? How can you say that? Because he must be dead. Because it's part of the pattern, the cycle... That is enough, Stefan. Come on. I will take you back inside. You're a very sick man. Yes, you should not. Yes, I'm sick. Not as sick as some, but sick enough. I won't go back, though. Not yet. I must wait. I'm not sure for what, but... I know I must wait for something. Listen... Major Mason? Yes. You found him? Yes. Yes, I found him. Father. Father. I told you. I knew. He had to be dead. Yes. Yes, he had to be dead. I think I knew it, too. Knew it was hopeless from the very beginning. How... How did it happen? Strangled. Like this. Strangled. Dying out there in the darkness. 
two of them killed within a few short minutes, and, and we still do not know. That's not completely true, Mia. You, you mean you know? Your father and Pao Tung were around here for a long time. They died because Stefan revealed their identity. That means the murderer had to have access to that information. He had to know precisely where they were and when they were going to be alone. And he had to be able to get at the medical supplies here. The medical supplies? Because Pao Tung's throat was cut with a scalpel. And your father was strangled with a catcut suture. And that means... I Don't move, didn't... Connor. Had you covered since I came in? Dr. Kornoff. No, I, I do not believe it. Thank you, my dear. I am sure that there will be quite a few others who will feel that same way. Stefan, you saw who shot you. Who was it? He. Kurnoff. You too, eh, Stefan? Well, I have a little something here I'd like to show all of you. Something Major, that... look out! Oh! oh. Quite fast enough, Kornoff. At least you saved us the trouble of a trial. As for you, Stefan... Do not blame him, Major. It was not his fault. Not his fault? It was he who exposed your father in Pao Tong. I know. But I think I also know why he did it. You know? Then tell me in heaven's name. Here. This should not come from me, but... Take it. Money? You are giving me money? Yes. Silver. The amount may not be exactly right, but... Now, do you understand? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And bless you. I do understand everything. What I have done is what I must do. What does he understand? Why did you give him that money? There was once someone else who betrayed a friend and was paid for it with silver. Thirty pieces, to be exact. You mean? Yes. In the Bible. One Judas Iscariot. What that? That's mad, insane. Are you implying that he... That that's why he didn't die when he was shot? That he's eternal, immortal? I do not know. Perhaps he is not always the same. Perhaps in each crisis, in every period of history, there is always one who must play the role of the betrayer, even against his will. But this much I do know. That he is not immortal. Wait a minute. I just remembered the story of Judas in the Bible. Come on, quick. What's that? The money I gave him on the floor. And... Good heavens. Yes. Matthew 27, as I recall. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed... And went and hanged himself. Well, that's the kind of character we like to have on this program. A little slow getting started, but he did deliver in the end. Ah, two corpses, plus his own. A nice down-to-earth sort of chap who uh, wound up high in the air with a rope round his neck. Yes, we'll have to see that he's back with us again next week. Rope and all. Hmm? Use the rope? Of course we will. You know our motto, no noose is bad news. <laughs> well, that's not my motto, Mr. Host. Is that so, Mary? Now, don't give me any of your lip tums. <laughs> I certainly won't give you any of my Lipton's. If you want Lipton tea, you can get it at your grocer's, just like anyone else. And by the way, folks, you'll find that it pays to ask for Lipton's in the larger, more economical size packages. That way, you not only save money, but you also make sure that you have a good supply on hand of that brisk-flavored Lipton tea. And you know, 
Lipton's is always welcome. And now here's a word of advice, friend. If you should be invited to spend the weekend with a friend in the country, and he should wake you at midnight carrying a lantern and shovel and invite you to go burying with him, make sure he doesn't mean burying with a you. And when I say you, I do mean you. <laughs> oh, by the way, this Martin Sinner Sanctum mystery novel is The Whistling Leg by Roman McDougall. Yes, the next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a honeymoon couple. Yeah, funny kind of characters to be on this program, eh? Is that what you were thinking? Well, this couple finds a corpse right in the middle of their bed, and they can't ask the corpse to leave, not to its face anyway, because you see, it has no face. <laughs> well, now it's time to close the squeaking door, so good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, here's a modern food with an old fashioned homemade flavor Lipton's noodle soup. You see, Lipton's takes no time to prepare, and yet it's blessed with a real fresh-cooked chickeny taste. And what's more, it's swimming with tender golden egg noodles. That's why Lipton's is such a grand food to give your child when he comes home from school for lunch. Yes, it's quick and it's appetizing. You'll find that children enjoy Lipton's just as much as grown-ups do, because it has the same good spices, the same rich, old-fashioned flavor as the chicken soup you'd make right at home. So, friends, don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friend. This is your host to be in a sanctum. Welcome through the squeaking door. Well, I hope you've spent a nice, quiet week building up your nervous systems. You're going to need plenty of red corpuscles to digest tonight's gory little dish. Hmm? What's that? Oh, you'd like to have a recipe. To a small quantity of apprehension, add a pinch of dismay and cook on a slow fire. Adding dread and panic in appropriate quantities. Then throw in a dose of terror and a whiff of horror and make it boil, brother. Make it boil. Uh, now, here's a personal question. How would you like to go on a honeymoon? Hmm? Well, you're going on one whether you like it or not. Because tonight's story is called Till Death Do Us Part. It's an original radio play by Emil Tepperman. And our stars tonight are Anne Shepard and Larry Haynes. Just look at them. Joe and Nancy Page. Married hardly five hours. And parked at the side of the road by the bank of the old mill stream. And whispering sweet nothings to each other. Living in a fool's paradise. Oh, gee, Nancy, it's wonderful to be married to you. Oh, darling. <laughs> Gosh, if the other clerks at Scott's department store could see us now. I don't want anybody to see us. I just want to be alone with you, Joe, for the rest of my life. Gosh, baby, I hope you don't mind spending a honeymoon in a tourist cabin instead of a swanky hotel. Joe, I love it this way. 
The stream rushing past, the moonlight shining on the bridge, and the woods all around. Joe, hmm? look, there's another car. They're parking on the bridge. Uh-huh. Well, he's turning his headlights out, too. <laughs> you think they've got privacy. Because <laughs> they can't see us parked here. Joe, look. That couple is getting out of the car. Yeah. For a walk on the bridge, I guess. Hmm? wonder if this is their wedding night, too. Oh, that's a gorgeous couple. Joe. What? A couple. They're acting very strange. They're having an argument. Joe. Look, he just took... Look what he just took out of his pocket. Holy mackerel. A gun. He's pointing the gun at her. <laughs> Joe. He shot her in the face. Holy mackerel. No, it can't be. It must be a gag of some kind. But you saw the flashes when he fired the gun. And... See how still she lies. Her body crumbled at his feet. Yeah. He's picking her up. I bet he's going to throw her in the... Joe, don't let him! Let's see, you push my hand down on the horn, he sees us. He's coming across the bridge. Heading for us. What? He knows we witnessed the murder. He's got to kill us, too. Quick, start the car. Stay here before I can turn the car around. Then what do we do? Oh, we'll duck into the woods. Come on. Quick. Let's run. My high heels. I can't run You've fast. you got to. Yes, with these bushes. Get behind this tree. He's getting out of his car. Joe, he has the gun. He means to kill us. He's... He's coming straight for this tree. He knows we're here. Nancy, we've got to run for our lives. Here, take my hand. Come on. He's shooting at us. Run, Nancy. Faster. Faster. Joe, I'm tired. I can't go much farther. We can't stop. He's close behind us. Is he gaining on us? No. Nobody's still after us. Oh, let's stop. Red. No, no, not yet. I saw headlights up ahead. Maybe there's a road. We can only make it. Joe, I'm true. I can't go anymore. Nancy, look. Through the trees. The road. Come on, one last sprint. Here's the, the road. road. Let's stop. I never thought we'd make it. Is he still after us? Coming through the woods? I don't know. We'll stop the first car that comes along. Oh, Joe. Oh, now, take it easy, baby. I was just thinking of that poor girl lying dead on the bridge. Our oh, wedding night, too. Here comes the car. I'll stop it. It isn't stopping. He went right by. Joe. What? I, I, I think I hear something behind us. In the woods. Oh, it's only the wind and the trees. Suppose he should suddenly stop. Step out of these woods with his gun. Maybe, maybe he gave up. Maybe, maybe he went back to take, take care of that body. Our car is there. With our marriage license in the glove compartment and the receipt Mrs. Swenson gave us for the cabin. Yeah. He'll know all about us. Who we are, where to find us. And we don't know a thing about him except his face. The face of a murderer. Come on, Nancy. I think we better start walking. We've got to get to the cabin and phone the police. How much further, Joe? Just around the bend. Oh, I'd like to lie down and sleep right here on the road. Find a way to spend a wedding night. Darling, look. Hmm? We're there. Swenson's cabin. Uh-huh. See, they're all dark. Everybody's asleep. We'll wake up Mrs. Swenson. Use her phone. Joe. What's the matter? Look, in front of our cabin. What? Hey. That's our car. The murderer must have come here by another road to wait for us. I don't see anybody around. Maybe he's in the car. Wait here, I'll go and see. No, no, Joe, Joe, you're kidding. No, don't worry. 
We both saw his face. He's got to kill us both. Don't you see, baby, if I go over there alone, he won't choke till he knows where you are. But, Joe, you... take it easy, will you? You stay back here in the shadows. It'll be all right. It's okay, Nancy. Car's empty. Baby, he's hiding somewhere close by. No, no, we must have skipped out. Why did he bring our car back? Well, he wanted to get away from the bridge. Don't you see, he must have dumped that girl's body in the river, and then he took our car away. No trace. Joe, I'm scared. Maybe he's hiding inside the cabin waiting for us. No, he'd be a sap. One shot would wake up all the people in the other cabins, Mrs. Swenson, too. You know, he'd never get away with it. Come on, we're going in our cabin and get cleaned up, then we'll use the phone. Switch is right here. There. See? There's nobody hiding. Holy mackerel. What? What is it? Oh, over there, on, on the bed. What? <gasps> oh! Oh! The girl's body, oh! with her face shot away, just like we saw on the bridge. <laughs> Imagine coming back to your cabin on your wedding night and finding a corpse on your bed. A beautiful corpse who'd had her face lifted without going to a beauty parlor. <laughs> uh, don't worry, before the night's over, the murderer may have his face lifted too by a rope around his neck. And now let's get back to that cabin. See how Joe and Nancy are getting along with their uninvited visitor, the corpse in their cabin. Yes, it's one of those times when two's company and three's a shroud. <laughs> I wonder what they're going to do with her, don't you? <laughs> now, listen, Nancy, we have to take this over. We're in a jam. For the love of Pete, Nancy, this is no time to faint. Oh, darling, it's awful. Her face shot away. Oh, don't look at her. Here, here, sit down. Joe, what do we do? I don't know. I don't know. I, I have to think. Oh, on our wedding night, to have a thing like this happen. Why did he leave her here? To put us in a spot. The cops will never believe our story. Now they'll think we killed her. We? But, Joe, we never saw her before in our lives. Nancy, we've got to get rid of her. What? Sure, we've got to take her back. Back to the bridge and dump her right back on the murderer. Oh, no, no. It's the only thing we can do. Suppose the cops come here and find her. They'll grill us for hours. They'll hold us for the inquest. It might take a week, two weeks. A fine way to spend a honeymoon in jail. Oh, I never thought of that. Sure, we've got to do it. We've got to take her back. But that means we have to lift her up and carry her. I'll carry her, baby. You, but you'll have to help. Oh, no, I couldn't. You've got to, honey. What must I do? Now, look. You go out and get the back door of the car open, and I'll bring her out. Joe. Oh, they'll find us here with a body. Quick, throw the blanket over her. I'll see who no, it is. No, I can't go near Do her. Do as I say, quick. I'll try. Give me a minute. Uh, uh, who is it? It's I, Mrs. Swenson. It's Mrs. Swenson. Have you got it covered up? The blanket, it's too short. Uh, just a minute, Mrs. Swenson. Her feet are sticking out. Get those clothes out of the valise. Throw them on top of her. That's the best I can do. All right, sit on the bed in front of her feet. Please, hurry, Mr. Payne. Uh, coming, Mrs. Swenson. Everything okay, Nancy? Yes, but I feel faint. Oh, bite your lip. Do anything, but don't faint now. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Swenson. Uh, good evening, Mr. Page. I hope I'm not intruding. I saw your light, so I knew you weren't asleep yet. Oh, we, we were just going to sleep. Uh, weren't we, Nancy? Yes, yes. <laughs> I should have thought you'd be asleep long ago. See, I brought you a jug of my own homemade apple cider. I'll put it right here, and some glasses, too. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Swenson. That's awfully nice of you. Oh, yes. not at all. It's so nice to have a honeymoon couple. I, I wanted to do it earlier, but my heart was bothering me. I have a bad heart, you know. Oh, I I'm terribly sorry to hear that, Mrs. Swenson. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for everything. Well, aren't you going to try my cider? 
I thought you'd like to drink a toast. Well, we're, we're not very thirsty right now, Mrs. Swenson. Uh, are we? Are we, Nancy? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. Of course not. Uh, now, I'll run right along and leave you both strictly alone. Yes. Well, well good night, Mrs. Swenson, and thanks again. Good night, Mrs. Swenson. Oh, you poor dear. You look all tuckered out sitting there on the bed. I bet you don't even know how to make up a bed. Here, I'll make it up for you. Oh, no, no. Well, it's the least I can do. Now, now, you just sit over oh, here no. on the chair. No, right? please don't. Oh, why? Well, she means, she means, please don't bother. Well, it's no bother at all. Oh, now, look at all those clothes all thrown around. Oh! What? What's this? We, we can explain everything, Mrs. Swenson. Shot! She's been shot in the face. Murder! No, no, please, oh. Mrs. Swenson, it's not what you... Murder! No, no. You, you know, honeymoon. No. You're murdering. No, we... Please! Stop please. that. Let me go. Let me go. Shut up. Let me go. Stop that. Joe, look out. She's fluttering her. Joe, your hands. I'm just look trying out. to stop her yelling. Please, Mrs. Swenson. Stop it. Went limp and slid down on the floor. Mrs. Swenson. Mrs. Swenson, are you all right? Mrs. Joe. What, what is it? She. She. She's dead. Joe. You killed her. You smothered her to death. I'm a murderer. Me, Joe Page, a killer. We started out on a honeymoon, and now, now I'm a murderer. <laughs> I'm a murderer, isn't that a laugh? Joe. Oh, I, I, I was kind of dizzy for a second. Joe, please, please, darling, you look like a ghost. You're trembling. Nancy, what are we going to do? I, are, are you sure she's dead? Yeah, yeah. Look at her face. Sure she's dead. And that one on the bed. We're in a jam, Nancy. In a jam. Oh, darling, I... I wish I were dead, too. Don't hold us for murder, Nancy. But it was an accident. You didn't mean to kill Mrs. Swenson. Yeah, but how will we ever prove we didn't kill the other one, too? We'll never be able to find that guy with the black road, so the cops will pin the rap on us. Don't take me out of here. I can't stand it. Her on the bed, Mrs. Swenson on the floor. Let's go way far away. You mean run away? Yes. Anything but let's not stay here. I won't go to jail. I won't take me away. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, we'll get out. We'll, We'll keep going. Nobody knows our names. They can't trace us. No. Come on. Get the clothes packed. Joe. I can't close this valise. I'll close it. You get the other one packed. And don't forget anything. Look under the bed. Yeah. Be sure we don't leave a single thing behind. No, no we mustn't, mustn't leave anything behind. Everything's packed, Joe. Hurry now. Hurry. Yeah, all right. I'll take the bags. You put the lights on. Yeah. You snap the catch. We'll lock the door. Hey. What? What's wrong? I just thought. Our fingerprints. All over the place. What do we do? We have to wipe them off. Off everything. Grab a towel. We'll wipe everything in sight. <laughs> Wiped everything, Joe, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, the bedstead? Yeah. Uh, the bathroom? The, the faucet? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the doorknobs? Dresses? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the water pitcher? Yes. Well, I guess that's all. Let's go. Joe! Huh? Cider jug. We didn't wipe the cider jug. Well, we didn't touch it. I'll, I'll wipe it anyway. Okay. Snap it up, will you? Okay. All right. Come on. Oh, I'll feel better in the car out on the road. Got anything? I don't know. I can't think. I'm numb all over. Oh, my darling. Oh, you mackerel, Nancy. I'm a murderer. A killer running away. 
No, we, we, we shouldn't have done it. We shouldn't have run away. Still, it's not as if you killed her on purpose. It was an accident. Nancy, do you realize you're married to a murderer? No. No, it wasn't murder. It was, it was so easy. So easy to kill. I never thought it could be so easy. All I did was to hold my hand over her Joe. face. Joe, please. What time is it? Uh, it's almost two o'clock. We've been driving for an hour. Got a cigarette? Yeah. I think there are some in the glove compartment. Yeah, I'll get them. Joe. What? Our marriage life. It's gone. What? You sure? It's gone, Joe. It was right here. The murderer. He took it. Why? Why would he take our marriage life? I, I don't know. I can't think straight anymore. Joe. He knows our names. He knows everything about us. Darling, there's no use running away. He knows who we are. We'll always be at his mercy. Oh, I feel all in. I, I can't drive anymore. I, I've got to rest and think. Pull up at the side of the road. Look, see? Uh, up ahead, a gas station close for the night. We'll park there. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I wish I could sleep. I wish I could sleep for a hundred years. My poor Joe. Here, put your head on my shoulder. <laughs> First night of our honeymoon. And maybe the last. Joe, it's six o'clock. Uh, oh. Hey, it's daylight. Yeah. Gosh, I slept all through the night. I guess I fell asleep, too. Oh, it's chilly. Yeah. You should have closed the windows. Gee, honey, you look pretty with your hair messed up. <laughs> Gosh, your hands are cold. Here, let me warm them. This is our first morning together. Yeah. Yeah. First morning together. But this isn't the way I used to dream about it. Oh, baby, how'd we ever get in a mess like this? We're back where we were last night in the same jam. Nothing's changed. Those two corpses still in the cabin. What'll we do? Darling, let's not think about it for a while yet. Let's go find a place for breakfast. Our first breakfast together. After that, we'll go back to thinking about it. But at least l let's have those few minutes of a sort of stay of execution. Yeah. Yeah, baby, okay. Look, there's a place. A diner. Yeah, but I haven't got much appetite. What we both need is something hot. You think there's an alarm out for oh, us no, yet? Darling, let's not think about it. No other customers inside this place. Good morning. You've been traveling all night? Yeah, yeah, all night. Uh, some scrambled eggs, please. Right. That'll take a few minutes. That's all right. We'll wait. Well, I'll turn the radio up for you. Station with the early morning local news. During the night, death came to Mrs. Hannah Swenson, whose tourist yeah. cabins are located yeah, yeah, on the Bay it. Park Highway. Mrs. Swenson's body was discovered by Oscar Jansen, the handyman, who was awakened by the sound of a car driving away from one of the cabins. Investigating, he found Mrs. Swenson lying on the floor of cabin three. Dr. Macklin, who was summoned immediately, announced that Mrs. Swenson had died of a heart attack. Uh, he had been treated for a severe heart ailment. A heart attack, and I didn't kill her. He didn't say anything success. about the other body. Oh, she's quiet. The state police are anxious to contact a couple who occupied the cabin and who apparently left during the night. They are traveling in a blue four-door sedan, license number 8N1637. 
Their names are not known as yet, but if they should hear this broadcast, they are requested to call at the state police barracks. Let's get out of here, Nancy. State police are Say, what about your age? Uh, can't wait. We're in a hurry. Come on, Nancy. What does it mean? Why didn't he mention the other body? The trap, honey. Get it? They're, they're keeping mum about the girl's no, no, body. No, 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 Joe, I don't think so. Well, what else could it be? We left two bodies there, didn't we? Darling, stop the car, please. Maybe the, the real murderer was waiting close by all the time. Maybe after we left, he went in and took the girl's body away again. I don't like it. I want to get away from here. Far away. Joe, Joe, wait. Look, darling, don't you realize you're not a murderer? You didn't kill Mrs. Swenson. It was a heart attack. That's what they say. I say it's a trap. Let's get moving. Come on. No, it, it's too late. Look. State troopers. Yeah, he's coming right over here. Sure, he's got this license number. Well, baby, I, I guess our honeymoon's over. Are you Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Page? Yeah, yeah. You're Joe Page? Yeah, that, that's, that's right. And you, lady, you're Nancy Page? Yes. Well, then, this belongs to you. What? What is it? Take it. Um, how did you like... What? Where'd you get it? One of our men happened to be cruising down by the old mill stream last night. Saw a fella get out of a roadster on the bridge carrying a girl's body. Fella dumped the girl over the rail and our man went after him. They had a gunfight and the fella got a slug through the heart. When we went through his car, we found this. On the back of it, you notice he wrote your license number. Then you got the murderer? Sure did. But we didn't recover the body of the girl. It was carried downstream. May take several days to find it. Then... Then we're not wanted for anything? Well, your other folks were in Mrs. Swenson's cabin last night. We figure you left in a hurry. Kind of embarrassing to have a thing like that happen on your honeymoon, huh? Can't blame you. Oh, uh, we're free to go on our honeymoon? Just come down to the barracks and sign a statement, and then you can be on your way. Uh, uh, would you mind, officer, just a few minutes? We want to go back in the diner for a honeymoon breakfast. Say, what's going on here? Two measly murders. And a happy ending. I was hoping Joe and Nancy would end up in a cell with a warden asking them what they wanted for their last meal. What do I get instead? A wedding breakfast. Ah, the crowd down at the morgue are going to laugh at me for this. It won't be their last laugh either. No, they had that already. <laughs> yes, I have a feeling that somebody's been tampering with tonight's story. I'm an expert on rugs. You see, I'm a cat. And my favorite place to sleep is on a scatter rug. That's why they call me Ruggy. Now, one place you don't want to put a scatter rug is at the top or bottom of the stairs. If you slip on a rug on your way up or down, you can fall and go, Meow! So, take it from me. Keep those rugs away from the stairs in your quarters and put them where cats like me can sleep in perfect peace. And now a parting word of advice, friends. Our solution for eliminating crime. The perfect way to prevent any murderer from committing murder is to commit the murderer before he commits the murder. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is The Whistling Leg by Roman McDougall. And now it's time to close the squeaking door, so good night. Pleasant dreams. and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Boris Karloff. Good evening.
evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host. Welcome again through the squeaking door to another session of mystery, murder, and madness. Oh, excuse me if I don't get up, but I'm all worn out. Yes, I've had a hectic few days with an old friend who just blew into town. He's one of those earnest souls who insists on doing everything for himself. Consultations with the monument makers, the grave diggers, fittings of the coffin maker. Yes, quite a busy body. But then we only die once, you know. <laughs> oh, these friends of yours, they're such unhappy people. They never seem to enjoy life. Never seem interested in any of the quiet, peaceful, good things of life. For instance, what's the use of telling one of your spooky characters about Lipton tea? They wouldn't like it. But other people enjoy that brisk Lipton flavor. They settle back in an easy chair and say to themselves, Mmm, Lipton certainly has a rich, hearty flavor. Never the least bit wishy-washy. No siree. But would a ghost appreciate Lipton's? Indeed, he would not. And it's lucky Lipton's is made for real live folks who like good things. Or else it wouldn't be the world's largest selling brand of tea. Mary, you've been very hard on my friends. Very. And they won't like it. But then most live folks don't enjoy being scared to death. And that's just what's going to happen to you tonight. Our story is called The Corridor of Doom. It's an original radio play written by Robert Newman. And our star tonight is a man who gives even me the shakes. The famous star of stage, screen, and radio, Boris Karloff. Have you thought about death lately? Not the fact that it's inevitable, that it must come to all of us someday, but rather how it will come. Do you think of it as a sleep and a waking, of a sudden transition from one state of being to another, or to a state of non-being? John Clay was one of those people who never thought about it at all, until he found himself walking down that dim and endless passage which... But suppose we let Boris Karloff in the role of John Clay tell you about it himself. If your blood pressure will take it, put out the lights and come on a little trip down the corridor of doom. When I woke up, I had no idea of where I was or how I'd gotten there. I was lying on a hard white bed in a clean white room. There was a dull pain in my abdomen. Touching it tentatively, I felt a bandage. So that was it. An operation. But for what? And where was I? At that moment, the door opened. And she came in. Good afternoon. Or is it evening? Whichever you prefer. It doesn't matter. My name's Clay. John Clay. Yes. And yours? You can call me Nada. Exactly. Where am I? In what hospital? It has no name. What? But that's ridiculous. I'd like to speak to Dr. Rogers. If you'll get him for me, please. There is no Dr. Rogers. At least, not here. Then who operated on me? And for what? Listen... <laughs> I'm not a well man. I've a very bad heart. Will you get someone who can talk to me? If you wish. I'll call Dr. Stone. A chill crept through my bones. It wasn't cold. It was fear. Unreasoning and abysmal fear. The door opened again. And there stood a heavy-set man, his hair flecked with grey. And with him, my son-in-law, Alex Bartlett. Alec, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Hello, Father. But why are you standing out there? Why don't you come in? Oh, no. No, I... I... shouldn't advise it, Mr. Clay. And why not? And why... Oh, is it you who operated on me? Yes. I'm Dr. Stone. Why wasn't Dr. Rogers called in? He's taken care of me for years. There wasn't time. It happened during the night. Acute appendicitis. And even as it was... Even as it was? What? And why are you dressed that way, Alec? All in black. Well, it's customary. 
After all, you are my father-in-law. Of course I am, but... Now, look, Alec. You've got to stop being so mysterious. You know about my heart, what any sudden shock will do. I don't think you need worry about that anymore, Mr. Clay. And as far as the mystery is concerned, this initial period of adjustment is always a little difficult. Difficult? Do you realize what it's like, lying here helpless, completely isolated, as if I were all alone in the world, or... Isn't there someone I can talk to? Some of the other patients? Not just yet. When the time comes, you'll meet them. But... Look, Doctor, I can't stand much more of this. I can't. If I don't find someone who really cares about me, who'll treat me like a normal human being... My dog. How about my dog? What do you think, Doctor? Yes, that's possible. We'll see what we can do, Mr. Clay. Come along, Bartlett. Goodbye, Father. You... You'll be back, won't you, Alec? I don't know. I'll try, but it's difficult. Very difficult. Then, then don't go, Alec. Don't leave me here all alone. Come back. Come back. I waited and watched. Watched and waited. Then the door opened and there was the doctor again. There was a small, thin-faced man with him this time, wearing the white coat of an orderly and carrying a black box with a handle. My dog! You brought my dog! All right, Martin. Give it to him. Yes, sir. Here you are, oh, sir. thank heaven. Now, at least. Come on, Carrie. Come on, boy. Get up. Wake up. Why, what's the matter? Carrie! He... He's not asleep. He's dead. You wanted him, Mr. Clay. But... But why didn't you tell me? When did he die? How? How old was he? Eleven and a half. Maybe twelve. Pretty old for a dog. That's probably why he could come. What do you mean? What are you trying to do to me? Don't you realize I'm a sick man? Easy, easy, Mr. Clay. I won't take it easy. I won't stay here another minute. I'm leaving right now. Sorry, but I don't think we can permit... Oh, well, we'll see about that. You're getting yourself all upset for no reason, Mr. Clay. Making it very difficult for the rest of us. Martin, you'd better let me have some of that that bottle there. About ten cc's. The uh, red medicine? Yes. I... I don't want any medicine. I, I won't take it. Now, please, Mr. Clay. I won't, I tell you. No, I, I don't want the... I... It, oh, it's awful. Salty. It... It tastes like... Yes. But I think you'll find that it will make things much easier for you. Very much easier. You're... You're doping me up. That's what you're doing. Putting me to sleep. You... I think that when I wake up, I'll, I'll forget about everything. Yes, Mr. Clay. You'll forget about everything. Everything. I was somewhere deep down under the earth. It was a passageway. Stone flagged and with stone walls, and I was walking slowly down it in my bare feet. I could feel the chill of the cold stones through the thick layer of dust. The passageway stretched ahead of me endlessly. And then suddenly, I noticed that there were doors set into the walls on either side. Closed doors. And on each door there was a name. Abel. Abercrombie. Abington. Where was I? What was this place? What was behind those awful, ominously closed doors? Something seemed to be drawing me on, on down the terrible passageway. Addison, Aga, Alan. I could feel the cold creeping up my legs, higher and higher, my heart pounding faster and faster. And suddenly I knew, knew where I was and where I was going. Knew what was waiting for me there ahead of me down the passage. No, exerting all my will, I turned, tried to go back. With a roaring in my ears, I was falling through the darkness. When 
when I opened my eyes, I was in that cold, white room again, clutching the blankets with trembling hands. How do you feel now, Mr. Clay? You cried out, sir, as if... A dream. The most awful, horrible nightmare I ever had. A dream? The doctor will be very interested. Would you care to tell me all about it? Oh, I don't even want to think about it. It was about your former life? For... Former life. Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I meant... Here, where are you going? Get my clothes to get out of here. I won't stay but here. But you can't go. You can't, Martin. Help me. Please, oh, let go. Let go. Let go. Don't you... Oh, don't you realize that if I do stay here, if I dream that dream again... Listen. I was in a passageway. An endless, eternal passageway like a corridor of doom. It stretched on and on to infinity with doors, closed doors on either side. And on each one of the doors in alphabetical order, there was a name. The name of all those who had died since the beginning of time. I was walking down that corridor on my bare feet and... Why? Why are you looking at me that way? You mustn't talk about that. You mustn't, do you hear? But, but you asked me... You didn't dream that dream. You couldn't have... And you've got to get it out of your mind. We, we'll help you. We'll give you a massage. That should make you relax. The alcohol, Martin, right over there. Yeah, a massage? You think that'll help? If it doesn't, we'll call Dr. Stone. Try something else. Martin. I see. Now what? What are you staring at? Your, your feet. On the soles. Dust. Thick, gray dust. <gasps> Dust. Like the dust in the passage, the corridor of doom. And that means. It wasn't a dream. It means. I was really there. Dirty feet on those nice, clean sheets. No wonder our friend the nurse seemed so upset. Or was that the reason? Maybe she was just disappointed that he still hadn't told her about his operation. Yes, that always has them in stitches. Great big stitches. Like the ones they take in a shroud. Mr. Host, I'm afraid I just can't believe this story. I can't believe that it really happened. Is that so, Mary? Do you think Mr. Clay got that gray dust in his feet because he has feet of clay? Hmm? <laughs> there you go again, always looking on the discouraging side of things. I really do believe I'd rather talk to cheerful folk, like those nice young men and women who sang that new Lipton tea song when I was at the studio, sing a song of Lipton's. Yes, that's the way people ought to feel about tea. Because, you know, when you're feeling discouraged or tired, there's nothing quite like that brisk flavor of Lipton tea to perk you up. Yes, brisk means that Lipton's is never wishy-washy. No, no, no siree, as they say in the song. So when you've had a busy afternoon, or maybe when friends drop in for a little talk, pour yourself a cup of cheer with brisk-flavored Lipton tea. It's got a special flavor that always tastes like home. And it always tastes like more, too. Well, now I think it's about time to take another little walk. Yes, down the corridor of doom, with our star, Boris Karloff. And by the way, don't be concerned about getting too tired, because you'll only have to walk one way. That's the nice part of a trip like that. You don't have to worry about coming back. <laughs> I lay there, staring down at my feet. No, it had not been a dream. But there, on my feet was the thick, heavy dust from the corridor of doom. I had been there, walking down its awful silence, not in my mind, but in the flesh. My heart clenched like an icy fist that I threw the blankets aside, started to get up. Mr. Clay, what are you doing? Where are you going? Let me go. But you can't get up. You can't leave. Oh, no, let me go. Martin, quick, say... help me. Please, Mr. Oh, Clay. For heaven's sake, let me go. Don't you realize what this means? If it wasn't a dream, and if I stay here, go down to that horrible place We've again... we to make him quiet down. Some more of that medicine, Martin. Oh. Another 10 cc. Right. Oh, oh no, no more of that. It's here, Mr. Clay. You must take it. You must. It will make you sleep. Sleep so soundly that you won't be able to go down there again. No, but... All right. Give it to me. Here. You stay here, Martin. 
I'll go get Dr. Stone and tell him. Better, Mr. Clay? I don't know. Color. Dark red. Taste. It's like... Yes, I know. And it makes me sleepy. My eyes get heavy and... Have you been here for a long time, Martin? No, not long. What... What is it like... Outside of this room? It's... Strange. Like no place else. And the other patients? What are they like? They're strange, too. Listen, Martin... I'm a rich man. You're the only friend I've got here. You, you've you got to help me. Whether you're rich or poor doesn't matter. As for helping you, that's what I'm here for. You've got to stay here. Watch me. Every minute. My heart. I, I don't think it will stand much more. My first sensation was one of cold, numbing cold, creeping up my limbs. I reached for the blankets, couldn't find them. Then I opened my eyes, and I was there again, back there in that awful endless passage, that corridor of doom. The same stone wall, stone floor, covered with a thick layer of dust. The same doors with a name on each one on both sides of me. But now... Now I was up to the bees. That one there, Baba, next with Babbitt and then Backer. I tried to cry out, but I couldn't utter a sound. I tried to stop, check myself. My muscles didn't respond. Slowly, heavily, I continued walking on down that endless passage. Past Badger, Baffin, Bagley, past the bees and towards the seas. Towards the dawn. My name on it. My heart pulsed, pounding with terror. My breath rasped in my throat. Convulsively, I clutched at the walls, forced myself completely around. Then, as if I were fighting against a roaring gale, I drove myself back. One step I took, two, three, and I stumbled. I was falling again. Falling through darkness, complete, absolute, unending. Even before I opened my eyes, I knew where I was. Back in my room, the sheets crumpled in my sweating hands. I lay there for a moment. I knew that this was my last chance. I knew where I was. Back in my room, the sheets crumpled in my sweating hands. Slipped out of bed, tiptoed to the door of the room, opened it a crack and peered out a hospital corridor. And sitting at a desk halfway down at the nurse. Could I slip past her? Then on a table next to the door, I saw the telephone. A telephone! Now I could get help. Wait someone who would save me. Take me out of this place. Picking it up quietly, I dialed my daughter's number, Alec Bartlett's wife. Hello? Jane? Oh, thank heaven. Hello? Jane, it's your father. Listen, you've got to help me. You've got to come and get me. I'm at the hospital. Alec hello? knows where. Hello, is anyone there? Yes, can't you hear me? Didn't you hear what I said? It's your father. And... Jane, Jane! Hung up. I heard her, but she couldn't hear me. Something wrong with the phone, her phone. I've got to get hold of somebody, somebody, but who? Dr. Rogers? Oh, might be out. And if they come in while I'm phoning... Oh, I know, of course. Police headquarters, Ryan speaking. Hello, police. This is John Clay of Riverside Road. I'm at the hospital. I don't know where. Hello? But... Can't you hear me, officer? For heaven's sake, listen. It's a matter of life and death. John Clay at a hospital. My son-in-law, Alec Bartlett, can tell you where. Hello. Officer, officer, listen. Don't hang up. Don't. Oh, I'm nuts. Officer, officer, hello. Anything the matter, Mr. Clay? Uh, Dr. Stone, uh, your telephone is... There's something wrong with it. No, Mr. Clay. 
There's nothing wrong. Not with the telephone. But, but I tried to make two calls. Two different numbers, and... I know. And you should have known. Nurse, all of them. Should have known what? Why couldn't they hear me when I could hear them? Why? Yes, Dr. Stone? Will you put Mr. Clay back into bed? No. I'm awfully sorry, sir. I only went out for a minute. No. Come on, Mr. Clay. No, no, please. leave me alone. Please, Mr. let Clay, go. Please. No, no, you're struggling. You know that, don't you? <gasps> yes. I know. Doctor, I won't have to go back down there again, will I? Down to the corridor? That's not up to me. All right, nurse. I think we're ready for another dose. The final one. Yes, doctor. No, Doc, no, not that red medicine, not again. I'm sorry, but you've had a lot of time, all the time we can give you. All right, Mr. Clay. No, I won't Here. take it. You know what it means, Doctor. I go back down there again to the corridor. It'll be to the letter C, to the place where my name is. If he won't take it by himself, perhaps you'd better help her, Martin. Yes, sir. No, Here. no, no, I won't, Doc. <laughs> Again, I knew where I was before I opened my eyes. I could feel the dust under my bare feet and through the dust, the biting chill of the cold stones. I was there, back in the corridor, walking down its silent length past the blank, closed doors. But the names on the doors, now they were all C's. Cabot, Cadden, Cahoon. On I walked, the beating of my heart, the pounding of my pulse loud in my ears. On down the passage... No longer even trying to fight against what I knew was in me. On past Cameron, Chelsea, Chiswick, and then... Suddenly, terribly, one door. A door with my name on it, gaping, waiting for me. I tried to stop, to turn, but my legs carried me forward. I was but two doors away. I could see into it now, see that it contained... Nothing... Absolutely nothing, not even a coffin, just stone walls and a flat stone stab. I was turning, turning to step over the threshold. I made a last convulsive effort. Merciful heavens, help me! Save me! All right, Martin. Pick him up. Yes, sir. Is it all over? Hello, Bartlett. In at the death, eh? I'll see if there's any pulse, of course, but... I should think it is all over. It is, Stone, but not the way you think. What? Clay! He, he's not dead. No thanks to you. All right, get him up, both of you. Here, Mr. Clay, let me help you. It's all right, Martin. I'll be fine from now on. But how... Don't look so surprised, Alec. Mr. Martin is a detective. I hired him some time ago. <laughs> you see, I had a feeling that something was wrong when that railing broke accidentally, and I took that bad fall. So I decided I should investigate. You can't prove it. You can't prove anything. The first results of Martin's investigation showed me what bad financial shape you were in. And it was then that I realized that you had actually been trying to murder me to get hold of my money. So I faked that story of having a very bad heart. You, you mean it? I thought it would give you the idea of trying something more subtle and less dangerous. And it certainly did. But you still can't prove anything, not a thing. No, don't you worry about that. Don't forget. Come back here, Bartlett. You'll never have a chance to prove it. Come back, Bartlett. Ah! Oh, you shot him, killed him. Well, I, I couldn't have. I, I fired up in the air to get him to stop. Come on. But I, I don't understand it. Uh, yeah, got a mark on him. But he is dead. He was the one who had the bad heart. That's what gave me the idea of pretending. Good heavens, look. At what? This hallway was supposed to be the corridor of doom. When I reached the door with my name on it, I was supposed to die. Look. Look at the name on that door there. The one right next to him. Bartlett. His name. So what? Nothing, Martin. Nothing at all. <laughs> now, 
where do you think old Dr. Stone got the idea for that little alphabetical graveyard? That's right, for me. Huh? You don't believe me? Then come on home with me tonight and I'll show you the one in the cellar of my house. What's more, I'll show you a door and a neat stone slab with your name on it. Nonsense, Mr. Host. Mr. Clay just explained that the whole thing was a hoax. And I'm not going to sit here and hear you say otherwise. Well, then don't sit. Stand up and we'll take a walk, Mary Bennett. Yes, back to your name. Back to the bees. Baker Bartlett Bennett. <laughs> you don't scare me. Yeah? Well, how would you like it if we went to the L's and found a door marked Lipton? Oh, why, well, that's fine. Inside, we'd find a wonderful, friendly beverage, Lipton's, the tea with the brisk flavor, the tea that's welcome at all hours of the day. Yes, the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world, Lipton tea. <laughs> And now a word of advice. If you should wake up tonight with a sudden chill, find yourself walking barefoot down a dusty stone corridor with doors on both sides of it, don't get excited. Just insist on a doom with a view. (laughs) By the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery Novel is The Whistling Legs by Roman McDougall. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown... And brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about women. Yes, two women who like to be treated rough. Choke them to death, shoot them, murder them. They love you for it. And who do you think is going to be their boyfriend? Hmm? <laughs> That's right. Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff will be with us again next week. Because who else could love such women? So, if you're in a tender mood, tune in next Tuesday. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. It's wonderful how quick and easy cooking can be these days. I guess some of you remember when it used to take half a day to make a pot of chicken noodle soup. But now we have Lipton's noodle soup mix. You might say Lipton's takes no time at all to prepare, and yet it has a a fresh cooked chickeny taste, a real old-fashioned homemade flavor. Yes, and it's brimful of tender golden egg noodles. Lipton's is grand for quick meals, and it's also a perfect beginning for the most elaborate dinner. So don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present... Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Boris Karloff. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door into the land of ghosts, vampires... Another gay, hilarious people. Friends, are you looking for an apartment? Well, we have just the place for you. It's sturdily built, completely of marble, with cold running water every time it rains. You don't have to worry about the landlord putting you out. The lease is forever. All you have to do to get this little love nest is call your undertaker and get yourself a little bit dead. (laughs) <laughs> Mr. Host, I assure you, no one is the least bit interested in your offer. But, Mary, just think. 
Once you're dead, you can appear on Inner Sanctum. You know, we always have a ghost in our story, someone whose voice comes back from the grave and gives advice to our characters. Yeah, sometimes I think our theme song should be, My Mummy Done Told Me. <laughs> Why, that's very funny. <laughs> but you know, Mr. Host, talking about voices coming back, that's what happened to me the other day. I heard my own voice coming back to me on the radio while I was eating breakfast. No. Yes. I just heard the new Lipton jingle, and then I heard myself. Yes, there I was, talking about Inner Sanctum and about Lipton Tea, too. Hmm. You see, it was a record, uh, an electrical transcription that I'd made, all about Lipton's brisk flavor, how Lipton's always tastes fresh and full-bodied, never wishy-washy. And you know what? There was a man on the record who talked almost like you, Mr. Host. An imposter. I'll kill him. Oh, it was just in fun. He made spooky remarks when I talked about Lipton tea. <laughs> but I did get a chance to say that Lipton's is the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world. All right, Mary, you've had your chance. And I'll make room for the creepiest voice you ever heard. The curdling kid himself, the star of stage, screen, and radio, Boris Karloff. <laughs> Tonight's story is called The Wailing Wall. It's an original radio play by Milton Lewis. And you'll hear Boris Karloff in the role of Gabriel Hornell. All set, friends. Then turn out the lights, curdle close to the fire, and listen. Night. And on the waterfront of downtown Manhattan, the fog creeps in like a crawling cloud. Tucked in between the towering skyscrapers, there's an old rundown mansion. An anachronism, a freak among the streamlined giants. It's the Hornell home. And tonight, leaping tongues of flame from behind the black shutters. Yes, it's Johnny. Is there anybody in that old dump? It's an old guy lives here, don't you? Gabriel Hornell. I hope he had sense enough to get out. That place is like a tinderbox. Yeah, and pretty well gone. Yes, get that horse. Hey! hey, there is someone in there. Get the action. Come on. I'm right behind you. What? Get out of the way. Ah! Hurry, will you? Ah! I knocked the door. All right, come on in. You see anyone in there? No. We can't see. Ah! Hey, ah! there he is. Oh, that crazy coat. He didn't even have sense enough to get out. Here. Grab a short. Yeah. Oh, don't hold me. We're just taking you out. I don't want to go out. We ain't asking you what you want. Come on, Johnny. Before this joint collapses, oh, take me out. I can't leave the house. Good evening, Mr. Hornell. I hope you're feeling... Mr. Hornell? Mr. Hornell? <gasps> Harry. Hello? Hello, this is Nurse Hopkins on the 18th floor. Gabriel Hornell is not in his room. The window is open from the bottom. It, there's a letter. I know, but I'm sure he's not alive. Oh, the, the letter? Yes, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, to whom it may concern. By the time, By the time you, you read, read this, this, I shall, I shall be, dead. be dead. There can be no mistake this time. Death holds no fear, no terror any greater than what I've endured in life. For the past 40 years, I've searched for freedom. I hope now I've found it. Even now, as I write, I can hear her voice calling to me as she did that night years ago. I'd prepared everything while she was in bed. Just the last few minute little details had to be completed. Gabriel! Gabriel, do you hear me? What do you want? What are you doing down there? I'm... I'm fixing something. Well, why don't you come up? I don't want to be alone here. I can't bear to be alone. Come up, Gabriel. What's the matter with you? Why don't you answer me? Oh, you're just doing it for spite. I know you are. Stop that hammering, Gabriel. You know I can't bear that noise. Now stop it, please. Gabriel, will you stop that noise? Oh. You came down. Well, of course I came down. Did you expect me to lie there while all this racket was going on? Now, you know I'm a sick woman, Gabriel. 
What are you doing there anyhow? You can see. Well, yes, I can see, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, you've made a huge gaping hole in the wall. Now, what on earth did you want to do a thing like that for? You'll find out soon enough. And, and what are all those things? Stonemason's tools, cement, plaster. Well, I never dreamed you knew how to use them. Oh, I'm going back to bed. No, Agnes. No? No. Gabriel, that rope in your hands. Yes. I've thought carefully about this rope, Agnes. It's the most merciful way. It leaves a little trace since there's no blood. Gabriel! You won't make it difficult, will you, Agnes? Murder? It's the only way. No, Gabriel. We couldn't go on like this. Your imaginary illnesses, your constant nagging. I, I have to be free of them, Agnes. But murder? This is best for both of us. No, Gabriel. Send me away. Do anything you want. You can get a divorce. A divorce there, see? That would solve everything. You could have your freedom. Stand there, Agnes. Just as you are. I know. That other woman, Dorothy Carter, that actress. That's why you're doing this. Oh, you thought I didn't know about that, Gabriel. Well, I do. Yes, I do. No. No, let go of me. That rope. Help, somebody. It will be done in a minute. Done? No. You'll never be free of me. As long as you live. The cat saw everything with its yellow eyes. The cat saw me take her body to the tomb I'd made in the wall. The cat saw me place her there and carefully seal it up. I worked quickly, skillfully, with infinite care. First the bricks, one on top of the other, then the plaster. Then the wallpaper to match the rest of the room. That wasn't very difficult. In a short time, it was done. I was free. All I had to do now was to go to the police and report her missing. It was even simpler than I'd thought. I put on the coat. I was about to open the front door when I heard it for the first time. I thought it must be my imagination. I listened carefully. I rushed to the wall, put my ear to it. What I heard made icy perspiration ooze out of every pore of my body. The wail was coming from the wall. It was like the insane shriek of some creature of another world. Was she alive in there? She couldn't be. She was dead. I knew she was dead. And yet I heard her voice wailing. I could swear it was her voice. I couldn't go out as I'd planned. What if someone else should hear it? Would they go to the wall? Investigate? The doorbell. Oh, it couldn't be at this hour. It, it couldn't be, but... Who? Oh, I, I had to risk everything and answer it. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Hornell. It was Patrolman Cleary. He was the officer on the beat. He was blue with cold. I was passing by and I saw the lights on. I peeked in the window. You... you looked in? Yes. Since you were still up, I thought I'd ring. It's a bit of cold out tonight and I'd like to warm these old bones for a minute. Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, of course, Cleary. Don't stand there in the door, man. Come in. Come in. Thank you. I see you got your coat on, Mr. O'Neill. Just got in? Only only a few moments ago. As a matter of fact, I, I was going to see you. See me? Why, yes. It's it's about my wife. Hi, something wrong? I I hope not. I was out all evening. When I got home, she was gone. It's not like her, Mr. O'Neill. No, it, it isn't. Was she alone all evening? Yes, I, at least I think she was. You know, she hasn't been feeling very well lately, and I... Why, oh, I, I hate to think it possible, but... But she may have destroyed herself. Mrs. O'Neill? No, she wasn't a sort... Oh, she was ill, terribly ill. I tried to keep it secret until she recovered, but the doctors knew... Insane? Yes. Don't you see? The river. I'd better get back to the precinct and report this. You'd better come with me. The missing Persons Bureau will... Hey, Mr. O'Neill. Yes? You must be mistaken. 
Isn't that her? That, that isn't a woman. Of course it is. She's coming from that room there. Well, sure, it's your wife. I know her voice, and she sounds like she's in pain. But it can't be. There's no one in that room. But she must have come in the back way. Come, I'll show you. No, don't go in. Huh? Nothing. No. There. You can see for yourself there's no one here. No one. I could have sworn your wife was in this room. How'd you like to live in a house with wailing walls? Well, one thing you have to admit, things aren't so very dead in the Hornell Mansion. Or are they? Well, all I can say is I'm glad I don't have to live in that house with that awful wailing. Why, Mary, there's a wailing, whistling kind of noise in your house, too. The first time I heard it, I was so scared, I shivered in my shroud. What? Oh, you're talking about my whistling tea kettle. Oh, goodness, there's nothing scary about that. Now, if you'd only try Lipton tea with its wonderful brisk flavor, that whistle would sound as cheery to you as birds whistling in the morning. Especially on these chilly mornings when a cup of Lipton's just makes you feel like the sun was shining inside of you. And, folks, if you want a sunny disposition, you should try relaxing with a cup of Lipton tea after a hard job like, well, maybe washing out your window curtains. Yes, and what's more, you can help your friends feel right with the world, too, by serving them Lipton tea when they come to visit you. Mm, Lipton's always taste so tangy and heartwarming, never flat or wishy-washy. Yes, that brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. All right, friends, we've given you a chance to warm your blood... And now we fondly hope to turn it to ice again, with the help of our star, Boris Karloff. Oh, let's hear the second act of Inner Sanctum. We continue with the strange letter left by Gabriel Hornell. Cleary watched in silent fascination as the cat screamed and leaped against the wall. Would he notice the new wallpaper in the dim light? Suddenly, the policeman turned to me. Yes, I... I guess that noise is only the wind. Strange how like a wailing woman it can sound, isn't it? Yes. Well, I'll be leaving now. I guess it'll be all right for you to stay here. I'll make a report at headquarters about your wife. It's very good of you, Cleary. she turns up, you let us know? Yes, I, I'll let you know. Good night, Mr. O'Neill. Good night. He left. I locked the door and came back to the room. The room where my wife was entombed. Was she still alive inside the hollow of that wall? I listened all that night. The wailing rose to a high, insane shriek. And then, towards morning, it began to grow weaker, as though she were losing strength. And it, it seemed to die. The cat crept away. There was a merciful silence in the house. She was dead. She had to be by now. I sank down onto the sofa into a feverish sleep. Somewhere a bell was tolling, calling the mourners to the grave. Suddenly I sat bolt upright, shaking, trembling. Oh, oh, I'd been dreaming. The front doorbell was ringing. It was night again. How long had I slept? The house was silent. Oh, there was nothing to fear now. I ran to the door, opened it. Hiya, kiddo. D Dorothy. Well, are you going to keep me out here in the cold? No, no. Come in. Come in. I, I haven't been... haven't been feeling well, Dorothy. Is that why you forgot our date tonight? I, I must have overslept. What time is it? Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. I must have slept clear through the day. Well, aren't you glad to see me? Glad? Why, yes, it's a, it's a delightful surprise. Well, that's more like you. Come here, kiddo. You've got the blues, but Dorothy will wipe them away. Give us a kiss. Mm -hmm. What? What's that? Just, just the wind. Oh, no, it can't be the wind. This is a very old house, Dorothy. 
You sometimes hear strange noises. Oh, I've never heard anything like that before. Sounds human. Oh, she's still alive. Even after 24 hours, suddenly I realized that the doorbell was ringing again. There was a large pair of wooden sliding panel doors between the room that we were in and the vestibule that led to the street. I wasn't going to take any more chances. There's someone at the door, Gabe. Yes. You wait here, Dorothy. What are you doing? Closing these doors. Why? I'd advise you not to ask too many questions. Evening, Mr. O'Neill. Officer Cleary. Who are those men with you? Hey, I've got something to show you, Mr. O'Neill. You'd better brace yourself. It's not going to be pleasant. All right, bring it in, boys. You can put it over there. What? What is it? It's a body. A woman. Just fished out of the river right near here. She can't be dead more than 24 hours. My wife? Hard to say. You see, the body got caught in the propeller of a boat. and It's not easy to recognize it. Unless it was examined by someone who knew her very well. Like yourself, of course. Uh, let me see it. Take away the burlap. Look, Miss Donnell. <gasps> I know. It's pretty bad. Is... Is it your wife? Agnes? Yes. Yes, of course. It's... It's her. You sure now? Yes, I, I'm sure. Positive. All right, boys. Take it away. You can stay here, Mr. Arnett. I'll take care of everything down at headquarters. Good night. Good night, Cleary. Luck, fate, whatever it is that seemed to control men's lives was playing directly into my hands. They'd never investigate now. The nightmare was over. This time I was really free. Suddenly, the panel door opened. Dorothy was standing there. A curious smile on her lips. I heard everything, kiddo. You did? So you were married. No longer, Dorothy. My wife died. Suicide. So I heard. Now everything will be quite all right and we can get married in a few weeks. We'll have money, lots of money. She left you plenty, eh? She was very wealthy. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> I see what happens to your face when you hear that wail. Did you kill her? What are you talking about? Did you murder her? You heard what he said. She was found in the river. You can fool a dumb copper, but you can't fool Dorothy. That wail. Queer. Awfully queer. Look at what that cat's doing, will you? Jumping up on that wall like it's gone crazy. Yes, there's something about that wall. That's what the cat's trying to tell me. Something about the wall. You better stay away from there, Dorothy. I'm going to find out something. Yeah, put that book end down. Not till I'm done with it, kiddo. What are you doing there? I'm going to break through that wall. You crazy fool, stop it. No! No! Give me that thing. You're too late, Gabe. I've broken a hole through and I'm going to look. Now you've seen. Yes. Is it the hand? The hand of a woman. It's... It's her. Your wife. Yes, Dorothy. You murdered her. Yes. Well, ain't you the kid? What are you going to do about it? What do you think? I want money. Lots of... That... That rope. Yes. This rope. It leaves no telltale traces. Oh, no, no, kid. I, d d didn't you get it? It was all a joke. No, d don't come any closer. Don't scream, Dorothy. It won't do you any good. Gabe, listen to me. I, I don't want a cent. Not, not one penny. I love you. I love you, I tell you. I, I, I'll keep your secret. I'll do anything you want. Anything. There's that rope. Take it away from my neck. Don't give it the name of heaven. Don't, don't raise it. She was dead. I took her body, put it in an old trunk in the storeroom of the cellar. 
I had to think of some plan, some way to get rid of those bodies. In my confusion, there was only one thing that I was certain of. I must never leave the house, not even for a minute. I never did. At nights, I would sit there, listening. Then it would come, the wail in the wall. I knew that after a week, she couldn't be alive. What made the wail? Plans? <laughs> I thought of a thousand plans, but all of them would mean that I had to leave the house, and if I left, someone would hear the wail and find out, just as Dorothy did. Fire. Yes, fire. That would do it. The idea danced like a flame in my mind. But no, no. They discovered charred bones of the skeletons among the wreckage. No, it... It wouldn't be worth it. The only way I could be safe was to stay there in the house. I stayed. I, who had risked everything for freedom. I opened it. Mr. Harnell? Yes? I'm Mr. Crawford from the bank. May I come in? Just in here, in the vestibule. We've written to you a dozen times, but you've never replied. What do you want? Well, Mr. Harnell, you may not realize it, but you've overdrawn your account. The money your wife left is gone. Gone? So short a time? So short? Why, she died 40 years ago. 40 it seems only yesterday. We've been investigating. Even the grocer who used to supply your food no longer will extend you credit. Oh, what do you want with me? I'm not starving. If you'd see your face, you'd realize that you are, Mr. Hornell. Now, if you'll only be reasonable, we can see to it that you get $250,000. Uh, a quarter of a million? How? By selling this house, it's become very valuable. Uh, no. You get out of here. Get out. But, Mr. Hornell... Get out! Very well. He was right. I was starving. That night, when I heard the wailing begin again, I came to a decision. I, I had spent 40 years in the house. More punishment than criminals receive who've committed even worse crimes than mine. I'd take a chance. I opened the wall I'd sealed up 40 years ago. She, she was still there. But the wailing continued. Why? Why? I looked into the tomb I made for her, and then I saw it. I saw this thing that had ruined my life. It was a tiny hole in the outside wall that I'd made when I first broke it open. The wind rushed through and made that horrible wail. Ah, what was the use? I took a match out of my pocket. I set its flame to the curtains. In a moment, the place would be an inferno. But I decided to stay. I wanted to perish with the house. In death, at least I'd be free. But even then, freedom was denied me. They rescued me. Brought me to this hospital. I had the nurse make inquiries from the police. She told me. No, there was nothing unusual found among the ashes. Everything was burned to a fine powder. If... If I had only set fire to the house 40 years ago. But no matter. The window is open. And it's 18 stories to the ground. I will soon be free. Meow! <laughs> Everybody's dead but the cat. We overlooked him because we couldn't find him. Of course, I'm sorry... That that wall made such an unpleasant noise, such a tuneless wailing. 
We tried to teach her to whistle the new Lipton tea jingle, but we didn't have time, eh, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> now, you just stop teasing me, because I'm not going to talk about the Lipton jingle now. No, and I'm not going to talk about Lipton tea either. Instead, the Lipton people want me to remind you folks about something important. I mean the victory loan drive. You know, friends, we've been buying bonds for many years now. But this drive is in some ways the most important. Because if a job is worth doing, then it's worth finishing. The bonds you buy now won't buy weapons. No, this time the money will help bring our boys home. It will also help take care of our wounded soldiers, provide them with the finest medical care in the world. And, friends, we can certainly do no less. And the victory bonds you buy now will help launch our veterans into a safe and secure post-war world, the kind of world they've been fighting for. Yes, you're helping others and yourself, too, every time you buy a victory bond. So buy all you can, won't you? All right, friends. Until we meet at some haunted house, here's a parting thought. Don't seal your wife in a wall. That won't keep her quiet. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's inner sanctum mystery novel is Devil in the Bush by Matthew Head. Yes, and next week's inner sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a man who gets hunches. His hunches are about death. He's sure he's going to be killed. Not by poison or fire or strangling. Nothing simple like that. No, our character has a nice, interesting death waiting for him. Oh, if you'd like to be in at the death, drop in next Tuesday. <laughs> and now it's time to close the squeaking door, so good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> Folks, the colder it gets, the more we all enjoy a good hot plate of soup. And for soup with a fresh, home-cooked taste, you can't beat Lipton's noodle soup. Yes, Lipton's is blessed with a real chickeny flavor, and it's just swimming with tender golden egg noodles. But listen, Lipton noodle soup takes almost no time at all to prepare. And Lipton's is economical, too. Costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So don't forget to try Lipton's noodle soup... And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Come on in, friends. Into the Inner Sanctum. This is really a lovely place. All kind of dark and cobwebby. But then the maid hasn't been around for some time. No, she was playing the numbers. Then her number came up. <laughs> Why, through these portals pass some of the nicest people in the world. True, they're rather boring, but after all, they are deadheads. <laughs> and I'll take a good old redhead deadhead any time. Why, Mr. Host, are you finally admitting that you like the ladies? Well, of course, Mary. Don't you know some of my favorite ghosts are girls? But I do wish they weren't so vain. Why, I know one who has pleats in her shroud. Not only in the front, but in the back, too. Yes, yeah, just in case she should turn over in her grave. <laughs> oh, dear. There you go talking nonsense again. I like talk that makes sense. Good common sense, like the things the tea experts say about Lipton tea. For instance, they say that Lipton's has a brisk flavor. And that's the truth. Because Lipton's does taste fresh and tangy and, and full-bodied, never wishy-washy. 
And then the experts say that that brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world when you're sitting down to a cup of tea. And, folks, that's absolutely right. That brisk flavor is the reason why Lipton's is such a comfort, why it actually makes good food taste better. Yes, folks, you just don't know how good tea can be till you've tried Lipton's. So buy a package of Lipton's and taste what you've been missing all this time. And talking of time, friends, may I take a few years of your life? Hmm? All right. Get ready to hear a gory little story entitled Boomerang. It's an original radio play written by a couple of Australian bushmen named Michael Sklar and Richard Manoff. And stars Martin Gable in the role of John Keeler. So, hitch up your chair, switch off the lights, and look out. Ah! Help, help me. No one heard me. No one came. I lay there watching the blood ooze from the wound. My chest was on fire. The flesh where the bullet had entered was torn, shredded. And in my back there was a kind of numbness. I screamed, Ah! Help! Help! But no one answered. I was utterly alone, helpless, watching my life dripping drop by drop to the floor. Then the blackness closed in. When I regained consciousness, two uniformed patrolmen were bending over me, looking frightened and puzzled. Suicide, Riley? Either that or murder. Their voices seemed to come echoing over an aching void. I wanted to tell them how it had happened. I wanted to tell them about Bill Sloan and Helen and the airplane. I was frantic. I had to tell them. He's trying to say something, Riley. Poor guy. He can't talk. He's too far gone. I couldn't talk. I'd lost too much blood. My tongue was thick like cotton. My lips moved, but that was all. It was all shut up inside me. They would never know how it had happened. Riley, it looks to me like murder. Murder, yes, it was murder. And if only I could have spoken, I would have told them. About my nervous breakdown. About the sanitarium. That's where it began, back there in that plushy prison. I was locked up behind that big wall. And my wife and my partner, they had had the chance to discover each other. And then when I came out, the doctor said I was cured. Their false solicitude... And all the while, suspicion was building up inside me. I was already suspicious that day. I caught them by surprise. I'd come directly home from my regular visit to the psychiatrist instead of returning to the office. Bill was there in the living room with Helen, my partner and my wife, laughing together. I closed the front door silently. The rugs muffled my footsteps. I entered the room suddenly, wanting to see their faces when they saw me. Oh, why, why, darling. Hello, Helen. Why, John, how did you happen to come home in mid-afternoon? Why aren't you at the office? I was thinking of asking you that question. Bill made some flimsy excuse, but I caught the look of guilt on his face. He was a bachelor, smooth with words, successful with women... And I was beginning to believe he had succeeded with my wife. Oh, I had evidence. There was the time a few nights later. Helen and I were going up to bed. As we passed the umbrella stand at the foot of the stairs, I noticed something. Helen, hmm? just a moment. This umbrella, it's Bill's. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. What's it doing here? Well, he must have forgotten it when he was over the other day. Take it out of the office in the morning, will you, darling? I made no reply. We continued up the stairs and went to bed. I waited until Helen was asleep, then crept out of bed and down the stairs. There was the umbrella. I reached out my hand, afraid to touch it, but I had to. The umbrella was still wet. 
It had rained that afternoon. I said nothing about it the next morning. Oh, I was suspicious enough. But I told myself I had to be absolutely sure. And then, that next night, it happened. Helen went out after dinner, saying she had an appointment with her hairdresser. As the door closed behind her, I picked up the phone and dialed the number. Hello? Grayson Beauty Salon? Alberta, this is Mr. John Keeler. I'm calling for my wife to verify her appointment for this evening. Mrs. Keeler? But, monsieur, she has no appointment for this evening. Now, I was sure. Bill and Helen were together. I struggled to control my emotions. My head was whirling. I felt ill, weak. My heart was pounding in my chest. The room began to spin. First the floor lamp, then the chairs, finally the table whirling around my head. I needed air, air. I forced myself out of my feet, stumbled across the floor to the window and threw it open. The stars, too, were spinning, chasing each other in a mad race across the sky. I sucked the fresh air into my lungs and slowly the stars resumed their normal positions. I drew my head back into the room and then it struck me across the nostrils. Gas. The room was full of gas. Yes, I found one gas jet open in the kitchen stove. I fought against the logical conclusion, struggled against it all that night and into the next day. But I could no longer stand it by mid-afternoon. That open gas jet last night had been no accident. They were planning to have me put out of the way. Well, two could play at that game. I also could commit murder. I worked out a plan. First, the business trip to Buffalo that I'd been putting off for weeks. I could use that as my alibi. I called my secretary. Yes, Mr. Keeler. Miss Jackson, I've decided to go up to Buffalo tomorrow. Could you get me a drawing room on the five o'clock train? I'll call the railroad station right now, Mr. Keeler. A few minutes later, she called me back. I had the train reservation. So far, so good. I went to the bank, and from the bank to the airline terminal. What can I do for you, sir? I want a seat on the Rochester plane. The plane that leaves New York at 9.30 tomorrow night. 9.30. Hmm? What is the name, sir? Dunham. Roger Dunham. Well, you're a lucky man, Mr. Dunham. It's the last seat on the plane. Roger Dunham. That assumed name would prove my alibi. The details of my scheme were falling into place. I went home, and at dinner told Helen I was leaving for Buffalo tomorrow. Tomorrow? Must you go tomorrow, John? Can't it wait? I've been putting this trip off too long already. I'll leave straight from the office and come home the next afternoon. Well, you're being a little inconsiderate. I'll be all alone here overnight. Oh, come, Helen. You're not afraid of anything, are you? Afraid? No, but Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask Bill to come over and keep you company tomorrow night. How'll that be? Why, why, that'll be fine. Another cog in place. Another gear meshed. Now one last piece to move and the engine of my revenge will be complete. Yes, it was revenge now. Revenge for what those two had done to me. Buffalo, eh? It's a good idea, John. The way your trip could combine business with pleasure. Pleasure? Well, you've been rather tense lately. The change of the scene will do you worlds of good. I'm sure it will. How about Helen? Can you make it tonight? Tonight? Yes. Yes, I, I'll be over after dinner. That day passed like a dream. With me, the sleepwalker in the center, going through all the motions correctly, but waiting for the evening. For I wasn't hunted now. Now I was the hunter. A little past four o'clock that afternoon, I left the office and took a cab to the station. I went directly to my drawing room, and as the train pulled out, I called for the porter. At midnight, sir? Just a glass of milk, porter. Warm milk. And don't bring it before midnight. Till then, I've got a lot of work to do, and I don't want to be disturbed. Just as you see, sir. I gave the porter an unnecessarily large tip to make sure he'd remember me. Now, when the train stopped to change engines at Harmon an hour later, it was raining, thunderstorm. I pulled my hat down over my eyes, raised my coat collar around my face, and became just another shadowy figure hurrying to get out of the rain. I crossed the platform unnoticed, and ten minutes later I was on a train going southbound, returning to New York. I 
picked up my car at the parking lot and drove out to my house on the cliff. Parking on a side road, I climbed up the hill on foot. By now the rain was coming down in sheets. Lightning split the sky and thunder crashed around me. I could see the light from my house perched at the edge of the cliff. Now Bill's car was parked on the driveway, pointed downhill. Light came from the living room. I crept through the shrubbery to a window. There they were, Bill and Helen. My partner and my wife, sitting side by side on the divan. He drinking my whiskey, comfortable and warm, while I, the unwanted, was standing outside in the storm. How I hated him at that moment. I went back to Bill's car, crept beneath it, and went to work. The sound of the storm covered the noise of my tools as I disconnected the brakes. And I was finished. And none too soon, for suddenly the front door opened, and Bill stood framed in the light of the doorway with Helen behind him. Bad night for it, but we'll never get another chance like this one, Helen. Well, all right, but come back quickly, Bill. I'm nervous. Oh, nothing to be nervous about. John is halfway to Buffalo by now. A perfect opportunity to go over our plans with Bates. All right, go ahead, then. But hurry. I'll have Bates back here in a jiffy. Bates. Bates. He was going to fetch Bates, undoubtedly a hired killer. I laughed inwardly as the car got started. I could see Helen watching it as it picked up speed on the steep downgrades. Something was wrong now, and she knew it. Bill, not the car! Too late, too late. The car was roaring downhill out of control, charging for the lip of the cliff. There was a crash and smash. Bill! 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 Oh, poor Bill. I always say, protect me from my friends, and I'll take care of my enemies. That's a nice guy, too. Who would have thought he'd go falling for a cliff? But there you are. There's no accounting for taste. There's no accounting for the people in this story, that's what. Such terrible people. Oh, Mary, wait till you meet Bates. He's a boy. He's really going to make our characters dance. Yeah, he's going to put them in the groove. Or do I mean grave? (laughs) <laughs> you don't know what you mean. And it seems to me, Mr. Host, that life is complicated enough without your making it more so. Well, look at what I had to do yesterday. Clean the house, do the Monday wash, and cook three meals in the bargain. Yes, and you'd be surprised at the big help I got from Lipton tea. You see, when I had a moment to relax, I'd make myself a cup of Lipton's. Such an easy thing to do, and it did me a world of good. Mmm, that brisk flavor makes Lipton such a cheering, satisfying drink. It really perks you up. It's never wishy-washy. Of course, I know that lots of folks serve Lipton tea at mealtimes and serve it to their guests, too. But, friends, you really should try helping yourself through the day with a good hot cup of brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Yes, treat yourself to Lipton's when you've got a moment to relax. Well, don't relax yet. First, let's go back to that tiff on the cliff where John Keeler has just killed his business partner. I'm just itching to know what's going to happen to his wife. She's standing by the shattered fence, peering down the side of the cliff into the darkness. And John, he's creeping up behind her. Look out, Helen. He's dead, Helen. Oh. It's a sheer drop of 400 feet to the bottom. John! I thought... John, you said you were going to Buffalo. I am going to Buffalo, Helen, after I finish my business here. Well, well uh, Bill, the, the car just... It was just... a pity about the brakes. They must have come disconnected. Disconnected? Accidents will happen, Helen. John. John, you killed him. You and Bill thought you would pull the wool over my eyes. Well, I fooled you. Stay away from me. I'm going to throw you over the cliff. I'm going to send you to join your lover. You can't do that. Tomorrow they'll find your bodies. They'll think you were thrown clear of the car when it crashed. They'll call it an unfortunate accident. No, no, please, Careful, John. Helen, you're at the edge. There's nothing behind you. John, John, don't touch me, John! Goodbye, Helen. If I had any feeling at that moment, it was a feeling of satisfaction. I, the failure, had committed the perfect crime. My scheme was flawless. I walked down the hill to my car, changed my clothes, and drove to the airport. As Roger Dunham, I boarded the plane for Rochester at 9.30 that night. 
Just as I'd planned it, we arrived at that city well ahead of my train. I was waiting when the long line of sleeping cars pulled in at the Rochester station platform. I boarded the train. My drawing room was just as I had left it at Harmon. I sank down in a seat, removed my coat and shoes. I looked at my watch. It was midnight. Uh, come in. Uh, beg pardon, sir. It's midnight, sir. Oh, midnight? Really? Oh, thanks for bringing the milk. It's lukewarm, sir, just like you asked for it. Thank you, Porter. In Buffalo, I went to my usual hotel, checked in, went to sleep. Oddly enough, I slept well that night. A deep, dreamless sleep. In fact, I overslept. For when I wakened, it was broad daylight and the phone was ringing. I, uh, uh, I struggled out of bed, lifted a receiver. Uh, hello. This is the long distance operator. I have a New York City call for Mr. John Keeler. This is Mr. Keeler speaking. One moment, please. Here's your party. Mr. Keeler? Yes? Uh, this is Miss Jackson. I've just arrived at the office. Mr. Keeler, I don't know how to tell you. The police. What about the police? They're here in the office. They want you to return at once. Miss Kilo, what's going on there? Mr. Sloan and your wife. Both of them are dead, Mr. Keeler. Dead? Mr. Sloan's car went off the cliff near your house last night. The accident was discovered this morning. Accident? You say it was an accident? It must have been an accident, Mr. Keeler. She thought it was an accident. Now, if only the police thought likewise. I told my secretary I'd take the first plane back to the city and I hung up. A few hours later, I reached New York, hurried to my office. There's a detective waiting in your office, Mr. Keeler. A detective? He said he had to see you. A detective. This was the test. I pulled myself together and opened the door to my office. Mr. Keeler? Yes. I understand you're from police headquarters. Jerome is the name, sir. Assistant Inspector. How do you do, sir? We won't take up much of your time, Mr. Keeler. It's an open and shut case. How do you mean that? Well, stormy night, slippery road, bad breaks, obviously an accident. I'm very sorry. I nodded at the detective, and all the while I was laughing inwardly. He sat there, the very symbol of the law, and offered me official sympathy. No question of clues, nothing overlooked, nothing to fear. Not now. I, the weakling, had committed the perfect crime. Yes, Miss Jackson? Mr. Keeler, there's a man out here to see you. Send him away. He won't go. He says you don't know him, but it's extremely important. What's his name? His name is Bates, Mr. Keeler. William Bates. Bates? The hired killer. I told my secretary I'd see him. I went into the outer office. Bates was sitting on one of the chairs with an open briefcase on his lap. He was a big man. Tough looking. I read the news in the morning paper, Mr. Keeler. Too bad. That was a tough break. Yes. Yes, it was. I didn't know if I should go after you now, but... Well, uh, after all, I'm a businessman. My time is money. I'm sure it is, but why tell me about it? You certainly don't expect me to pay you. Why not? They're your plans. My plans? Well, look at them. Here they are. Why, they've even got your name on them. I didn't know whether I could trust my ears. Whether I could believe my vision. Bates drew a roll of architectural drawings out of his briefcase and shoved them at me. Look at them. There it is in your partner's handwriting. Plans for the new Keeler house. Who are you? I told you. My name is Bates. I'm a building contractor. Your partner and your wife insisted that the whole job had to be done in secret. In secret? They said something about you having just come out of a sanitarium. They wanted the whole thing to be a big surprise. <laughs> My mind was reeling. The secret meetings that led me to suspect Bill and Helen. Those meetings were to go over the plans for a house. My house and Helen's. I had killed my best friend and my wife. Inspector Jerome, I want to confess. I killed them. I killed them. 
Kill them? Killed who? Don't look at me like that. You know who I'm talking about. My partner and my wife. I killed them last night. Now I'm ready to take my punishment. Well, calm down, Mr. Keeler. You've had a hard time. We realize this thing has been a great shock. What are you talking about? The Homicide Squad doesn't jump to hasty conclusions, Mr. Keeler. We made a thorough checkup on your background. What's my background got to do with it? Well, we know you spent three months in a sanatorium recuperating from a nervous collapse. Now, on top of that, this unfortunate it accident. It wasn't an accident. I killed him. We checked every movement you made since you left the office yesterday. Then you must know. We know you took the five o'clock train to Buffalo. The porter on your pullman had no trouble recalling you. Why, well, he even told us how he brought you a glass of milk at midnight. You were a good 200 miles away from New York when the accident happened. <laughs> The detective went away, shaking his head. <laughs> Sympathetically. My mind was in a turmoil. I had committed the perfect crime. And it had boomerang. I went home. The house on the cliff was empty. Everywhere I looked, I saw Helen. Her photograph on my desk. Her red-tipped cigarette still in the ashtrays. Two half-empty cocktail glasses side by side on the living room table. There was desolation in the house. Emptiness. Loneliness. And it would be like this for the rest of my life. But there was one way out. I always kept a loaded gun in the desk. I took it out of the drawer in my hand. Here was my punishment. This time, I couldn't fail. I placed the gun against my chest and pulled the trigger. I fell by the desk and lay there where I am now, staining the carpet with my blood. I was dying, and I was glad of it. And then I remembered the plane. The plane reservation to Rochester. I could tell the police when they came and they could check that and they would know that I was guilty. But they came too late. They bent over me. I tried to tell them. I tried. I tried. Riley, he's trying to say something. Yeah, cool guy. He's too far gone to talk. Now I'm lying here on the carpet, waiting to die, with my guilt locked up inside me. I can see a new figure among the police, a man in civilian dress with a small black bag in his hand. How long is it since this man was discovered in this condition, officer? About half an hour, Doc. He's in very bad shape. Will he live, Doc? Will he recover? Oh, yes. He may recover, but only partially. Partially? How do you mean, Doc? Notice his inability to move so much as a finger. Notice how only his lips move, trying to form words without being able to speak. The bullet must have injured his spinal cord. This man is paralyzed. Totally paralyzed. So now I know... I'm paralyzed. I'm not going to die. And yet I can see the policemen moving carefully about the room. And I hear them speaking softly as one speaks in the presence of the dead. So I've failed again. For the last time. Because I know my fate now. To live... In this living death, alone with my guilt, forever, that is my punishment. Poor old John Keeler. Who would have thought his spinal cord could have tied him up in knots? Not so nice for John, hmm? <laughs> He started out as a keeler, tried to be a keeler dealer, but got all wound up. <laughs> Mr. Host, let's forget about that awful story, because there's something really important I'd like to talk about. 
The makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup want me to remind all you folks of a debt that must be paid to our servicemen. A debt that can be paid in part by buying and continuing to buy victory bonds. You know, I think the best reason for buying bonds was given many, many years ago by one of the great statesmen of all time, by Abraham Lincoln, when he said, Let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Yes, folks, that's just what we're helping to do when we invest in victory bonds. So keep on buying all that you can, won't you? And now, friends, for those of you who like morals with your drama, here's one for tonight. Never mix your partner's business with your pleasure. For if you do, he may consider it a pleasure to give you the business. <laughs> by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Devil in the Bush by Matthew Head. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, Next week's story is about a genius, a photographer who believes that death can be beautiful. So he only takes pictures of people who are in the throes of dying. It's enough to make your camera shudder. And naturally, he has to arrange his models, arrange to have them die. So next Tuesday, bring along the kiddies and we'll make it a nice family picture. <laughs> And now it's time to close the squeaking door. So, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, cold weather and hot soup just seem to go together. And Lipton's noodle soup is the soup of the season. Yes, Lipton's is blessed with a fine chickeny flavor, and it has real fresh-cooked goodness. Mmm, it tastes just like the chicken noodle soup you'd make right in your own kitchen. The only difference is that Lipton's takes almost no time at all to prepare. So if your family likes chickeny tasting soup that's brimming with tender golden egg noodles, then don't forget to ask for Lipton's noodle soup. Yes, friends, and don't forget to tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door... Draw up a tombstone to sit down. Don't mind the fact that we've carved your name on it. <laughs> well, it's rather lonesome around here tonight, isn't it? Yes, most of the folks who haunt the place are out tonight with their sleds. If it snowed near your house, you may find them ghosting down here. But, Mr. Host, <laughs> ghosts don't go sledding, do they? Well, of course, Mary. Especially the ghosts of gangsters. They're used to being taken for a sleigh ride. Well, now, why don't you take your sled and join your friends and let me have a word with our Lipton listeners? Folks, have you ever noticed how often we all use the words good, better, and best? We're always comparing things, because comparisons help us decide what the best things in life are. For example, the perfect way to prove how really flavorful Lipton tea is is to compare Lipton's to any other tea and taste the difference. Lipton's flavor is brisk, 
Never flat or wishy-washy. It gives you all the flavor. Tastes just the way you like tea best. No other tea gives you more bright, mellow goodness because that superb flavor of Lipton's is extra rich, extra satisfying. Yes, friends, just compare Lipton's to any other tea. You'll find Lipton's gives you brisk flavor, and you'll find Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor gives you more contentment in every cup. All right, Mary. Now you go and perch yourself on that teapot over there and get ready to hear about The Dark Chamber. It's an original radio play by Robert Newman, who witnessed the story while peeking through a keyhole. Yes, and our star tonight is Kenneth Lynch, who plays the role of Joel. Our story tonight is about death, violent death, and also about something which is even more terrifying, the unknown. You don't believe that anything can be more frightening than death, then you've never experienced the ultimate in fear, but you will within the next few minutes, if you'll put out the lights... Pull your chair up close and listen to the dark chamber. Police headquarters, Ryan speaking. Hello, police. Listen, you've got to help me. You've got to. I don't know how you can, but... My name is Watson, Joe Watson. I'm a driver for the Acme Sanitary Hand Laundry. Address? Where I am, I... I don't know. That's part of the trouble. Now, look. Hey, wait, listen, I, I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Check the laundry, check the veterans. I'm an ex-GI. They'll tell you I'm straight. It, well, I'm in a room someplace. I don't know where it is or how I got here or what I'm here for. I don't even know how long I've been here. It's a big room, but it, it's funny. No doors, no windows that I can see. It's just a couple of chairs and a table with this phone on it. I'm scared. What do you expect us to do? Find me. Find out what this is all about and get me out of here. I, I don't know. Oh, listen, this isn't a gag. Can't you tell? You don't know what it's like just sitting here waiting, not knowing where or why or what's going to happen. Can't you trace this call or something? Well, okay. Hang on. Oh, thank heaven. I was afraid. Listen, I hear something. Someone's coming. I better hang up. I'll, I'll call you back later if I can. How do you do? Who are you? My name's Helming. Dr. John Helming. And your name? I don't have to tell you anything. That's very true. Although I didn't think you were aware of it. I think I already know everything about you that I'm interested in knowing. Like what? Name? Joseph Watson, age 26, occupation, employee of the Acme Laundry. Honorably discharged from the army six months ago with the Brown Star... And the Purple Heart. What the... So you cased me. Went through my pockets, huh? Well, if you know that much, you know I haven't got any dough. Money? I'm not interested in money. Well, what do you want, then? Where is this place? The last thing I remember is making a delivery on Spruce Street, noticing that the lights were out in the hall and hearing a noise behind me. You or somebody slugged me. That's right. Well, will you stop grinning like that and tell me what this is all about? Of course. I brought you here because I need your help in an experiment. An experiment whose details I've already worked out with mice and rabbits and cats and other animals. What kind of an experiment? An experiment in fear. Fear? Yes. You fought in the war. You were wounded. That means you've probably known fear. And still, you won the Bronze Star, which means you overcame it. Now, the question is... Can you overcome your present fears? What are you talking about? You're afraid. Nothing has happened to you yet, absolutely nothing, and yet you are afraid, aren't you? You're afraid because you're face to face with the unknown. Because you don't know what I want and what I'm planning to do. Um, which is as it should be. And uh, that's the way we'll leave it. For the moment. Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. Come back, you can't... Hello, police. This is Joe Watson again. Listen, I got a little more dope. I don't know if it'll help, but there was a guy in here just now. Said his name was Helming, John Helming. That's probably a phony. He's about 50, tall, over six foot, white hair and gray eyes. No, I still don't know what it's all about or what he's after, but have you been able to trace this number yet? How long will it take? 
Okay, I'll hang on, but... What? The lights just went out. The room's pitch dark and somebody's coming in again. I better stop. But for Pete's sake, hurry! Who... Who's that? Who just came in? Who are you? A girl. Keep away from me. Keep away, do you hear? Keep away? What's the angle now? Angle? Why did you bring me here? Wait a minute. You mean he put the snatch on you, too? When I was on my way home, chloroform or something. And the next thing I knew... Why are you pretending? You're in on it, too. You must be. It's a trap. It's a trap, all right. But I'm not in on it. I'm in it, along with you. My name is Watson. Joe Watson. I'm Betty Grant. You swear? I swear. What would I lie about it for? I wonder why he put you in here. Put us together. Who is he? What's he going to do? I don't know. He said something about an experiment. An experiment in fear, but... Hey, listen, we've got to get out of here somehow, some way. He might be listening. Very astute, my dear. Of course I'm listening. What the... Where are you? Right here in the dark. I've been here all the time. Why are you... No, Joe, don't. He must want you to go for him. He's probably got a gun. Right again, my dear. Not that I'll need it. This is stage two of the experiment. A new stimulus to action has been introduced. Man against the unknown has become man and woman against the unknown. Look, let's get down to brass tacks. Be sensible about this. Thank you, Joe. That's why I won't need my gun. This new uh, stimulus has been negated by an increased sense of responsibility. Responsibility towards the girl, and therefore, by uh, increased fear. Blast you, gun or no gun, if I get my hands on you! Where are you? Where are you? Outside now, so you can relax. That was the final stimulus in this stage. Injured pride. The discovery that I could read your innermost thoughts and knew exactly what you were going to do. But you mustn't let that bother you. I already know everything you're going to do from now on. Till the end. Listen, you! Help me! Help me! He's gone. Joe. I know. Hold on, baby. Don't let it get you. There must be a way, some way. Do you suppose he's still listening? It's hard to say. But I'm going to take a chance. There's one thing he didn't figure on. A telephone. Here? Yes. If I can find it again in the dark. It was over on the... Here it is. I put through two calls already to the police. Told them what was happening and asked them to get me out of here. I had to hang up both times before they could trace the call and get this number, but this time... Hello. Hello, operator. What? No, this isn't the operator. You're on a busy wire. It doesn't matter. Thank heaven I got somebody. I've been trying for about ten minutes now. Hey, look, get off the line, will you? I've got to get through to the police. It's terribly important. But you've got to help me. You've got to. My name's Ben Lazari, and I'm a prisoner someplace. I don't know where. You what? I it's true. A strange house somewhere. A doctor who says his name is Helmy. What? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Joe, what is it? What is it? I haven't got headquarters. I've got a guy that... I'm sorry, Ben. It's no use. What do you mean? We're in the same boat you are. A girl named Betty Grant and myself. Helming's got us locked up, too. You, too? Yeah. He said he knew everything we were thinking. Everything we were going to do. I did get through to the police before, but I guess he caught wise. We're talking to each other over an inside line. Then... Yeah. We're through. No! Joe, don't say that. Don't even think it. Look, ask him exactly where he is. Just where are you, Ben? Do you know? It's hard to say. I was out cold when he brought me here. It's a kind of a hall, a passageway. Cement floor, ceiling, stone walls. There doesn't seem to be any door or opening or anything like that. That's what I thought here, too. But there must be one, or how would he have gotten you in there? Hey, listen, start looking. See if you can find it. That's true. I never thought of that. 
Well, I do find the door and it opens into where you are. That's right. Three of us together. We'll surely be able to figure something out then. Hold on. I'll start pounding on the walls. You see if you hear anything. Go ahead. What's he doing? He's going to knock on the walls to see if he's anywhere near us. And if he is, if he can find a door, we can get together. Hear anything? I'm not sure. Maybe. I'm not sure either. Sounds awful far away, is it? There, listen. That wall right there. Hello. Hello, Ben. Yes? We heard you. You're right next to us. Now, Ben, you listen and Betty will knock back. Go ahead, Betty. That way, Ben, you'll be able to tell just which wall it is. Okay. All right. I hear it. I know where it is. Now to find the door, if there is one. Hold on. He's got it. He's going to see if there's a door. There must be one. There must be. Ben. And... Ben. Ben. Hello. What is it? I don't know. I thought it hurts a moan. Joe. Look. There is a door. It's opening. It's open. You. Dr. Helming. Why, yes. Were you expecting someone? <laughs> Well, now that you mention it, Doctor, there was someone we've been expecting and waiting for since we first heard about that cozy little place of yours. I think he's finally arrived. He's a tall, rather striking gentleman with a skull for a face, and his name is Death. Mr. Host, that Dr. Helming is insane. <sighs> he gives me the chills. Oh, maybe it's just because it's so cold tonight, Mary. You know, it's getting so nippy these days that some of my friends are having fur collars put on their shrouds. <laughs> well, my <laughs> friends are smarter. They know that the way to warm up in cold weather is with a hot cup of fragrant, delicious Lipton tea. A cup of tea in front of the fireplace just hits the sot these chilly days. But make it Lipton's and your pleasure's complete. You brew up a pot of Lipton's, throw another log on the fire, and summer tiptoes right into the room. Let the wind blow and the snow pile up on the roof. There's all the magic of June in a cup of Lipton's, in its deep amber color, its tantalizing fragrance, and its rich, hearty flavor. Mmm, and what flavor that is. Never wishy-washy. Always brisk and full and satisfying. Try it, folks. You can let winter do its worst when you've got Lipton's in your cup. That's right, Mary. But I think it's time now for something a little more cold-blooded. Such as a cold-blooded murder. We're having a juicy one here tonight. A tale of gore galore. So let's see what's happening in the dark chamber. It's just a moment later now. Standing in the darkness of the strange room, Joe and Betty stare at the tall figure of Dr. Helming, silhouetted against the dim light from outside. I asked you whether you were expecting someone. Then it was just a trick. It was you on the phone all the time. Now, don't you think I'd know his voice? Where, where is he? Our friend, Mr. Lazari, right outside. What did you do to him? Answer me. What did you do to him? Don't you know? Sure, I know. You killed him. You Did you kill him? Quite a state you've gotten yourself into. Why? Is it because you finally tried to do something about your predicament and failed? Or is it because you weren't sure whether I would kill or not and because you still don't know? You're mad. Really mad. You'll be interested to know. You have not done. Nor will you do. One thing that I did not foresee. Every move you made, every emotion you felt, was charted, outlined, and... What's that? That, I think, is probably the police. The police? Yes. I know that you're very anxious to talk to them, and I'll see that you get a chance to. Soon. Good evening, officer. I'm looking for a guy named Helming. Dr. Helming. I'm Dr. Helming. Come in, won't you? Okay. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, kind of a funny business. It's about a phone call we got a while ago. Finally traced here. A guy who said he was a prisoner or something. That must have been Watson. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Joe Watson. 
Do you know her? Of course. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It was really very careless of me, and I'll see that it doesn't happen again. What do you mean? If you did any investigating, which I'm sure you did, then you know that I, um, well, I don't run a sanitarium exactly, but I do take a few patients, mental cases, for treatment. Ah, so that's it. A nurse, eh? I, I wish you wouldn't say that. Watson's case is particularly interesting. A 4F who wasn't able to enlist, and he developed a persecution mania. Thinks that everyone is down to me. Not everyone, exactly. His present fantasy is that he's an ex-GI and that I'm keeping him prisoner. Sure sounds plenty tough. Well, I guess I'll run along. I, I'm sorry I bothered Don't you. Don't you want to see them first, officer? Talk to them? Ah, oh, there's no need of that, doctor. We, we get calls from cranks every day. We, we always investigate the cause. But I insist. After all, you only have my word for it. Uh, there's, um... And well, there's just one thing I'd like to caution you about. Sure, sure, I know. I'll play along. Sure, madam. Splendid. Right in here. Hmm. It's quite a room. Joe, look. It, it's a cop, and that means... Then you did get my message. Uh, sure, sure, Joe. Took a little time to trace a call, but uh, everything's okay. Oh, thank heaven. It was such a screwy story, I was afraid that... Hey, wait a minute. Then why is he standing there like that? Why haven't you got the bracelets on him? Have to tell me? No need for any rough stuff. He said he'd come along quietly. What? You're but... lying. I don't know why, but there's something wrong here. Something... I know. You think we made the whole thing up. But we're crazy. I know, no, no. It's true. He told you we were, and you believed him. Of course not. Look, I... I... Stop it, will you? Stop saying that. Well, if I could only prove it somehow, I'll show you. I know. Lazari. Joe. Murder. That'll open your eyes. Somewhere in that wall is a door. Make them open it. Show you what's behind it. I think maybe it'd better be going down. But there is a door there, officer. Just a second. I'll open it for you. Here we are. Joe. Body. It's gone. <laughs> These doctors are always hiding the bodies. But turns up again later. Give us another ring, huh? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Uh, can I go up this way down? Down to the end of the corridor, then to your right. I, I'm sorry I gave you all this trouble. It'll be all right. Thank you for being so understanding. Quite all right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doc. Well, children? Don't look that way, Joe. Don't. I know what you're thinking, and it's not true. We're not crazy. There was a body there. Of course. You hid it when you went out to let the cop in. And the telephone. You left that here purposely. Wanted me to use it. Get the police here. Obviously. I told you that this was to be an experiment in fear. What I didn't tell you was that, in a sense, I was one of the subjects, too. It was important for me to learn how I would function under pressure. And speaking objectively, I think I did rather well. Don't why? you? Why are you doing all this? What are you after? There's no reason why I shouldn't tell you. If anyone truly understands the nature of fear, is able accurately to forecast the actions and reactions of an individual, then he can use fear as a weapon. Society will react as the individual reacts. You see... Society doesn't want to believe that anything can menace it. Doesn't want to take action to protect itself any more than the individual does. This was something that Hitler and Mussolini understood intuitively. I understand it scientifically. They failed, but I shall succeed. You... you mean that you... I'm afraid that's all I have time for. As far as you two are concerned... The experiment is finished. Completely finished. I have a few arrangements to take care of. And then, uh, well, make the best of these last few minutes. Uh, for they will be your last. Joe. Do you hear anything? Is he coming back? Not yet. He's going to kill us, isn't he? Just the way he killed Lazari. He's going to try to. 
Why are you sitting there like that, looking at me? Hmm? I guess because it's the first chance I've had to look at you. How do you mean? When they first put you in here, it was all dark. So many things happened after that. It's funny. What is? The things that you can tell about a person even in the dark. I kind of thought you were little and... I knew you were awful nice and had a lot of nerve, but... I didn't think you'd be so pretty. I'm not so pretty, Joe. I'm not very brave either. I'm scared. I'm awful scared. And I don't want to die. Don't worry about it, baby. Don't think about it. Just sitting here like this, waiting. And there's nothing we can do. Every time we did try to do something, it was something he knew about. He was expecting us to do. Please, baby. Joe, something happened to you. You were scared before, too, but now... It was not knowing that was scary. Not knowing what was going to happen or why or what you could do about it. But once you do know, once you make up your mind, then you've got to forget about it. Forget about everything. Make up your mind about what? This is going to sound kind of funny, especially now, but... Well, do you have anyone special? A fellow, I mean, that... Why... Oh, I know. That's good. I mean... Well, gee, it's a shame we never met before. If we had, we wouldn't be here now. I... I mean, we probably would have been out together someplace, and... What time do you get through work, usually? About six. The store closes at 5.30, but... Me, too. I could have picked you up at about six. So... I hear something. He's coming. Yeah. Okay, get up. Over in the corner of the room so that he'll see you as soon as he opens the door. What about you? I'll be waiting over here, behind the door. Joe, you, you, you're not yeah. going to... I know I haven't got much of a chance, but... Well, wish me luck. And it'll be quick anyway. Oh, no. Joe, please. All right, my young friend. Time. All my arrangements have been completed, and I'm... Where's Watson? Right here. Joe, stop it! It's okay, baby. It didn't get me. I got the barrel of the gun. And... Good Lord. Got him. In the chest. Yes. You couldn't have done that. You couldn't have. Outside, Betty. See if you can find another phone. Call the police again. And this time, tell them to bring an ambulance. But you couldn't have done it. It was all plotted. Graphed and worked out in detail. I knew just what you were going to do. How you would react. By this time, you were to be in a state of complete frustration. Resigned. Ready to die. Why did you do it? Why? I don't know. Now, just take it easy. I've got to know. You've got to tell me. Was it because of the girl? Out of... Desperation? Because you... <laughs> knew you were going to die anyway? I tell you, I don't know. I just know that... Well, a guy will take just so much pushing around. <laughs> pushing around, eh? Well, it sounds to me as if one of our characters is going to get a lot of pushing around at the end of a pitchfork and in a very warm climate. Yes, good old Helming's finished. He's got to be if we're to have at least two corpses, the inner sanctum minimum. Oh, you think that's a little arbitrary? Not at all. We've got to have at least two corpses to play our theme song, When a Body Meets a Body. Theme song? I didn't know we had one. Oh, Mary, we've got lots of them. 
Didn't you ever hear our skeleton song? I ain't got no body. Hmm? Mr. Host, <laughs> let's be serious for a moment, because I want to talk about one of the most serious things in life, our health. For instance, the war may eventually lead to an increase in tuberculosis. And that's why the makers of Lipton tea and Lipton soup have asked me to remind you of the annual sale of Christmas seals. Funds raised by this sale support tuberculosis control programs, x-rays, health education, and medical research. Remember, over a half million people in the United States and Canada suffer from this disease. So buy as many Christmas seals as you can. No one is safe from tuberculosis until everyone is safe. And Christmas seals can save lives. And now, friends, here's a word of wholesome advice. If you've had any murderous thoughts lately, give them up. It uh, just doesn't pay. Well, I know a lady who killed off her husband, and you know, it just ruined her marriage. Yes, he grew very cold to her. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Fearful Passage by H.C. Branson. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, next week's story is about a vampire. He's a very stingy fellow. As when you go out with him, the drinks are always on you. <laughs> Naturally, we're going to try to make you feel at home here, so uh, I've just ordered a good supply of bats with green eyes, a coffin for him to sleep in, and a wooden stake to drive through his heart. I wouldn't stake my life on it, friends, but he may visit you before next Tuesday. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> Easy to make and easy to take. That's Lipton's Noodle Soup. The perfect opening dish for your cold weather menus. Lipton's Noodle Soup has that real chickeny flavor your family likes so much. And it has that wonderful fresh cooked homemade goodness. You can prepare Lipton's Noodle Soup in a jiffy too. And it's oh so kind to your budget. Costs less and makes more than canned soups. So don't forget to serve Lipton's Noodle Soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door for another half hour of lovely chills and shudders. Oh, before we begin tonight, I'd like to give you a word of advice. If you should ever walk through a cemetery at midnight and come face to face with a transparent personality floating above a tombstone, don't be frightened. After all, you can see right through him. Good gracious, why do we have to talk about cemeteries? Because, Mary, our story tonight is about a vampire. Where else would you expect to find one if not in a cemetery? In the Vampire State Building? Well, <laughs> suppose you go wait in that closet there and talk to the skeleton while I have a word with our Lipton listeners about one secret of success. You know, folks, when a Hollywood actress climbs up to stardom, it's usually because there's something different about her personality. And that's true of other success stories. Lipton Tea, for example, is the largest selling brand of tea in the world because it's different from other teas. 
Lipton's has that wonderful hearty flavor the tea experts call brisk, which means it's bright and zestful in taste. It's ever wishy-washy or flat. Now, don't take my word for it. Compare Lipton's to other teas yourself. That's the real way to discover Lipton's rich, full flavor. Lipton's extra flavor that brings you all the goodness of a superb tea. It's full-bodied and satisfying with a smooth, mellow tang that brings you real enjoyment. So pour yourself a cup of Lipton tea, folks, and then see for yourself what a difference that brisk flavor makes. That's fine, Mary, but quietly, my dear. Why the whisper, Mr. Shh. Don't make too much noise or you'll wake the dead. And we don't want to do that because tonight's story is called The Undead. It's an original radio play by Milton Lewis. Yes, and our star tonight is Anne Seymour, who plays the role of Diana. I was alone, here in the penthouse, sleeping. The doors leading to the terrace were open. Suddenly, I was awakened by a queer, whirring noise that sounded like the flapping of wings. I opened my eyes. Moonlight filled the room. It was one of those clear, cloudless nights. But the winds moaned and howled like weeping women. Somewhere, a dog howled. I sat up, peered into the green light of the moon. See nothing at first. I lay down again. My eyes were half closed. And I heard it again. The sound of wings beating on the air. I told myself it was nothing until out of the queer green shadows that surrounded me like a mist, I saw a pair of blood-red eyes close to my face. No, they weren't human eyes. They were rimmed with green. They glittered like glass in the dark. I looked closer. Too frightened to move. Too terrified to cry out. The thing that seemed to be flying around my head looked like a bat. Said it wasn't a bat. Suddenly, it floated down. I felt soft fur on my neck, and my throat was pierced with a sharp, terrible pain. I started screaming, let me go, let me go. Richard, where are you, Richard? Richard! Go on, Diana. When I felt your arms around me, I knew I was safe, Richard, but it, it was the most horrible dream I ever had. Yes, I know, I know, darling. You were hysterical. What do you think it meant? Well, nothing... Nothing, of course, dear. Everyone has nightmares like that sometime, Rose. But it was so vivid. I could almost swear it happened just as I told it to you. Oh, Diana, do you really believe you've encountered a vampire? I know it sounds ridiculous, darling. Listen, baby, you're living in New York City on top of an 18-story building. This is 1945, not the Middle Ages. Well, the whole notion is just rubbish. I tried to tell myself it was nonsense, too. But somehow... Oh, Richard... I want to get out of this place. But why? I don't like this apartment. There's something evil, sinister here. I've, I've always felt it. And listen. Listen to that wind. The wind howl around here all the time. Well, naturally, it's a penthouse, and it catches the winds from the river. Do you hear that? Something flapping on the terrace. That's just the awning. Yes. There are always queer noises around here. All the time, and I, I can't bear it being alone here at night. Would you please, please don't let me stay here alone tonight. I can't stay with you, darling. I've got to go to the theater. I don't want you to go there, please. Let, let your understudy take the part tonight. Take me away from here. Far away where it's warm and there's sunlight. Diana, you don't know what you're saying, dear. I can't give up my part in the show. Of course. Of course. Oh, darling, forgive me, please. I'm, I'm sorry I ever mentioned it. You do forgive me, don't you, Richard? Say you do. Why, of course. You were just upset over this silly dream. I know, I know. I I won't mention it again. You're okay, baby. Well, it's ten to eight. I'd better get going. Want to come with me? Yes. No. Well, I'm going to stay here. But if this place frightens you... That's just why I'm going to stay. And alone. I'm going to beat this thing. Somehow. That's better, darling. Much better. Here's your coat. Right. And you better take your scarf. It, it feels chilly. Richard, hmm? I said I won't mention it again, but there's one thing more I have to tell you. That the face of that thing in my dream, it was your face. Diana, in the name of I heaven. I won't talk of it anymore. I promise you, darling. I, I didn't mean to upset you just before you went to the theater. Just, 
Look, kiss me, dear. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Diana. An idea. I'll be waiting when you get back. It was just midnight. Two nights later. I was waiting for Richard to come home from the theater. I was going through his desk looking for a postage stamp. And I found something that turned my blood to ice. It was a newspaper clipping dated ten years ago. The picture of a man and under it the caption, Prominent Real Estate Operator Richard Barker found dead of a sudden stroke. I looked at the picture again. There could be no doubt of it. It was Richard. I read further. The deceased will be buried at Woodlawn, Greenlawn Cemetery after services in the Westland Funeral Chapel. Good evening, Diana. Richard. Why, what's the matter? You seem startled. I... I didn't hear you come in. Have you been brooding again? No, Richard. Of course not. Well, how do you feel tonight? Not... Not very well. Weak? Weak, sleepy, ill. Well, no wonder you've hardly been eating a thing. And I know that you never catch a wink of sleep. I told you I can't sleep in the daytime as you do. As you do. Why are you staring at me like that? Why? Why do you sleep in the daytime? I've been doing it for years. Years? What's so terrible about that? Most theatrical people do. We live and work at night. Yes. Yes, I know. Really, Diana, what is the matter with you? Nothing. You, you think I'm losing my mind? Well, I don't know what to think. Why are you pretending? Pretending what? That you're something other than what you are. Because I know what you are, Richard. Really? I found out. This clipping I found in your desk, it it tells how you died. That clipping? Oh, that. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> well, you see, it's a joke. It's a gag. One of my pictures was sent to the papers, publicity for a new play, you know. And a drunken typester put it in the obituary column. It's quite an amusing story. I don't believe you. You're lying. Listen, you can't go on like no, this. No, don't, don't touch me. You're not well done. Get your away from me. But I just want to kiss no, you. No, no, don't, 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 don't touch me. Diana, where are you going? Out of here. Diana, come back. I'll come back when I've proved something to myself. <laughs> What do you want, ma'am? I'm sorry to wake you up. Uh, are you the caretaker here at Greenlawn? Many years, ma'am. I, uh, I want to see the grave of Richard Barker. Who are you? Diana Barker. His wife. But it's one in the morning, Mrs. Barker. I know what time it is. I, I want to see the grave. No one comes at a time like this. Please, will you tell me? Uh, perhaps this will help. And Donna... Uh, for disturbing you. All right, you take the path from the back of my house. Turn to the right. Have you flashed I brought one from the car. It's only a short way, but it isn't a grave, ma'am. It, uh, it's sort of a tomb. Thank you. I'll find it. You, you want me to come with you? No, I've uh, troubled you enough. Good night. Good night. Somewhere, an owl was howling. As though warning me not to go on with this insane adventure. But I knew I had to continue. I had to be certain. I followed his directions along the path of the cemetery. The moon poked yellow fingers through scudding clouds as though showing me the way. I was frightened. Terrified. There's nothing to fear from the dead. I kept telling myself I had to keep up my courage. The dead. Perhaps they were right. There was nothing to fear from them. But the undead... It was a tomb. The inscription was clear. Here lies Richard Barker. Born May 7th, 1890. Died September 4th, 1935. There was a lock on the door. It was old and rusty. I'd come this far. I made up my mind... I picked up a stone. 
smashed the lock. I opened the door. Blackness. Inky blackness, such as one imagines one would see at the end of the world. Turned on the flashlight I took from the car. Coffin was lying in the center of the tomb on an altar. I felt my heart beating wildly, like a throbbing drum inside me. With a trembling hand, I opened the coffin. I looked down on a ghastly white satin lining. That was all there was in the coffin. There was nothing else. It was empty. I looked up. There was a face staring at me in the shadows of the tomb. It was Richard. Diana, I knew you'd come here. That just goes to show that an empty coffin makes the most noise. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of nice domestic story I like. The intimate family chronicle of a vampire. My goodness, is that what you call intimate family life? Why, of course, Mary. It looks like our lovebirds will even share the same coffin. <laughs> I'm afraid you're drawing a very strange picture of family life, Mr. Holst. Now, I always picture the family gathered around the dinner table. Everybody's laughing and happy. The bright lights push back the shadows of evening outside and shine on the teacups, where Lipton tea is waiting to add to the family's mealtime pleasure. Lipton's brisk flavor will make that good meal taste even better. Everyone around the table, from junior to grandfather, will enjoy its tempting fragrance, its deep amber color, and that brisk flavor that makes Lipton's different from other teas. They'll all like its full-bodied, hearty goodness and the zestful tang of Lipton's flavor. So serve Lipton tea for dinner at your house, folks, and round out the family picture with real enjoyment. Right, Mary. And now let's go back to our horrors. Let me see. What dire predicament are we in tonight? Oh, yes. Diana has just discovered that her husband was wandering around his tomb. What would you do in a situation like that? Here's what Diana did. Listen. I ran blindly, stumbling, tearing my clothes. Somehow I managed to reach the car, stop the car. In the car, I knew it wasn't all some dream. People didn't come back from the dead, did they? Could they? I drove to the city. I wanted to see the lights, people, hear music. I wanted to be sure this was the world I'd always known. I tried to reason. I, I tried to understand what had happened to me. Because I knew something was happening to me. Something that I dreaded. I was becoming like... Like them. Like Richard. I felt a strange craving. Desires that I didn't... They I think of. Excuse me, Mrs. Barker. Oh. May I sit with you? I... I don't believe I know you. But perhaps not. Does it make any difference? No. No, it doesn't. Please sit down. Thank you. I'm glad you came over. I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk to anyone tonight. I've been watching you for the last ten minutes. Have you? You... Look very strange tonight. How do you know me? We all know each other. We? Yes. You realize you'll be dead soon. Dead? At least, what they call dead. You... You know what's happened? Oh, yes, of course. I've seen it happening for weeks. Your face became paler and paler. It will not be long now. You will become one of us. I don't want to. It's not in your hands. It, it isn't true. It, it can't be true. It's quite true. Many of us have gone on for hundreds of years. Those who sustain us 
become like us. And I... There is no escape. No, I don't believe it. Don't you feel it? Blood. That strange desire. Yes. There. You see? I don't want to. I once tried to fight it, too. It's no use. I'm going away. Far away. But he can't reach me. I'm going now and no one's going to be... Waiter. Waiter. Will you help me here? There's been an accident. Everything is going to be all right, Diana. Just lie here and rest quietly. You're in your own home. I opened my eyes and saw Claudia, my older sister. Never was so glad to see anyone in all my life. Claudia had always helped me, always advised me. She'd know what to do. You want something to eat? No, I... I'm not hungry. But the doctor said you'd have to eat. How did I get here? You collapsed in the cocktail lounge. They brought you home. When? Last night. It's dark out. You've been sleeping almost 24 hours. Where's Richard? At the theater. Poor boy, he was so worried about you. Was he? He sent for me. I've been with you since last night. Diana, what happened? It's... It's terribly difficult to explain. I... I sometimes think I'm losing my mind. I'd, I'd be sure that's what it is if I, if I hadn't found out differently. Tell me about it. I, I found out Richard is dead. He's been dead for ten years. What, what are you talking about? Sue, Claudia. I went to Greenlaw and I saw his tomb. I opened it and the coffin was empty. Diana. I know what you're thinking, but I'm not insane. He never sleeps at night. Now I feel this strange craving. Claudia, don't scare me. You know what you're saying. Yes, I know it sounds wild, fantastic, but I... I haven't told this to anyone, but it's true. There are things in this world you only think are primitive superstitions, but... Claudia, you must believe me. Yes, of course, I believe you, dear. We must destroy Richard. I've read about those things. We must destroy him by driving a wooden stake through his heart. That's the only way I can escape from him. That's the only way I can become a human being. Diana. You, you'll help me, Claudia. Of course, dear. Haven't I always helped you? Where are you going? Just to fix you something to eat. No. No, you're going to leave me. Leave me here alone with him. I won't let you do that, Claudia. Uh, that gun. Where did you get that gun? We've always had one here. Ever since I first told Richard I was afraid of this place. You're not going to leave me alone now, Claudia. I'm not going to let you. Of course not. Get away from that door. Yes, that's what you want. Claudia, come back. No. No, you're in. No. She was so sure I was insane, she didn't even give me a chance to explain. I was alone in the house. I felt terribly weak. I wanted to sleep. I wanted to sleep forever and ever. But I knew if I lay down and closed my eyes, I might never open them again. Never open them and see the world as you or I used to. I'd, I'd be something else. I looked at the clock. Almost midnight. Richard would be coming back any minute. I ran to the door, locked it from the inside of the safety bolt. What to do? What to do? Please, I ran to the telephone. Operator. Hello, operator. Get me the police and hurry, please. One moment, please. Hurry, will you? This is a matter of life and death. Hello, are you ringing them? Police department. Sergeant Gilway talking. Hello, police. You've got to help me. Yes, what is it, please? My husband, he's, he's going to do something to me tonight. He's going to make me what he is. Uh, what's that, lady? He's been dead for ten years. I saw his empty coffin. That's proof, isn't it? That's evidence. You always want evidence, and there it is. Now do you understand? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I do, lady. Well, what's your name? Diana Barker. Well, all right, all right, all right. Now, calm down. Tell me where you live. I live... Oh, you think I'm insane, too, don't you? I didn't say it. You think I'm crazy, just as Claudia does. If, if you'll just give me the address, lady. Oh, what's the use? Please, lady. No one believes it. I know I'm not insane. I know it, and yet... What's that? His key in the lock. He can't open it. It's bolted from the inside. He's trying to get in. But he can't. Not with that bolt. I won't open it. I won't. I'll just pretend I don't hear it. I'll cover my ears with my hands and I won't hear it. He can't get in here. If I can keep him out for daylight, I'll be safe. Safe. <laughs> Suddenly, the doorbell stopped. I knew he hadn't gone away. I could feel him near me. But he couldn't get in. No, he couldn't get into the penthouse. 
There was no way to get in unless he came through the terrace. And there was no way to get on the terrace unless he could fly. Fly. The wind was screaming. When I turned to look at the French doors leading to the terrace, it was impossible. He couldn't. And yet, he couldn't. And yet, and the doors burst open. The wind blew through the house like a cyclone. The air framed in the double doors. Just make it. Why didn't you let me in? How, how did you get out on the terrace? Never mind. What are you doing with that gun? Don't come near me, Richard. Diana. Go away. Go away and leave me alone. Give me that gun. No. I'm warning you, Diana. You'd better give it to me. If you take another step toward me, I'll fire. Diana. You see? The bullet. They didn't harm you. No. But I didn't miss. No. Empty. You see? It didn't do any good. What are you going to do? I'm going to put an end to this once and for all, Diana. An end? And I've prepared for this. I have a knife. You see? We can. Don't be afraid, Diana. You won't quite die. No, no, don't. Come here, Diana. No, Richard, no. You're no. making too much trouble while you're alive. No. Help me, Thomas! They got me! Ah! I saw the knife over my throat. I beat at his chest with the empty pistol. Then, just before everything became black, I saw three flashes of lightning. Go on, Mrs. Barker. When I woke up in the hospital, Inspector, I couldn't believe that I was still alive. It it seemed like a miracle. You would have been dead if it wasn't for your sister. Claudia. She came back with one of our men. He shot and killed your husband just as he was about to plunge the dagger into you. But how did he get in? He came over to the adjoining terrace from the penthouse next door, just as your husband did. No, Mrs. Barker. Your husband didn't fly. But the other things, the, the picture, the tomb, the, the empty coffin. All props for an elaborate scheme your husband worked out to murder you. Richard Bach is not an uncommon name. He found a man with that name who died ten years ago. He removed the body. He got the whole idea from the dream you told him. But why? To establish that you were insane. Oh. He planned to murder you. And claim he did it in self-defense to protect himself against an insane woman. But... The gun... Filled with blanks. He wanted to get your money, Mrs. Barker. But the, the way I felt, those strange cravings... You're suffering from anemia. The doctor told us that. It's not uncommon for anemia sufferers to feel the way you did. I still can't believe it. I, I still feel that he isn't quite dead. I'll relieve that fear right now. His body's in the other room. I think you should see it. Come this way, Mrs. Barker. There. Ready to deliver the coffin, Charlie? Yes, Inspector. <gasps> What's the matter? He, he looks so lifelike. His lips are so ready. He looks as though he could move. Get up at any minute. Nonsense. I assure you he's quite dead, Mrs. Barker. And I can further assure you that the police department has never encountered one authentic vampire in its history. You're, you're very reassuring, Inspector. I... I think I'd better leave now. Don't bother to see me to the door. All right. All right, Charlie. Cover him up and have him buried. Okay, Inspector. I... Well, what is it, Charlie? Inspector. Maybe I'm nuts, but I... I, I could swear that I saw him move. Oh, nonsense. Close the lid. Uh, it's getting dark, Charlie. Sun sure goes down quick these winter days. I'm going home. Good night, Charlie. Well, friends, do you think Richard is really dead? Oh, that's something for you to sleep on when you go to bed tonight. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we have a moral for tonight's story. Yes, it's taken from a diary of Miss Delirium Tremens, who once said, Never marry a vampire. He may turn out to be 500 years old without a social security number to his name. How can a girl have any fun going around with a guy like that? Well, Mr. Host, I don't think that's a serious problem. 
I'm positive that no girl will ever meet a vampire, much less marry one. Ah, but you can't be sure, Mary. The safest thing is to drive a wooden stake through your husband's heart. Yes, if he dies, then he must be a vampire. Oh, such a foolish <laughs> Let's forget all this talk about vampires, because I want to tell the folks about something wonderful that's going to happen next week. And next Tuesday's Christmas, you know. So instead of our usual mystery thriller, Inner Sanctum will bring you a tender and beautiful Christmas play called The Littlest Angel. And our star will be that great and beloved actress, Helen Hayes. There's a lovely musical score, specially written for The Littlest Angel. And the play is one your whole family will enjoy, especially the youngsters. Perfect entertainment for Christmas night. And, of course, you won't want to miss Miss Helen Hayes' performance. So be sure to tune into this station at the regular Inner Sanctum time next week. I promise you, The Littlest Angel, starring Helen Hayes, and brought to you by the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, will be the crowning pleasure of your Christmas day. That sounds great, Mary. You know, Christmas is really wonderful. There's something about it that gets even the most hardened characters. Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Fearful Passage by H.C. Branson. And don't forget what Mary tells you, friends. Next week, we'll bring you Inner Sanctum's special Christmas program, directed by Hyman Brown and starring Helen Hayes, America's first lady of the theater. There'll be no gore, no chills. Not even one little murder, believe it or not. The holiday spirit is getting even us. So be sure to join us next Tuesday. Meanwhile, I'm going to do my Christmas shopping. You know where I can get a nice fur-lined coffin for a cold-blooded friend? <laughs> Until next Tuesday, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> These busy days, we all want to save time when we prepare meals, and yet we don't want to sacrifice that good homemade taste. Well, that's just the time to serve Lipton's noodle soup. Lipton's has a real fresh cooked chickeny flavor. It tastes like the chicken noodle soup you'd make right in your own kitchen, and yet it takes almost no time at all to prepare. And Lipton's is economical, too. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soup. So don't forget to try Lipton's Noodle Soup Mix. And remember to tune in next Tuesday night for Inner Sanctum's special Christmas show with Helen Hayes. And Lipton Soup presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Irene Wicker. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host inviting you in through the squeaking door. Ease yourself in. The welcome bat is out. Pick yourself a place to stand. You have several choices. You can stand in awe, or stand aghast, or stand rooted to the spot. Or if you find you can't stand it at all, just stretch out on the floor and lie still. You'll have plenty of company there before we get through with tonight's list of victims. Good gracious, Mr. Host. I don't think I'd enjoy that company. Well, you're not very lively, Mary. In fact, you may find them a little, uh, stiff at first. But they won't interrupt if you want to talk. <laughs> and you know I do want to talk, Mr. Host. So suppose you go greet your other visitors while I have a little chat with our Lipton listeners. You know, folks, sometimes when you're trying to describe a thing, you find it very hard to think of just the right word. But that doesn't apply when you set out to describe Lipton tea. For Lipton is so different from other teas. 
It, its flavor is so extra special that there's a special word to describe it. Brisk. Yes, brisk is the tea expert's word for full-bodied, tangy flavor. Oh, but then why bother with words when Lipton's itself can tell you so much more? You'll taste the difference right away and discover how much Lipton's brisk flavor adds to your enjoyment. Yes, with Lipton's, you get all the goodness nature puts into tea. So for deep down satisfaction, folks, fill your cup with brisk flavored Lipton tea. That's a good idea, Mary. And now, friends, if you'll just reach over and switch off those harsh, bright lights, we'll begin our story of The Creeping Wall by Sigmund Miller. Starring Irene Wicker in the role of Karen Jeremy. Just let the soothing darkness envelop you like a straitjacket. You'll be surprised how nervous you'll feel. Here's Karen now. Can you think of anything more absurd than being afraid of the walls in your own home? Why I should feel that way, I don't know. My husband, Horace, seems to think it's just a case of nerves. Walls are just made of wood and plaster. Still, they give me a queer feeling. Once while sitting alone and reading, I had an odd sensation that the walls were tilting. I looked up. Sure enough, they were all leaning toward me. I closed my eyes. When I opened them again, they were all straight again. Oh, it was a horrible experience. But a much worse thing happened to me last night. I was asleep, dreaming that I was sitting in front of my vanity, making myself pretty. I was alone. It was late at night. Suddenly, I noticed through the vanity mirror that the wall behind me was a little closer. I sat quite still for a moment. And I turned round. And it was closer. You have to experience it to know what a dreadful feeling that is. And I heard a crunching sound. The opposite wall also had moved nearer. I screamed. It was only a whisper. Then all the four walls began to hem me in. They moved nearer and nearer. I could feel the cold of the walls filling the remaining space of the room. I was going to be crushed to death. There was a book of matches on the vanity. I lit a match and held it near the cold walls. They stopped moving. They were afraid of the heat. Then the match went out. The walls began to move again. I lit another match. They stopped. I held it until it drained itself out in my hand. I frantically lit another one. The last. It flared up, and then it died out. The walls began to move. They were just inches away now. And one of them touched my hand. I was cold and dreadful. In an agony of terror, I beat against the walls, and I screamed with every breath of life in me. Karen, 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 what's the matter, dear? Don't let them crush me. Help me, Horror. Stop beating the walls. Karen, what is the matter with you, dear? Oh, really? The walls were closing in on me. I, I had to light matches to stop them. Oh, Horace, it was ghastly. I'll never forget it so long as I live. Well, nightmares are always frightening, dear. You threw the covers off and the room's very cold. That's what probably brought it on. You forget it, darling. The dream won't come back. We talked for a while. And Horace dozed off. But I remained wide awake. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. I even tried counting sheep. And while I was counting, I got a sick feeling the walls were really closing in on me. I continued to count. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. The walls were coming closer. I mustn't believe it. It was my imagination. Only in mind. Eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. I could feel the walls hovering over me. Moving silently this time. Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. Karen, Karen, get some water quickly. The curtains are on fire. They were on fire. The flames were creeping up the curtain. Here, help me pull the curtains down. Here, here, here's the water. Oh, how did they catch on fire, Horace? Well, there's a book of matches on the floor, Karen. Here's a burnt-out match. Uh, I didn't do it. Oh, believe me, Horace, I swear I didn't. Darling, you haven't been feeling well lately. 
I think you ought to see Dr. Gustafson. I'm oh, not you sure don't that... believe me. I wouldn't do anything like that. I, I, I couldn't. You probably weren't aware of it. Probably nothing serious. <laughs> Dr. Gustafson's a very good man. <laughs> now, 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 Karen. Don't be a baby, darling. All of us get ill sometimes. <laughs> Dr. Gustafson is a little man with sharp eyes. I told him the whole story about the walls and the dream. He tried to be at ease. There was a mirror on his desk, and as I talk, I kept fixing my hair. Hmm. Didn't look so well today. Two new gray hairs which I had to pull out. He kept watching me very closely. All the time asked me questions about my youth. I told him everything, even about winning the beauty contest. When I was 17, he seemed very interested. Mrs. Jeremy, it seems to me you have an obsession about being beautiful. You're not as young as you used to be. Neither is your appearance. That's why you're afraid of close scrutiny. That may account for your fear of close spaces. You really it went on like that. Obsession? Looking at me as though I were a drab, middle-aged woman. He didn't like me, and I didn't like him. I didn't like the way he spoke to me. The way he watched me. Karen! Put the letter opener down. I... I was just holding it. You'll hurt somebody holding it that way, darling. No harm was meant, I'm sure. The first thing you should do, Mr. Jeremy, is to get larger living quarters. Your wife may be suffering from acute claustrophobia, among other things. I was glad the visit to that horrid little Dr. Gustafson didn't influence Horace at all. He still loved me. Told me I was the loveliest woman in all the world. One day he came home in great excitement. Darling, I've got a wonderful surprise for you. I've just bought the famous Meadow Mansion. Oh, Horace, do be careful. <laughs> you must my hair. What is this Meadow Mansion? Well, it belonged to John Aiken. You know, the famous naturalist. Mm -hmm. He was killed, poor fellow, not of accident. It's a huge house, and you won't be troubled by walls ever. Come on now, darling. We have to see the agent and sign lots of papers. We went to the agent's office. Mr. Swanson was his name. A very friendly old man. He kept looking at me all the time he was talking. Mr. Swanson, we'd like to take occupancy of the house right away. I, uh, I don't think it's a good idea, Mr. Jeremy. You see, there's still a lot of Mr. Aiken's property in the house, and... Oh, well, we don't mind that. You don't understand. Hmm? It's uh, specimens Mr. Aiken's left there, uh, animals and snakes. They're waiting to be shipped to the zoo. Well, there's nothing to worry about. They're in cages, aren't they? It'd be very unpleasant if they weren't. I'm scared to death of snakes myself. If we only wait a few more days, they'll all be shipped out. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll leave the animals strictly alone. We've just got to move in right away. Well, the house is so big. Uh, I guess you can manage. Uh, here are the keys, and good luck to you both. Meadow Mansion was magnificent. It was big and gracious. The rooms were huge and beautifully decorated. The high ceilings gave you a wonderful feeling of freedom. But the drawing room was loveliest of all. A large prison chandelier hung in the middle of the room, and the walls were paneled halfway up to the ceiling. But most exciting of all, each wooden panel had a darling little mirror set into it. There were easily a hundred such mirrors. Oh, it was very gay. You could see images of yourself anywhere in the room. It was all breathtakingly beautiful. Except for a picture on the wall of a very flashy-looking woman called Delilah. Well, darling, how do you like our new home? Oh, it's wonderful, Horace. I love it all. Everything. <laughs> except that picture. Oh, you mean Delilah? Well, that's a fine painting, dear, of a very beautiful woman. Well, it... She looks evil to me. <laughs> darling, I do believe you're jealous. You needn't be. She isn't half as pretty as you are. Alice! Alice, answer the door, please. We didn't talk about the picture anymore. Because Mr. Swanson, the agent, came in to see how we were getting on. I left Horace talking to him, and I wandered into the next room. There were a dozen cages standing near the fireplace. 
ready to be shipped off to the zoo. There were mostly snakes and lizards in the cages. All of them were quite motionless, except one. It was labeled Bushmaster Venzuela. Very odd name for a reptile. Fearfully ugly. Yet it fascinated me. About four feet long. Fat and clumsy looking. Yet it slid round the cage with wonderful grace. Kept moving round and round. Trying so hard to get out. It looked at me pleadingly. And then I found my hand on the safety catch. I drew it away in horror. It kept going round and round the four glass walls. I'd be maddening to have walls so close they touch you all the time. I remembered what a terrible feeling it was to be frightened of walls. Then suddenly, the snake was in the middle of the floor. Karen, don't move. Good heavens, it's out of the cage. Stand still, Karen. I didn't move. Not one bit. I wasn't frightened. I was only wondering how it had escaped from the cage. The snake lay there in the middle of the floor with its head up. Hissing. And it started to move. It slid in a wide circle toward Horace and Mrs. Swanson. It's coming towards me. I've got to get out of here. Don't run. But he didn't listen to Horace. He started running and the snake struck him. It struck him twice in the left. Ah. Then he continued running past him. Then suddenly he fell. Horace picked up a chair. He smashed it down the snake. He smashed it again and again. something else. It's simply murder. You do have a lot of trouble, don't you, Mr. Host? Mary, we have so much trouble on Inner Sanctum, even our troubles have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are times when all of us feel that trouble is piling up on us. But you know, friends, I've found a good way to get over that feeling. Just say to yourself, I'm going to relax and have a cup of Lipton tea. Then when you're comfortably seated with your teacup within easy reach, give your mind something pleasant to think about. That Lipton tea, for instance. Notice Lipton's deep amber color and its welcome, familiar fragrance that's so tempting. Then taste it and discover how, de- how really delicious that brisk flavor is. Just for real enjoyment any time during the day, just take a few minutes out to enjoy a piping hot cup of brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Well, I'll certainly give you a suggestion to try, Mary. And now, friends, if you'll give me your hand, we'll go on with the story. Or would you rather... Take yourself in hand. Things are going to be a little rugged from now on, so take a firm stand, sit tight, and buckle down. And it won't be a bad idea to grit your teeth and square your shoulders at the same time. By the way, if you can do all those things at once, let me congratulate you. You're quite an athlete. Well, here she is, Karen Jeremy. We'll be all for a long time. I don't remember how long, weeks, maybe months. Horace never spoke about that horrible afternoon. And after a while, I stopped thinking about it. I liked my new home. Meadow Mansion was such a beautiful place, I rarely left it. I loved best of all the drawing room, with its darling little mirrors and the wooden panels. I could see myself from all sides. It was so much fun. My absurd fear of walls was beginning to fade away only one thing that irritated me. That was the picture of Delilah. I was determined to get rid of it. Karen, stop glaring at that picture. I don't like it, Horace. I wish we'd get rid of it. It's a fine work of art. Why? I don't care. It's an evil picture to me. Karen, look here. You're just jealous of it. 
You're jealous of any beautiful woman, even if she's only a painting. You... You don't care for me anymore. That is a ridiculous thing to say. You know it's not true. If you really love me, you... You take that picture down off the wall. That picture is staying right where it is. Now, it's for your own good. I'm going out for a walk. And, Karen, I absolutely forbid you to touch that picture. I'm in it. I sat there for quite a while, staring at that picture that was upsetting my life with Horace. He was always kind and gentle with me. For the first time, he'd ever lost his temper. I looked at Delilah with a gleam of white teeth between her full lips. She was an abandoned-looking thing. Her long hair cunningly untidy. Her eyes sparkling, black, shameless. She seemed to be laughing at me. I made up my mind. Horace would understand. I got a knife from the kitchen. And I pulled a chair over to the picture. And I stood up on the chair. Then began to slice down the length of the picture. Mr. Jones! What are you doing? It's no business of yours. Go away, Alice. Oh, you mustn't do that. Mr. Jeremy will be angry. I told you it's none of your business. Please. Please come down off that chair. You're destroying a beautiful painting. You meddling little fool. I'll teach you to interfere. <gasps> Mr. Jeremy. I've put up with you for a long time. Nobody's ever dared to slap me. You, you vicious, miserable hag. That's what you are, a hag. For years, I've pampered you. I've always told you how beautiful you were, how lovely you looked. Well, maybe you were beautiful once, but now you're just a self-centered, haggard old woman. Well, just look at your face. You're... She was lying on the floor. Silent. Bleeding. I didn't stab her. It wasn't me. It couldn't be me. I wouldn't do such a thing. I looked at myself in the paneled mirror. I looked pale. My hair was all untidy. And I thought of Horace. He would never believe I didn't do it. He'd look at me in that piercing, sad way. No. No, he mustn't see the body. I must hide it before he gets back. I dragged her over to the closet. And I hid her body in the corner. And I, I locked the door with a key. Blood on my hand. I don't know how it got there. But I had to wash it off. And the knife. It threw it in the garbage pail. There was blood on the carpet, too. I took a scatter rug and carefully placed it over the spot. And I sat down. I waited for Horace to come home. The room was very queer. The chandelier seemed to be lower. All the walls. They seemed to be closer. I sat there fighting off that old terror, praying and praying that Horace would come home. As soon as he came, I'd I'd put my arms around him and never let him go again. Never, never, never let him go. And I heard the door not turning. I hurried over to the door. Hello, Karen. Oh, darling, 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 I'm so sorry. It was all my fault. Please forgive me, Horace. I, I can't bear your being angry with me. Please say you forgive me. That's all right, Karen. I shouldn't have lost my... <laughs> what happened to the painting? It's cut. <laughs> I don't know what came over me. But you see, I, I didn't cut it all. I stopped. It just cut a little. I can repair it. It'll be just as good as new. I'll never do it again. I, I swear I'll never touch it. Well, it's not too badly damaged. I'll get Alice to take it over to the art shop. Maybe they can repair it. Oh, well, Alice isn't here. She's she, she's gone to get get your blue cloak from from the tailor's. Karen, that is not true. Alice got that coat this morning. Where is she? I, I don't know where she is. Karen, you do know. Where is she? She was here just a little while ago. She she must have gone out. Alice. Alice. I'm going to find. No, her. no. Please don't leave me. Please, Horace. Must tell me where she is, Karen. I, I, I can't remember. I can't remember anything. Karen, did, did you do anything to her? Oh, no. No, no, nothing. You're not telling me the truth. Something has happened to her and you're hiding it. 
Oh, I'm going to find her. She must be somewhere. No, no. No, she isn't in the house. How do you know she's not here if you don't know where she is? I I, I didn't mean that. I'm going to look around. What? There's blood on the floor near the closet. Yes, I, I, I cut my finger. The closet is locked. Have you the key, Karen? No. No, I don't have it. Karen, give me that key. back as soon as I can. He left me in the room all alone. I looked at myself in the mirror. All my beauty was gone. I looked haggard. I wasn't beautiful anymore. My face was all wrinkled and pale. My hair hung down lifelessly. I was ugly. I wasn't that horrid see me now. I looked evil. I bolted the door. I didn't want him to come back and see me looking this way. He, he would hate me. The walls were moving again. They were very clever. They waited for Horace to leave. They were afraid of him. I looked at myself again in the mirror. There were dozens of me. Then something very strange happened. All the images of me began to come out of the mirrors. Right into the room. It was incredible. They were all ugly. They kept coming out of one mirror, going back into another. I watched them. They began to move very fast, in and out, in and out, in and out. Made my eyes hurt to watch them. The walls were moving slowly, but they couldn't fool me. I knew they were moving because the picture of Delilah was nearer than ever. She was still laughing. I could even hear her laughing. <laughs> she pushed one leg out of the picture frame. <laughs> then the other. came slowly toward me. Hello, Karen. Don't you think I'm beautiful? I didn't answer her. But she kept on talking to me. I'm Delilah. And I'm going to cut off your hair. <gasps> I couldn't stop her. She laughed as she cut my hair. It made me very, very sad. I began to cry. She began to cut faster and faster because the walls were very close now. I could even feel that coldness. Don't be frightened, Karen. I turned around. A man I never had seen before. He had a kind, good face. He looked at me tenderly. Admiringly. I'm Nano, the spirit of this house. You mustn't be afraid of me. I think you're beautiful. I've always admired you. You're even lovelier than Delilah. Oh, please help me, Mr. Meadow. The walls are so close. They're going to crush me. If you get into the picture frame, they won't be able to harm you. Quickly. Quickly, before Delilah comes back. Open the door. Hurry. You'd better hurry and climb into the frame, Karen, before it's too late. Hurry. Alan, open the door. Hurry, hurry. You haven't much time. You'll be safe inside the picture. Miss Head for head. In the picture frame. Karen, you... You, you cut your hair off. It's amazing. <laughs> she looks 20 years younger. <laughs> She's beautiful. <laughs> I'm safe now, darling. The wolf can never get me. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I think we did rather well tonight. Two of our characters were gathered to their forefathers. 
I'm sort of sorry about that maid. She seemed like a nice sort, and I don't think it was quite kind to be so cutting to her. But that renting agent, you couldn't get an apartment out of him anyhow. As for our heroine, it's true we didn't kill her off, but we certainly framed her. <laughs> well, it couldn't have been a very pretty picture, Mr. Host. No, Mary, but you'll have to admit it was remarkably lifelike. Well, while you're admiring it, I have a few words for our friends listening in. You know, some people tie a string around their finger to remind them of things. Well, I'm not going to ask you folks to do that. All I want you to do is just remember all the good things I've told you about Lipton tea. And let them remind you to get a package of Lipton's tomorrow. Lipton's wonderful, brisk flavor, its full-bodied goodness, mean more contentment in your teacup. Remember, Lipton's is the tea that gives you extra pleasure and extra satisfaction. Ask your grocer for a package tomorrow. Well, that should be easy to remember, Mary. Well, friends, it's time to close the squeaking door until next Tuesday when we'll get together again for another killing time. <laughs> Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Pavilion by Hilda Lawrence. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, next week's story is called The Edge of Death. Feeling a little edgy already? <laughs> a very interesting story. Yeah, it's sort of a mixture of Russian legend and modern psychiatry that tells of a beautiful and sinister old sword. But I'm sure you'll get the point. <laughs> so, until we meet on the edge of death next Tuesday. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's a grand dish to get your dinner off to a good start. Lipton's Noodle Soup. It has all the homemade goodness and real chickeny flavor your family loves. Lipton's Noodle Soup is seasoned to perfection and it's full of tender golden noodles. Hard to prepare? Not a bit. It takes only a few quick minutes from package to soup plate. Economical, too. Costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So get Lipton's Noodle Soup mixed tomorrow. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. The CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Here's your host at the creaking door. <laughs> Through these portals pass the world's most horrified people. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Did my happy medium startle you? Sorry, I keep him around to get in the right spirit, you know. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you feel a cold, thin sliver of steel across your neck in the next half hour, sit perfectly still. Someone's got an edge on you. Oh, gracious, Mr. Host, I'm afraid I'd have to move fast. Oh, no, Mary, you must sit still. You wouldn't want to lose your head. Well, I'll remember your advice, Mr. Host. But right now, I have some advice for our Lipton listeners. You know, a teapot can't talk. But if it could, I think it would tell you the same thing that I do about making tea. I think it would probably say, the most delicious tea is the tea with the most flavor. And I'll bet it would cast its vote, as so many folks do, for Lipton tea. Because Lipton's has that grand, brisk flavor. The flavor that's so different from other teas. The flavor that fills your cup with pleasure. You'll taste a world of tangy, full-bodied goodness in Lipton's. It's tea at its tastiest. So make that next pot of tea you brew at your house Lipton tea. And now here's a little tale of horror that speaks for itself. The Edge of Death. 
Written by Frederick Matho and starring Larry Haynes in the role of Ralph. We're going to tell you of a night Satan played a game of murder along a deserted strip of Manhattan's waterfront. For his sport, he chose two friends. For his victim, a woman. And the weapon he suggested he had long ago placed in the hands of another murderer. The weapon was a long, slender, graceful rapier, which first drew blood at the hand of Rasputin, the mad monk of Russia. Then, there's no bread. Open up. Then. Ralph. Ralph Lipkin. Well, come on in, man. What's the matter with you? You're soaked. No hat, no coat. Denton, you're my best friend, my only friend. You've got to help me. Well, I just got back from Chicago. I was going to drop over to your shop a little later. You, you got back too late. You could have helped me. No, it, it, it's too late. Well, what's the matter, Ralph? What have you done? Well, what's that in the package? Why, it's the antique sword I gave you when you were married. Ralph. Naked steel always looks different. Coated with blood. Ralph, you fool. You didn't... Yes. I just pierced a woman's heart with that rapier. About 15 minutes ago. Warned you about your temper ever since we were kids. You almost killed me once, do you remember? You warned me about my hobby, too. You said I had a psych... A psych... Psychosis. That's what we psychiatrists call it. Your unnatural love of steel blades, your worship of ancient weapons and tempered steel, it... Well, it's off balance. There's nothing in the world more beautiful than a piece of true hand-forged steel. It's an art as old as man. Yes, I know. We've been over all that before, but... Now you're a murderer. And I want to know everything that happened. It's too late, then. I only maybe, came... Maybe I can dig something out of you that might help your defense. Now, Ralph... Close your eyes. Close your eyes and let your mind wander. Tell me the first image you get. Tell me every detail, no matter what. I see the wedding. Here at your house. The guests have left. Ingrid is blonde and beautiful in white satin. She's standing beside me. And you come toward me with a pack. Denton. Oh, it was so good of you to make such a beautiful wedding for us. You are the best, best man ever. Oh, no, no, no. Maybe, maybe, maybe the best, second best man ever. Ralph was best today. Well, you gave me some stiff competition, then. I, I've got another wedding present for you, Ralph. Mm -hmm. I waited till now to bring it out because I, I... I didn't think the others would understand. Here, open it. Open it. It's... Well, do, you, do you like it, Ralph? Is it a good one? This is a good one. Well, it's the most beautiful rapier I've ever seen. What, the balance and, and the lines. Magnificent steel. Look, look, Ingrid. Isn't it wonderful? It will be the very nicest sword in your collection, darling. As well as your last. His last? Oh, yes, yes, then. I promised Ingrid no more auctions. <laughs> and he'll keep his promise this time. I'm going to change, darling. Won't take me long. All right, darling, hurry. You really like that blade, don't you, Ralph? Like it. It's beautiful. Where did you find it? Well, I saw it yesterday in a small, junky antique shop in the village. Little Russian fellow runs it. Oh, did he tell you anything about the blade? I mean, where he got it? No, but he said it was Russian. He said the hilt was uh, black lacquer on rosewood and the steel was superior. Oh, he said something there. He mumbled on about wanting to get rid of it before the full moon. Something about it being an evil thing. Claimed it once belonged to Rasputin, the mad monk of Russia. Say, I wonder if it did. I doubt it. Anyhow, he finished by saying that whoever owned it would have evil luck and failing to get rid of it before the full moon would die by violence. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it back to him if you like, Ralph. No, no, not on your life, then. But uh, don't mention that nonsense to Ingrid, will you? I remember all that myself, Ralph. I left for Chicago that night. Now, what's the next thing that comes to your mind as important? Well, about three weeks ago, 
I was working on some knives in the shop. Ingrid had left. I was alone. The shop door opened and she was there. She? Who, Rob? Stasha. She was beautiful. Tall. White as marble. Dressed in black. And beautiful. I beg your pardon. What did you say? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> You said beautiful. There's no cause to be embarrassed. I have heard this said before. Um, what can I, I do for you, Miss... Miss... Kasov. Stasia Kasov. You own something that I would like to buy. What is it? A rapier. A Russian rapier. I saw it in your window as I passed. It's not for sale. Oh, Really? Are you sure? I will pay you well. Say, a hundred dollars. Sorry. Very well. Perhaps you might change your mind. Hmm? Here. Here is my card. Come and see me if you do. Well, thanks, but, but I... <laughs> Shall we say... Before the next full moon, Rob. <laughs> Ralph, if it weren't for that blood-stained rapier on the table, I'd say you were lying. How could this woman know your name or anything about the legend of the rapier? I know how. What happened then, Ralph? I've handled steel all my life. I've forged it, pounded it, tempered it, ground it to razor edge, and I've never cut myself. After Stasha left, I put the rapier to the stone. And as I worked, I, I kept seeing her eyes in the forge fire, glinting with evil beauty. Kept hearing her voice. turned suddenly to see if she was there. And I tripped. The rapier fell and I fell against the upturned point. Ah! Oh. Oh. Rolf! Rolf, what's happened? Rolf! I, I'm all right. Pull it out. Straight out. Oh, no. No, I can't do that. All right, I'll do it then. I'll do it. Oh. Rolf, your arm is all blood. Oh, it's not bad. It just passed with the flesh. Called out to burn. Oh, those stupid knives. Why don't you get rid of them? While well, Ingrid phoned, it crept over me the deadening certainty that my fate was tied to Stasha Kasov's. That death was lunging at us with Rasputin's rapier, and I was unarmed. I told Ingrid about the woman. I told her about Stasha's offer of $100 for the blade. I shouldn't have. And to turn down $100 for it? Ralph, that's the limit. Ingrid, I can't expect everyone to understand some things about my character, but I do expect you to try. I think I do understand, Ralph. I think you didn't want to sell that thing because you want that woman to come back. That was your first quarrel, Ralph? Yes. There were lots more. Things got worse. We quarreled a lot. It, it wasn't Ingrid's fault. I was changing. I kept thinking of Stasia. Her eyes mocked me. I tore up a card in anger, but I'd memorized the address. It was an old Dutch mansion on Littner Street. I had to see her again. There was a light in the house. And oddly enough, the front door was open a bit. I rang a long time, but no one answered. I obeyed an impulse and walked in. There was a coal fire going in the high ceiling living room. It cast dancing shadows on a life-sized oil painting above. A cold hand gripped my heart when I saw that painting. It was the painting of a man in a monk's habit. And his gnarled hand rested on the hilt of a jeweled rapier of exquisite beauty. Yes, the man in the picture is long dead. But his mad spirit is in this room. It laughs from within you, Rolf Wittkum. It has seized your body. Stasia. You 
now? If I were Ralph, I wouldn't be seen dead with somebody else's spirit. You can't tell what will happen to a man when the, the spirit moves him. Goodness, <laughs> Mr. Host. That sword has certainly brought Ralph bad luck. Yes, Mary. It got him in trouble right up to the hilt. And we're only halfway through the story. Oh, yes, there's still a lot more excitement to look forward to. And I think looking forward to things is so much fun. For instance, imagine you're brewing up a pot of Lipton tea. Well, you know there's enjoy enjoyment ahead just as soon as that water starts bubbling in the tea kettle. The very sound of it is warm and cheerful and friendly, like Lipton's itself. And then when you lift that cup to your lips, oh, there's such a deep down satisfaction in Lipton's brisk flavor because it's so mellow and satisfying, brimming with lively, full-bodied goodness. Yes, all those little promises of enjoyment are completely fulfilled in your first delicious sip of brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Well, you certainly have a point there, Mary. But now, back to Ralph Wiedkin as he tells his friend the events leading to the murder he has committed tonight. He's telling of his first visit to the strange house of Stasia Kasov. So the Kasov woman convinced you that the spirit or the ghost of Rasputin had taken possession of your body. And you fell for it. Oh, I fought against believing it, Tenton. But it did explain so many of the strange promptings that had been stirring me all up inside. Did she say anything more about it? No. I turned to face her. She was a smiling column of white beauty. Sheathed in black satin. Miss Karsoff, how is Stasia. it? Stasia. Call me Stasia. How is it you know my name? What, what do you know about the rapier? Does it matter? You have changed your mind, perhaps, about selling me your rapier? Hmm? No, I... I came to ask you about it. Oh, you came because you are confused. We will discuss it. But first, let us have some tea. Yes? I examined the room while she was out of it. On the wall across from the fireplace were five oil paintings. All of them portraits of men. At first I thought the light was playing tricks. It wasn't. Each face was painted with closed eyes. Each was a study in sleep. Or death. You like my painting? Come and sit down. We'll have tea and talk. Who are those men you painted, Stasia? The five men you see in those paintings, each own the rapier you now possess. Good Lord. Then they're... Dead. Uh, and the dates on the paintings? Uh, those are the dates on which they died, Rolf. Each on a day of the full moon. Each kept the rapier beyond the time he should have. More tea? Stasia's eyes were eager and wide. My ears began to ring. I recall setting the cup down. I remember Stasia's voice a long way off. Russian cheese from my friend. And so a Russian legend. <laughs> This is all so fantastic, Ralph. Are you sure it wasn't something you... something you dreamed? Something I dreamed? No, she drugged me. It was no dream. Those portraits were no dream. The painting of Rasputin was no dream. They were there when I woke. Stasia was gone. The fire was on. My head ached. There was an easel near the lamp. It hadn't been there before. I shuffled toward it. It was a fresh painting on the easel. I stared at the face before me. Its eyes were closed in sleep. The face was... mine. There was a date painted in Denton. It was January 15th. Why? Yes. Yes, that's tonight. I couldn't find Stasia, so I dashed out of the house, cursing like a madman. It was four in the morning when I reached home. 
Ingrid was waiting for me. She was crying. Rolf! Rolf, darling, where have you been? Why? What difference does it make? You... You've been to see that Kossoff woman. Yes, yes, I've been to see that Kossoff woman. Oh. I had to. I'm losing my mind, Ingrid. Something's trying to kill me. That woman knows about it. She knows how and when it'll happen. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I don't care anymore. I don't care. Rolf, where are you going? Back to the shop. Back to that cursed rapier. In the shop, I tried to reason the thing out. I was toying with the rapier. It was a tiny green speck on the black hilt. Idly, I picked at it with my thumbnail, and the chip of lacquer snapped off. The hilt was supposed to be wood. But here, it was what looked like a large emerald. My heart pounding, I chipped and picked at the lacquer until bit by bit I uncovered the most dazzling and richly wrought collection of jewels I'd ever seen. Set in solid gold were pearls, rubies, emeralds, and a magnificent star sapphire. This was the bejeweled blade that Rasputin held in his hand in Stasha's painting. This was Rasputin's rapier. I returned to Stasha's house. Like the first night, the door was ajar. Like the first night, I walked in. I walked into the living room. I looked about. Nothing had changed. Nothing, that is, except that mine was the sixth painting, now hung beside the others. And the art. Easel already had a fresh canvas. Stasha was already painting a new portrait. The face was indistinct. But the date was clear. One lunar month from tonight. I gave up and walked home with the rapier under my arm. It was drizzling and foggy along the waterfront, and I was sick inside. I kept hearing Stasha's voice locked in my brain. Tonight is the last night you may own the rapier, Rolf. But there is a way out. A way out? How? Oh. There's no way out as long as either of us lives. There is a way out, Rolf. Somebody's following me. A woman. I could hear her high heels on the cobblestones. I just passed that little blind alley. You know, the one about a block away from my shop. I decided to trick her. I stopped short. I spun around and caught sight of a woman in black as she darted into the alley. It was Stasha. And there was no exit from that alley. I tiptoed to the entrance and leaped into its shadows. All I could see was a large empty carton against the far wall. She had to be behind that. I gripped the jeweled handle of the rapier until it burned my hand. Only one searing thought in my tired mind. Stasha must die. I took a deep breath and drew the needle-pointed steel back. Aimed at where I judged a heart to be. And thrust... <laughs> Blade out, and her body slumped forward. I lit a match to see her face. But it. it wasn't Stasha Karsoff I had killed. It was. Ingrid. My wife. Ingrid. It worked. My plan worked. Ralph reacted just as I planned it. You mean he did it? Killed the her? The psychological masterpiece. He told me the whole story at my office ten minutes ago. He killed her thinking it was you. Well, now that she is gone, you are happy. 
You will love me and forget her then. Oh, perfect, perfect. She, she picked that stupid fool instead of me. Now she's dead and he'll die too. Oh, Denton, I'm so glad. I would do anything Everything for you. Everything went like clockwork. This rapier I found in your attic, the, the legend I made up, the phony paintings of former owners, your flirtation, yes. perfect, perfect. <laughs> the perfect murder, I've done it. Did my acting please you, Denton? Oh, you were magnificent, but... There's only one weakness to my plan, Stasia. What is it? When Ralph is picked up, there must be no way for anyone to find out that you and I know each other, Stasia. Oh, I know, and no one will know, darling. Ralph's fingerprints are still on this rapier. He'll be electrocuted for one murder. Might as well be for two. Denton! No! I love you! I'm Denton. sorry, Stasia! I love you. Still, I will wait for you. Very neat stroke, then. Ralph! I heard everything you said, Denton. But I didn't have to, I knew. No, don't move. The gun is faster than a rapier. How did you know, Ralph? Something I said tonight? No. No, something I saw. Stasia loved you. The painting I saw on her easel tonight, the one I told you she'd begun, was your portrait. The only way I knew was because, as an artist, she was conscious of the scar on your forehead. She painted that in first. The scar you gave me as a kid. Oh, you've a lot more brains than I gave you credit for, but at least we'll burn together. Sorry, Denton. I'll have to decline that honor. Ralph! Ralph, am I too late? Ingrid! Ingrid, no, you're... You're dead. Ralph! Everything you told me at my house tonight was a lie. No, Denton. Your plan almost worked. I told you the truth. Except... Except for the part about murdering Ingrid. You... You should have studied psychiatry, Ralph. I did, Denton. I had a good teacher. You. soon, darling? Uh-huh. You seem so far away, Ralph. Is anything wrong? No. No. I've been thinking about Denton. Odd the way things turned out. He made up that story about the rapier and its belonging to Rasputin and its owners dying on the night of the full moon. You don't believe it, do you? No. But what he thought was a cheap blade... Turns out to be a priceless treasure. It matches the one Rasputin held in his hand in the painting. That was coincidence, darling. Come on, now put your work away. Let's go home. It's late. Mm -hmm. Such a beautiful night, Rolf. Let's walk home. All right. You know... You know that painting Stasia started of Denton? The one that gave us plot away? Yes. Yeah. It had a date on it. I wonder what ghostly hand guided her brush as she wrote that date. Why? The date she wrote was today's. There's a full moon. And tonight was the night Denton was electrocuted. Wouldn't you say that's a story which gets down to fine points? Mm -hmm. Happy ending, too. Yes, you get a ghost-to-ghost -ghost hookup between Stasia and Denton. Ralph and Ingrid get an Exhibit A worth a few bucks and go back to the old grind. <laughs> well, I'm glad Denton's plot didn't work. Yes, Mary, but if it had, Ralph would have had a plot of his own, you know, in a cemetery. 
After all, that's one of the best-selling plots I know of. Oh, nonsense, Mr. Host. If you think that's the kind of thought we want to leave our Lipton listeners with, you're quite wrong. Here's a much better thought for folks to carry away with them. Tomorrow, when you visit the grocers, get a package of Lipton tea. Buy it, try it, and see if you don't agree that Lipton's brisk flavor gives you extra enjoyment. Oh, yes, there's a great treat in store for you when you first taste Lipton's full-bodied, zestful goodness. Ask your grocer for a package of Lipton tea tomorrow. And now, friends, in case you're wondering, we do have a moral for tonight's story. It's short and sharp. Knife can be beautiful. If you keep your temper and look out for people with an axe to grind, they may be trying to get ahead of you. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's inner sanctum mystery novel is The Pavilion by Hilda Lawrence. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup bring you another grisly inner sanctum tale directed by Hyman Brown and titled The Confession. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have an appointment with Stasia and Denton. Yes, they've got the concession for hand-forged hinges where it's hotter than the hinges of... Hmm? <laughs> Until next Tuesday, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> Got tomorrow's meal on your mind? Well, how about letting me make a suggestion? Now, here's a real menu masterpiece that the whole family will love. It's Lipton's Noodle Soup. A grand soup chock full of wonderful fresh-cooked chickeny goodness. Lipton's Noodle Soup is prepared with ease, ready to please in just a few quick minutes. It's economical, too. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So ask your grocer for Lipton's Noodle Soup Mix. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Welcome. Come right in. There's room enough for everybody. As a matter of fact, the more bodies, the better. <laughs> Don't be surprised by the gloom. It's our new paint job in black so the bloodstains won't show. Why, Mr. Host, that's an awful thing to say. Giving all these nice people the wrong impression about our oh, program. Oh, on the contrary, Mary. You know very well that our proceedings here are rather terrifying and our little family a bit on the gruesome. Of course, it used to be different in the old days of Inner Sanctum, but since then we grew some. <laughs> <laughs> we have indeed, Mr. Host. But now, while you're busy making last-minute arrangements, I'm going to enjoy a chat with our Lipton listeners. When you tip up the teapot and pour yourself out a cup of Lipton tea, mm, what a lively, inviting fragrance curls up from the cup to greet you. And above all, what sheer delight there is in Lipton's delicious taste. You say to yourself... There must be a reason why Lipton tea is so much more enjoyable than any tea I've ever tasted. And friends, there is. It's Lipton's brisk flavor. Briskness in a tea is what folks like. And brisk is the very word the tea experts themselves use to describe Lipton's hearty, more flavorful goodness. So no wonder tea drinkers love Lipton so much. Unlike ordinary dull-tasting teas, Lipton's has a world of fresh, lively, full-bodied flavor. 
And because it's brisk tasting, more people buy and enjoy Lipton's than any other brand of tea in the world. Chances are you'll prefer it, too. Try this tangy, more flavorful tea soon. It's Lipton tea. Brisk-flavored Lipton tea. And now, friends, draw up your chairs. Dim the lights and listen to a story designed to freeze the spine and set the teeth on edge. It was written by Michael Sklar and Richard Manoff. And it's called The Confession. And our star is Santa Sotega, who plays the role of Alex. The last thing I remembered was the gunshot. The thought of the bullet. And the burning pain in my stomach. And everything got black. When I regained consciousness, my impression was of blinding whiteness. There, don't try to move, Mr. Sturgis. Where am I? This is the emergency ward of the general hospital. I felt no pain. Just an overall numbness. And a desire to sleep. Am... Am I going to die? Yes. How much time have I got? A couple of hours. Doctor, I... I want to make confession... I want to confess to murder. I told the doctor about the money and Lenore. She was much younger than I. And she thought because I owned a little drugstore, I must be prosperous. And I suppose that's why she married me in spite of the difference in our ages. But there wasn't any money for fun or nice clothes. So she became restless. But I loved her. And I did my best. Until the other night. In the drugstore. Oh, uh, it's 12 o'clock, thank heaven. Time to close up, Alex. Five more minutes, dear. Another customer might come along. <laughs> Just like an old man chasing pennies. Never getting anything out of life. Be reasonable, dear. I'm trying to make a living for it. Is this your idea of a living? Is this what you promised me before we were married? I know it's not what you deserve, Lenore, but someday... Oh, you make me sick. I must have been crazy when I married you. Lenore... I'm going to say something I've had on my mind for a long time, Alex. Rather than go on this way, I'd prefer to be dead. <sighs> Look at you. I don't have to put up with you. I'm still young, Alex. So there it was. Out in the open. An old man with money would have been acceptable. But because I had no money, she was going to leave me. I wanted to plead with her. I would have gotten down on my knees. But before I could say anything, the street door opened. And a man stumbled into the store. Oh, Alex, look! Help me, quick. I'm wounded. I helped the man to a chair. He'd been shot on the chest and the front of his coat was covered with blood. His breathing came hard. Bullet, my chest... Patch me up. I'm only a pharmacist. You need a doctor. I, I, I'll call Dr. Johnson. No, no, I don't want any doctor. I want you to help me. Is it because doctors must report bullet wounds? Is that why you want a doctor? Never mind my reason. I got plenty of do. I'll give you $500 to take care of me. Well, I'd better call the police. No, lady, no. Look, mister, take care of me. Keep it quiet. I'll give you a thousand. thousand dollars? Let me see the money. Here. Here's a thousand dollar bill. But I got plenty more. No, no. Help me take him into the back room. Oh, but Alex... No, I'll take him myself. You get busy and wipe the blood off the floor. Oh, no. No, you can't. Wipe up the blood. Do as I say, Lenore. Hey, what's taking you so long? I'm looking for a certain medicine among these bottles. Give me something to stop the bleeding. Hurry. I'll be ready for you soon. Oh, Lenore, did you get the floor clean? Yes, it's clean. How is he? He's in bad shape. Weak from loss of blood. Alex, you, you haven't done anything for him yet. Be quiet. But you've been in here five minutes and he's just like he was before. Alex, you're stalling. Uh, oh, the hell. Alex. Let him lay there. But, but he's dying. I know. Alex, call the police. No. Uh, are you going to let him die? Yes. That's as bad as murder. I didn't shoot him. It's not my fault if he dies. Lenore, he's got money. Thousands of dollars. 
No one knows he came here. This is our chance, Lenore. What do you mean? I'm going to let him die. Take his money. And then get rid of his body. He lay still. I stooped and went through his jacket. There was a wallet containing a few one-dollar bills and a driver's license, which I handed to Lenore. Hmm. His name is James Kirk. He lives in Hillsborough. His pockets were crammed full of bills of large denominations. Lenore watched, fascinated, as I counted. Hmm. How much is it, Alex? A little over $78,000. We're rich, Lenore. Oh, I, I'm frightened. There's nothing to be afraid of. All we have to do now is wait until he dies and get rid of the body. <laughs> Do you need me to help you? No. I can manage alone. This body's heavy. Yeah. It's through the door. Oh. oh. Alex. He's still alive. Yes. Well, what are you going to do now? It'd be dangerous to wait here until he dies. Anyway, what difference does it make? He'll be dead when he goes into the water. No. No. No, that's murder. Call it what you like. We've gone too far now to stop. You wait in the car. I'm going to carry him to the edge of the pier and drop him over the side. He's gone. I watched Kirk's body sink into the water. I knew the current in the bay would carry it out to sea. One doesn't picture a middle-aged druggist committing a perfect crime. But I felt sure that I'd done it. For I had Kirk's money. And it seemed that no one could connect his death to me. I rejoined Lenore in the car. Started for home. After I'd driven for a few minutes... I noticed she was strangely quiet. What's the matter, dear? Nothing. Nothing at all. Something's troubling you. What is it? Nothing. You act as though you're afraid of me. Uh, no. You are afraid of me. But no. Why? I, I never saw you act this way before. Something's happened to you. You're different. Oh, nonsense. Don't you feel it, Alex? You're a murderer. No. You wouldn't even wait until he was dead. Listen to me, Lenore. Whatever I did, I did for your sake. I wanted the money for you. So you could be happy. Oh, how can I be happy with this... this thing hanging over us? We had breakfast the next morning in absolute silence. Then Lenore went to open the store. While I wrapped the money in a parcel. Took it to the bank. Placed it in my box in the safe deposit vault. No one paid any attention to me. Although the bank was swarming with police detectives. From the bank, I went directly to the drugstore. And found a man there waiting for me. Mr. Sturgis. Yes? Bigard is my name. Mark Bigard. What can I do for you? I'm an insurance company detective, Mr. Sturgis. I'm investigating the first national bank robbery for my company. I want you to tell me everything you know about that robbery. <laughs> Don't say I didn't warn you about Alex Sturgis at the beginning of our story. You know, he's quite a guy for an oldish man. A real killer. He thinks death begins at 40. Mr. Host, I think Alex Sturgis is a perfectly dreadful person. Oh, but he's a good druggist, Mary. Just the man to go to if you have to fill a prescription for murder. <laughs> well, <laughs> we've certainly had plenty of prescriptions for murder, mayhem, and arson on our program, Mr. Host. But now I've got something different, a prescription for enjoyment. The directions are pleasantly simple. First, just stretch out in an easy chair in front of the fireplace. Then make sure there's a cup of brisk-flavored Lipton tea at your side, and your pleasure will be complete. 
Mmm. There's just nothing more delightfully good than the zestful flavor of Lipton tea. It's so bright and refreshing and satisfying. Its familiar welcome fragrance seems to fill the whole room with summer. And how beautifully its deep amber color fits the scene. A color as warm and cheery as the flames dancing on the hearth. Now there's a real prescription for enjoyment. Try it tomorrow with a piping hot cup of delicious, brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Well, that should be a very pleasant prescription to take, Mary. And now, friends, let's get on with our story. Lying on a hospital bed, Alex Sturgis has confessed to the murder of a bank robber who entered his drugstore in much the same manner as the fly who entered the spider's parlor. Alex pocketed the robber's loot and dumped him, still alive, into the bay. An insurance company detective has just come in to question him. He was a big man, but not fat, this detective. And although he didn't appear to be very intelligent, he had a look of cunning. His clothes were rumpled, and he rolled an unlit cigar around in his mouth as he spoke. Suppose you start from the beginning, Sturgis. There's nothing to talk about, Vigard. I don't know anything about the robbery. You don't, eh? No, I don't. Why should you come here annoying me with silly questions? I'll tell you why I'm here, Sturgis. And then maybe you'll see your way clear to talk. You know the bank was robbed last night and the cook got away with better than $78,000? Yes. The night watchman was shot. He's in a coma now, but before he was shot, he shot one of the crooks. What does that have to do with me? I'm coming to you, Sturgis. I'm a slow man, but I'm thorough. Which is more than you can say for the harness bulls on the police force. Take those harness bulls. They didn't spot the trail of blood that wounded crook left when he ducked on the alley behind the bank. (laughs) Funny thing, they clean missed it. But I noticed it, Sturgis. I followed it through the alley and straight up the street. And here's another peculiar thing. The trail ended right smack at the door of this drugstore. Are you implying... Two and two makes four, Sturgis. As I said, I'm not a fancy pants detective, but... Here's how I figure it. This Yeg was wounded. So he came in here and asked you to fix him up, which you did. In exchange, he gave you a nice big piece of the tape to keep your mouth shut. Am I right, Sturgis? You're 100% wrong. If you were smart, you'd talk now and save yourself a lot of grief. I've got nothing to tell you. Suit yourself, Sturgis. But here's my business card. In case you change your mind, you can reach me, the Hotel Empire. Uh, By the way... The company is offering a $5,000 reward for the return of that money. I'm not interested. Good day. Okay. It's your next, Sturgis. I'll be seeing you. Alex. Alex, I heard what he said. He knows. I should have thought of the blood outside. How can you stand there and act so calm about it? He knows, I tell you. Take hold of yourself and know. He only suspects. And his suspicions aren't worth two cents unless he can produce evidence. Believe me. We've got nothing to worry about. I was cocky then. Too cocky. Fanon was right. I was a changed man. That money had put iron into my spine. And then, that afternoon, I got the first of the phone calls. Hello? Sturgis Drugstore. This is Western Union calling. I have a telegram for Mr. Alex Sturgis. This is he speaking. Yes, yes, of course. The message reads as follows. Place the money in an envelope and mail it to box number 11, General Post Office. Don't fail to act as instructed because your future depends on it. Is, uh, that all? That's all, Mr. Sturgis. There is no signature. Thank you. Bye. Oh, it was bad enough having that detective snooping around, but now this telegram. Oh, don't take any more chances, Alex. Send the money. No. Alex, please. I'm frightened. Listen, Lenore. Calm yourself. It's perfectly clear what happened. One of the bank robbers came with Kirk as far as the store. He must have been frightened away by the police. Now he's using this method to get the money. But he won't get it. Why? What are you going to do? I'm going to put a wad of blank paper in an envelope and mail it to that post office box. Then I'll stand watch at the post office and see who claims it. And then what? That money means everything to us, Lenore. I've already killed one man for it. If necessary, I'll commit another murder. I placed blank strips of paper in an envelope and mailed the envelope to that post office box. The next morning, 
I went to the post office and stood near the window, waiting for someone to come along and claim the envelope in box number 11. Hours passed. I got hungry. My legs began to shake from exhaustion. But I couldn't leave that spot. I meant to stay there until... What are you waiting here for, Sturgis? A voice cut through my thoughts. I looked up. It was Kelly, the policeman. He was suspicious. The clerk noticed you hanging around and called for a cop. Uh, uh, it's nothing, Kelly. I, I I, arranged to meet my wife here. She's late. Yeah, I saw your wife through the drugstore window as I came up the street. She must have forgotten all about your appointment. You'd better get back to the store, Sturgis. I couldn't stay there after that. I walked around the block. When I came back, the policeman had disappeared. I entered, went to the window, and asked the clerk if anyone had claimed the mail in box 11. He nodded. The letter was gone. My plan to discover the identity of Kirk's confederate had failed. There was nothing to do but go back to the drugstore. It was empty. I felt a sense of danger as soon as I entered. So I closed the street door quietly. And walked as silently as I could to the door of the back room. It was open. And I know I was at the telephone. Hello. Hello, Empire? Hotel? Hello. Connect me with Mr. Biggert, please. Yes. Mr. Mark Biggert. Hang up, Lenore. Oh. Hang up the receiver. Alex! You were calling that detective. Suppose I was. What of it? You were going to tell him about the money. You were going to double-cross me for the reward. You're so smart, Alex. What are you going to do about it? No. Don't you understand? I don't want the money for myself. I took it for you. To give you the things that will make you happy. <laughs> Big-hearted, unselfish Alex. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> I'll tell you why you took that money, Alex. You thought you could buy me with it. Well, you're wrong. I wouldn't stay with you if you had all the money in the world. Oh, no. Would you leave me after all that's happened? I'm packing up right now. No. You can't stop me. I love you, Lenore. I did my best to hold you. If I can't have you, no one else will have you. What do you mean? Alex, stay away from me. I'm going to kill you, Lenore. Alex, no. Don't... I'm going to... Kill you, oh, my let darling. Let go of my throat. Uh, Alex. Uh, yeah. uh, let go. <laughs> She's dead. All men kill the thing they love. And I've killed you, Lenore. I felt empty. Drained of all emotion. I buried her body in the cellar of the drugstore. I was even a bit glad that it ended in this fashion. For now, Lenore would be with me forever. Did I say it was ended? I was wrong. I found no peace. For the very next morning, Bigot came to the drugstore. Good morning, Sturgis. Nice morning, isn't it? What do you want? Just stop by to have a chat, Sturgis. We've been giving a lot of thought to the first National Bank robbery. You know, that night watchman came out of his coma this morning. Why tell me about it? I thought you might be interested. He is an angle, Sturgis. The watchman says the robbery was pulled by only one man. One single crook, and he was shot. Nice angle, isn't it? Is it? Yes, it gave me a new idea, Sturgis. Now, I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but I figure it this way. That crook came in here and asked you to fix him up. We've gone through this before. I'm going to take it a little further, Sturgis. The crook asked you to fix him up, but you got a peek at all that money. So you let him die, took the money, and disposed of the body. How's that for a theory? Very clever. But can you produce the body? No, the police haven't been able to locate it, but I'm not discouraged, Sturgis. Those harness bulls aren't very smart. I'll find that body. And when you do? I'm an insurance company, Dick Sturgis. I want that $78,000. When I find that body, I'll come around here and you'll cough it up. I've told you before, I know nothing about that robbery or the money. Now I've got work to do. Suppose you run along. Okay, Sturgis. So long.
Hello. Sturgis Drugstore. Western Union calling. I have a telegram for Mr. Alex Sturgis. This is he speaking. Read it to me, please. The message reads as follows. Received your letter. Contents not what requested. Suggest you obey instructions. Same box number and post office. This is final. His... Is there a signature? No, sir. There's no signature, Mr. Sturgis. I hung up. My head was reeling. But out of the confusion in my mind, one thought emerged. The night watchman had said Kirk had no Confederates in the bank robbery. Therefore, the person sending me the telegram must be Kirk. The salt water of the bay must have revived him. Kirk was still alive. I found Kirk's wallet on a shelf where Lenore had placed it the night all this began. From the driver's license, I copied his home address. I waited till after midnight and drove to Hillsborough, where I found Kirk's apartment in an old tenement building. The door was unlocked. I drew out my gun and entered. I meant to kill Kirk. I had to kill him. The living room was empty. No one was in the bedroom. I turned Drop that gun, Sturgis. Big, drop the gun. Quick, I'm not taking any chances with you. How, how, how did you know? How did I know you were going to come here, Sturgis? <laughs> Sit down in that chair by the table and I'll tell you. You? You sent the telegram? Yes, I sent them. You got me to think that Kirk was still alive. That's right. And you followed me here. You trailed me. It's all clear now, isn't it, Sturgis? <laughs> you take two and two and add it up and it comes out four. Now, where's the money? The money? We're going to cut out the cute stuff, Sturgis. I want that money. Now, where is it? It's in a medicine jar. On a shelf in the back room of the drugstore. All right, let's go, Sturgis. First you'll give me the money, then I'll take you down to police headquarters. We drove to the drugstore. I led him into the back room. I knew exactly what I was going to do. On one of the shelves was a bottle of hydrochloric acid. Bigger thought it was the bottle containing the money. I reached up, uncorked the bottle... And flung the burning liquid into us. Ah, I'm blind. I'll kill you for this, Sturgis. If I could only see you. Where are you, Sturgis? Sturgis, Sturgis, where are you? I was huddled I against the wall. Down. He stood between me and the door, screaming in pain, firing his gun blindly. The first three shots missed, but the fourth bullet struck me in the stomach. Oh, oh. The last thing I remember... Is Bigot running out of that room shouting for help? I lost consciousness soon after. When I came to, I found myself here in this hospital. You know the rest of the story, Doctor. That's your confession, eh? That's my confession. Did you get all that down on paper, Mr. Bigot? Got every word of it, Doctor. Bigot, you... How did you get here? I thought... Hydrochloric acid. You thought you blinded me permanently, but not enough of the stuff to get into my eyes to do any real damage. I... Oh, oh Lenore. Lenore. Oh. He's dead, Biggert. I've seen a lot of funny cases in my time, Doc, but this beats them all. He is a man who commits murder to get a lot of stolen money for his wife. Then he kills his wife. And finally, he gets killed himself. And the money? <laughs> the money is safe and sound in the bank safe deposit vault. <laughs> oh, what a pity. Exit Sturgis. Yes, Bigot smoked him out just like a poor fish. <laughs> smoked Sturgis. <laughs> Think of it, a respectable pharmacist ending up that way, and all because of his wife. Now, there you go again, Mr. Host, always blaming it on a woman. Oh, come, come, Mary, you know very well that was Lenore's fault. If you ask me, Alex should have tossed her oxide and tended to his business. He never would have been nabbed by the copper. But the fool, he didn't think of it. Now the world is iridium. Goodness, Mr. Host. <laughs> well, after all that, I, I hope you won't mind if I get serious for a moment. Because I have a very important message for our listeners. Friends, the 1946 March of Dimes is now in its final week. And your contribution is needed as never before. 
Every year, thousands of children are stricken by infantile paralysis. Your dimes and dollars guarantee expert medical treatment and continuing care for these children. So give generously. Send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Join the March of Dimes. And now, friends, a word of advice to all prospective murderers. Never fall in love with your victim because, as Oscar Wilde found out, it's so embarrassing to kill the thing you love. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Pavilion by Hilda Lawrence. Next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will bring you another Inner Sanctum mystery directed by Hyman Brown and called The Blood of Cain. It's a grim little story of a New Orleans family with a fine old tradition of murder. Yes, this family tree casts a shadow of death. So, if you're able, tune in next Tuesday and we'll all raise Cain. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good evening, Cree, and welcome to the Mystery Playhouse. If you like to curl up with a good mystery, if suspense and mysterious adventure are your particular dish, then don't go away. Stay right where you are, because tonight we've been fortunate enough to again secure the services of that light-hearted raconteur of murder, horror, and the supernatural, the laughing boy of inner sanctum, your host, Raymond. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Welcome once again through the squeaking door. So brave of you to drop in. You know, I do like to have a body around. It keeps me in good spirits. <laughs> eh, what's that? Oh, you feel warm. Well, now, that may be the fault of the chairs. You see, we've been redecorating, and the chairs you're sitting in are hot seats. Uh, we bought them cheap from a firm that builds them for prisons. The uh, convict didn't like them. Now, they complained that everyone who sits in those chairs gets absolutely burned alive. <laughs> and now, friends, draw up those chairs we talked about earlier and listen to tonight's tale of terror written especially for the Inner Sanctum by Michael Sklar. Our star tonight is Santa Sotega, who acts the role of Martin Wheeler in a blood-chilling story entitled, I Want to Report a Murder. Other women don't have to put up with such treatment. The way she carried on, you think I was Clark Gable? Me. Instead of a middle-aged the bank cashier getting bald in a little pot belly. I've never given her any reason to be jealous, not in 20 years of married life. She saw green every time I mentioned another woman. Every time I went out of the house. Like tonight. That was the reason the last time. You've always got a reason for going out and leaving me here alone. Now you've got to practice for the bank employees bowling tournament. That's a likely story. It happens to be the truth, Margaret. Oh, I'm sure the team will be practicing over the bowling alleys. And I'm just as sure you won't be there. Where else would I be? Oh, now you needn't pretend, Martin. I know you've got a date with one of those... Those women? I've told you a hundred times I don't have any dates with any other women. And I'm sick and tired of your insane suspicions. Insane, are they? Yes, they are. I'll be home at 11 o'clock. You can wait up for me if you like. Good night. I went down to the car and began to drive to the bowling alleys. Margaret, always nagging at me. Someday she'd push me too far. Yes, someday if she didn't stop the nagging, there would be another woman. Stop the car for a red light. A girl crossing the street. I noticed that she was blonde and pretty. A little like Margaret had looked when we were first married. And suddenly, as the girl passed in front of the car, she slipped and fell to the ground. What happened? Are you all right? That hole in the street. I tripped. Uh, let me help you to your feet. Oh, my foot. 
I must have strained it. Can you walk? Well, I'll try. Oh, no. No, I can't put any weight on it. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, look here, let me drive you home. Oh, I don't like to impose, but I... It's not an imposition. I'd consider it a pleasure. She was about 25 years old and married. She said her name was Mrs. Susan Holmes. I didn't tell her my name. And as things turned out, that was lucky. No one was home at her apartment. I helped her to a chair and started to leave. Don't. Don't go yet. Come here. Oh, don't be afraid of me. I'm not going to bite you. <laughs> now, Mrs. Holmes, uh, uh, I've got an appointment at the bowling alley. Uh... Well, that's not very flattering. Don't you like me? Oh, well, yeah, sure. I, I, I do, but... Uh, Mrs. Holmes, <laughs> please, uh, don't, don't you... You shouldn't. Don't be silly. You've been very kind. And I like you. Her arms were around my neck, pulling me down toward her. She used a faint perfume. Margaret hardly ever used perfume. Margaret. I thought of her as Susan kissed me. Then I stopped thinking until the door opened. Say, what is this? Robert! Susan, who is... I come home and find my wife kissing another guy. How long has this been going on? Well, uh, this this is all a mistake. Your wife tripped and hurt her ankle. I, I brought her home and... You won't weasel out of this by blaming it all on Susan. It won't work, mister. I saw both of you. Mr. Holmes, I've tried to explain. You won't listen to me, so I'm leaving. No, you don't. Get out of my way. This gun is loaded, mister. Put that gun back in your pocket. Don't be a fool. You're staying here until... Now, hey, let go of my arm! I've got the rope back... Gun! Out! Kill you for this! Let go of the gun! I'll break your arm! Now uh, I've got the gun. Give it back to me! I won't! Stop it! Don't give the gun! Oh. Stop it! I, I, I had to take the gun away from him. Oh. I didn't mean to pull the trigger. He's he dead. You killed him. I killed a man. I had to get away quick before the police came. Yes, I could walk out of the door and forget the whole thing. Mrs. Holmes didn't know anything about me nor even my name. I had to fast. I could get away. Go straight to the bowling alley and pretend it never happened. Where are you going? I'm leaving. Come back here. Come back here. Well, you did come to the bowling alley after all. Margaret, what are you doing here? I've been waiting for you. Checking up on me. Why shouldn't I? It certainly didn't take you this long to drive over from the house. Where have you been? Oh, for heaven's sake, Margaret, leave me alone. Why are you staring at me? Your face. What about my face? Plastic. Oh, that's why you took so long to get here. Margaret, not so loud. And you swore you'd never have dates with other women. Oh, I knew it. Well, I knew it all the time. Don't shout like that. People are staring at me. Let them stare. Let them hear every word I say. I want your friends to know what kind of a man you are. Here comes Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler. Oh, that phone call, it must be for me. Uh, I'll be right back. Hello? Mr. Wheeler? Yes, who, uh, who's this? This is Susan Holmes, Mr. Wheeler. What? You killed my husband. Just in case you've already forgotten. Huh? How did you know my name? Where to find me? It was all in your wallet. My wallet? It dropped out of your pocket during the fight. What? You want? I gotta see you. Right away. Well, that, that, that's impossible. My, my wife... Would you rather have me call the police? No, no. Don't do that, please. Where shall I meet you? Downstairs, in front of my apartment house. I'll be there waiting for you. I'll be there in ten minutes. Bye. Who is that phone call from? No, no one you know, Margaret. I can tell from the expression on your face. It was that woman again. I can't argue with you, Margaret. I, I've i got to go. Go where? I, I can't tell you. You're going back to her? No. I won't stand for it. I won't be humiliated. If you go to her, I'll kill you. I swear I'll kill you. <laughs> Be 
hated to leave her there crying. What else could I do? She wouldn't have believed what happened any more than Holmes did. Even less. Because she was so jealous. Susan's voice had sounded hard and bitter over the phone. Well, I couldn't blame her. It's a rotten thing I did. Running away like that. Then I saw her waiting at the curb. Young. Slim. And pretty. So you came. I get into the car, Susan. I want to tell you, I'm sorry about running away. Save the apology. Let's start driving. We drove for a while in silence. Several times I tried to start a conversation, but you wouldn't answer. Finally, I parked at the end of a deserted street on the waterfront. Fog was rolling in from the water. A few minutes, the mist would close around us. I've been thinking. I decided what we're going to do. You don't want the police mixed up in this, do you? No, of course not. Oh, neither do I. And don't ask me why. I got my own good reason. You got a plan? Yeah. My husband subleased the apartment under an assumed name. We've only been there a few weeks. Nobody in the house knows it. I'll leave town for good. The police won't be able to trace either of us. What? Your husband's body? I'll leave it. That'll give me at least a couple of days' start before the police find it. You'll have to help me. I need money. How much? Five thousand dollars. Five thousand... That's a lot of money. You got a nerve squawking about money. After what you did. It was self-defense. How would you like to tell that to a jury? But I simply haven't got $5,000. There was a card in your wallet that showed you work in a bank. The bank got plenty of money. You know how to get it. And more, too. She wanted me to steal the money. I saw it clear now. No longer young and fresh and pretty. Just this cheap, flashy woman who wanted money. Money? It was blackmail. If she got the 5000 it wouldn't end there. She'd keep driving me, squeezing me, milking me. Well, which is it going to be? The money or the police? Neither. Ah, don't be stupid. There's a law against murder. I'm going to do something very sensible, Susan. What do you mean? You... Take your hands off my throat. I don't like to do this. Oh, you're joking me. No. No. My fingers tightened on the throat. And I felt as though I was killing something inside me. She kissed me once. She said she liked me. And for a moment, I felt young again. <laughs> The body went limp suddenly between my hands. She was dead. I was a double murderer. You know, I'm really annoyed at that Martin Wheeler, the ungrateful scoundrel. And that poor kid, Susan Holmes. She got her neck twisted, all because she was trying to do Martin a good turn. <laughs> that wasn't a good return for her pains, was it? But on the other hand, it's not hard to see Martin's point of view. He probably felt that one good turn deserved another. And now, let's return to Martin Wheeler, the middle-aged bank cashier, who's having a night full of trouble. A moment ago, he killed Susan Holmes because she threatened to tell the police about the death of her husband. The fog was all around me now. 
making the world unreal. Sinister. Off in the water, the fog whistles were sobbing. I stood at the end of a pier. Body of Susan in my arms. I held her a moment longer than was necessary. And then dropped her into the water. In the car, I found a handbag. Contained a change purse, the key to her apartment, but not my wallet. The wallet must still be in her apartment. I felt that I had it. Drove wildly, disregarding the fog, passing through red lights. Then a car loomed up in front of me. I slammed on the brakes and stopped the bumper to bumper. Man got out of the car in front of me. He wore a uniform. I'd almost hit a police car. All right, what's your race, mister? I, 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 I didn't see the stop sign, the fog. Uh, you were doing at least 40 miles an hour and on a city street, too. Driving like that on a night like this, you could kill somebody. There, uh, what's your hurry? Uh, no, nothing, nothing at all. I, I, I just want to get home to my wife. Uh, let's have a look at your life. My, my driver's license? Uh, it's in my wallet. Get it out. Well, I, I lost my wallet the other day. <laughs> license and all, I... I haven't had a chance to apply for a new one. What's your name? Martin Wheeler. Where do you live? Six and three and a half, Sunset Drive. And you say your wife is at home, huh? Yes, sir. All right, move over. We'll drive over to your house. Your wife will have to identify you. Is that all, officer? All except for this. Now, here's your ticket, Wheeler. Appear in traffic court tomorrow morning. And apply for a new license, you understand? Yes, sir, I'll do that. All right. And don't let me catch you driving like that again. Good night. Good night. Well, Martin? I'm sorry, Margaret. You're sorry. Who is she? What's her name? Believe me, this isn't like what it's Are you in love with her? Are you? Answer me. No, I don't love her. Someday I'll be able to tell you what happened, but not now. I'm awfully tired. Let's go to bed. I pretended to sleep. The thought of my wallet still in Susan's apartment kept spinning through my mind. I had to get out of the house. I had to get to Susan's apartment and find the wallet. I couldn't leave until I was sure Margaret was asleep. She was asleep now. I slipped out of bed. Got into my clothes. Crept toward the door. I didn't see the chair in the dark until I stumbled over it. Who's there? Martin? Martin, where are you? I used the key I found in Susan's purse to let myself into her apartment. The body was no longer on the living room floor. She must have dragged it away. Perhaps she put it in the closet before she went to meet me. I didn't look for the body. My first concern was my wallet. And I found it where she must have left it on the telephone table. Everything was there. A few dollars, my license. I put it into my pocket and started to leave. Wait a minute. Holmes! I, I thought you were dead. I'm still very much alive, Mr. Wheeler. But, but the fight, the gunshot... You fell to the floor. Susan said you were dead. <laughs> You're not even wounded. I don't understand. The gun. It must have been loaded with blanks. That's right. But why? Why didn't you tell me? Why did you let me go on thinking that... Oh, I think I understand now. It was the old badger game right from the beginning. <laughs> Susan's... Brain anchor. When she kissed me. When you came in on us. That was all arranged in advance. Oh. I thought she really liked me. But it was all done in order to blackmail me. And now. Now she. Where is she? I. I don't know. 
She left you to arrange for the money. Now, you've got her door key. What did you do to her? Nothing. Nothing. You don't kid me, Wheeler. I can figure out what happened. She met you and asked for the money according to plan, but you figured you could get out of the mess by killing her. That's what you did. No. Sure you did. Else, how could you get the door key? She wouldn't give it to you. Why would you come back here for the wallet? You better be on the level with me, Wheeler. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. So you killed her. But I don't hold it against you. Level with me and we'll make a deal. What do you want? So you did kill her. Yes. So it's a real thing now, instead of a phony. But the price is still the same. I'll keep my mouth shut for $5,000. He was right. The situation was still the same. I got the money for him, I'd be in his grip forever. This is his life or mine. I had no choice. But I needed a weapon. And I saw it on the desk. A sharp pointed leather knife. All right. I'll give you the money. When? Right now. I'll sit down at the desk and write you a check. You're doing the smart thing, really. Yeah, you... Hey, that knife. Stay away from me. Some money. No. No, no. Wait a minute. Oh, twice in one night. But this time, I made sure he was dead. Then I wiped my fingerprints off the knife, wiped the doorknob clean, then left the apartment. I thought of everything. I left nothing behind that might connect me with the two murders. Going home, I concentrated on one thought. I must forget this night. Erase it from my memory. If I ever thought of this night again, it would be as a nightmare. Our bedroom was still dark as I entered. Margaret must have gone to sleep. Felt good to be home again. Safe. Back in a world where such things as I had done simply didn't happen. Someday, I tell Margaret the truth. Someday, when we were old, and such things no longer mattered. And then the room exploded in my face. Oh, oh, Margaret! Don't, don't, please don't. You're making a mistake. Yeah. But, you would let me explain. I don't need any explanation. You went back to her. I told you I'd kill you if you went back to that woman. Number, please. Operator, get me the police. I want to report a murder. surprise for Martin Wheeler. You might say it was curtains for Martin. <laughs> but you know, come to think of it, he made one big mistake. He shouldn't have murdered that nice Holmes couple. Mm-mm. No, indeed. He should have murdered his wife. Then we might have had a happy ending. <laughs> I 
Well, good night to you, old poison puss. And thanks for your story, I Want to Report a Murder, tonight's performance in the Mystery Playhouse. We'll be digging you again in the near future. Creeps, until next time. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Your Mystery Playhouse presents Inner Sanctum. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host inviting you in through the squeaking door. Ah, I just left a friend of mine. He runs an all-night billiard academy near the cemetery. Yes, after midnight, he uncovers the ghoul table. But no rough stuff in his place. No, he settles all arguments by arbitration. Simply lifts a shroud and points out they haven't a leg to stand on. Believes the old motto that a fiend in need is a fiend indeed. <laughs> Dust off the edge of your chair, because that's where you'll be sitting for the rest of this half hour, and listen to Murder Comes at Midnight. This is the story of how one average family, even as yours and mine, spent a quiet night at their rented country house. A night of terror. As I said, the Cannings were just an average family. Harry was 29 and worked as a sound engineer for a broadcasting studio in the city. Ethel was 27 and had been a school teacher before she was married. Now she was kept pretty busy between writing the great American novel and taking care of Judy, her seven-year-old daughter. This was the first year they had rented a house in the country for the summer, and Ethel didn't take much to the idea of being alone either. At first, I didn't know what it was that woke me. Perhaps it was because I was expecting Harry. He phoned that he was working overtime. He wouldn't be home till after midnight. I didn't like the idea of his driving 60 miles from this city at that hour. Or maybe it was just because I wasn't used to being alone with Judy in the old house. I got out of bed. I opened the connecting door to Judy's room. She was sleeping. Quietly. I closed the door softly, went across to my window. Something had awakened me. What? Was it a sound I heard in my sleep? Or... Or was it a premonition? I looked out the window. The night was dark with a thousand secrets. Harry should have been home by this time. My watch showed a few minutes after twelve. Maybe he'd had an accident. Maybe that's why I awakened. Some sort of telepathy. And then I saw the headlight. It was Harry. He was turning in our road. The headlight bathed me for a moment as he swung into our driveway. Everything was all right then. I'll be right down, Harry. Breathlessly, I raced downstairs to let him in. I was so happy I could cry. It was only then I realized what tension I'd been under, all because of my silly fears. I unlocked the door quickly. Oh, Harry, I was so worried. Sorry to bother you so late, miss. Had an accident with my car. Oh, I... I thought you were my husband. Oh, sorry to disappoint you. Oh, no, no, I'm afraid you can't come in. My husband isn't home yet. Well, it won't be for long. Oh, 
Oh, my heavens, you're hurt. It's your arm. Oh, it hurt in the accident. I'm afraid it's broken. Oh, you poor man. Here, sit down. Yeah. Sit down right here. Oh, that's better. Here. Your arm's so limp. Do you really think it's broken? I can't tell. It's kind of numb. Oh, dear, I feel so helpless. I don't know what to do. I I took a first aid course during the war, but I don't remember a thing. Now, maybe I better call Dr. Schultz. Oh, please, don't go to the trouble. There's no trouble. The phone's right here. I said no doctor. But it's all Put right. Put down I... that phone, please. I don't understand. Maybe you understand this. A gun? Put the phone down. Who are you? I'll ask the questions from now on. Your name's Canning, isn't it? How did you know? Name's on the door, isn't it? Oh. What kind of phone is that? What do you mean? Party line? No, it's a private wire. Uh, can you dial or do you have to ask the operator for the number? No, you just dial. Good. Uh, push the phone over here to this side of the table. Who were you going to call? The phone, please. You'd better get out of here before my husband comes home. <laughs> oh. How do you think he'd make out in an argument with this? Oh. The phone. Thank you. Now step back a little. That's good. Good. I have to put this gun down while I make my call. It's arm of mine. But you understand that I can pick it up faster than you could reach it from there, don't you? Yes, I understand. I see we'll get along, all right. Oh, operator, get me Plaza 9, 9970. Yeah, I'm hurt, please. Oh, this is uh, 864. Please. After your phone call, you get out. Before my husband comes home. He's late already. <laughs> you wouldn't turn an injured man out of your house in the middle of the night. Oh, hello. Linda? <laughs> That's right. I had a little trouble. I hurt my arm. Look, I think you'd better come up here. Yeah, and bring Fred and Doc Stetson along. No, no, no. Everything's fine. Don't be any trouble. I'm a guest of some very good friends up here. Canning to me. Or you drive up Highway 26 through a court and turn right when you pass the first gas station. Huh? It's just a mile from there. You ought to be here by 6 in the morning. There'll be a light in the downstairs window. Right, Linda. It'll be in the morning. You can't stay here all night. You've got Shut to Shut up. Go. Um. What's that over there? Radio? Yes. Pretty big. It's a sending and receiving set. Harry built it himself. He's a radio engineer. Hmm. Can you get short wave police calls? Yes. Turn it on. But I don't... Turn it on. No. Well, getting brave, huh? I don't think you'd dare to shoot me. It would be murder. They'd send you to the chair. Now you get out of here. You call your friends and tell them to beat you someplace else. Now there, I've opened the door. Now get out. <laughs> Worried about your husband, aren't you? Afraid of what'll happen to him if he comes home now, huh? I want you to go away. And if you don't go now, I'll run out and scream for help. There are other houses in this neighborhood and somebody will hear me. Oh, go ahead and run. What? I won't shoot you. You won't? I don't have to. What do you mean? You wouldn't dare to run out and uh, leave your kid upstairs. That little red-headed kid with the cute curls. Judy. How do you know I have a daughter? Easy. A doll carriage over there. How do you know she has red curls? Maybe I guessed it. And her name, too? Turn on that radio. All right. <laughs> Junction's on Highway 26. All cars must be searched. Every passenger positively identified. Officers are warned to exercise extreme caution. Though believed to be wounded, he's armed and dangerous. 
I will repeat, Arnie Bishop, known as the Gentleman Killer, escaped from custody on board the Allegheny Limited at 11 o'clock while being escorted to the death house at the state prison. He's thought to be heading north in the direction Send of the north. Now, you know who I am. Arnie Bishop. You're Arnie Bishop. How many rooms in this house? Six. Fine, fine. My friends and I will stay here for a few days. It will make a fine hideout. What will you do when my husband comes home? Don't worry about him. Now, suppose we go in the kitchen, then you can make me something to eat. Wait. Huh? Why did you choose this house to come to? This house of all of it. Can't you guess? Yes, I think. How did you know Judy's name? And about the color of her hair? Ah, you're getting warm. My husband, Harry, Harry told you. Ah, you know you're pretty smart. Oh, please, don't you have any pity at all? Tell me what you did to Harry. He's not hurt much. I just tapped him on the head. He picked me up on the road, gave me a lift. I pumped him, found out all about this house and about you and Judy. Then I knocked him out and kept going. It was pretty tough driving with one hand, but I made it. Where's Harry now? In the back of the car. He can't get loose. I'm going out to... Stay where you are. But Harry's hurt. I can't leave him out there alone. About this little red-headed kid of yours, uh... Where did she sleep? Upstairs? You wouldn't... You wouldn't hurt her. Better stay here if you want to make sure. Oh, no. That's better. <laughs> now, suppose we have something to eat. Now let's return to the little white shingled house on the hill where Ethel Canning is entertaining her uninvited guest, Arnie Bishop. You know, he's a pretty courageous guy for an ex-convict. But then maybe he has the courage of his conviction. <laughs> but Arnie isn't so smart, you know, tangling with a red-headed gal. He ought to recall that old ditty. How's it go? Beware of a girl with deep red hair. A man is safer in the electric chair. But who can tell how a tale will end out in a sanctum? Let's join them in the kitchen. Hmm. Oh, excellent bacon and eggs. I'm sure my friends will like cooking when they come. More coffee? Yes, please. Careful. Oh, I was only reaching for the coffee cup. <laughs> I thought you might have ideas about grabbing this. There's your coffee. Hmm. What time is it? Twenty after two. Uh-huh. Three and a half hours to go before my friends get here. How will they get through the roadblock? Oh, you'll leave it to there. Oh. What's that? That's the telephone. It's in the living room. You better get to it. Oh, oh you don't let go of that gun. Oh. You shouldn't have tried that. What are you going to do? Answer that telephone first. Get going. Yeah. Anybody in the habit of calling you at this hour? No. All right, answer it. But be careful what you say. Yes, this is Mrs. Canning. Oh. It's for you. Oh. All right. Lay the receiver down on the table and walk away. That's right, far enough. Don't try anything. Hello? Linda? Wait, did you get started yet? Oh, where are you? What? Roadblock. Well, you, you've got to get through. I need Doc Stetson. You, you've got to make it, Linda. I can't stay awake forever. But... All right, all right. Do your best. Call me back later. Oh. What's the matter, Mr. Bishop? Are your friends falling down on you? Shut up. I've got to think. Oh, you don't have anything to worry about, Mr. Bishop? Aren't you a guest of the Cannings in the little white shingled house a mile off Highway 26 north of Accord? Oh, you can be sarcastic, too. Oh, huh? I wouldn't dare be sarcastic to you, Mr. Bishop. Especially when you have that gun. 
And with my husband unconscious in the car, and you threatening to harm my child, oh, no. No, you still hold all the cards, Mr. Bishop, and you're such a big, strong, brave man. What are you trying to do, get me mad enough to kill you? Aren't you going to kill me anyway? What makes you think that? Because you're a killer by instinct, Mr. Bishop. It's easier for you to kill than to do anything else. I wonder why you didn't murder my husband instead of just knocking him out. Was it because you thought you might need him? Well, you're not afraid of me anymore. No, I'm not. No, I just realized. I can't afford to be afraid. What? I'm a woman fighting for her family, for Harry and Judy. And I've got to use all my wits against you. I can't afford to be afraid. You've got some scheme in that crazy little brain of yours. Yes, Mr. Bishop, I have. I think I've found the chink in your armor. You're a coward. Me? Yes, you. You're the one who's afraid now. Your friends aren't coming. You have a wound in your arm that needs treatment, and you know you can't trust me. You don't dare close your eyes, even for five minutes. And you may have to stay here for several days. How do you like the prospect of staying awake night and day, watching me every minute of the time, afraid that you might drop off to sleep at any minute? Oh, that's how you figure it, huh? Maybe you better kill us all right now, Mr. Bishop. That would be easy, wouldn't it? Just three bullets. Then you wouldn't have to worry about watching anyone. That's an excellent idea, Mrs. Canning. Yes. But then you'd have other things to worry about. Such as? This is Saturday morning. The milkman will come to collect for the week's milk. The neighbors will stop by to ask if I want my marketing done. And what will you do? Skulk in the cellar while they ring the doorbell? Yeah. And then there's the police. What about the police? They'll surely search this part of the country. They'll be making inquiries at all the houses. Do you want them to find the car outside? With Harry in it? <laughs> oh. You figured all the angles, huh? You know, you're pretty smart, Mrs. Canny. I think you're even smarter than Linda. But you forget one thing. Yes? You forget that little girl upstairs. What do you mean? Come along and I'll show you. Upstairs. You stay away from Judy. Oh! Maybe you think you've got everything figured out, but I'm still the boss. Oh, it's... Gun muscle hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> now, shall we go upstairs? <laughs> so you think Arnie Bishop is licked, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh. Which is Judy's room? What are you going to do to her? Which is Judy's room? Or are you going to make me open all the doors to find her? It's that one. Uh-huh. All right, let's go in. Are you first, Mrs. Canning? I warn you, if you hurt You Judy... first, Mrs. Canning. Ah, very pretty child. How peaceful she looks. And innocent. Ain't all childhood the best time of life. It's almost a pity to grow up out of it. You couldn't, you couldn't hurt her. Oh, I assure you, Mrs. Canning, I won't lay a hand on her. Oh, no, not on a beautiful child like that. No. But, um... I've got to protect myself. Let's see. That's the connecting door to your room, isn't it? There's a key in the door. Lock it, please. Now give me the key. Thank you. Now we'll go out the way we came in. I'll take the key out of this door, too. Thanks. You first. Now we'll lock this door on the outside. There you are. Everything's set. Mm, you, you just want to make sure she doesn't get out? Yeah, no, something like that. Huh? Now, will you pull the mattress and sheets off your bed and bring them out here, please? Are you going to sleep in front of her door? Do as I say. All right. I'll help you. I don't understand. Why do you want to sleep out here? Oh. No, I'm... Yeah. Everything just the way I want it. The mattress against Judy's door. But you can't sleep on it that way, half up against the door. I didn't say I was going to sleep on it. Well, what are you going now, to Mrs. do? Mrs. Canning, we'll see if you can figure out how to beat this angle. What do you mean? 
What would happen if I were to put a match to this mattress and bedding? Oh, no! This whole floor would be in flames in five minutes. With both doors locked. <laughs> Judy wouldn't have much of a chance, would she? Oh, no! <laughs> Still think Arnie Bishop is licked, Mrs. Canning? Oh, no. You're right about one thing, Mrs. Canning. I am in the corner. With this bum arm, I've got no chance of running if the police come. So if they do, and if I'm cornered, I'll set a match to this mattress and fight them off till the whole house is just a bunch of rubble with Judy in it. <laughs> you uh, understand me thoroughly, Mrs. Canning. Yes. Uh, so it's up to you to see that the police don't come. You're going to lie for me, Mrs. And you're going to cheat for me, and you're going to kill for me if necessary. Because I always have a match ready. Now, do you still feel like trying any tricks? I'll do whatever you say. More like it. Now, the first thing you have to do, go downstairs and run that car into the garage. Get it out of the way. But don't touch your husband. Don't even look in the back of the car. I'll be watching, understand? Yes. Ah, glad we understand each other at last. Let's go. I'll be standing right here in the driveway, so don't try any tricks. I won't. Remember, I'm watching. Harry. Harry, dear, can you hear me? Harry? Harry? Oh, he's still unconscious. There's blood on his head. Mrs. Yes, I'm coming! You did take a look at him, didn't you? No, no. All right. No. All right, come inside. Ah. Beautiful night, isn't it? It'll be morning soon. What time is it? Almost six. The milkman should be here soon. Oh? Well, here's where you start lying for me. After you, madam. Uh... Now, I'm going to sit right here in this chair with my hand in my pocket. And in my hand's the gun. Understand? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's the milkman. You tell him I'm your cousin just visiting here for a few days. He'll wonder why you're up so early. Let him wonder. Go on, answer him. Good morning, Mrs. Canning. I'm the new milkman on the route. Hope I didn't wake you up. Come in, please. Uh, that's two bottles of milk you wanted this morning and a bottle of cream. Yes, yes you can put them on the table. Yes. All right. Oh, this is my cousin. He's visiting us for a few days. Oh, how are you? Hello. You have my bill? Yeah, I got it right here in my pocket. Here. Hey, is that... That's right, Bishop, it's a gun. Sit still and take your hand out of your pocket very carefully. Okay, okay, you win. But how come a milkman with a gun? I, uh... <laughs> I borrowed this coat from the regular milkman. I'm Sergeant Wright, State Police. What? Thank heaven. State Police? Uh, how did you know I was here? Mrs. Canning told us. She? Well, how? I, I didn't let her out of my sight. She broadcast it to us. Broadcast? Yes. Over this set, Mr. Bishop. Uh. Remember the speech I made you? You didn't know what had come over me. I was really talking to the state police over the short wave. Don't you remember I told you that this was a sending and receiving set that my husband built it? And when I turned off the short wave signals, I turned the switch to sending. And then I hoped, I just hoped my message would get through. Ah. Uh. I didn't think you were smart enough. And I thought I had you scared stiff. You uh, look like the kind who would scare you. Oh, I am, Mr. Bishop, I am. But I warned you. This was a time when I couldn't afford to be scared. <laughs> With? With? All 
goes to prove that a determined man can always get what he goes after. You remember Bishop tried to get free board and lodging from Ethel Canning. He finally got it all right, but not exactly where he wanted it. You know, as a matter of fact, Bishop was the type of man who should never have gone in for murder. Oh, too many risks. He should have specialized in arson. That's always a sure-fire undertaking. <laughs> that was your host, Raymond Edward Johnson, closing the door on Inner Sanctum, tonight's performance in the Mystery Playhouse. It's late, Creed, so good night. Sleep time. <laughs>